The story begins as a fire engulfs a huge factory, and a helicopter with reporters rushes in to film what is happening. Fire trucks rush to the factory at top speed to provide first aid and save all the workers of the factory. The huge factory was trapped in a cage of flames, which, like a bright dome, enveloped it from all sides. Firefighters are gathering equipment with all speed to start extinguishing. Li Yue Du walks into the tent where the firefighting squads are being briefed, and at the same moment, everyone cast their eyes on him. The team reports to Chief Ko De Su that the situation is critical. The chief is flustered, but still gives the order that he's taking control. The firefighters follow their new commander's instructions and get to work putting out the fire, taking care to be careful. The firefighters quickly divide into groups, then deploy water cannons and begin to extinguish the fire. One of the firefighters finds the first victim and carries him out of the fire while his comrade tries to put out the fire with the water cannon. One of the firemen quickly rushes with an important report to the command tent. He tells the command that he has managed to find the exact number and location of the people who are in the factory. However, the place is completely overrun by a massive fire that does not allow any living creature to get inside. The fire is slowly destroying everything around, and the firefighters are only silently watching and cannot do anything. At this moment, another fire truck at full speed is moving towards the scene. In this car rides a rapid response squad led by a young legendary firefighter named Ho Su. The firefighters pull up a large fire truck from the backside of the scene, as ordered by the young commander. A few minutes later, legendary firefighter Ho Su arrives on the scene. Quite quickly, he and his team leave the vehicle and inspect the scene without paying attention to others. Ho Su greets the chief of the department and declares over the radio that his squad is now taking control. The hero climbs onto a fire truck and selects six firefighters, who are ordered to climb into the fire truck and follow his instructions completely. The young fireman then gets into the truck without further ado, but none of the firemen understand what he is up to. Finally, he starts the fire truck and slowly turns around in the direction where the flames are raging. The young commander sharply presses the gas and rushes at full speed to the very spot where the factory workers are trapped. For a split second, it seems that the fire would have no trouble consuming the fire truck along with the legendary Hosu. But at his command, all the firemen open fire with their water cannons. The fire truck, engulfed in fire and water, destroys all obstacles ahead and creates a passage to rescue the people who were trapped all this time. No one makes a single sound. All the firefighters mesmerized watching this red monster with the familiar emergency number on its back. Colonel Ko De Su's legs gave out from the overwhelming emotion and he fell to his knees silently. The colonel's face is contorted with surprise and horror, unable to believe what he is seeing. This story is about a firefighter with exceptional abilities, and his journey begins in an internet cafe. On this day, a close friend of the hero helps him find out if he passed the firefighter exam. As they fill in all the necessary lines, a strong excitement grips their hearts, causing them to start beating rapidly as if in unison. A few minutes later, however, Hosu receives word that he has passed the entrance exam, thanks in part to his gift of seeing the future. He bangs his head on the glass because he can't always see the future, but only when he is highly agitated. This ability can't help the hero from being scared or when he wants to confess to someone who cares about him. A little girl that Hosu meets along the way causes him to drift back in time, which makes him remember the reason he wanted to become a firefighter. He first learned of his ability when he, along with his mother, younger brothers, and sister, was trapped in a house that had been consumed by fire. With his ability, he saw a fireman, a true hero, appear out of the window to save them from imminent doom, which soon happens. Without a shadow of a doubt, the fireman bursts through the flames to save the people in the burning building. Hosu heads to the Central Firefighter Academy, his dream of becoming a firefighter realized. He checks the time on his watch so he won't be late for the Academy's intensified training. The hero gets to the bus stop and meets only one person there with a huge bag on his shoulders. Hosu manages to find out that this man is also heading to the Firefighters Academy, to which he is madly happy. A few minutes later, Hosu gets on the bus and holds up his card, but there isn't enough money on it to pay the fare. His new friend Wang Ho saves the hero from this situation and pays the fare for two, after which they continue their dialogue. Halfway through their conversation, Hosu becomes tense and hardly listens to what Wang Ho is telling him. In a cold sweat, Hosu quickly stands up and yells towards the bus driver about stopping immediately. 
He then heads towards the man who was sitting in front of them and asks Wan Ho to help him. The man falls helplessly into Ho Su's arms because he's having a heart attack. The young firefighter sees the future again, where the man falls from his seat due to a heart attack. He begins to perform indirect heart massage and hopes it will help prolong the man's life until they end up in the hospital. Wang Ho asks the driver to take them to the nearest hospital as soon as possible because this is a critical situation. The two young firefighters perform cardiac massage, changing once every few minutes so the other can take a break. Ho Su calls the hospital and tells them to prepare a ventilator and asks them to prepare a stretcher in advance. Five minutes later, they reach the hospital, where the doctors have already prepared the stretcher and are waiting outside the bus door. The man is quickly placed on the stretcher and Ho Su explains what happened on the bus. One of the doctors thanks the firemen for their help, but does not let them go any further and asks them to leave the care of the sick man to the doctors. Without further argument, the young firefighters sit down near the nearest wall and try to catch their breath. Wang Ho asks Ho Su how he guessed that the man had a heart problem, to which Ho Su replies that it was just intuition. Wang Ho pulls out his phone and looks at the time. He realizes they are late for the entrance ceremony and doesn't know what to do now. At the academy, they tell the reason why they are late for the ceremony, and then they are sent to change. They quickly change and go to the canteen, where a huge number of firefighters have already gathered. Wang Ho and Ho Su go to find the dormitory where they are to live during their time at the academy after lunch. Inside their room, they meet Beck Sung Wu, who is ten years older than them and in good physical shape. As they settle into the room, a few other guys walk in and talk about how they are all one team now. Each of those in the room walks to the center of the room and introduces themselves, saying their age and name. A voice from the speaker interrupts their introductions and asks everyone to gather in classroom A. All the newly minted firefighters gather in a large auditorium where the academy director gives his motivational speech. He says that not everyone present will be able to become a true professional and that there is no shame in leaving the profession halfway through. At the end of his speech, he thanks Ho Su and Wang Ho for saving the man on the bus. The third team discovers that Ho Su is a record breaker who has broken all records in training. The academy has hard and exhausting training every day, and the coaches watch carefully to make sure the young firefighters act as a team. Third team captain Park Jong Siok says that there will be rescue and extinguishing training in the morning, so he asks everyone to put on their uniforms and split up. Ho Su sees a future where the fireman's rope can't support Wang Ho's weight, causing him to fall off and fall from a great height. After seeing this, he becomes very absent-minded, which makes his team worried about his well-being. The hero goes to the shower room to get his thoughts in order and tries to think of a way to inform Wang Ho about the danger that awaits him. The instructor explains to the firefighter what he will need to do in the next exercise. Ho Su doesn't listen to the trainer. He's too immersed in thoughts of saving his friend. Wang Ho is about to be the first of the group to go to do the exercise, but Ho Su stops him. The hero asks his friend to accompany him to the infirmary and lies about not feeling well. As they descend the stairs, Ho Su is relieved that he has saved his friend from danger. But he sees the future again, in which his captain is already flying down from a great height. The young fireman quickly thinks over the situation and tries to come up with a plan where everyone will be alive. His friend puts on special gear and is about to go down to go through the training first. The iron beam that the safety rope was attached to fails and Wang Ho promptly flies down, but Wang Ho catches the rope and tries to hold on to his friend. All the firefighters who were nearby at that moment rush to Ho Su's aid. With all their might, they pull the rope and pull Wang Ho up and then check to see if he's okay. The trainer announces that the training is over for the day and the newly minted firefighters gather their equipment. After practice is over, the third team is sent to the medical room to check on Van Ho's well-being. He asks about how the training went and thanks Ho Su for saving him. As the guys are about to leave, Wan Ho asks the hero how he knew the man on the bus would have a seizure. Ho Su replies that it was his intuition and tries not to give away his anxiety. Wan Ho says that Ho Su knew about the man and the cable beforehand and asks him if he can see the future. Hosu admits to having the gift of seeing the future and says that his senses are only heightened when he's nervous. Wan Ho doesn't believe his fool and accuses him of blatantly lying to him. He ponders the situation and decides that he will believe Ho Su, but asks him to warn him about similar situations in the future to help him. Five days later, the third team arrives at the scene of the fire in full force. 
When one of them opens the door, a fire whirlwind rumbles out through it to the outside. The fire calms down a bit and the squad of firefighters goes inside the apartment, pouring water cannons on the fire. One of the firefighters finds the first survivor while the other covers him by pouring water cannon fire on him. The firefighter discovers another survivor and is asked to clear a passageway to get him out of the burning room. The team pulls all possible survivors out of the building and reports the mission to command. All of this was a rescue training exercise where mannequins were used instead of people. The trainer carefully records the third team's performance and makes a judgment that the newly minted firefighters earn the highest score for teamwork. During their time at the academy, Ho Su and Wang Ho became best friends and they often helped each other. The Central Fire Academy receives a report of a fire in Shintang District. A fire truck stops in front of the young firefighters before advancing to the epicenter of the fire. Squad Captain Kim Sung recruits several volunteers among whom turn out to be Ho Su and Wang Ho. The fire chief tells the volunteers about the situation and asks them not to be heroes. Ho Su is worried about his first assignment and gets a vision of the future where a huge explosion takes place. Firefighters arrive at the scene of the fire and disperse all the people away from the building. Volunteers quickly climb out of the fire truck and begin to untangle the water cannons and then hand them to the experienced firefighters. The firefighters break into groups and spray the windows of the burning building with the water cannons. One of the firefighters reports that there are no injuries and that the building is made of high-quality materials that will not allow the fire to spread further. Very close to the burning building is another building that is being renovated and has a huge amount of explosive materials. In this building, a man is painting a wall, and because of the music playing in his headphones, he is completely oblivious to the sounds coming from the window. Hosu again sees a future where the building being renovated explodes like a powder keg. One of the volunteers, a girl from another squad, calls out to Wan Ho and tells him that they have completed the task and only need to wait by the fire truck. Hosu goes into the store and asks if there is a construction site, and the saleswoman points him in the direction of it with her finger. The hero thanks the saleswoman and quickly runs out of the store, heading towards the building where the construction site is being held. Yaren, a girl from the other squad, is angry with the third team and asks Wan Ho to go back to the fire truck because otherwise they could be in serious trouble. He warns Yaren that an explosion is about to happen, but she believes that the firefighters have the situation under control and will put out the fire soon. A girl who works at the store approaches Yaren and Wan Ho and asks if they put out the fire, and afterward tells her that one of the firemen came by to see her. Wang Ho goes into the building where the construction site is and finds gas tanks that could explode at any moment. Yaren and Wan Ho find Ho Su, who put his mask on a worker to save him from suffocation. The girl looks around carefully and realizes the danger of the situation they are in. Wang Ho plans to go downstairs to help Ho Su, but Aaron stops him and tells him not to go downstairs. Pointing to the cinders, the girl explains that if he goes in mindlessly now, there will be enough oxygen downstairs to cause a fire and then an explosion. To keep Hosu from suffocating, she tries to reach inside with a cylinder of air. The hero slowly moves towards the air tank, the smell of paint making him double-eyed. With a weakened hand, he reaches out for the cylinder but misses, and the heavy object hits his head. Hosu manages not to lose consciousness and he puts the mask over his face while slowly opening the valve of the oxygen tank. He is now safe, and with a hand gesture, he thanks his comrades for their help. The fire squad commander moves to the vehicle to check on the newcomers who were supposed to be waiting inside it, but finds no one. The volunteers contact the rest of the firefighters and report the situation at the construction site. The fire commander, instead of his deputy, moves towards the volunteers to help and find out the reason why they left the fire truck. Yaren tells the firefighter's commander in great detail about the situation and warns that if Ash is inside the building, everything will blow up. The commander asks everyone to step aside because he has a plan and also asks his deputy to call an ambulance. After holding his breath, he goes down the stairs inside the building with the oxygen tank and opens it. Then he asks for a window to be opened and throws the oxygen tank in there, with all the ash that was nearby flying away. Hosu looks at the fire chief in amazement and doesn't understand how he could come up with a solution to this situation in such a short time. The ambulance arrives and the firefighters carry the injured man on their back so that the doctors can give him first aid as soon as possible. The firefighter commander reprimands the volunteers. He talks about how they did nothing and just got stuck in this building. He asks the guys to think critically 
because if they run around again to save someone's life, they will have to save theirs. The commander, on behalf of the entire squad, thanks the volunteers for being able to find the person and help them. While in the fire truck, Yaren asks Hosu and Wanho how they guessed that there was going to be an explosion, which makes the guys worried. The firefighter commander scrutinizes the volunteers and notices that they are very upset about what happened. He asks them not to be upset because they have not done anything criminal and their punishment will be small. Ho Su and Wang Ho are awakened by a musical alert from the speaker in their room. The third team wakes up as well, and Ho Su and Wan Ho put on their firefighter uniforms. They tell the squad that they left the firefighting site yesterday, and because of this, they have to meet the instructor early in the morning. In the hallway, the guys meet Yaren and discuss the situation that happened while putting out yesterday's fire. Ho Su, out of excitement, sees the future again in which the instructor has them run five laps around the field in full gear and tells his friends this. The instructor tells the boys to do the same thing Ho Su was talking about a few minutes ago. Yaren, who didn't believe until the end that Ho Su could see the future, now recognizes it and believes in his ability. Due to a huge wave of emotion, Aaron faints and the guys manage to catch her. The run in full uniform proves almost impossible for Wan Ho, and he falls to his knees halfway through. Ho Su helps him up, and they continue running together so that they don't have to extend the already long distance. On the fifth day of punishment, Wang Ho is a little used to this kind of running, but he still can't catch up with Ho Su and Yaren. Wang Ho is tired and asks them to stop, at which point Yaren yells at the top of his voice that Ho Su can see the future. The guys try to shut Yaren's mouth because they're worried that someone might find out the truth about Hosu's abilities. Yaren is surprised at Hosu's endurance, to which he states that he used to practice long-distance running, so this workout comes easy for him. After a short break, the boys continue their run despite the heavy uniforms they are wearing. In the dormitory, the third team is discussing plans for the weekend, and Wan Ho suggests that they all have a little training session. All the guys arrive at the treadmill to set up a long-distance run. Hosu took one of the treadmills and got ready to start, but he was puzzled about something. He was completely immersed in his thoughts, replaying in his mind the moment where he was trapped in a trap from which he had to be rescued. The commander of the third squad looks at the stopwatch and sees that Hosu ran the course in three minutes. He almost broke the national record. At that moment, the fire brigade commander and the academy director walk past the stadium. They point out that the third squad contains capable kids, and they are sure to have a great future in the firefighting profession. The boys in the third squad notice that one of the firefighters directs them to join their training. This fireman turns out to be an officer and suggests Hosu to organize a pull-up competition. The hero tries to give his best, so he uses all his strength in this competition. Hosu was much slower than the officer and loses the competition. The officer won the team in the whole competition, causing all of them to fall down and only saying that the rescue team is a bunch of lunatics. Hosu can't sleep. His head is full of thoughts that chase away any sleep. Early in the morning, he goes to the fire brigade commander to ask him for advice. He pours coffee for himself and Hosu, then explains to him that everything will come with experience and worries should be left behind. The door to the room opens and a young man appears with a small blue box in his hands. He stands in front of Hosu and speaks words of gratitude for his rescue at the construction site. The third team changes clothes and prepares to leave their room to take the physical test. The boys gather around Hosu to watch a recording of a firefighter passing a physical test that he has turned on his phone. The footage shows a firefighter going through an obstacle course in heavy gear along with a fire mask. The instructor gives a brief briefing to all the teams and talks about the basic rules of the physical test. Yun Sung appears in front of the squads to demonstrate to the others exactly how to pass the test. Ho Sun recognizes him as the man who joined them over the weekend to participate in the training and beat him in the pull-up contest. The officer, in full firefighter's gear, gets into position and prepares on the instructor's whistle to begin the physical test. He passes the test lane rather quickly and performs various tasks before pulling a mannequin out of a burning building. A panting Yoon Seung, to the sound of the cadet's applause, slowly walks down the stairs and tries to catch his breath. With a smile on his face, Hosu prepares for his race. He wants to show the best result. From excessive efforts, the hero begins to choke. He grabs his hands on his mask and tries to calm down. The story takes us back to where Hosu has not yet started the test. He has seen his future. 
Yoon Seung sits on a bench as the instructor reprimands him for going through the test lane too quickly. Another group of cadets take position for the obstacle course, with Yerin among them. Quick and collected, she passes several obstacles without delay, not inferior to her predecessors. The rest of the cadets are inspired by her result and finally start to complete the obstacle course correctly and clearly. Hosu checks his gear and puts on his firefighter's helmet along with his mask. He will be the next to go through the obstacle course. The officer and instructor pay attention to the hero. Yoon Seung thinks the hero is weak and won't be able to pass the test. Hosu takes the starting position and waits for the instructor's command to start the test. Pretty quickly, he passes the test lane without paying attention to the dangers that might happen because of it. He quickly picks up a fire hose and one of its ends flies into his helmet, but he has no problem catching it thanks to his gift. Hosu throws the ladder forward to complete the rescue task faster and places it against the wall. The instructors watch closely as the hero goes through the trials. They can't believe his speed. The hero is completely focused on the test. He is unable to see the future during the test. The story switches to Ho Su's memories of the first time he saw a fireman and wanted to be one. He sees a fireman reporting to headquarters that he has found survivors in a burning building. The fireman rubs the boy's head and speaks to him in a soft voice, trying to calm him down and thanking him for his help. Ho Su passes all the test lanes and rings the bell to complete the physical test. All the firefighters applaud and cheer for the hero as he set a new record and passed the test in only six minutes. The third team puts on full firefighter uniforms and prepares to pass the physical text. The entire team is exhausted after the obstacle course and sit on a bench to rest. Only Hosu is full of energy and continues to cheer on the firefighters who have yet to pass the test. In the dormitory, the third team discusses the events that took place during the obstacle course. The young firefighters are getting ready to graduate and put on their special parade uniforms. They are worried and some are even crying with happiness because today is their last day at the academy. The commander of the third team encourages his squad and with tears in his eyes says that he was glad to meet his comrades. The academy graduates are seated in the huge hall where the ceremony will take place. On a huge screen, the graduates are shown moments of their time at the academy, including a recording of them taking a physical text. The director of the fire academy gives Hosu his diploma and takes a picture with him. Hosu nonchalantly drinks his drink and waits for his friend Yaren. They agreed to meet at a cafe today. Yaren and Hosu sit at the same table and discuss their future jobs. They learn that they will work in the same fire station and will be able to see each other more often. The third team meets at a farewell ceremony and they wish each other good luck in their upcoming jobs. Hosu is given a briefing at his new place of work and the fireman tells him how everything is organized in their brigade. The fireman gives him a tour of the entire fire brigade hangar and tells him how their second team works. Hosu takes a notebook and pen and carefully writes down his mentor's words without leaving out important details. The hero takes his workplace and gets acquainted with his new team. It turns out that he is the youngest firefighter in the team. A medical worker asks Hosu to help him clean up the ambulance and they unload it together. Hosu goes with the second team on his first real firefighting assignment. The second team arrives at the scene of the call, and they learn that there is no fire because it was a false call and people were just cooking meat outdoors. The fire department asks the citizens to be careful, and they leave the place. The team discusses the situation and rejoice at the fact that the call was false and everyone is safe. They go to another call, which also turned out to be a false call, where an elderly couple was burning garbage in a barrel. The second team returns to base and takes off their heavy firefighting gear. Yaren and Hosu are busy cleaning the fire building and discussing their first day on the job. The fire alarm sounds and the team puts on their uniforms and takes their seats in the fire truck. Black smoke rises rapidly from the basement of the shopping center. Hosu watches the smoke carefully from the window of the fire truck and ponders his plan of action. The hero sees a future where he is engulfed in black smoke and cannot see anything around him. In this pitch blackness, he trips over an object and falls to the floor. The firemen deploy the fire cannon and approach the iron gate, ready to extinguish the fire. One of the firefighters goes around to the other side of the building and opens a small window leading inside. The second team goes inside and fires water cannons into the passage ahead of them, clearing the black smoke from the road. Hosu pulls out a heat detection sensor and tries to determine where the fire is. The hero loses sight of his team and finds himself trapped in black smoke where nothing can be seen. 
A hand emerges from the smoke and grabs Hosu by the collar of his clothes and pulls him out of the trap. The team captain holds the hero by his clothes and reprimands him for disobeying orders, demanding that he strictly follow instructions. Hosu rests his arm on the captain's shoulders and they walk out of the smoke into the fresh air together. Reinforcements from the other fire brigade quickly rush to the hearth of the fire. Ho Su and the captain rest together, sitting on a fence and discussing the situation that happened while fighting the fire. The officer of the squad encourages the hero and asks him not to get upset about the last incident because it was his first call. The second team goes to a restaurant to celebrate the addition of Ho Su to their squad. The team raises their glasses and the officer makes a loud toast in honor of the newcomer. Yeren complains to Hosu about working the night shift and not getting enough sleep. The hero tells his girlfriend about his first call and feels strongly about letting the team down. The director of the center enters the fire brigade building and greets his colleagues, and he wonders where the newcomer is. Hosu takes off and puts on a full firefighting outfit as ordered by the center director Beck Du Jin. The center director is not satisfied with the speed at which Hosu follows his order and demands to put on and take off the fire uniform once more. The hero enters the office of the center director and salutes him, greeting him. Bak Du Jin shows Hosu a map of the area their fire department is responsible for and explains that the team lacks the manpower to competently provide security. He reveals that a factory complex has recently come up, which is the most dangerous place for a fire to break out. The firefighters rescue people from the two-story building, which is slowly consuming the fire. The second team arrives at the scene of the fire and puts on firefighter uniforms. The commander, along with his officer, take water cannons and rush towards the fire. They ask Hosu to stay at a safe distance and assist them. The hero watches mesmerized as the factory complex is engulfed in flames. The other squads uncoil the fire hoses and rush toward the fire in a coordinated fashion. One of the victims runs out of the smoke of the fire toward the firefighters and, screaming in pain, asks them to help the others. Several teams of firefighters pour fire from water cannons to get inside the buildings. An ambulance lays the injured on stretchers and gives them first aid. Hosu comes to his senses. He joins the firefighters and begins to put out the fire with a fire hose. Several firefighters climb onto the roof of the building and use water cannons to put out the fire from above. An explosion occurs and a column of fire rushes upward, piercing the roof of the building, but the firefighters manage to move aside. The squad leader asks Hosu to keep up, and the second team makes their way through the fire to Building C together. The firefighters see a large building in front of them with billows of smoke and fire. The second team acts cohesively as they fire water cannons to create a conduit inside the building. They find themselves inside a huge warehouse, which is filled with a huge number of boxes of different sizes and shapes. The squad commander orders them to move to Building B to put out the hotbed of fire. In the corridor, Hosu becomes very hot. Sparks of fire hurt his face, and he wrinkles his face and closes one eye. The squad acts as one and creates a small passage for themselves that leads to the next building. The squad sees the dormitory building in front of them, which has already been hit by fire from neighboring buildings. The squad leader reports that they need help putting out the fire and are going to rescue the victims from the dormitory. Hosu opens one of the doors of the building and sees a man in front of him who is trapped under the rubble of the building. He leads the man out to safety while the team covers him from the tongues of flame with water cannons. The hero puts an oxygen mask on the victim to prevent the man from suffocating from carbon monoxide. He hands him over to the rescuers to give the injured man first aid. Hosu meets Wang Ho's gaze but decides not to greet him and remains focused on what's going on around him. The firefighter's water cannons can barely cope with the huge flames, which seek to destroy everything in their path. Another explosion occurs and a huge column of fire rises above the firefighters and the building begins to collapse. The firefighters notice that the roof of the building is starting to collapse and their comrades are still inside. Several firefighters run out of the burning building and pull a survivor out of the flames of the fire. Hosu has seen the future again. He puts his hand on Wang Ho's shoulder and tells him that there is one more person left in the burning building. The hero rushes inside the building to help his comrade, but Wang Ho only stares at him in silence. The fire envelops Hosu from all sides and its bright red flames are reflected in the glass of his helmet. Medical personnel treat the victim's burns and try to calm him down. A huge building collapses before Wang Ho's eyes, and he barely manages to jump aside. 
the injured firefighter in tears, screams that his comrade is still inside the burning building. A second squad officer approaches Wan Ho and asks where Ho Su is now, but Wan Ho says he doesn't know anything about it. Ho Su emerges from the rubble of the building, shrouded in black smoke, carrying the injured man on his shoulders. The firemen step in front of him so that he can get to the doctors without any problems. The hero is too tired. He falls uncreated into the arms of Wan Ho, who manages to catch his friend. The center director of the second fire department gives a report on the actions taken at the fire in the factory complex. Command reprimands the director and says that one of the firefighters violated orders and entered the building alone to save his comrade. Baek Du Jin listens carefully to the command and then points out two problems they are facing, one of which is the lack of staff. The command doesn't like what the center director says, which makes him angry, but he doesn't say anything in response. The officer expresses his admiration for the center director, amazed that Baek Du Jin was able to find the right words for the command. The center director heads out of the building, slowly going over the events of the factory fire in his head. The building is about to collapse, but Hosu quickly moves through a hallway littered with various debris. He carefully walks along the wall and passes a crack in the floor, which the hero was able to spot thanks to his gift. Inspecting the building, the young firefighter finds a passageway that was not in the plans for the building. From the other side of the door, he hears a call for help and without a shadow of a doubt starts kicking the door open. Hosu sees a man buried under the rubble of the building in front of him, but the man is conscious and begs for help. Enveloped in black smoke and in pain, the hero carries the victim out of the collapsed building. Hosu saw all this in a dream, experiencing this moment like a nightmare. He wakes up abruptly and sees the second team in front of him. The team was worried about Hosu, so they came to the hospital to check on him and bring him some fruit. The hero apologizes for his action to the squad and apologizes for making them worry about his life. As the second team leaves the room, Yeren walks in on Hosu and quite loudly starts reprimanding him for his thoughtless act at the fire. Yeren explains that the situation the hero is in is a serious one, as the head of the center has been summoned to report to headquarters. Aaron says that it's time for Hosu to learn to work as a team, as there may be situations that he can't handle alone. Hosu is discharged from the hospital and returns to his fire station. He salutes and greets his colleagues. He heads to the office of the center's director to apologize to him for the inconvenience. The hero is greatly worried and further afraid. He does not know how to choose the right words. He is distracted from his thoughts by the director of the center, who suddenly appears behind his back, scaring him. Bak Du Jin opens the door to Hosu's office and asks him to come in to discuss the incident. Cold sweat covers the hero's face. He's not mentally ready for this dialogue yet and hasn't picked the right words. The director rolls back his chair to sit in front of his desk. Bayek Du Jin tells the young firefighter about the report that the captains of all the fire centers are required to conduct a safety briefing because of the hero's actions. The center director isn't interested in Hosu's apology, but wants to know where the victim the hero saved was. Bayek Du Jin tells the young firefighter the reason for the squad's existence and explains to him that he should share his thoughts and assumptions with everyone. Ho Su offers to treat everyone to dinner as his apology, but a call goes out and the rescue workers are forced to go on a call. The emergency workers are actively discussing something and Ho Su heads over to find out what they're talking about. They ask him to make ramen, and the hero carefully writes down the recipe in his notebook. The hero fails to complete the task the rescuers gave him because of the fireman's alarm. The second team hastily gathers their belongings with their uniforms and goes to the call where an accident has occurred. A fire truck along with an ambulance rushes to the scene to arrive at the accident as quickly as possible. The squad commander gives some orders. The firefighters look for the necessary equipment and prepare a circular saw. Meanwhile, medical personnel rush to the car and check the victim's pulse to see if he is alive. One of the firefighters picks up the circular saw and moves toward the car to pull the man out. The medic talks to the man. He tries to calm him down and tells him that he will be rescued soon. The rescuer gives the order and the firefighter begins to cut the car door open. The medic notices that the man is bleeding intra-abdominally and tries to bring him to consciousness. Rescuers and firefighters quickly get the victim out of the car and place him on a stretcher. The ambulance rushes at full speed, the rescuers trying to get to the hospital as quickly as possible. A medical worker asks Hosu to help fix the victim's body while he treats his wounds. At the sound of the siren, all the cars on the road part, giving an open path for the ambulance. 
Hosu recalls his girlfriend Yaren's words that he needs to change and work as a team. The hero suggests that the rescuers take a detour around the park through the alley in order to arrive at the hospital on time. The driver agrees with Hosu's plan and takes a sharp left and turns off the main road. The ambulance speeds down the narrow road through the night park, which is lit only by the car's headlights. The driver uses all his skill to maneuver on this narrow road and takes the corners perfectly. The rescuers make it to the hospital in five minutes and place the victim in the hands of the doctors. The medical worker is very tired and he falls on a soft couch to take a break. The rescuers and Hosu thank each other for their work and pour themselves a cup of instant coffee. The hero is impressed by the work of the rescuers. He praises them for their hard work and suggests they go to the headquarters for dinner. The second team takes dinner and forgets to leave a few pieces for the rescuers and Hosu. The hero sees a different future where the rescuers didn't get there in time because the driver forgot about the possibility of passing through the park and shortening the road time with such a maneuver. Hosu, with a smile on his face, happily looks towards the ambulance driver. He realizes that working as a team is the right decision. The rescuers, along with the hero, reach the fire station, parking the car in the garage. The firefighters try to hide from the rescuers as quickly as possible and not get crushed because they did not leave the chicken for them. Only the captain of the fire brigade stands still, silently looking out the window and waiting for word from the rescuers. Hosu pulls out her cell phone and sends a text to Aaron thanking her for her words. Aaron meets Hosu in the hallway. They discuss the hero's meeting with his classmates that he has to go to today. He enters the cafe, where he is greeted by his friends from the academy, who have been waiting for his arrival at a large table. The friends cheerfully discuss the report for the fire units that happened due to Hosu's actions. The former third squad leader tells the guys that their classmate has decided to leave the fire department. Byungi, Hosu's friend from the academy, arrives on the scene, but the fire has already been extinguished. The squad leader enters the building. He hopes to find a survivor, so he scrutinizes every room. The fireman reports to the commander that there must be a person in the building. An old woman calls out for her son, who is supposed to be in the building, and walks toward the fireman. Byungi becomes unwell and walks towards the back of the building to recover. The grandmother sees the charred building and falls to her knees. Her neighbor and the fireman try to support her and ask her to keep her hands up. Byungi leans on the wall of the building. He feels even worse and vomits due to the accumulated stress. He tries to regain consciousness and looks under his feet. To his horror, the fireman discovers the burnt man his team was looking for. Hosu and Wang Ho leave the cafe. They walk through the night city and discuss the situation with Byungi. The comrades are very worried about their classmate and decide to go to his house to check on their old friend. They stand by his door and dare to make the first move, but Wang Ho comes a little closer and presses the bell button. Byungi slowly opens the door and tries to see who's coming to see him. You can tell by his appearance that he hasn't shaved or cleaned up in a while. He lets his friends in and together they discuss the situation that has befallen Byungi. Byungi is very happy that his friends have come to see him, but he asks them to postpone this conversation about work until later. Wang Ho and Ho Su are upset that they were unable to help their friend. They are walking down the street and see a man walking his dog in front of them. Wang Ho goes over to pet the dog without a second thought and asks the owner what his name is. The man turns around and Ho Su recognizes him as the captain of his fire department and greets him. They decide to stop by the playground and while Wang Ho strokes the dog, Ho Su and Captain Beck talk to each other while sitting on a bench. The hero thinks about his friend Byungi. He is distracted from the conversation and his gaze drifts downward. Captain Beck notices Hosu's bad mood and asks him what's bothering him. Hosu talks about the situation that happened to his comrade and asks Captain Beck if he's dealt with PTSD. The captain crosses his arms over his chest and stares off into the distance, talking about an incident that happened a few years ago. The fire department is slowly advancing in the burning building and using a flashlight to light its way. The captain of the squad reports the situation over the radio and then puts his hand on Cadet Beck Jong Tan and asks him to keep his head down. In the burning building, the firefighters listen carefully to the squad leader's briefing and head out to search for survivors. The cadet scrutinizes the rooms with a flashlight. He stops abruptly and tries to listen to the sound he heard. He quickly runs around the room and finds a crevice from where those strange sounds were coming from. Bak Jong Tang leaves the room and reports to the commander about the sounds of the child who is trapped under the rubble. The firefighters pull out a map with the layout of the building and devise a plan to rescue the trapped child. 
The firefighter pulls out an axe and heads to the wall to break it down and open a passageway. He makes several strikes with the fire axe on the wall and several rocks fly off to the side. The firefighters quickly rush through the passage and start searching for the victim. Bak Jungtan loops through the narrow corridors of the building. He doesn't understand where he is going and is confused by the layout of the building. He runs a few meters and sees a crying girl standing in the center of the room. Peck gets down on one knee in front of the girl and removes his helmet to comfort her. The child becomes frightened and runs as far away from the fireman as possible into the interior of the building. The firefighter tries to catch up with the child, but the girl is pretty quick to run through the hallways, making it impossible to catch her. Peck finds the child again and asks her not to run away. He slowly approaches the girl. The girl gets scared again and with crying eyes rushes away from him and runs straight into the abyss. The cadet jumps after her and catches the girl in flight, covering her with his body. They fly for several meters, Beck's body constantly hitting rocks and concrete beams, but he continues to hold the girl tightly in his arms. Beck Jotan doesn't show up for a long time, and the commander uses the walkie-talkie to contact him. From the sound of the walkie-talkie, Beck comes to his senses. He tries to slowly stand up and looks around the place. He finds a girl who is not hurt at all from the fall, and they try to get out of the building together. The firemen discuss the situation and decide to send a small squad to find the cadet and get him out of the burning building. The girl points Peck to the stairs, where he sees the light of several firefighters' flashlights that have come to his rescue. Along with the other firefighters, he makes his way outside and holds the girl in his arms. Beck looks at the girl and notices that her eyes are closed and she is not giving any signs of life. Tears roll into his eyes, and he tries to figure out when this happened and examines his gear. He notices the broken oxygen mask he had been holding the whole time and realizes that it was all a hallucination due to the carbon monoxide. The firefighters manage to get to Peck, who is on his knees shouting something upwards. They see the girl he is holding tightly in his arms. The hero thanks the captain for his help, and Beck, along with his dog, move on leaving Hosu and Wan Ho alone again. Captain Beck can't sleep. He goes to the bathroom to wash his face and goes over the memories in his head. Young Cadet Beck is lying on a stretcher with severe injuries. He covers his face with his hands. He can't stop crying and screaming about the girl going to the other world because of him. He washes his face once more and sees a little girl in the doorway who can't stop sobbing. Hosu can't sleep either. He washes his face with water several times and promises himself in front of the mirror to change. Byungi sits at the appointment with a therapist who checks his condition and gives him therapy. The second team discusses the previous day and finishes writing their work reports. Hosu, along with Captain Beck, go through a training session given to them by the center's director. The hero proves to be slower than the captain and starts doing push-ups, and the commanding officer watches him with misunderstanding. The officer finds Hosu in the locker room and offers him a coffee, but the hero refuses and starts checking his equipment. The fire alarm siren sounds throughout the building. Hosu, thanks to his gift, has foreseen it, and in full gear is waiting for the team in the fire truck. The firemen arrive at the scene and see puffs of black smoke billowing from the building. The firefighters quickly climb the stairs and get to the floor where the fire occurred. The commander scrutinizes the floor plan from the evacuation map and gives orders to the firefighters. Hosu heads to the fire area fairly quickly along with a fire hose. A newcomer enters the firefighter's headquarters. His name is Ku Jintai, and he too will be traveling with the squad to the fires. He puts his hand on Hosu's shoulder and asks him to give him a tour of the team headquarters. Sergeant Ku Jintai lights a cigarette and demands that Hosu provide him with an ashtray. The hero clenches his hands into a fist. He's annoyed by the rookie's behavior, but can't do anything about it. The sergeant and the officer leave the headquarters room to talk, and Ku Jintai offers a cigarette to the officer but he politely declines. The sergeant asks the officer for personal information and learns that Hosu is brand new here and the officer is about to be promoted. Ku Jintai approaches Hosu and asks him about the ashtray, twisting the hero's name in the process. Hosu replies to the sergeant rather sharply, causing him to hurry away towards the exit. The sergeant meets up with the rescuers who have returned from their mission and greets only one of them. He doesn't pay attention to the people below him. One of the rescuers moves towards the warehouse and notices Ku Jinte, who is on the phone and speaks unfavorably about the second team of firefighters. 
The commanders discuss the fire equipment inspection and want to issue the assignment to the sergeant, but he tries to leave the office without being seen. The sergeant pretends to have a stomach ache and asks if he has an assignment. The officer tells him that he should have gotten the address, but Hosu did it all by himself, so there's no work to do now. Ku Jintai approaches the hero's workplace. He puts his hand on Hosu's shoulder and asks him to discuss something in private. The sergeant lights a cigarette and explains to the hero that he purposely left to go to the restroom to do all the work for him. He finishes his cigarette and unceremoniously tosses the cigarette butt in Hosu's direction and walks away inside the building. The firefighters go on another mission and Hosu notices that even in a dangerous situation, Ku Jintai only tries to pretend to be busy. The sergeant sends to the shower rooms. He turns on the water for looks and writes a message on his phone. A notification of a call from the fire department unit chief appears on Ku Jintai's phone. He answers the call without delay. With a fake smile on his face, he tells that he really enjoys working in this fire department team. Hosu casts his gaze at the sergeant, annoyed that Ku Jintai is constantly slacking off. The fire alarm rings and the second squad puts on their gear pretty quickly and goes to put out the fire. Captain Beck reports to his command as his squad approaches the fire. He drives a fire truck and gives everyone separate assignments to be completed on the scene. The sergeant, along with the other firefighters, find themselves in front of the mountainside where the fire has broken out. Hosu runs to call for reinforcements while the others climb the mountain with the fire hoses. Ku Jintai reprimands the hero for being too slow and takes over the task of calling for reinforcements. The firefighters carefully climb the mountain and pull the fire hoses behind them. The team climbs the mountain and sees the fire in front of them, which is spreading rapidly from tree to tree. Hosu and the officer drag the fire hose to the hearth of the fire, and the squad leader decides to survey the area. The hero sees fragments of events that will happen in the future, so he tries to put his best foot forward. Captain Beck carefully examines the terrain. He tries to anticipate the behavior of the fire in strong winds. The reinforcements from the other squads that were heading towards the second team can't move on because of a road accident. Captain Beck listens carefully to the report of the road accident and ponders the next plan of action. He tells the squad about the backup situation and asks them to be careful with the forest fire. The sergeant is scared and asks the captain to stay by the car and wait for reinforcements, but Peck doesn't listen to him and gives orders to the squad. One by one, the firefighters, along with a variety of equipment, head up the mountain to stop the fire. Hosu and the officer water the fire with a water cannon. They aren't sure if they can handle the fire, but they see no other way out. Commander Beck, along with the sergeant, try to cut down as many trees as they can to make the fire spread slower. Kujintai is unhappy that he has to work in such a dangerous environment. He can't understand why others are willing to work full time for little pay. Heo Su senses something wrong, and thanks to his gift, he pushes the officer out of the way seconds before the fire breaks out. The two firefighters are illuminated by a bright flash of flames due to a strong gust of wind, but they are both unharmed and uninjured. Hosu asks the officer to get up and move on, but he has twisted his leg and won't be able to move on his own. Hosu helps the officer both stand up and holds his back with his hand. They slowly leave the dangerous place. Sarge and Captain Beck notice that the pine trees are slowly starting to burst into flames like matches, and they decide to retreat so they won't be surrounded by fire. The firefighters meet together, and Hosu proposes to make a counterfall to keep the fire from spreading. The sergeant opposes the hero's plan, saying that it's complete nonsense and not worth the time. The firemen rush on their own two men up the road leading up the mountain. They have taken some jerry cans with them to set a fire on top. They split into two men and spill gasoline from the canisters near the bottom of the mountain. Captain Peck, along with the rest of the firefighters, sets the gasoline on fire and prepares to set up a counterfire, but he doesn't fully believe in the success of this plan. The other groups of firefighters try to clear the road as quickly as possible so they can come to the aid of the second group in time. The squad commanders receive a report over the radio from the captain of the second group that his squad has let the counter pole in to prevent the fire. The police get to the scene of the accident and help the fire units bypass the highway and get to the mountain. In one of the fire trucks, Hyun Seong, who had one of the best scores on the physical test, is sent to help the first group. The second group scrutinizes the charred trees. They were able to competently set up a counter fire and defeated the fire. The other groups of firefighters break into groups and tackle the remaining pockets of fire. 
The second group squad reaches the rest of the firefighters. They report to the commander on their progress. The department director calls Captain Pack into his office to discuss his report regarding the mountain fire. The center director asks Captain Beck to be more responsible with his progress reports and allows him to leave. Sergeant Kujintai talks to one of the fire station commanders and is reprimanded by him for exceeding his authority. Yaren and Hosu bring hot drinks for their team and are surprised to hear a loud voice from the sergeant who is not happy about the situation. Ku Jintai voices his grievances against Captain Back in a raised tone, even though one of the officers tries to calm him down. He asks the captain to cut him out of the report immediately and make sure he's not at the scene of the mountain fire. Hosu is fed up with listening to the sergeant complain and puts his hand on his shoulder and demands that he stop his tantrum. The sergeant apologizes through gritted teeth and directs him to leave the control room, shoving Hosu in the shoulder. The captain puts his hand on Hosu's shoulder and asks him to calm down. He says that this sergeant is not worth wasting so much energy on him. The media shows on the news a fire that happened in a mountain forest. A correspondent who is on the scene after the firefighters have extinguished the fire shows the forest where the fire originated and recounts the exploits of the second firefighting team. Phone calls go off all at once on all the control room desks and firefighters eat in time to pick up the chops. The governor finds himself among those who called the fire department. He expresses his gratitude for the work done. The colonel, along with one of the firefighter's commanders, watches the news report on the fire extinguishing in the mountain forest. From the report, he learns who from the team participated in extinguishing the fire and smiles because he has a plan of revenge against the director of the center. A phone call rings in his office. The colonel quickly picks it up and listens to the governor. The colonel is covered in cold sweat and his eyes widen with surprise because the governor demands a certificate of honor for the firefighters of the second squad. Ku Jinte talks to someone on the phone and asks to be added to the firefighting roster. A huge number of people gather for the award ceremony and the announcer asks everyone to take their seats. The squad of firefighters take their seats and they discuss the award presentations and say that all of this is a credit to Ho Su. Ho Su, the officer and Captain Beck take the stage. They wait for the mayor to congratulate them for their work and present the awards. The medical officers are out on another call. They discuss a possible promotion and connections that can help them. They arrive at the scene of the call and see drunken teenagers in front of them demanding a ride home for their girlfriend. The medic listens intently to the young man and refuses to help because it is not within their job description. The teenager in the red t-shirt becomes furious at this response from the medic and plans to beat him up. He swings at one of the medical staff and says that he is from the Marines and insists on his position. The senior medical officer observes this situation closely and afterwards states in a calm voice that he too is from the Marines. The firefighters and medical personnel have a lively and fun discussion about the scuffle with the drunken teenagers. Young Jin, a senior medical officer, decides to get away from the commotion and stands outside the building. He drinks hot coffee and looks up at the night stars. Young Jin's friend comes down to support him. They discuss the service. He suggests he come to the core reunion. The senior medic says that he doesn't particularly like these meetings, which is why he doesn't go to core reunions. During the conversation, he receives messages from his old friend who offers him a good job in the office. Young Jin goes to meet the Marines at a restaurant where they discuss their service and current life. The senior medic leaves the restaurant and calls his friend to tell him that he turned down an offer to work in an office. Young Jin watches the snow slowly fall on his clothes and ponders his decision. He walks slowly through the narrow city blocks, leaving his footprints behind him in the newly fallen snow. Hosu works at his computer and occasionally glances at his certificate for fighting a fire in a mountain forest. He searches the internet for information about the firefighter who saved him when he was just a child. He stands near the road where the fire station should have stood, but the place turns out to be empty. The hero is upset that he could not find the fire station. He sits down on the curb and ponders his further actions. A classmate calls Hosu and congratulates him on his successful mission in the mountains. The hero asks his old friend to find a firefighter who worked a few years ago. The classmate taps on his keyboard pretty quickly, but he doesn't find any information about the old firehouse. Hosu arrives at the kindergarten. He sits down on a vacant bench and watches the children who are rolling down the slide. The events take us back to the hero's childhood when he constantly cried when falling down the slide. Hosu does not notice that his old teacher comes up to him and jumps up in fright. 
The teacher sits down next to him and they talk about past times. He asks his former teacher if she knows the name of the fireman who saved them from the fire at the orphanage. The teacher can't remember the fireman's name and gets upset when Hosu tells her that the fire station where that fireman worked no longer exists. He thanks his teacher for the life lessons she taught him, and the teacher laughs and asks Hosu to visit her more often. Sergeant Kujin Tai sits outside the fire station and smokes his fifth cigarette to calm his nerves. Hosu is on the phone with his classmate who found the information on the firefighter he was looking for. A sergeant approaches the hero's workplace, interrupting his conversation and asking him to clean up the cigarette butts he left in the headquarters courtyard. The senior medic heads over to Hosu and asks why the hero is cleaning up so early in the morning. The medic is angry about the situation and heads to the sergeant to voice his displeasure. He goes with the sergeant to a separate room to talk privately, but a siren sounds that interrupts their conversation. Several fire engines rush down the main highway to the scene of the fire. Huge columns of white smoke billow from the buildings. Firefighters arrive on the scene and assess the situation. Several firefighters run out of the magnesium plant and warn their comrades that a howl is about to erupt. The deafening explosion travels hundreds of miles and is accompanied by a bright flash of light that hits all the firefighters. The commander of one squad of firefighters reports the situation and asks the other firefighters to be extremely careful. The commander of the second squad gives orders to his subordinates and tells them to build a wall of sandbags. Several firefighters take the victims out of the building while other crews listen to the briefing. An injured man explains the situation in the factory to the firefighters and tells them how many workers are inside the building. Firefighters bring up a huge truck full of sand and dump it near the entrance of the factory. A piece of shrapnel flies out of the factory like a bullet and the firemen watch it closely to dodge it in time. The firemen pick up shovels and dig sand to create some sort of shelter from the blast. Captain Bayek orders Hosu and the sergeant to join the rescue team because there aren't enough people there. The rescue team captain shows his team the layout of the building and quickly brings the newcomers up to speed. The firefighters head inside the building and Hosu notices his old friend Wang Ho in another squad. They bump fists to greet each other. The firefighters continue to pull the seriously injured out of the factory, and a group of medical personnel give them first aid. There are so many people, and the medical workers can barely manage to get to the injured in time to treat them. Yun Xiong, the record holder of the Firefighters Academy, is watching Ho Su's work closely, admiring how fast the hero is doing his job. The sergeant asks the injured factory worker if there is anyone in the warehouse. He doesn't want to go there and risk his life. The sergeants from the Rapid Response Squad discuss Yun Xiong and Hosu's work. They admire how quickly these firefighters carry injured people out of the building. Hosu and Yun Xiong are inside the factory. They check the map of the factory and decide which way to go next. Wang Ho, in full firefighter outfit, stands outside the building and looks down frustrated because the quick response squad didn't take him with them. The young firefighter and Yoon Seung look around the factory and carefully look for casualties under the rubble of the building. Hosu abruptly opens one of the doors of the building and is engulfed by flames that burst out. A fireman runs to him to pull him away. The fireman puts his hand on the hero's shoulder to see if his comrade is okay, but he sees a crying face. Yoon Seung is shocked by what he sees, worried about the hero and doesn't understand why he's crying. Ho Su runs into the lava so his body feels the strain. A fireman from the rapid response squad runs after to stop the hero. Yoon Seung saves the hero and pushes him aside. He reprimands Ho Su for his thoughtless and crazy action. The sergeant reports over the radio that there are no casualties in the warehouse. He's glad he didn't have to go there. The young firefighter quickly jumps up from his seat and runs towards the warehouse. Yoon Seung is shocked but runs after the hero. They exit the building together and take off their fire helmets. Hosu asks the fireman to check room two. The firefighters radio Sergeant Kujintai and ask him to check room two again. The sergeant reports that there are no casualties in the warehouse. He's angry that the firefighters below him are giving him orders. Yoon Seung looks around and tries to find Hosu, but there's no one around him. Hosu tearfully rushes towards the warehouse to save the person inside that room. The rapid response squad digs in the sand and Yoon Seung goes to look for Hosu, who hasn't been seen in a while. He walks past the fire trucks and gazes into each fireman to find the hero. He notices the fireman pulling another injured person out on a stretcher and carrying him towards the ambulance. Yoon Seung approaches the firefighters and discovers that the injured man is a building worker who was found in a warehouse.
Out of the fog, someone's hand abruptly grabs Sergeant Kujinte by his clothes and drags him into the darkness. Hosu strikes the sergeant with all his might, and from the surprise, Ku Jintai only manages to cry out in pain. The medical staff scrutinizes the injuries the sergeant sustained after the fight with Hosu. They go to the base and discuss the situation that occurred during the scuffle between Hosu and the sergeant. Yeren is angry for the hero's action. She grabs him by his clothes and is about to hit him, but Hosu asks her to calm down. His girlfriend ignores her friend's request, and with all her might, she performs a punch on the hero and tells him off for his stupid act. Yeren and Ho Su continue to discuss the situation. Their dialogue is interrupted by a fireman from the second squad, who heads in their direction and carries some hot drinks. The girl becomes furious at what is happening and knocks both glasses to the floor while the hero tries to calm her down. Ku Jinte is standing on the balcony of the outpatient clinic. He is holding an IV and talking to the colonel about the fight that happened between him and the fireman. The colonel, with a smile on his face, promises the sergeant that a disciplinary committee meeting will be called and wishes him a speedy recovery. The colonels meet in the hallway and discuss the upcoming disciplinary committee meeting that is about to begin. Yaren is annoyed by Hosu's whining and she walks up to him and pulls his hair to get himself together and continue writing his report. The captain tells the hero what the report should look like and offers his help. The second squad of firefighters are sitting in the control room discussing the fire that occurred at the factory. The firefighters are worried about their friend, and the squad leader asks the hero to be careful at the committee meeting. The center director leans on the roof railing of the firehouse and contemplates the upcoming events while looking at the garbage cans. He notices a sergeant on the phone reporting to the colonel about the state of affairs in the fire brigade. The disciplinary committee meeting begins and everyone present takes their seats. The colonel announces the start of the committee meeting and introduces all those present at the meeting. The meeting is scrutinized by the reports and Professor Zhang Soyoung states that the case is very complicated. Ku Jin Tai writes a report that everyone in the department avoided him and treated him with great disdain. The commander and the chief medical officer discuss the sergeant's report. They are worried that the disciplinary committee might make the wrong decision. Yaren has just woken up. She has no time to clean up and heads to the main hall to start her shift. Another disciplinary committee meeting begins and Hosu is present, having been called to testify. The colonels meet in the small command office and discuss the branch of the Chocto Center where the incident occurred. The colonel suggests that the other should oppose the fire department because the second squad is violating all command orders. The colonel agrees to his friend's suggestion and at the committee meeting, he inundates Ho Su with uncomfortable questions. He shows the other members of the meeting some documents that mention several unauthorized actions of the hero that led to unpleasant consequences. A profusion of experience drips down Hosu's face. He is greatly worried and doesn't know what words are best to approach, although he had foreseen the matter with his gift. The captain stands up for the young firefighter. He explains to the audience why his actions were the right thing to do despite breaking the general rules. The colonel is infuriated by the captain's words. He thumps loudly on the table and says that the disciplinary committee is obliged to bring the hero to punishment. The professor listens attentively to the position of the colonel's and captain's stance and then concludes the committee meeting. Hosu approaches the captain after the meeting and thanks him for his help during the disciplinary committee. In parting, the captain tells Hosu that if he tries his best, he will reach the heights and raises a finger in the air. The story shifts to the captain's past, where as firefighters he disobeys the commander's orders and heads to the sound of children crying. This young firefighter reports to the group that he has found the children and calls for backup. The old captain rides home in his car, remembering his youth. This is the same fireman who once saved little Ho Su from a fire. The next meeting of the disciplinary committee begins, with Sergeant Ku Jin Tai as a witness and telling his version of events. The colonels are in the bathroom discussing their plan of action regarding the disciplinary committee meeting. The colonel throws a wet rag into the trash can and suggests they do the same with the second squad of the fire brigade. The professor reads the sergeant's report and declares it to be false, and also talks about another report where Ku Jin Tai himself asked to have his name removed from the list of those involved in fighting the mountain forest fire. The sergeant is lying in the hospital and calls the colonel asking for Hosu's report to verify its authenticity. With a smile on his face, the sergeant recounts the events in the forest that occurred while fighting the fire. He uses Hosu's report to make his words sound authentic. 
The committee finishes its work, and the participants believe that the sergeant is not guilty of the circumstances. The members of the meeting slowly stand up and discuss the situation, and the captain writes something down on his sheet. He says that there are a lot of inconsistencies in the sergeant's testimony, and the captain thinks that Ku Jin Tai lied in his report and tells all the members of the committee about it. The members of the disciplinary committee come to the factory where the fire happened and look around the place. They go to the security building and ask the workers to provide them with the CCTV footage. The worker shows the surveillance tape. It shows how the warehouse was closed during the fire and no one went in except Ho Su. The colonel can't believe his eyes and asks for data from other cameras that might have captured the events at the fire. Other cameras in the factory show the sergeant standing and doing nothing, hiding behind a container while a worker trapped in the warehouse asks for help. The workers rewind the footage further, where Ho Su is seen rescuing the injured man, but meanwhile the sergeant continues to hide further. The colonel suggests an investigative experiment to see if the sergeant could have heard the man's plea for help, who is trapped in the warehouse. He distinctly hears the sound of knocking coming from the warehouse building, his face turning red and contorted in an angry grimace of indignation. The colonel approaches the captain and holds out a lighter to him. He tells him of the cunning plan of the chairman of the committee. The chairman decides to visit the injured man Hosu saved during the factory fire. The man's arm shows several abrasions and bruises due to the fact that he was continuously banging on the door to escape. The chairman notices this and clenches his palms tightly into fists. He is filled with anger because his subordinate made such a mistake. The second squad is working in the office and discussing the disciplinary committee. They are very worried because the decision will be made today. Hosu is very worried but still smiling. He wants to get promoted and this is his new goal. The committee chairman pulls out the documents and reads the decision of the disciplinary committee to the people present. The center director watches the live stream through his monitor and listens attentively to the committee chairman's speech. The second squad of firefighters are jubilant that justice was on their side and none of them will be punished. Ku Jinte bursts into the colonel's office and voices his displeasure over the disciplinary committee's decision. The chairman bangs on his desk several times. He demonstrates to the sergeant the sounds of the injured man that Ku Jinte ignored. The sergeant yells at the chairman and says that he will tell everyone about the bribes and other public connections. The chairman listens to Ku Jintai's accusations and walks past him. Now he sees the sergeant's real face and wants nothing to do with him. The sergeant realizes that this is the end for him. He helplessly falls to his knees and begins to cry to his heart's content. Firefighters from other units learn of the committee's decision and discuss the situation that has unfolded around Ho Su and Ku Jintai. Captain Beck, along with the other firefighters, look at the message from headquarters saying that three people are being transferred to their squad. Young Jin is talking to his old friend. He doesn't want to talk to him, so he tries to end the conversation as quickly as possible. His friend tells him that there will also be an addition to their medical squad in the form of Choi Bo Ram, who studied with Young Jin. The medic thinks back and tries to remember his classmate, but in his mind he only imagines a middle-aged man. The door slowly opens and a newcomer appears in the room, loudly greeting the members of the fire department. The guys introduce themselves to the new member of the squad and tell him how things work here. A new paramedic enters the room and greets everyone. The newcomer is Choi Bo Ram, who used to study with Young Jin. The director of the center sits in his office and listens to the reports of the new sergeants who have recently transferred to his fire station. He scrutinizes the map that is in his office and develops new strategies based on the new team composition. Sergeant Choi sung Diak is excitedly discussing with the firefighters the situation with the forest fire on Mount Chakdo. He notices a patch on the hero's uniform with his name on it and quickly runs up to him to ask him a few questions about the job. The senior medic tells his classmate how his car is organized and shows her where the equipment is located. Choi Bo Ram is very upset that Young Jin doesn't remember how they went to school together and tries to reminisce with stories. Young Jin goes through his memories of his classmates, but he still can't remember Choi Bo Ram. The newly minted sergeant gets on his motorcycle and says goodbye to his new team until tomorrow. The paramedic girl also says goodbye to her new team and decides to take the bus home. Ho Su sees a concerned senior paramedic. He walks up to him and spells the girl's name, after which Young Jin remembers his classmate. There are a lot more people at the center, and with it all comes a huge amount of work. The medics discuss yesterday's situation and Choi Bo is happy that her classmate finally recognizes her.
As the day ends, the team discusses going to a restaurant to celebrate the newcomers to the team. Choi Boram looks at Youngjin and asks her to keep her eyes on the commander. The commander is excited about the newcomers and tells Choi Bo Ram how the work in the department usually goes. The firefighters and the newcomer are tidying up the truck and firefighting equipment, and the sergeant notices the conversation in the office and tries to listen. The commander of the rapid response squad gets a call from the colonel. He talks about the newcomers soon to be transferred to their squad. Major Pak listens carefully to the colonel's words and searches for suitable candidates using the database on the computer. The colonel holds a sheet with lists of candidates that he has personally compiled. He asks to consider them without discussion. On one of the sheets is a picture of Ho Su with his detailed data and a recommendation for enlistment of the rapid response squad from the colonel. The new firefighters ride out on a call, driven by the squad's new sergeant, Choi Sung Deok, who questions his team about preventative calls. An elderly man runs toward the firefighters and asks for their help. He apologizes to the squad for starting the fire and asks them to put it out as quickly as possible. Hosu Lightning fast grabs a hose and rushes towards the fire. The sergeant looks at him with great surprise. He didn't expect him to be so fast. The hero quickly presses the trigger lever and opens fire from the fire hose on the hearth of the fire. Firefighters without unnecessary words synchronously perform their work and pour the fire from water cannons. The sergeant stands like a stumbling block and only watches the coordinated work of his team. The sergeant smiles broadly as he is happy to be working with such professionals. The squad returns to the base and changes into their normal uniforms, and they hear praise from the commander, who is pleased with their work. The paramedic squad arrives. Choi Bo Ram gives first aid to the victim, and the other members of the squad discuss her work. The girl gently examines the patient and tries to find out the cause of the elderly woman's ailment with the help of a question. The senior medic is very worried. He turns his head every now and then to make sure that the girl is doing her job correctly. He sees that the situation is under control and decides to take off his mask. Young Jin is glad that they have reinforcements, and he won't have to carry as much responsibility on his shoulders as before. The ambulance squad returns late at night after a call where a squad of firefighters is already waiting for them. After the call, the ambulance is in chaos, and Young Jin asks the new sergeant to help him clean it up. The firefighters and medical staff decide to celebrate the arrival of the newcomers at the base. They sit down at a makeshift table and eat pizza. The commander looks out the window and notices the rain starting to fall. He chews his food and asks the firemen to take the hoses indoors. A downpour is drumming outside the window, the commander says he has a very bad feeling about it and asks everyone to stay alert. The story shifts its gaze to a man standing in the downpour barefoot and holding his white sneakers in his right hand. The rain continues to pour down like a bucket. No one else is standing at this spot, just the white sneakers lying in the damp ground. An alert sounds over the radio and a team of firemen put on special raincoats and go to the call. The ambulance, along with the firefighter's vehicle, pulls into the reservoir. The senior medic calls the dispatch office. He gets the details of the missing person and learns more about the situation. The fire department officer calls the police station and writes down the missing person's description. The team takes bright flashlights with them and scrutinizes the place in search of the missing person. Youngjin divides the squad into several parts and asks them to scrutinize the shore of the reservoir. The newly promoted sergeant pulls his hood up as tightly as he can but the downpour still makes it very difficult to see anything. The officer asks Ho Su to focus on finding the injured man and get his thoughts in order. The hero looks at his hand. He ponders the officer's words and tries to get rid of the chaos in his head. While searching, the girl slips on the wet grass and falls to the ground, and her flashlight flies out of her hand and rolls down to the shore. She reaches down to retrieve the flashlight and sees in front of her the white sneakers that the missing man left behind. Bo Ram beckons her friends to examine her find more closely, and they quickly make their way down the hill to meet her. Captain Beck is filling out a report. Suddenly, he hears his squad's voice from the radio, a second squad of firefighters reporting that they have found the missing man's shoes. The police arrive on the scene, and together with the firefighters, they discuss the situation. The police officer asks the firemen to stay and help them with the search for the missing person because they are short of men. The water level in the reservoir is gradually rising due to a heavy downpour, but the team has not been able to find any new footprints yet. 
Hosu uses his gift and tries to look further into the future to find the missing man. A call on the radio interrupts the paramedics' patrol, and they are asked to go to the highway where the accident occurred. Hosu circles every inch of the reservoir and manages to find the missing man using a bright flashlight and his gift. He runs to the man and gives it from the water. The hero listens to the man and realizes that the man is not breathing. The hero radio Young Jin and asks for help. The medic says his team is on call and they can't help him. Hosu gives the man indirect heart massage until the ambulance arrives. He tries to press gently on the man's chest so as not to break his ribs. After a few movements, he manages to get the man breathing again. The man regains consciousness. He grabs the young fireman by his clothes and tearfully asks him loudly why the fireman saved him. He calls Hosu a freak. From confusion, the hero does not say a single word. His eyes only widen with surprise. Over the radio, the young firefighter reports to his friends that he has found the missing man, and they head in his direction. The medic contacts another fire engine driven by his friend. He asks him to arrive at the reservoir as soon as possible. The young firefighter performs artificial heart massage. His head is visited by thoughts of whether it is worth saving this man, because in the future that Hosu saw, the man does not want it. The hero dismisses these thoughts. He takes the radio in his hand and reports to all units that the man has been saved. The man lies in the downpour, unable to move. He curses Hosu for saving his life. The medical staff reaches the hero. They put the injured man on a stretcher and prepare him for transportation. The hero listens intently to the conversation between the police officer and the victim's family about what happened. The police officers are talking among themselves, helping the medics to put the victim in the ambulance. They are annoyed by the fact that the relatives do not want to come to the hospital. The fire squad finishes their work and returns to headquarters with a report of what happened. The team despairs to the commander and captain about the incident, before changing their uniforms and going to rest. Hosu walks into Young Jin's office and asks for advice on the situation that happened at the reservoir. The paramedics listen attentively to the hero's problem, and Young Jin says that reality shouldn't always be happy, and Hosu will have to take it for granted. The paramedic holds out coffee for the hero to warm up and distract him from his bad thoughts. His friends share their thoughts on the problem, and Young Jin decides to tell the story of his challenge, where the place of the challenge was. The story shifts to the events of a few years ago, when Young Jin stays at the scene and is about to talk to the complainant. He approaches the grandmother who called the rescuers, but she only grabs the will to throw it in the trash can before the police arrive. Young Jin's mind still flashes the silhouette of this grandmother. He's not sure of the right thing to do until the end and shares this with Ho Su. Bo Ram also shares a story and talks about his challenge, which also involved the death of a man. His friend's stories touch Hosu's heart, and he starts crying because of their tragic ending. Sergeant Youngjin explains to the hero that their job is to save people, and they have to fulfill it because they will have many challenges ahead of them. He suggests that everyone take a little walk around the building grounds and not think about bad things. The medic goes outside to smoke a cigarette, but his lighter stops working and then the cigarette breaks. The fire station is quite lively, with commanders assigning duties to their subordinates for the day. An officer introduces a new member of the team to Hosu and asks him to follow him around and show him how everything works. The second squad commander also welcomes the newcomer and the squad discusses today's work plan together. Hosu strikes up a conversation with his paramedic friends and asks them about the third squad of firefighters. The commander joins their dialogue and tells Hosu that there have never been any incidents in squad three, so they are not memorable. In the locker room, the guys discuss the volunteer firefighter squad. The hero wants very badly to meet the members of this team. Young Jin warns Hosu that the deputy commander is a very strange uncle, and it is better not to cross paths with him. Assistant Commander Kwak Do Young sends firefighters to the second floor of the building to meet his commander. The officer asks the newcomer to bring three mugs of coffee for the commanding officer who has gathered upstairs. He also tells him about the volunteer fire department and explains their basic duties. Lee Jae walks up with a tray of hot drinks to the second floor and knocks on the office of the center director. He walks inside and sees before him the commander of the volunteer fire brigade, along with his deputy, discussing a number of issues with the director. The deputy reprimands Lee Jae for the poorly made coffee and demands that it be made again. Commander Lee Hyun Daeok takes a few sips from the cup and asks his deputy to calm down. 
The center director gets up from his seat and suggests that everyone try vitamin drinks instead of coffee and puts them on the table. He thanks Lise for the coffee and asks him to leave the premises, whereupon the director returns to his seat. The officer goes outside with Lise. He drinks the coffee and asks the rookie just once not to worry about it. After the night shift, Ho Su returns to the fire department building. He wants to meet the people from the volunteer fire department in person. He goes up to the second floor and meets the volunteers near the office of the center's director. The hero happily greets the captain. They exchange a few words and Ho Su is about to head home. Kwak Du purposely coughs to draw attention to himself. He was hurt that the hero didn't greet him. The second team has a dialogue about the third squad. They discuss Ho Su's acquaintance with the commander and the ambiguous personality of his assistant Kwak Du. The commander tells his team that the volunteer squad only has volunteer duties, so everyone in the squad has a different profession. The firefighter's room is pierced by a loud siren. The center requests support and asks for an ambulance to go to the call. Young Jin is unhappy that he doesn't get a chance to rest and muttering to himself along with his team heads to the vehicle. Sung Doc is working in the kitchen, making a seafood lunch he hopes to serve to the entire squad. He carefully carries the pot down the stairs and notices the paramedics who are on a call. The sergeant sighs heavily and goes with the food to the rest of the team. The team quickly selects people for their squad. They discuss possible candidates together. The squad commander is told about the candidacy of a young firefighter, Ho Su, who was recommended from above, but he says he gave his refusal a long time ago. The captain and commander look at the announcement about the expansion of the rapid response squad. They tell the team that a special rapid response squad will soon be formed. The commander scrutinizes the announcement and suggests Ho Su to apply for the rapid response squad. The hero has worked the day shift and returns home. He sees a huge number of volunteer squad members gathered in the building today. He walks out the door of the building and greets Lee J, who is cleaning the front porch. Ho Su asks Lee J to come to him with any questions or help if any arise, and then bids him farewell and heads home. Lee J helps with the cleaning of the fire trucks. He climbs inside one of them and gives the interior a wet cleaning. The head of the volunteer firefighter squad is holding another meeting of his squad. Kwak Du approaches the chief at the end of the meeting and asks for attention to the opening of a store near the market. The captain listens attentively to his deputy's request, but refuses to highlight the issue at the meeting. With anger in his eyes, Kwak Du looks at the back of the captain leaving the hall and considers a plan of further action. He approaches one of the officers of the fire station and asks for a permit to build a store. The officer denies his request and tells him that a special permit is needed to access the document. Lee J stops by the door and hears a heated argument between the deputy captain and the fire station officer. The next day, Li Zhe recounts in great detail the argument between the deputy and the fire station officer. The hero listens carefully to the rookie's report and puts his hand on his shoulder. He asks him not to worry about it and thanks him for his help. Sung Deok walks into the control room with a large pot of noodles and suggests that the squad take a lunch break. Young Jin holds out her friend's chopsticks and they take in the food together. The captain, along with the crew, notices the medic's act and banter about young Jin being overprotective. They each put noodles in their bowls and eat, while the crew listens intently to Bo Ram's story about how she met young Jin. Bo Ram talks about neither meeting a senior medic, and the whole squad instantly goes quiet with surprise. The girl admits that it was a joke and laughs, diffusing the tension in the room. She turns toward young Jin to see his reaction and sees him tense up a bit and blush. Together, the squad washes the dishes, they clean the table after the meal, and they talk amongst themselves about distracting topics. A fire siren crackles and the paramedic squad goes out on a call again. In the ambulance, Young Jin addresses Bo Ram and asks if her words were actually a joke. The rescue team's call has been canceled, and the ambulance turns around to head back to base. Ho Su calls Wang Ho and they arrange to meet to discuss the latest news. Their conversation is interrupted by a message that arrived on the hero's phone, and he opens it. Hosu reads the message carefully and realizes that the meeting with his friend will have to be postponed. In a hurry, the firefighters put on their uniforms and listen to their captain's orders. They use civilian vehicles to get to the scene of the fire faster. The firefighters arrive at the fire scene and see a huge fire in a shopping center under construction. Hosu hears a report from one of the firefighters. He says that several workers are left in the underground parking lot and they can't get out because of the smoke. 
The squad commander orders to throw all the equipment to eliminate the smoke to save people. The officer sees Ho Su's worried look and asks him to calm down because it's a routine call. The hero is very concerned about what's happening. He sees a future where the rapid response squad couldn't get out of the smoke-filled parking lot. The rapid response squad moves to the scene of the fire. They discuss the situation, and Yoon Seung notices that his suit is torn. Firefighters covered in soot are resting outside. A firefighter is pouring water on himself because of the heat from the fire. They are waiting for reinforcements to arrive soon. People are lining up for food and water. The fire has severely exhausted all the squads. Yaren, breathing heavily, leans on a fire truck and tries to catch his breath. Wan Ho holds out a bottle of water to his friend and offers her a snack, but she flatly refuses and fears she will vomit. Wan Ho looks around and sees a large number of firemen who can barely stand on their feet, and he goes to get water for them. He approaches one of the members of the volunteer fire brigade and hears a loud conversation between the deputy and the captain of the brigade. Kwak Du reprimands his commanding officer for his short-sighted actions and blames the construction workers for causing the fire. He turns toward the fire and hopes that a fire of this magnitude will definitely stop the construction of the store. The captain briefs the emergency team and shows a plan of the building. This group includes members of the first squad, and they listen intently to the briefing and ask questions related to the fire. The captain warns that there is a lot of smoke on the lower floors and asks the firefighters to be extremely careful. Hosu comes out of the tent and sees his friend Young Jin. He notes that the firefighters' clothes look very unfamiliar on the medic. Their conversation is interrupted by a weary-looking squad of firefighters who pass a few meters away from them and slowly move towards the tent camp. The second team puts on their fire helmets and prepares to head inside the building. Hosu turns his head to the right and sees the rapid response squad rushing into the basement. The rapid response squad gathers together and mulls over a plan to infiltrate the building. The squad commander gives the order to go to the parking lot and pull the three workers out of there. The firefighters break into groups of two and use a water cannon to try to put out the fire. Hosu looks around and notices the vent, which is sucking in a huge amount of black smoke. A volunteer from the fire department thanks the deputy for being able to warn of the fire threat in time. Quackdu watches the firefighters carefully and pulls a cigarette out of the pack with his teeth. He ponders the situation and hopes that thanks to the fire, the construction site will not continue. The special response squad is standing near the entrance to the basement, using a pump to pump smoke out of the parking lot. They slowly make their way through the black shroud of smoke with only the flashlights on their shoulders barely lighting their way. The firefighters hold on to each other's backs so they don't get lost. They head toward the sounds of help coming from deep down the hallway. Using sign language, the squad leader indicates that the sounds are coming from the right side and asks them to move in that direction. The fog completely obscures the squad's view and they regroup to the sounds. In the semi-darkness of the room, they find an iron door by feel and try to open it. The bright light blinds the firefighters, and they try to shield themselves from it with their hand. They see the workers in front of them, who have managed to hide in a small room from the smoke. The squad gives the workers oxygen tanks so they won't suffocate from the carbon monoxide. The captain takes a close look around the room and sees smoke that is strangely drifting down the wall of the building. He picks it up with his hands and realizes that it is combustible smoke. A huge explosion occurs near the entrance to the parking lot and huge streams of fire burst to the surface like a fountain. The fire on the rack can be seen hundreds of miles away, illuminating everything around it. People from the houses go to the window to look at it. The firefighters don't understand what is happening, and the squad leaders ask all squads to gather for an emergency briefing. The firefighters discuss the cause of the explosion in the tent, but are unable to determine its source. The captain of a special squad is panicked because his squad is trapped in the basement, and he asks for a report on the situation on the underground floors. Quack Du is mesmerized by the fire that has once again engulfed the construction site and rejoices at the incident. The commanders discuss the rescue plan of the rapid response squad. The fire chief enters the tent and asks the commanders not to stop the briefing. The center director suggests using the still-collapsed main entrance to rescue the squad. The chief fully trusts the center director to lead the operation based on his past performance. The firefighters bring water cannons to the main entrance and open fire on the fire. They use the water to clear the path of fire and smoke so that another group can pass through. 
The director of the center recruits Ho Su, Yeren, and Wang Ho into one squad, and they go to help the rapid response team. The squad goes downstairs. They pull the fire hoses behind them and find themselves in front of a wall of fire. The squad leader has no time to give an order before his team starts to follow it. They pull up the hoses and start putting out the fire. Ho Su grabs Aaron by the sleeve of her clothes. He asks her to be extra careful when the doors open. The squad leader grabs the handles of the door and slowly pulls it towards him. He asks his team to be on guard. From the open door, a wind rushes towards the squad along with flames that soon engulfs the captain entirely. Hosu manages to save the captain from the fire. He looks carefully at the fire and analyzes the situation. At the hero's command, Yeren opens the valve of the fire hose and directs a huge stream of water towards the fire. The water and fire collide in a fierce confrontation, trying to consume each other. Hosu grabs the hose and joins the team to hold back the fire, while the commander silently watches the scene and can't move. The hero turns his head toward Brigadier Sang Hyun and asks him to give the squad the next order. The commander gathers his strength and rises to his feet. He orders the squad to make their way inside as quickly as possible. The captain of the fire squad runs towards the fire chief and reports that the squad has successfully made its way inside the building. He asks the chief why he entrusted the center director to manage this operation. The commander replies with a smile on his face that only someone who believes in his men can give clear instructions. The special team continues to sneak inside the building. Wan Ho hears the crackle of his walkie-talkie. The director of the center contacts the squad and demands a report on the situation in the parking lot. He listens to the report of his subordinates, who say that they have reached the first checkpoint and continue their movement. The other firefighters of the squad prepare an escape route for the special squad and bring special cables to the exit. Wan Ho manages to locate the rope that the rescue squad left behind. The squad grabs the rope, they follow it and make their way through the scarlet flames. The team commander follows the rope. He leads the squad and wonders if the men of the rapid response squad are still alive. The brigadier's head is occupied by a myriad of thoughts that distract him, causing him to stumble and fall to the ground. The rapid response team is lying on the ground. They have built a defense from improvised materials that protects them from the fire. The team remains conscious, but they are badly exhausted, and it is only a matter of time before the room is consumed by fire. The captain of the special team discovers the end of the rope and realizes that they will have to go on by feel. Hosu looks around and finds the other end of the rope, and the team continues to follow the trail of the special response team. The hero opens fire with a water cannon and creates a small passage for his squad. The floor of the building gradually crumbles due to the fire, and the squad captain keeps a close eye on it to make sure a piece of rock doesn't fall over his team's heads. The oxygen breathing mask does not help the worker and firefighters add oxygen to his tank to make it easier for him to breathe. The firefighters give first aid to the worker and try to keep their cool. They realize that there is very little oxygen left, and they need to use it wisely. The rapid response squad commander looks over his team and the injured, he is going to sacrifice his oxygen tank if the workers don't get better. The squad sergeant also decides to sacrifice his tank to buy as much time as possible for the rescue squad. The commander drops the oxygen mask along with the tank and piles all his weight on the doors to keep them from opening. The rescue squad, led by Ho Su, opens the doors to the room and helps the emergency response team and workers get out. The center director and fire chief listen to the hero's report. He says he discovered the rapid response squad. The firefighters distribute oxygen tanks between themselves and the construction workers and are about to leave the room. The commander of the rescue squad calls Hosu and Yeren over to him. He orders them to head back to the base and get more oxygen tanks. Hosu points to his oxygen tank meter. He says that the captain shouldn't worry because his oxygen is enough for everyone. Kwak Du sits on a small chair with his arms folded across his chest. He keeps a close eye on the firefighters and the events taking place. The firefighters secure a rescue rig near a small opening and wait for the rescue squad. The captain picks up a blue horn and notifies the squads to stop. He gives a few orders and asks everyone to stay in their seats. The firefighters stop and look up at the sky. They are mesmerized by the raindrops that are falling on their helmets. The firefighters throw down lifelines and work together to pull people out of the lower levels of the building. A deputy from the volunteer squad slowly climbs up the stairs of the building. He heads towards the fire and contemplates his action. The captain from the rapid response squad falls to his knees. 
He tries to catch his breath and draws as much air as he can into his lungs. The firefighters move toward him to help, and the captain looks up into the sky and rejoices in the rain that covers him from head to toe. The firefighters pull out all the members of the rapid response squad, and they approach each other to discuss what happened. The captain, with a smile on his face, thanks his team for their work and for standing strong during the mission. He looks towards Ho Su and assesses his abilities. The captain wants to invite the hero to join the rapid response squad. The captain quickly walks over to Ho Su. He extends his hand and helps him up from his knees. The rapid response team thanks the young firefighter for his help. They say they are now in his debt. Wang Ho and Yaren give Ho Su a big hug and the guys rejoice at the successful completion of their assignment. The fire chief thanks the center director for his service, and with a smile on his face, he leaves the briefing tent. Kwok Du snatches a box of bottles from his commanding officer and heads over to the firefighters to hand out water. The deputy looks toward the construction site and admits that he really wanted the whole thing to burn to the ground. He tells a story about his daughter who he can't find and decides it's best to let the situation go. The deputy and the commander have a long conversation with each other, and Kwok Du offers to have a drink together after it's over. The commander relays to the entire squad the end of the firefighting operation, and all the firefighters cheer and head off to rest. The firefighters head towards their vehicles, and Bo Ram approaches Young Jin and asks her to take her home. The captain and his crew take a small seat under the tent. They offer Ho Su and his friends an exam for the rescue squad in three months. The boys stand in the rain with surprised faces and listen carefully to the information about the exam. The squad officer warns them that the exam will be difficult and asks them to do their best. The captain comes close to Ho Su and puts his hand on his shoulder, hoping that the hero will definitely come to the exam. The rapid response squad packs up and heads to their fire truck. Ho Su and Wang Ho are jumping up and down with happiness that they got this opportunity, and Yerin watches their reactions. The guys discuss the physical text and Yaren heads off to work. She's not sure she wants to be involved. Ho Su introduces himself as one of the members of the special fire department. He stands in a neat dress uniform and salutes. The second team finishes with their work. The firefighters head towards the hero to congratulate him on getting the opportunity to become a member of the special fire team. Ho Su looks towards the second team with a sad expression. He realizes that if he becomes a member of the special fire team, he will have to say goodbye to the people at the Chakto Center. The hero sits down at his desk and tells the second team about how his team conducted the operation to rescue the special squad. The second team is in civilian clothes having a few hot drinks. They discuss the fire at the construction site amongst themselves. Hosu doesn't listen to what his team is talking about. He is very worried and tries to find the words to inform that he wants to take the test for the special fire brigade. The hero squeezes out the words that he has been offered a special test, and the whole team cheers and supports the young firefighter in this endeavor. The squad leader and sergeant ask Captain Beck to help with the hero's training, but the captain refuses the request. Hosu gets tears in his eyes as he thanks his squad for their support, and hugs his comrades tightly around the shoulders. A squad of paramedics arrive at the headquarters to drop off their belongings. They stare in amazement at the firefighting team, and don't understand what is happening. The media warns the population of a coronavirus infection and asks everyone to use caution. A senior medic shows the team a new anti-epidemic suit and tells them to wear it when visiting patients with high fever. The fire department discusses the coronavirus infection amongst themselves. The officer tells them that they can evacuate an entire building if infected. Bo Ram asks Young Jin to buy some masks for the fire department. The medic is prepared for this and says that he bought several hundred masks in advance. The squad leader checks the mail, and he reads everyone the official message about the virus and group epidemic safety measures. An alarm siren sounds in the building, and the paramedic squad puts on their uniforms and prepares to go to the scene. The second fire squad peeks out of the door with great interest to see the paramedics' new suits and wishes them a speedy return. The order comes to mobilize the emergency services, and a huge line of ambulances rushes to the center building for special instructions. A paramedic shows his friend a picture of his son on his phone and tells funny stories about his child. A man in a special protective suit approaches the ambulances and asks everyone to gather for a briefing. The head of control uses a large mouthpiece and gives a briefing to all units of the medical service. The paramedics listen carefully to the lieutenant colonel's briefing and raise their hands to ask some questions. 
Young Jin sits in the same car with Young Jun and discusses the situation with the infected. They are about to go to the store and buy the necessary items. Young Jun absentmindedly looks towards his comrade. He is worried about getting infected and is worried about his family. The senior medic tells Young Jun not to worry about the situation and gets out of the car. The paramedics approach the tent camp. They chat with their colleague and listen to instructions on how to deal with infected people. The paramedics put on their white protective suits and head out on their first call. They arrive at the first house and ask the girl to proceed to the ambulance, but she yells at them and demands they leave her alone. Young Jin asks the girl to give him the keys to her mom's house, and he opens the gate and heads towards the door. Young Jun jumps out of the car and rushes towards his friend to stop him from doing something rash. The senior medic enters the house. The woman yells at him and demands him to leave the house as quickly as possible. Young Jin stands in the doorway and asks her to calm down. He tells her that the woman needs to get treatment. The medical officer manages to talk the woman down, and together they leave the building and head to the ambulance. The paramedics help the woman into the vehicle. They get in the front and head towards the center. A doctor approaches the ambulance with a small notebook and asks the paramedics for some details about the patient. The paramedics park their car near the tent camp and do a complete disinfection inside the cabin. The senior medic admits to his friend that he's a bit exhausted and scared about the situation around the virus, and young June tries to cheer him up. The paramedics lie on the bed and try to catch their breath. They have rented a motel room for themselves to rest and spend the night. The marshal and high-ranking people from the fire department hold a press conference to report on the job. The reporters carefully record the marshal's speech and ask clarifying questions. They take a few pictures for the newspapers and TV programs. The paramedics take a short break. They set up near the cafeteria and drink hot coffee. Young Jin's classmate approaches the paramedics and gives them a list of patients they have to transport. The director of the center invites Hosu into his office, and they discuss the rapid response squad exam. The rapid response squad prepares a test for the candidates. The squad captain gives orders regarding the exam. The captain reminds the squad that the unit will soon leave for the new building, and asks the team to prepare the equipment for the move. Hosu and Wang Ho go to the park stadium to prepare for the special squad exam. They take a few laps around the park, and Wang Ho asks the hero to stop for a little break. During their run, the guys meet Brigadier Sang Ho, who is also studying for the exam. They head to a vending machine and buy themselves a few cans of soda. Together with the foreman, they discuss the upcoming exam. The firefighters approach Yeren's workplace and offer to take part in the special response squad test, but she declines and asks not to be disturbed. Yeren mulls over the invitation and does agree to take the exam, thanks to her squad leader, but asks not to spread the word. She confesses that she pondered her participation because of her mom, who worries a lot about her. Wan Ho calls Ho Su on her cell phone and suggests they meet at a cafe together with Aaron. Wan Ho is very worried with drops of sweat running down his face, worried that he won't be able to pass the exam. The friends sit down at the same table and drink cold drinks. They discuss amongst themselves about working at the fire station. They also discuss Ho Su's ability to see the future. Wang Ho suggests his friend use his natural adrenaline to further see the future. Wan Ho offers to give Ho Su a training session to teach him how to use the gift of seeing the future. He throws a small object at the hero, which flies at high speed at Ho Su. The hero tries to worry as much as possible to see the future and catch the object in time. But the stone hits Ho Su right in the eye. Young Jin returns to the fire station. He scrutinizes the headquarters building and notices two ropes hanging from the roof of the building. He heads inside the building and asks the firemen why the fire hoses are hanging down into the roofs of the building. Yeren is in training. She climbs up the fire hose to train her hands for the special squad exam. The girl bandages her hands so she doesn't get weeded out and heads inside the fire department building. The squad hears the sound of Hosu's footsteps approaching and turn around to greet their friend. They greet the young firefighter and ask about his black eye, which paints a blue mark on Hosu's left eye. Aaron sits Hosu down in a chair and asks Lee J to bring some ointment from the ER to get rid of the bruise. She scrutinizes Hosu's face and asks him to tell her how he got that bruise. Hosu suddenly jumps up on the spot in pain and falls from his chair to the floor. Aaron reaches out her hand towards the hero. She asks if he's in one piece and tries to pick him up. The girl is distracted by Lee J who brought the ointment and lets go of Hosu's hand, causing the hero to fall to the floor again. 
She thanks Lee Jay for his help and takes out the ointment to treat Ho Su's eye. Aaron gently treats the hero's eye and asks him not to move, while Lee Jay says that they're perfect for each other and there's silence after his words. The unified control room detects a fire in a commercial building and calls the Chakdo Security Center to deal with the threat. A fire truck rides to the call, the driver through the loudspeaker asking to clear the way for the fire department. Ho Su closes his eyes to focus on his thoughts. He tries to see the future in great detail. Major Yu So Bin contacts all the firefighter units and takes command. An obstacle arises in front of the fire truck of the Chakdo unit from cars that are illegally parked in the center of the road. The major loses his temper and hits the door of the fire truck with all his might. Ho Su alone reaches the shopping center, which is engulfed in flames, and inspects the scene. Passersby look at the young firefighter in amazement. They don't understand why he is here alone. Ho Su uses his gift to the maximum and uses the walkie-talkie to tell the path of travel for each fire truck. The fire brigade commanders follow the hero's instructions, and the fire trucks head towards the fire. Ho Su runs into the burning mall building alone and quickly climbs the stairs. He finds the fire extinguishing system and opens it. The hero takes out a fire hose from there to start extinguishing the fire. The young firefighter begins to shake from sheer excitement and finds it hard to hold the hose in his hands. He manages his panic and runs up the stairs with the fire hose. The hero untwists the fire hose and throws the end of it through the window with all his might. Shards of glass fall down, and passersby scatter to the sides and try to stay more away from the burning building. Hosu moves through the hallways with lightning speed and notices the burning wreckage of the building through the open door. He abruptly turns around and opens fire with a water cannon on the flames. The firefighters reach the turn leading to the burning mall, but a civilian car blocks the way for the fire trucks. The major grabs his head with his hand and carefully considers the situation. He tries to come up with a plan for further action. Yusiobin looks around the place and sees smoke coming from around the corner, which is coming from the site of the fire. The second team discusses with the major about the young firefighter's actions. They ask that Hosu not be punished for his actions. The firefighters are about to ram an illegally parked car in order to pass on. Hosu slowly makes his way through the smoky corridors of the building. He is very tired but still continues to drag the fire hose behind him. The hero picks up the radio and reports to the major about the situation in the building and asks for reinforcements to save people. The fire is slowly rising on the outer wall of the fourth floor of the building and will soon spread to the neighboring buildings. The major listens carefully to the young firefighter's report and asks him why he lured the firefighting squads into a trap. Hosu tells the major that in case of an emergency exit, they can forcibly punch a car and clear the passage. The officer holds on tightly to the handrail at the car door, and the fire truck flies toward the civilian traffic. The fire truck slams into the civilian vehicle at full speed and blows it off the road, opening the way for other fire trucks. A huge number of people are standing on the roof of the burning shopping center screaming for help. A man swings over the guardrails. He wants to go down, but is stopped by a female senior and not to risk his life. The man jumps down, but several people manage to catch his arms and slowly drag him back up. He comes to his senses and looks around, his eyes fill with tears, and the man pleads with the people not to let go of his hand. There is a deafening explosion behind the men, and bright flames of fire erupt behind their backs. The girl is distracted by the fire and releases the man's hand from her palms, and the man flies down. Hosu runs out of the burning building, and out of the corner of his eye, he notices the man flying headlong to the ground. The hero sees these terrible events and climbs onto a neighboring roof to calm people down. He climbs onto the roof of the building and yells at the people to calm down and move away from the edge of the building. The man shouts a few insults in the hero's direction and asks him to save the people as quickly as possible. Hosu lets the man's insults pass his ears and rushes down the stairs. Fire trucks with their sirens on are approaching the scene of the fire. Hosu looks in their direction with joy in his eyes, then falls to the ground due to the fatigue that has overtaken him. The commander's car pulls up next to the second fire department's car, and the commander notices its mangled bumper. The firefighters try to lift Hosu and medical personnel prepare a stretcher for him. The major gives the order to take the hero to the hospital, and the rest of the firefighters follow him into the building. He listens to the officer's report about the people who are stuck on the roof of the building and need rescuing. 
The major puts on his firefighter's uniform and goes inside the building with the squad to check on the young firefighter's actions. He squats down and picks up the hose that Hosu used to extinguish one of the fires. Reporters show footage of the mall fire and talk about the heroic actions of the firefighters that saved lives. Hosu is on the phone with the officers of his squad. They are worried about his health, so they decided to find out how he is feeling. The officers tell the hero that their fire truck had to be put into repair and wish him a quick recovery. Hosu needs his injured shoulder a bit and sees a colonel from headquarters enter his room. The colonel enters the room with the reporters. He gives the hero a little hug and tells him more about the young firefighter. Hosu scrutinizes the colonel and the huge crowd of reporters, an emotion of incomprehension flickering across his face. The captain of the rapid response squad summoned the major to his office to discuss the candidates for the special squad. The captain pulls out several sheets with the candidates' biographies and asks the coordinator to read them in detail. The major studies the sheets and pulls out a document with the biography of firefighter Ho Su, which he takes special care to read. Wang Ho goes jogging in the park at night to prepare for the special fire brigade exam. He sees the ghost of Ho Su in front of him, who overtakes him and runs off somewhere in the distance. Wang Ho sees a flashback in which his fire squad is asking about his friend Ho Su and their studies together. His entire squad discusses the hero and his former accomplishments with great awe and enthusiasm. Wang Ho takes a quick dash towards the ghost of his friend whom he wants to overtake. He fails to notice the obstacle under his feet and falls to his knees, but the ghost stops and looks in his direction. The ghost reaches out and helps Wang Ho up. The sergeant leans on his knees and tries to catch his breath. Wang Ho takes a few more breaths and continues his training through the night park. The major fills out a list of candidates for their recommendation to the special rescue squad, and on that list are Yeren, Ho Su, and Wang Ho, among others. The center director on his computer scrolls through the latest news and reads a summary of the fire at the mall. He looks at the photo of the colonel in Hosu, which was taken at the hospital, and hopes that there won't be any intrigues against his squad anytime soon. Sergeant Song Diak congratulates Hosu on his recovery and suggests they go for a joint training session. The squad leader walks into the squad room and tells them that the rapid response squad has prepared a list of applicants to join. The team familiarizes themselves with the special squad list, and the squad commander gives way to an officer to talk about each candidate in detail. They discuss each candidate and talk about how this year's competition is going to be very tough, and Hosu heads off to training. Wang Ho and Hosu do a short warm-up in the park before the main run. The guys discuss the fire at the mall, and the hero thanks Wang Ho for the sound advice on using his ability. Hosu tells Wang Ho about an amazing firefighter who cleared a tunnel with his bare hands, and they pass a man wearing a black hooded sweatshirt. The man turns out to be Choi Do Jin from the Dako Fire Department. He takes off his headphones and looks in the direction of the departing guys. A small multi story building is engulfed in flames, and several fire trucks arrive on the scene. A firefighter takes people aside and asks them to stay away from the building's flames. A woman approaches the fire brigade and asks them to save her child who is left inside the building. The firefighters look toward the building and consider a plan to save the child. Fireman Choi. Dojin clutches the baby tightly to his chest and runs to the exit of the building. He reports the situation to the radio and asks for reinforcements to get out of the burning building. The second crew changes clothes and prepares to go through training, which takes place once a month. In the main fire department center, Firefighters take their seats and listen to an instructor who speaks in front of a podium. He shows slides on a screen and gives a lecture that focuses on different areas to benefit firefighters while on the job. The firefighters look at the slides carefully and jot down the necessary information on a notepad. Suho puts on his ceremonial clothes. He, along with Choi Dojin, will be admitted to the award that will be given out at the firefighter training event. The hero arrives at the ceremony and reports to the firefighter, Choi Do Jin isn't there yet because he's late. The door to the room creaks open and Ho Su sees Do Jin behind him, who came without his ceremonial uniform and a sweatshirt. Do Jin is a very tall firefighter, so the organizer asks Ho Su to move to the side so that this difference won't be too visible on stage. The tall firefighter walks outside and reads his favorite black superhero manga. He heads to his car and pulls out his dress clothes for the awards ceremony from there. Hosu meets up with Wan Ho in the restroom during a break and talks about firefighter Choi Dojin. 
The tall firefighter is changing clothes in a closed stall and listens to the conversation of the guys discussing him. The lecture begins and all the firefighters settle into their seats. Du Jin sits down next to Hosu and stares at him intently. Hosu notices that the tall fireman is constantly looking at him. The hero gets a little worried and adjusts his clothes. Wang Ho, along with the tall fireman, stand outside the building. Do Jin turns to the hero and asks if he can see the future. The hero's eyes light up. He sees the future in which Do Jin knows the truth about him and starts to worry. Ho Su grabs Wang Ho's hand and walks away from Do Jin with him, but suddenly he hears a question in his back about whether the hero can see the future. The guys head to a nearby coffee shop and discuss Ho Su's special ability. Du Jin orders a cold drink and asks Ho Su why he became a firefighter with such a strong ability. Ho Su's eyes widen in surprise. He didn't expect such a question from a tall firefighter. Du Jin takes the pipes in his hands and exerts first on Wang Ho and then on himself and says that the job of firefighters is an important job for them. He looks into Ho Su's eyes and tries to determine how important being a firefighter is to the hero. Du Jin looks at the guy's faces and asks them to take his words seriously. He talks about how most firefighters don't seriously think about their job. They discuss the test for the rapid response squad, and Du Jin talks about how he doesn't want Ho Su on the squad. Ho Su abruptly gets up from the table and declares that he will prove during the test that he is responsible for his job. Du Jin goes home, and the guys talk about the conversation that happened between them for a while. The tall fireman sits in his car and waits for the red light to change to green. He thinks about the conversation with the guys, and his thoughts drift back to memories when he was a kid. Little Dejin is reading a superhero comic book, and his mom walks into his room. He fights with the overweight kid, and the girl tries to break them up and asks Du Jin not to fight. The woman reprimands the child for fighting and asks him not to read superhero comics anymore. Du Jin doesn't want to continue the conversation any longer and runs out of the house with tears in his eyes. He slowly walks along the road and wipes his tears with his hand. He is upset that his mom is judging his dream. The boy wipes his eyes and sees people running screaming from the fire that is engulfing the building. He is very scared and can't move. A fireman runs to him and grabs him by the shoulders. The fireman holds him tightly to his chest and shields the child with his back from the explosion. The head of the fire station center, Dokko, is talking to Do Jin. He raises his voice at him and tells him to listen carefully. Du Jin hears his squad training hard in the courtyard and promises the center director that he will definitely join the special squad. The commander and the officer watch Hosu's training carefully and are amazed at the young firefighter's stamina. Hosu, in full firefighting gear, is practicing with a fire hose. Lee J brings a bottle of water to the hero and offers him a little break from the training. He records the results of the hero's training and tells Hosu about his progress compared to other days. The commander removes his outer clothing and walks over to the hero to join him in his training. The officer carries the commander, exhausted from training, on his back to the control room. The captain of the special response squad discusses with his officers the plan of the exam. He suggests a physical test to weed out weak applicants. The director of the center reads the plan for the physical test that the special response squad has prepared. Ho Su is quite fast in swinging his arms and squatting. He is practicing long jumping. Yeren is practicing on the playground and doing a variety of exercises on the crossbar. Wang Ho and his comrades are practicing in full firefighter uniforms. Dog Ko and his squad are practicing shuttle run. He is saying goodbye to the guys in advance because he is going to leave for the special response team. Hosu calls Aaron and asks when she is coming for the physical test. He puts on his gym sneakers and leaves the house. Wang Ho meets up with Hosu and together they head to the stadium in Chakdo City where the first test to join the special fire squad will be held. The guys enter the locker room and see a huge number of contestants preparing for the physical test. Wan Ho and Ho Su check in with one of the special squad members. He points the guys towards the lockers and asks them to change. Sergeant So Lee Gong writes down the guys' names in a notebook and marks their names with special symbols. Wan Ho and Ho Su are assigned to different teams. The hero puts on a blue vest and heads to his squad. He meets Du Jin, who is also in the blue team. Warrant Officer Kim Ik Wan greets everyone and tells them the rules of the exam. The examiner gives some time to prepare and the guys do warm-ups with Ho Su looking intently toward the tall firefighter and keeping his eyes on him. Du Jin pulls out his phone to read his favorite manga, but it's not out yet. He gazes at the hero and wants to ask for his help. 
He turns towards Ho Su and covers himself with the hood of his sweatshirt. Du Jin hesitates to approach the hero with this request. The examiner announces the start of the exam with a loud voice. Du Jin and Ho Su, along with the rest of the contestants, head to the set. Each participant puts a piece of paper with a serial number on their clothes. Warrant Officer Kim points to the mattresses on the floor and announces the start of the torso lifting exercise. A loud whistle blows, and the candidates begin to perform the exercises at a fast pace while the examiners record their data. Ho Su and Du Jin find themselves in the second group and start performing the exercise together. The competitors discuss the guys. They are very surprised by their result. Ho Su and Du Jin finish the exercise and try to catch their breath. They go through the exercise one more time and use all the energy they have left. The special team sergeant posts the first team's results for the other members to review. The members of the first team watch the fight between Ho Su and Do Jin carefully and try to conserve as much energy as they can for the next challenge. The military officer chats with a candidate from his group and lights a cigarette to calm his nerves. He doesn't understand why he has to take the physical test with everyone else and promises his friend to perform top notch on the next test. A military officer squeezes in between the hero and Do Jin. He pushes them in the shoulder and passes on. He picks up a bench press machine and performs well because he served in the elite military. He closely watches Du Jin and Wang Ho pass this test, military confident that they won't be able to break the record. The military officer looks at them with astonishment mixed with horror and doesn't understand how it could happen. Everyone looks admiringly at Du Jin, who showed the highest score on this exercise, and the tall fireman looks at the military officer and watches his reaction. The military officer and his special forces friend go out for a smoke break, the military officer kicking an empty can with all his might because of his anger. The commander of the special unit passes by and picks up the can that the military officer kicked. He glances at the can and at the military officer. The commander puts the empty can in the officer's hands and asks him to throw it in the trash can. He starts a conversation with the candidate and asks about the exam. The officers gather all the teams in the common room. They thank everyone for participating and talk about the last two tests left. Sergeant Seo Li Gan leans on the fence and scrutinizes each of the candidates. He erases the information on the board and writes in marker about another discipline, behavior. The special fire brigade, led by the commander, goes to the candidates to announce the behavior results. The officer approaches one of the red team candidates. He reprimands him about his shoelaces and takes away one point. The special fire brigade watches the cadets closely and reprimands them during the exercise. The commander admonishes a military officer and asks him not to get angry over nonsense. Sergeant Sang Hyun studies the team's score sheet. He looks at Ho Su and Do Jin's scores with a smile and marvels at their accomplishments. The team stop discussing Do Jin's accomplishments. They are very interested in the young firefighter and his results. The candidates watch carefully as Ho Su performs the exercises they hope he can surpass Do Jin. The long jump exercise begins. The hero takes the starting position and waits for the examiner's command. Hosu makes the jump. The examiner and the participants are mesmerized by his back. The hero managed to beat Do Jin's result. The candidates are discussing Hosu's new record and the military officer casts a baleful glance at his surroundings. The special squad commander notices the military officer's displeasure and asks him the reason for his displeasure. He listens to the officer's comments and makes notes in his notebook. The commander asks the military officer not to categorize people. The blue team heads to the last discipline in this test, which is flexibility exercises. Du Jin gives his best effort, but his body wasn't ready for this exercise, and he loses to Ho Su in this competition. As the physical test comes to an end, Ho Su and Do Jin discuss the results between them. Du Jin wipes the sweat from his forehead and takes a breath. He admits that Ho Su's intentions to become a firefighter come from his heart. All the teams gather in the main hall and familiarize themselves with the results of the physical text, which are posted on the board. The examiner gathers all the participants in the large hall and tells the features of the discipline, shuttle run. Candidates take their positions and prepare to begin the test at the command of the instructor. The commander sees the military officer's gaze on him and heads towards him to find out the reason for his anger. The officer turns sharply to the special squad commander. He looks him straight in the eye and calls this test complete nonsense. He points his finger at Ho Su and Do Jin and says that they are not worthy of being here, and the guys stare at him silently without the slightest emotion on their faces.
The captain listens to the military officer's words and writes down a few sentences on his sheet. The officer is even more filled with anger, and with all his might he hits the stapled papers of the commander, and together with the pen they end up on the floor. The commander walks towards the notebook without any extra emotion and picks it up from the floor. He holds out his notebook to the military officer and explains why the behavioral evaluation was necessary. The military officer carefully reads the form with his scores. He realizes he was wrong and regrets his action. His scores are sketched on the form and the behavior column contains only positive comments. The military officer gathered all his belongings in his backpack and went home. He did not wait until the physical test was over. The officer takes a quick step down the stairs but twists his foot and falls down. Ho Su and Du Jin continue to compete against each other. This time the subject of their competition is Shuttle Run. The guys meet outside the building and they discuss the exam and the man who decided to leave the exam early. Brigadier Sang Hyun wants to know how the competition between Ho Su and Do Jin went, so he asks the hero for the results of the shuttle run. The second group goes inside the stadium with Yeren to take a physical test. Sergeant So Lee Gong checks the clock time and announces the start of the exam for the next group. The group listens attentively to the instruction from the handler and begins a short warm up. The examiner announces in advance that a discipline called behavior will be evaluated. Yaren's school memories appear before her eyes. She participates in a long-distance running competition and tries to catch up with her rival. The coach reprimands Aaron for her defeat and asks her to do her best next time. The coaches discuss the race and are going to take out the competitors so that Yaren wins the competition. The girl overtakes the other competitors in the race without much trouble and runs ahead of everyone. Yaren is awarded a gold medal for first place, but there is not a single gram of smile on her face. At the Olympics, the girl again runs ahead of everyone, but stops and looks at the stands. A huge number of people support Yarin, the girl's former rival, holds a huge banner and shouts words of support. Yarin does a little warm-up and prepares for the physical test. The girl's friend calls her and they discuss the future exam together. She wishes Yarin to defeat everyone and above all herself. Yarin is inspired by her friend's words and goes to the site where the first test will be held. She analyzes the other contestants and decides to develop a special strategy to pass the exam. Yaren uses the right technique in each exercise and manages to get an average result where she is not strong. The girl's success is noticed not only by the cadets, but also by the officer of the special unit, who notes this peculiarity in his notebook. Yaren fixes her lower body and straightens her legs to achieve a good result on the abdominal muscle strength test. The scoreboard shows the results of the cadets, and among them is the name of Yaren, who is in the top five in some disciplines. The captain and the officer of the special unit are watching the cadets closely. Their attention is attracted by Yaren, who is making great progress. Yaren performs a huge number of repetitions during the shuttle run and moves quickly from one point to another. Most of the cadets are unable to compete with the girl and they fall to the floor from fatigue. The rapid response squad cleans up the pad and takes over the scoring of the cadets who pass the physical text. Two officers move a marking board closer to the squad to make it easier for the commander to allocate candidates to the special fire squad. The special squad captain composes letters and emails them to the cadets who pass the first round of the special fire squad exam. Ho Su and Du Jin meet at a small cafe and discuss the physical test they passed. Du Jin tells the young firefighter that he has familiarized himself with all of the hero's cases and outings. He admits his wrongdoing to the hero and apologizes to the young firefighter for his past words. Du Jin gets up from the table and slowly heads towards the exit. He thanks the hero for the conversation and hopes that Ho Su will pass the next test. The commander along with Ho Su head off on their mission. The hero looks out of the car and looks around. They drive through the fields to the village and discuss the exam that took place in the stadium. The squad puts on special suits and heads to the wasp hive to get rid of it. Hosu goes to get a shovel and digs through the fire truck to find it. Out of the corner of his eye, he notices a boy covered in water hiding behind the truck and watching the hero. The young firefighter approaches the commander with a civilian and tells them about the boy who is hiding behind the fire truck. The firefighters realize that the boy is in danger and rush towards the fire truck. The boy is playing soccer and stumbles upon a swarm of bees. They fly in his direction to sting him. Hosu looks around and tries to find the boy who was stung by the wasps. He opens the door of the fire truck and finds the injured boy there. The child is lying on the seat and breathing heavily. 
his whole body covered in sweat, and he pays no attention to the hero. The young fireman takes the boy in his arms and runs to the commander in the hope that he will help save the child. The headman and the commander go to get a car and ask Hosu to watch the child until they arrive. The commander calls the chief medical officer and tells him about the child's situation. Hosu radio contacts the nearest hospital and asks them to send an ambulance to the village where he is. The headman brings the car and the squad heads towards the nearest hospital. The medical squad and the ambulance heads towards Hosu. The paramedics radio the firefighters and get their coordinates. The ambulance squad contacts the doctor and receives the recommendations necessary to save the boy. The boy's face is covered in red blotches and his face contorts in pain. The vehicle arrives at the meeting place and Ho Su rushes towards the medic with the child. The firefighters and medic lay the child on a wooden table and administer first aid. The medic carefully treats the bites with a wet towel and waits for the paramedic squad. Emergency services arrive on the scene and rush toward the child with a medical gurney. The commander tells the squad the story of the child's rescue and suggests that Young Jin take an exam to become certified as a lifeguard. The senior medic refuses, saying that he still has a lot to teach Bo Ram and doesn't have time to get certified. The fire chief calls the captain of the special fire squad into his office and asks him about expanding the squad. He walks up to the fire captain and puts his hand on his shoulder. The chief thanks him for the great idea of combining the rapid response squad and special rescue squad into one unified center. The entire fire department learns that Bo Ram Youngjin is dating. The firefighters approach the chief and congratulate him. Youngjin hugs his friends who came to congratulate him tightly. He is angry because they are teasing him, but still the medic is happy to see them. The fire department learns of the establishment of the Chakdo City Special Rapid Response Center. The director of the center walks into the control room and all the firefighters salute to greet him. Hosu notices the special squad commander in the hallway, who heads to the office of the center director. Lee J brings two mugs of coffee into the center director's office. He listens as the commanders discuss the addition of the special squad. The center director turns his head towards Lee J and asks him to call Brigadier Youngjin into his office. The special squad commander suggests that the senior medic get into the special ambulance squad. The firefighters ask Young Jin about the special squad commander's offer, and the senior medic hesitates about joining the special squad. Young Jin calls his classmate Sung Dae and asks him about the special ambulance squad. Sergeant Sung Dae can't tell him anything about the special unit, and the chief medical officer quickly drops the call, not wanting to continue the conversation. The commander reads the information about the medical aid course and warns Young Jin that there will be indirect heart massage training today. Young Jin shrieks across the room and grabs his head with both hands. He knows the heart massage technique but doesn't want to teach it to children. The senior medic looks out the window of the ambulance and contemplates joining the special medical unit. His friend asks him not to rush into a final decision because there is still plenty of time before the squad enrolls. The paramedics take the medical kits with them and send them to the school auditorium to meet the children. The school kids pay no attention to the medical staff and go about their business. Young Jin grabs his head and mutters to himself that he wants to get out of here quickly while his friends try to support him. Not far from the high school, former firefighter Ku Jintai crosses the road at a red traffic light. He doesn't look around at all, so he doesn't notice the car that is speeding straight at him. The former firefighter grabs his leg and screams in pain. Passersby surround him and try to call for an ambulance. The paramedics finish training the children and get into their car to head back to base. Young Jin is too shaken after his interaction with the children. He stares out the car window and doesn't pay attention to what his friends say. The ambulance gets caught in a traffic jam, but by a strange coincidence, all the cars part in front of it and clear the way. Passersby call the medical personnel closer to the crosswalk and ask them to give the injured man first aid. Young Jin gets out of the car and walks towards the crosswalk where Ku Jin Tai is lying. He gets very close to the former firefighter and examines his wound. Firefighters from the special rescue squad also arrive at the call and leave the car near the ambulance. The captain, along with an officer, review the lists of candidates for the special squad. He singles out a few special candidates to go to them personally and offer them jobs on the squad. The officer is impressed by the captain's diligence and asks why the captain is trying so hard. The captain does not take his eyes off the documents and with a smile on his face tells his officer that he wants to do everything perfectly because it is his last duty as squad leader.
He explains that he is only pretending to be a squad leader and hopes that a worthy successor will emerge soon. The captain points his finger at Officer Doyoon and says that he'll be the commander now. Ku Jintai tries to break free from the rescue stretcher and demands to be taken to the hospital faster. Young Jin looks at the injured man with a calm expression and holds his left arm. People surround the injured man and the senior medic. They discuss Young Jin and don't understand his actions as a rescuer. Ku Jintai hears the disgruntled cries at the people and declares to the paramedic with a smile on his face that the paramedic is a weakling who can only work for pennies. Young Jin lets the former firefighter's words pass his ears and asks him to lie still. The senior medic examines the injured man once more, and then together with his friend, they carry Ku Jintai inside the car on a stretcher. The special response squad commander approaches the medical vehicle and offers his squad's assistance. Ku Jintai lies in the ambulance and with a smile on his face continues to sling mud at the paramedics, but no one pays the slightest attention to him. The special squad commander heads towards his team. Young Jin stops him and talks about wanting to train for the special ambulance squad. The second fire squad listens to Young Jin's story about the accident on the road with Ku Jin Tai. Bo Ram tells the guys about the senior medic's decision to join the ambulance squad. The guys approach Young Jin and congratulate him on his decision, while Hosu teases the medic. The senior medic gets tired of all this attention and asks the fire department to leave him alone. The firefighters finish their work and go home until tomorrow. The officer stops by the bookstore on his way home and couches a book about the firefighter's code. He walks into his home, turns on the lights and removes his outer clothing and settles in. The officer turns on his computer and listens to an informational video about the advanced training exam. Hey Day talks to his mom. She asks him to transfer to headquarters so it will be safer to work. He wakes up in the middle of the night because of his sister's call and decides to write some words in his will. Wang Ho helps his comrade gather firefighting equipment and pack it into a bag. A warrant officer walks past them with a cigarette in his hand and asks the guys about their night shift duty. Wang Ho sits down at his workstation and goes through some documents from an email. The commanders ask Wang Ho to take it easy and ask for help from his co-workers if needed. Wang Ho's friend goes to a firefighting competition. He promises that he will return to the firehouse with first place. He says goodbye to the whole team and Wang Ho brushes aside all worries and waves him off with a smile on his face. The evening shift of firefighters goes on their duty, with only two people outside the building to inspect the fire truck. The commander thanks the squad for their help and asks them to stow the fire hoses in the truck. He suggests that they take a short break and the whole squad goes out to dinner. Wang Ho stays one of the latter and twists the fire hose. His colleague heads over to help. They remove the fire hose together and the comrade asks Wan Ho if he regrets staying for the night shift. Wang Ho says that the job is indeed hard, but he doesn't regret anything. He finishes his work and goes into the locker room to change and take off his extra uniform. There is the noise of a phone ringing in the room and Wan Ho looks around for the noise. A phone left on the closet repeats the same tune and tries to attract the attention of its owner. Wang Ho picks up the phone and reads the message his comrade sent him. The phone screen shows a message from his friend who went on vacation to prepare for the competition. He thanks Wang Ho once again for his help. Wang Ho reads his friend's messages with a smile on his face. He is very happy that he can help him. He sends a small message asking his friend not to worry and try to rest. For a while, they passionately exchange messages and words of encouragement with each other. They end their communication, and Wang Ho checks the other calls and texts he might have been left while he was working. Messages pop up on his phone screen about two missed calls during his night watch. Ho Su is sitting at a bar and calls Wang Ho. He asks if he's busy and offers to meet him and his classmates. The classmates from the academy listen attentively to the conversation between the two friends and eat their food without taking their eyes off Ho Su. They are gathered in full and even a silent classmate is sitting nearby using chopsticks. Wang Ho says he'll be late because of the night's holdup, but that doesn't upset Ho Su in the least. The hero hopes his friend will still come to the feast. Classmates sit in a cafe and celebrate the return of their friend Byung Gi to the fire station, who has already had a few beers. Wang Ho stands alone in the narrow hallway and questions the young firefighter about Byung Gi. He's very happy to hear that his friend is back to normal and wishes him to be careful. The firefighting team calls Wang Ho for dinner and he says goodbye and hangs up the phone. The classmates say hello to Wang Ho and wish him a successful night's duty. Byung-gi moves closer to Hosu and asks Wang Ho to be sure to come next time.
Wang Ho is happy to hear from his friend and congratulates him on his return to the fire brigade squad one more time. The classmates also ask Wang Ho to make sure to come next time. They keep talking amongst themselves and order some dishes for themselves. Wang Ho asks the guys to give him a heads up when they will be going to the next meeting so that they can gather as a full group. He drops the phone call and puts his cell phone down. Wang Ho ponders the guy's words. He was really happy to hear that they all gathered, especially Byung Gi. The commander along with the team sit at the table and ask Wang Ho to sit down with them quickly. There are a few bowls of food on the table and Wang Ho pours himself a small portion. He hums something to himself and takes his food with great appetite. The other firemen keep up with their friend and eat too. They discuss today's duty and enjoy the taste of pork soup. The fire alarm sounds and the crew turns towards the sound with cheeks full of food. They leave their food on the table and quickly jump out of their seats to make it to the call. The team runs to the fire truck and their locker rooms as fast as they can to make it to the call. A lone spoonful of rice is left under the table, which one of the firefighters dropped in his haste. The fire truck, along with a squad of firefighters, rushes down the main street to the call. The commander doesn't understand why there are so many calls this evening and suggests that it is because of the dry weather and when he thinks this day is special. The team listens to the commander's orders and Wang Ho puts on his helmet and sternly stares ahead of him. In Wang Ho's mind, memories of his morning conversation with a friend who is supposed to be competing come to mind. Wan Ho asks his comrade if the knight's ridiculousness will hurt his uniform in the competition and offers to take over for him on duty. Wang Ho ponders the conversation with his comrade and regrets offering his help. The firefighter distracts Wan Ho from his thoughts and points out the scene through the car window. The team arrives at the scene of the call and sees a multi-story building that is completely covered in fire. They quickly get out of the car and drag a fire hose towards the fire. The commander asks his squad to be extremely careful and tells them to call for support from the base. Wan Ho is at a bit of a loss. He has not had to work with this team before. The squad leader realizes this and asks Wang Ho to stay out of dangerous places and wait for the support squads near the car. Wang Ho did not expect to hear such an order. He looks at the commander with a little surprise and does not utter a word. He silently watches as the squad along with the commander rushes towards the burning building and carries the water cannons with them. The sparks from the fire fly not far from Wang Ho's face and red hot air envelops his entire face. Wang Ho's gaze settles on the building from whose windows the flames are violently bursting out. The commander opens the wicket and lets his subordinate forward along with the fire hose. The classmates celebrate the return of their friend and do not realize that Wang Ho is now on call. Wang Ho continues to stare back and forth at the flames and the squad and doesn't know what he should do. The classmates exchange stories and tell each other about past events. Wang Ho adjusts his helmet and tries to put his thoughts together. A fire truck along with a support squad rushes to the aid of Jing Wang's team. The squad leader reports that his Haitian team will be there in a few minutes and asks them not to be heroic unnecessarily. Squad leader Jing Wang replies to the support team that there is nothing to worry about. They have the situation under control. He stands covered in soot and despairs about the actions of his team. His subordinate extinguishes the remaining fires from which smoke is emanating. Wang Ho stands by Jing Wang's squad car and awaits the commander's orders. He listens to the squad's report and takes off his fire helmet because he realizes that the work of the fire brigade in this place is over and his help is not needed. From the radios of the other fire department squads come reports that the big fire has been extinguished and their help is not needed. Yeren turns toward the radio and listens to the commander's report. The second squad commander picks his nose and talks about how busy things are at the Jing Wang Center today. He asks his team to remain on alert because their center may have the same situation. The team continues to listen to alerts from other fire stations. The squad officer suggests that they prepare fire trucks in advance. The sun's rays illuminate the signboard on the Jiguan Fire Safety Center building along with its distinctive sign. Jiguan's team returns to their dinner and sadly notices that the food has already managed to get cold. Wang Ho offers to cook it all again and wants to do it himself but the squad officer along with the commander ask him not to overdo it. Wang Ho ponders his squad's words and agrees to let someone else do the cooking. The officer heads to the kitchen along with a plate of meat to heat it up, and Wang Ho sits down at the table and takes to eating cold rice. 
The officer is very much surprised that Wang Ho chooses to eat cold rice and discusses his comrade's preference for the place with the sergeant. The commander asks Wang Ho to calmly take his food and not to hurry anywhere because there will be no calls anytime soon. A familiar fire alarm siren blares from the ceiling, ringing throughout the room. The commander and Wang Ho turn towards the sound and can't believe that they will have to go on another call again. The team runs down the narrow corridor to another call and forget all about trying to eat. Team Jing Wang puts on their firefighting gear and prepares to go to the scene. The officer takes another look at the truck and asks the squad about the hoses that were on the drying rack. Two fire engines from the center are dispatched to the scene of the fire. Team Yeren receives a report of a fire at the mall and ponders the situation. The team commander says that their center is located near the call and asks the team to be ready to go. The glow of fire brightly illuminates the night streets of the city. The fire has already completely consumed the mall building and is slowly spreading to the neighboring houses. A man in glasses with tears in his eyes reaches out his hand and tries to get closer to the fire, but he is stopped by his friend. Firefighters arrive on the scene and quickly rush towards the burning building. A passerby films on his phone as the building speaks and firefighters stand near the main entrance along with a fire hose and try to get inside. A car arrives at the scene of the fire with a red sign that says it belongs to the coordination team. Major Yu So Bin gets out of the car and takes on the role of coordinating the squads. Several firefighters surround the burning building and prepare to open fire with water cannons. They ask the major to keep his distance from the fire. The major takes a close look at the buildings. He realizes that they are standing close together, which can cause the fire to spread quickly around the area. Hosu walks into the house and slowly takes off his sneakers in the hallway of the house. The hero walks through the house and hums a pleasant tune to himself. He has no idea what danger has befallen Wan Ho's squad. He sits on his bed and checks the texts and calls on his phone. On the screen of his phone are a few pictures of his classmates that they took together at the cafe as a souvenir. He continues to scroll through the photos, but suddenly an unpleasant shiver and excitement grips his body. A notification from Commander Shinjun Bomb's call appears on his phone screen. A fire truck rushes to the call to support other groups in the neighborhood. In that vehicle is Ernie's team. The squad leader summarizes the situation and gives the first orders. Yeren's gaze is fixed strictly forward. She is ready to act at any moment. Hosu talks to the second squad leader and listens to the information about a possible state of emergency. The commander asks the hero not to come to the center, but to remain ready to go on a mission at any minute. Together with the officer, the commander drives through the night streets of the city and continues to outline the situation around the commercial buildings to Hosu. The hero listens intently to the commander. He becomes anxious and activates his ability to see the future. The hero sits beside the bed he placed his phone on and waits for a call from his team. Hosu checks his phone for notifications and is surprised that no one has declared a state of emergency yet. He is very happy that the fire situation has not become critical, but suddenly he hears something drumming on the glass of his window. The hero sees that it is raining heavily outside the window, which inexorably slides down the glass. A notification pops up on his phone that his girlfriend Yeren is calling him. He picks up his phone and checks the messages. The hero notices the call from his girlfriend and answers it. The young firefighter puts on white sneakers and rushes to the exit of the house. He slowly walks through the city streets at night and comes to near a brick fence. Hosu opens the door of Chakdo University Hospital and walks inside the building. He walks through several corridors and turns a corner where he sees several people waiting for a doctor. The man tries to comfort the woman, but she doesn't hear him her frightened and puzzled eyes looking only at the floor. Several people look at this picture, but they do not choose to interfere with the situation. Ho Su's feet stand in front of them, and he slowly walks towards the frightened woman. He walks a few meters and carefully examines the faces of the people, which are filled with fear and pain. The hero walks past them and heads towards the red arrow that marks the direction to the emergency room. Hosu wraps his arms around himself and stops near the wall where his body begins to shake with excitement. People notice the hero and look in his direction but say nothing and watch Hosu's actions. He approaches two men and tries to ask them about the situation in the intensive care unit. The men's voices reach his ears, but due to his excitement, they pass by and do not reach his mind. The man puts his hand on Hosu's shoulder and tries to calm him down before heading towards the exit. The hero turns toward the room and tries to see what is going on behind its closed doors. A wave of terror envelops Hosu's body from head to toe, and his eyes fill with tears that slowly roll down. 
Yaren runs into the hallway, the girl leaning on her knees and trying to catch her breath. She turns towards the people present, her eyes filled with the same fear as Ho Su's. The hero slowly turns in her direction and stares silently into the girl's eyes. Yaren sees Ho Su's eyes become wet with tears and stares immovably in his direction. Raindrops glisten in the night sky as they quickly replace each other and cover the hospital building with moisture. The man uses a strange device and does something with it, aiming it at the floor. Using a long stick, he carefully adjusts his shoes and places them in a single row with the other shoes. People gradually leave the building. They say nothing to each other, and their heads are strictly tilted downwards, as if they are trying to see something on the floor. An elderly woman, along with a young man, remains near the memorial wreath while the man bows his head before it. The young man takes the woman under his arm and helps her up from the floor. The woman casts her gaze toward the memorial wreath and her legs give out in shock, but the young man manages to catch her. In the small restaurant, the waitress is serving drinks and food, and Ho Su is sitting at one of the tables in the corner of the building. The hero's gaze is completely glassy and directed into the void. He is thinking about what happened and cannot believe that all this is true. The commander of the 2nd Fire Brigade, along with the medical staff, is heading towards the hero. They stop opposite and want to express words of condolence to their friend, but a hard lump in the throat does not allow them to do so. They silently take a seat with Hosu at the same table and look somewhere under their feet, the entire squad maintaining the cafe's sepulchral silence. Hosu's eyes clear and he turns his attention to his friends who have come to support him. The waitress brings the guys several plates of food and drinks, and they all begin to eat, except Hosu. Throughout the entire meal, they don't say a word amongst themselves, and the hero grabs his face with both hands and starts crying. A few feet in polished shoes slowly make their way towards the building. Hosu's classmates walk inside the room, their faces blank and their gazes directed somewhere far away. They take off their shoes in the hallway and pile onto a memorial wreath to honor their friend. The classmate looks around the room and notices a vase that is filled with white flowers. Several huge vases that are filled with white chrysanthemums stand to the left and right of the memorial wreath. A classmate slowly pulls one flower out of the vase and walks closer to the wreath. He holds the flower in front of him, and behind him stand his friends, who are confused, and only Panji breaks the silence of the room with his sobbing due to tears. The classmate slowly and carefully places the flower on the shelf next to the photos, where a huge number of similar chrysanthemums lie in a row. He turns back and sees his friends who have bowed their heads and are barely holding back their tears. His classmates are standing in front of the altar with their hands folded in a lock, and Pan Gi tries to rub his eyes from crying. On the altar, amidst a huge number of beautiful white chrysanthemums and incense, there is a picture of Wang Ho in his fireman's uniform, which is crossed out with a black ribbon. On the table is a huge amount of food, which consists of seafood and several bottles of alcohol. The classmates sit down at the table, and the academic squad leader tells them that Wang Ho was left under a building that collapsed due to rainwater and could not be rescued. The commander lightly adjusts his glasses and says that the sky was very ruthless to them. In front of his eyes, Pang Gi rubs his moist eyes over and over again, but it doesn't help him get rid of his tears. The silent classmate only looks down. He can't find any words for the guys. One of the guys can't stand the influx of emotions. He covers his face with his hands and starts crying hard. Panji closes his eyes and meditates, which is interrupted by the commander's voice. The academic squad leader suggests that Panji go home and rest if he is having a hard time. Tears begin to flow profusely from Panji's eyes, and he says that everything is fine and he will just let his emotions open up. After his friend's words, the classmates don't try to hold back their emotions. They just lightly cover their face with their hand and let the tears flow without end. The captain corrects his glasses and tries to get rid of the tears with his hand that prevent him from seeing. The guys wipe their tears and take their food. They finish their dialogue and finish their meal in silence. The bright lights of Chakdo University Hospital illuminate the sky from which it never stops raining. The fire squad commander hands over a small envelope with the money he was given to collect. The man holds out a memory book to him and asks him to write down the name of the center there. They make a few entries in the document and suddenly hear a voice addressing the center's commander, Jing Wong. Several men surround Commander Cho, whose squad Wang Ho was in, and ask him to calm down. Commander Cho tries to break free from the hands of the men and looks at the commander from the Jing Wong center with fierce eyes. 
He listens to the insults and humiliations that come out of Cho's mouth in a fit of rage. Commander Cho says that they should have gotten Wang Ho out by all means and not left him alone. He asks why Wang Ho was given a job to do when he was supposed to do nothing and is on the sidelines. The center commander ponders his co-worker's words, but doesn't know what he should say to these claims. The commander breaks free from the men's grip and heads toward the center commander with threats. The commander's argument is interrupted by the voice of a firefighter who was substituted for Wan Ho during the night shift. The fireman looks at the fire department commanders in horror and asks everyone in the neighborhood where Wang Ho has gone. Commander Cho's legs are shaking from fatigue and yelling. Now his anger is focused on the firefighter who has to go to the competition. He doesn't stop yelling at the firefighter for a second and demands that he show the highest score. Tears come to Wang Ho's friend's eyes. He can't understand what's going on and why he's being yelled at. The commander grits his teeth and stops saying anything. He realizes that no one is to blame. The fireman turns to Commander Jing Wong and asks what happened to Wang Ho. The commander puts his hands on the fireman's shoulders and talks about the situation with Wang Ho. The fireman listens attentively to his commander and tears appear in his eyes. The commander only stares at his subordinate absent-mindedly, unable to find the right words. The firefighter asks to go to Wan Ho because this situation was his fault. He tries to go further, but the commander stops him and asks him to stay in the hallway. The commander asks him not to go inside because he won't be able to tell Wan Ho's mother the whole truth. Wang Ho's friend looks at the commander with horror and doesn't understand, but backs off after his words. The second team sits silently at the same table, all of them dressed in black memorial suits. Ho Su is immersed in his thoughts and he doesn't pay attention to his friends and the people around him. Captain Beck asks the hero to take some rest and get some sleep because the funeral is coming up. The second squad has left the cafe. Only a few people, including Ho Su, remain sitting in their seats. The hero looks toward his plate of food, which he never touched. He hears a familiar voice echoing in his head, calling his name. Ho Su looks up and sees Wang Ho in front of him, who sits down across from him and asks why the hero is sitting here alone. The young firefighter slowly wipes his teary eyes and tries to figure out what's going on. Wang Ho tells the hero with a smile on his face that he looks really bad, and so he needs to get some sleep. Ho Su talks to Wang Ho, the hero's eyes widening in surprise after asking his friend who is having a wake. The young fireman looks around and says he can't remember who he came to see. Wang Ho raises his glass and says with a smile that he doesn't understand why Ho Su came to a funeral for someone he doesn't know. Ho Su takes in the food and the guys discuss together about the rapid response squad exams and preparing for them. The hero listens to the information about the exam time with a smile on his face and with his mouth full, he suggests that Wang Ho continue running around the park. Wang Ho agrees to Ho Su's suggestion. He says that the next exam will be no nonsense and he will need to prepare well. Ho Su opens his eyes and is horrified to realize that the conversation with Wang Ho was just a dream. He is the only one sitting at his dining room table, surrounded by a couple of people at neighboring tables who have fallen asleep. He slowly rises slowly from his seat and shakes off the remnants of food from his suit. He walks briskly along the corridor, occasionally swaying from side to side. He stops in the middle of the aisle and remembers Wan Ho and decides to go to his altar. Ho Su turns the corner and heads toward the room where the chrysanthemums stand along with a picture of Wang Ho. The young firefighter sees Wang Ho's picture in front of him, which is tied with black ribbon around the edges and huge bouquets with white chrysanthemums around it. He hears the clatter of footsteps heading in his direction, and another pair of boots appear in front of his feet. Du Jin, who has also come to honor Wang Ho, appears beside the hero. Ho Su returns to his desk and sits in front of it with his hands folded in his lap. Du Jin sits down across from the hero. He decides to break the silence and with his loud voice makes Ho Su pay attention to him. Du Jin decides to tell a story about the Meibun Tunnel that happened two years ago during the same rainstorm. The story carries over Du Jin's memories. A gasoline truck filled to the top with fuel slides down the wet highway and collides with several cars inside the tunnel. The fire department arrives on the scene. They go through the flames to help the victims and try to put out the fire. The firefighters find themselves facing a picture of a real hell. Several injured people are lying crushed by cars, and the fire is quickly spreading through the tunnel. The team pulls people out from under the rubble and helps the injured to leave the tunnel.
The fire team stops and listens to strange sounds coming from the ceiling of the tunnel. The tunnel cannot withstand the huge torrents of rain that endlessly pour from the sky, and it collapses. Du Jin recounts the story of the tunnel and talks about how not everyone managed to get out of the accident that day. Ho Su puts his hands down on the table and looks intently at Du Jin with his tired and wet eyes. Du Jin says that it makes him very bitter that the names of the heroes who didn't manage to get out from under the rubble aren't in people's memories. Talking to Du Jin brings Ho Su to his senses a little and the hero feels a little better. Du Jin says that those who stayed and didn't make it out of the rubble are obligated to continue their work and remember their comrades to the end. Hosu doesn't continue to take his eyes off the tall fireman, and after his last words, the hero's eyes fill with tears that run down his cheeks like streams. Very neat and strictly calibrated steps are carried along the asphalt. They are more like some kind of march. The firefighter farewell ceremony begins, and a man in dress uniform and white gloves holds Wang Ho's picture firmly in his hands. A huge number of firefighters in dress uniform stand behind the portrait and salute firefighter Wang Ho, who was left under rubble in the line of duty. Several firefighters lift the casket, which is covered with a Korean flag, and carry it along the entire ceremony. The firefighters watch this procedure, and some of them cover their face with their hand to hide their tears from others. A firefighter approaches the portrait of Wang Ho. He bows low in front of it and salutes. Yaren is also present at this ceremony. She stands a bit away from the main procedure and observes what is happening. The firefighters line up in front of the larger pedestal that is dedicated to Van Ho and salute him. The colonel walks up to the podium and announces the beginning of the farewell ceremony for Sergeant Van Ho. All the firefighters salute after the colonel's words, and only a few of them manage to hold back their emotions and not cry. The commander of the academic team comes to the podium to say a few words about his comrade. From the back rows comes the loud voice of a woman, which rivets the attention of the firefighters. The commander tries to ignore the woman's words and tearfully continues to read his speech. The voice of Wang Ho's mother continues to come from the back seats. She doesn't understand the significance of this ceremony. Tears begin to flow from the woman's eye, and her son, who is sitting nearby, tries to comfort her. The commander stops his speech. After Wang Ho's mother's words, he can no longer hold back his tears. Some firefighters also start crying. The woman's words really hurt their heart. Wang Ho's mother asks to finish this ceremony quickly so that she can stop seeing all these firefighters as soon as possible. Then she covers her face with her hands and starts crying. The commander, through copious tears, tries to finish his speech and asks Wang Ho to forgive him for everything. Ho Su and Yaren can't hold back their tears either and lower their caps so no one can see their faces and only Du Jin remains calm. The ceremony ends and the black car along with the coffin speeds off towards the cemetery. Soon the car arrives at the memorial alley, a place that keeps all the heroes and the memory of them. Inside this alley is a huge number of well-maintained stone memorials on which the heroes are marked. Now, one of them bears the name of Sergeant Van Ho along with his picture and a small bouquet of flowers next to it. A week passes and the second fire department starts its work. Its building has not undergone any changes. The commander of the second team fills out a report. He casts his gaze over his team and looks them over. He looks at Ho Su, who unlike the building has changed a lot since his close friend left. The officer gingerly looks in the hero's direction. He is very worried if Ho Su will be able to handle the job after the situation with Wan Ho. Ho Su comes to his senses and responds to the commander's words after a few minutes. The commander sighs heavily and asks Officer Hei Day to take over Ho Su's job. The hero absent-mindedly looks at his commander and asks him not to shift the job to the officer, but no one listens to him. He stares at the back of the departing commander and can't find the words to change his mind. Captain Beck looks in the hero's direction and hopes that Hosu will get over his loss and be able to get back to work. The center director adjusts his cap slightly, a small burn on his arm. The commander is looking somewhere off to the side. He's trying to pick up words and trying to find a clue around him. The commander and the center directors sit in the office to discuss the situation surrounding the young firefighter. The commander is very worried about Hosu. He believes that in such a state, the hero will not be able to make the right decisions and will get hurt. He shares his concerns about the firefighter Ho Su with the center director and asks to suspend the hero from the fire department. The center director listens attentively to his subordinate. He still adjusts his cap and ponders the current state of affairs. 
The center director waits for the firefighter to come to his office and hears a long-awaited knock on the door. Hosu walks into the director's office and asks about the reason he was called here. The director of the center points to a chair and invites the hero to sit down and discuss the situation. He takes a seat opposite Hosu and asks him how he feels after what happened. The hero didn't expect this question. He looks at the director of the center with confusion. He asks the director with a small smile and asks him to explain the nature of the question. The director of the center only looks at him silently and waits for an answer to his question. The center director's gaze reads the rigidity and seriousness of the question he asked. Hosu is startled by the director's gaze. He stares at it for a while and gathers his thoughts. He folds his hands into a lock and tells the center director that he is perfectly fine. The hero lowers his gaze down a bit and says that he has heard of people who didn't get out of fires before and were prepared for such a situation. The center director continues to listen to the hero in silence and does not interrupt him. He adjusts his cap and suggests that Hosu take a vacation to sort out his thoughts and come to his senses. Hosu thanks the director for his concern but refuses the vacation and leaves the office. The office door closes on the other side, and the director adjusts his chairs and ponders the hero's words. He sits down at his desk and opens a file folder to start working. The director worries that Hosu only understands the loss of his friend with his mind and wasn't prepared for it psychologically. The second team is dealing with reports in the control room and there is complete silence in the room. The commander has already finished his work and out of boredom twirls the pen in his hands and looks at the workstation of the paramedics who recently left on a call. He looks around at his team and his gaze once again clings to Hosu, who remains still immersed in his thoughts. In the afternoon, another discussion of the fire squad takes place in the office of the chief center. The commander stops by the center director's office to discuss Hosu's condition and his conversation with him. The center director confirms the commander's concerns and says that the hero is still young and inexperienced. The commander listens to the director's words. He is worried about the hero and tries not to give away his emotions, so he looks somewhere in the floor. The director of the center goes to the kettle and pours a mug of tea for himself and his guest. He walks over to the window and says that the young firefighter is surrounded by only old people, so Hosu will have to find a solution to his problem alone. The commander looks towards the director and ponders his words about Hosu. He wants to help the hero, but doesn't know how to do it right. The center director walks over to the chair the commander is sitting on and hands him a hot drink. He says that it's very harmful for Hosu to not show emotion like they do. He walks to his workstation and then sits down at his desk and drinks tea from a mug. The commander agrees with the center director. He says that they are all abnormal because they can't show emotion. They sit opposite each other for a while longer, the center director suggesting that they keep an eye on Hosu for the time being and suspend him as a last resort. The commander sits at his desk and listens to his squad's requests. Officer Heyday asks permission to take the fire truck and go to the watering station. He says he wants to take Ho Su on this mission. The hero hears this phrase from the officer because he is sitting nearby. The commander is surprised by this request and suggests that everyone go along with Brigadier Sung Deok. The sergeant crosses his arms and tries to show with a sign that Ho Su and the sergeant should be left alone on this mission. The officer casts a wary glance in the commander's direction. He doesn't say anything, but with his eyes he asks the commander to let them go. The commander takes the hint and says a little absent-mindedly that he doesn't mind Heite's decision and lets the two of them go on the mission together. The fire truck pulls out of the fire brigade building and rushes down the daytime highway. Hosu sits in the front seat and silently peeks out the car window to admire the scenery. Officer Heide turns his head toward the hero and asks him how he's feeling. He doesn't wait for an answer and turns his head in the direction of the road to follow the movement of the car. The officer says that he knows how hard it is for the hero because the office is silent and there's no room for him to vent his emotions. Hosu listens attentively to the officer's speech and hears him suggest that he yell in the cab during the watering because no one can hear him. They arrive at the watering site and the officer helps an elderly man water his vegetable garden. The man tries to correct the direction of the water cannon, but the officer can barely hear him because of the noise. They are standing in a clear field where there is not a single soul besides them, and the old man asks to turn off the water so that the officer can hear his requests. The sound of the engine of the car and the generator of the water pressure in the fire hoses create a single symphony that does not allow the sound from the cabin to penetrate outside.
Ho Su is left in the cab of the fire truck. He finally manages to find a place to vent his emotions and he cries himself to tears. The officer and elderly man can't hear the sounds Hosu is making at all due to the roar of the fire truck drowning out everything around him. Commander and Captain Beck greets the first fire team that has just returned from a call. The captain of the first team picks his nose as per his habit, followed by his subordinates. Yeren follows the captain as well. She walks at the very back of the squad and sinks into her thoughts. The girl lifts her tired gaze and listens to the captains talking amongst themselves about Hosu. An officer puts his hand on Yaren's shoulder and asks her to go up to the second floor and take some time off from work. Yaren replies to the officer with almost no emotion that she is fine and doesn't need a rest. The officer insists that the girl should go on vacation and gives her orders to go up to the second floor. Yaren listens to the officer's words and her eyes read that her mind is a jumble of thoughts, just like Hosu's. The girl has no choice but to obey the officer's order and leaves the control room. She walks leisurely through a few rooms and hears a voice coming from the restroom. Yaren opens the door slightly and tries to find the source of the noise that attracted her. To her surprise, the girl sees Ho Su, who is chatting with Wang Ho and talking about his duty. In the fireman's locker room, there is no one but Yaren and Ho Su, and only the young fireman is saying something, but his words are directed to the wall opposite his silhouette. Yaren sits alone on the porch of the fire brigade building and only the light from the building's lanterns and windows illuminates her. She hugs her knees and rests her nose in them. Yaren ponders the situation that happened to Ho Su. The young firefighter looks dazed and misunderstood at the squad leader who yells loudly at him and asks him to come to his senses. The squad commander holds Ho Su's face in his hands and asks him to stay off work and go to the hospital. Yaren, along with the firefighters, are watching this conversation. They are very worried about Hosu and hope he gets better. The hero looks quite detached. It seems that he does not hear the voices of the people around him and only nods at the questions that the commander asks him. Hosu comes to his senses and apologizes to all the firefighters, and the commander calms him down and tells him to go home. Yaren sits on the night porch and contemplates the incident with Hosu. She hears the sound of footsteps slowly approaching her. An officer takes a seat next to Yaren and hands her a glass of hot tea. He asks her not to worry so much. Their conversation is interrupted by voices coming from the exit of the fire station, and they listen to them carefully. The center director and the captain of the first squad discuss the situation around Ho Su, and together they head towards the exit. The center director says that Ho Su won't be out on duty for a while and asks them to look for a replacement for him, and after saying that, he opens the door to the outside. Yaren and officer stand outside and look intently at the center director and commander approaching them. The eyes of the commanding officer and firefighters cross for a moment, and a dead silence is created on the porch. The center director raises his cap slightly. He walks past the firefighter to go home, and the remaining firefighters salute him. The center director hears Yaren's voice over his shoulders and stops his movement. He turns toward Yaren and heads in her direction to hear her request. The center director is standing near the fence of the fire station. He brings his burned hand up to his face and looks at Yaren. Aaron asks that Hosu not be removed from service. She has an idea on how she can cheer up the young firefighter. The girl says she'll take full responsibility for Hosu's actions and make sure he comes to his senses. The director of the center isn't sure of Aaron's decision, saying that Hosu might inconvenience others and his condition is extremely shaky. The director's words leave Aaron a little dumbfounded. She wants to help the hero, but she realizes that there is a lot of truth in the center director's words. The director ponders Aaron's words and says that there might be a reason why Hosu can't rest properly. The girl couldn't think about the fact that the hero might have trouble resting, and she ponders the director's assumption. The director of the center looks directly into Aaron's eyes. It's as if he's trying to find the truth in them. He thinks that the reason for Hosu's problems is because the hero can't rest properly due to the heaviness on his heart. Yaren shifts his gaze from the center director and to the asphalt beneath his feet and thinks about what can be done for the hero. The director folds his hands on his chest and lowers his gaze. He notes that the Jing Wang Center is standing on its ears after Wang Ho left, and all the firefighters are having a hard time because of it. Yaren shuffles her feet from place to place and tries not to lift her gaze up. She tells the center director to go through difficult situations together. 
The center director frowns slightly and points out that prevailing altogether is a very dangerous decision. The director's words echo in Yaren's head, the girl realizing that her actions could only hurt Ho Su. The director of the center adjusts his cap slightly. He tells Yaren that the profession of firefighter is very laborious, and for such people you need to be able to lay down your heavy burden. Yaren tucks her hands behind her back and watches the movements of the commander. She never thought about the fact that the burden of firefighters could be so heavy. The center director tucks his hands into his pocket and heads past Yaren towards his house. Lastly, he tells Yaren that no one from the center has gone on vacation, and that is a very big cause for concern. Yaren looks after the center director and thinks about the last sentence he said before leaving. Halfway through his journey, the center director turns towards Yaren. He looks at her with a hard stare and says that she is afraid of being replaced. Aaron realizes with horror that the center director is right, and the rest of his words pass her ears. Hosu is being examined at the hospital, his bags under his eyes and clouded gaze giving away his fatigue. The doctor says there's no cause for concern, but it's necessary to check in with her from time to time to prevent further complications. The doctor tells Hosu that it is necessary to rest for a while and not to come to work at the firehouse, and the hero says nothing to these words and looks down. A new day begins at the Jingwang Fire Center. The fire brigade building has not changed a bit as always. The director of the center is in his office chatting with Hosu and asks about his decision about his job after seeing a doctor. Hosu runs his fingers over his back, and after some thought he replies that he's thought about the whole situation. The hero says that he acted childishly and decides to take a vacation and have a good rest. The center director raises his head in surprise after the hero's words and looks him straight in the eye. Officer Dai Ho approaches the second team commander and asks him to sign a number of documents. He will be Hosu's replacement while the young firefighter is on vacation. The second team of the fire brigade examine the new officer and welcome him to their team. The team warns Dai Ho that he has a lot of work to do but the officer says with a smile on his face that he was prepared for it. The commander with a smile on his face listens to the guys talk. He's glad that they found common ground very quickly. He holds out the papers towards Dae Ho and asks him about Yerin and her vacation. The officer replies that Yerin didn't take her leave because she decided to take on a lot of work to recover. The commander leans back on his chair with all his weight. He's happy to hear that Yerin and Ho Su are trying to work through their problems. The commander's face becomes sad and he says he's worried about Ho Su because he can't keep an eye on him. But Captain Beck tries to reassure him. The captain turns to the commander and says to be sure to believe in Ho Su's strength. The fire brigade works as usual. They fill out tables and make a report. Captain Beck's words encourage the commander and he agrees with his comrade with a smile on his face. Officer Dae Ho listens to the conversation between the commanders and then receives orders from his commander. Officer Hei Day turns to his squad and points to the monitor screen where he points to the announcement that the special response squad has put up. The firefighters head towards the officer to familiarize themselves with the special response squad document. The fire truck rushes to the emergency call but gets caught in traffic and has to stop in front of the car. The squad captain peers out of the car window and shouts to the other traffic to give way to his squad. The cars pull aside and the fire truck rushes like lightning to the call. As Hosu jogs along the road, he spots the fire truck and casts his gaze over it. He stares after the departing car, then puts on his hood and continues his training. The young firefighter runs along the bridge, his breathing and the noise of his sneakers drowning out the sounds of the cars that pass him. Hosu sits in a doctor's office and listens to recommendations for curing his post-traumatic stress disorder. The doctor recommends frequent jogging or hiking in the mountains and trying not to think about the situation with Wan Ho, otherwise it could be bad for his health. Hosu clutches his head and wrinkles his nose at the pain and emotions overwhelming him. His thoughts flit through memories of the day of the wake when he first saw a hallucination in the form of Wan Ho. The hero tries to get these thoughts away from him and calm down, but the memories of Wang Ho won't go away and make him hurt, causing him to keep holding his head. The doctor tries to help the young firefighter. She shows her hands to separate the emotions and situation into two different parts. She makes a few more hand gestures and tries to use visual demonstrations to explain to the hero what he needs to do to heal. Hosu watches her hands carefully and tries to use her advice and separate the emotions in his head from the situation. The doctor says that after constant exercise, Hosu will be able to face the situation and stop avoiding it.
The young firefighter lowers his eyes down. He tries his best, but such exercises are given with great difficulty for him. The doctor makes some notes on his computer and suggests that Ho Su go together to Wang Ho's memory alley. The story shifts its focus to the fire station of the Dokgo Security Center. The commander is talking to his team and handing out orders to be carried out for the day. He turns to Do Jin and warns him that the rapid response squad exam will begin in a month. The tall firefighter listens attentively to his commander, no emotion slipping across his face. Du Jin ponders the situation that happened to Wang Ho and worries about Ho Su and his condition. The commander notices the tall firefighter's heavy gaze. He clarifies Du Jin's participation in the special squad exam and asks about his well-being. Du Jin continues to sit silently in his chair and occasionally glances at his superior. The commander begins to guess the reason for Do Jin's upset. He adjusts his cap slightly and looks at his subordinate with a smile. He sits down at his desk and says that the tall firefighter shouldn't worry about Ho Su because the young firefighter will definitely participate in the exam. Du Jin doesn't finish listening to the center director's speech and heads towards the exit of the office in the middle of the conversation. He stops by the door and says that he's heading to practice because there's not much time left before the exam. The door to the office closes and the center director looks back at Do Jin as he leaves with a smile on his face. The evening shift of the fire department goes on night duty at the Chakdo Center. The girl drums relentlessly on the keyboard and enters the incident information into the computer. The commander of the 1st Fire Brigade picks his nose and watches Yeren's work with his officer. The girl looks at the monitor and checks the data. She tries not to get distracted and does not pay attention to the commander who came in. The officer calls her over and hands her new paperwork, asking her to fill out a maintenance sheet for the fire department's vehicles. The commander and the officer discuss Yaren's hard work. They are worried that the girl will lose all her physical fitness and will not be able to prepare properly for the new exam of the special fire brigade. On Yaren's desk is a huge stack of documents from different parts of the fire brigade. The sun gradually illuminates the dispatch room, but the girl does not pay attention to it and continues to work. The commander is brooding over something and with a smile on his face says that he is very proud of his subordinate because she is a very strong girl. He suggests that the officer push for training on the day shift so that Aaron can pass the special squad exam. The officer looks at the commander with a little apprehension, worried that the new training might be too much for him to handle. The sun's rays gradually illuminate the fire department buildings and somewhere in the back of the building, the clinking of a keyboard can be heard as Yaren types nonstop. Do Yun checks his paperwork at his desk and notices two officers walking in his direction. The officers report to the senior sergeant that they have prepared the pad for the next exam and ask to check their work. Do Yun nods to his squad and continues to read the reports from the scene and the fire crew's work. The officers notice Do Yun looking at the cadet's personnel files through the computer and ask him not to overdo it. The officer's words are interrupted by the exclamation of a special fire brigade captain who stands up for the senior sergeant. The captain drinks his cooled coffee and says to do the job very carefully. The team didn't expect to see the captain at his workplace because his shift has long since come to an end. The captain says that he can't rest when his team is working so hard. He walks over to Do Yun and takes his personnel file from his hands to familiarize himself with it. Staff Sergeant Do Yun watches intently as the captain examines the cadet's personnel file. The captain says that there's a reason the sergeant has spent a very long time studying the files of firefighters who take the special unit exams. He tells them that the recent incident had a strong impact on young firefighter Ho Su, among others, and shows the team his personnel file. The commander runs his eyes over the hero's personnel file. He expresses his fears that Ho Su may not be as good as he used to be. The team stands around their workstations and discusses Ho Su. The senior sergeant thinks that maybe the young firefighter won't show up for the main exam because of the recent turmoil. The commander finishes his coffee and continues to hold the firefighter personnel file document. The officers agree with the staff sergeant's version of events and tell him that Ho Su recently took some vacation time. The staff sergeant says he wants to prepare for any situation, so he offers to prepare another team assignment if the hero doesn't show up for the exam. The commander looks at the staff sergeant with a small smirk on his face and asks for the team's opinion on Ho Su. He hands the personnel file papers back to the sergeant. The captain is confident that the hero can handle the stress and will definitely show up for the exam.
Hosu quickly rushes to the man and grabs his arm to save him from falling off the broken bridge. With one hand, the hero holds on tightly to the anchor and pulls the injured man onto a solid surface. The story shifts to two hours before the man is rescued. Ho Su is hiking in the mountains and memorizing a map of the area so he doesn't get lost. He looks at a huge sign that says the western trail of the Chakdo Mountains is ahead. Ho Su walks forward and notices other people who have also gone mountain hiking and are cheerfully discussing the route among themselves. The hero adjusts his backpack and walks forward purposefully. He concentrates only on the road in front of him. Hosu takes a few turns and follows a small, narrow road along a small wooden fence. A beautiful picture opens up in front of him. Several mountain peaks loom in the middle of the dense forest and fresh air blows across the hero's face. His mouth is very dry from thirst, so he sits down on a loose rock and drinks a pre-prepared bottle of water. Hosu wipes the sweat from his face and suddenly hears a voice addressing him. He sees an elderly man sitting on a nearby bench looking at him. The elderly man is very surprised to see such a young man in these parts and starts a small dialogue with him. He tells Hosu that as soon as the hero sees the landscape in the mountains, everything will immediately lose meaning, but also everything will make sense. The old man slowly gets up with the help of a small stick and walks towards the trail. He hopes that the hero will sort out all his worries in this place. The old man's words strike Hosu to the core. He looks towards the departing old man and doesn't say a word. Hosu barely manages to shout words of thanks towards the departing man and continues to sit in his seat. The tourist study stares at the poster that warns of the dangers of the route ahead. The man ignores the words on the poster and walks past it. He thinks there is something interesting ahead. He leads his friends and they reach a wooden bridge that is fenced off with yellow tape. The tourists look at the view from their seats and look around in amazement. Hosu walks near where the tourists are staying and hears them arguing loudly. He notices a poster next to him warning of the danger ahead, which the tourists ignored. The hero's eyes glow blue and he sees the future again with the help of his gift. The man tears the yellow caution tape and steps onto the wooden bridge, beckoning to his friends. Under the man's weight, the bridge begins to crack and some of the planks are covered in small cracks under his feet. The cracking of the wood gets louder and the tourists listen to this strange sound. Hosu's feet rush with great speed towards the suspension bridge where the tourists are. Surprisingly for the tourists, the hero emerges from the forest and rushes towards the man who was standing on the bridge. The bridge breaks under the man's weight, and he falls into the bottomless pit that the flimsy planks were hiding. Hosu reaches out to the falling man and manages to catch his palm. He firmly grasps the support of the bridge and tries to pull the man up with tremendous force. The man looks at the young firefighter in surprise as he silently watches the hero's attempts to save him. He grabs onto Hosu with both hands and tries to find some sort of support with his feet to climb up. Several pieces of the bridge's wood fall down. They occasionally collide with the stone mountaintop and make a light cracking sound that is barely audible to humans. Hosu holds the tourist by the shoulders and slowly pulls him away from the chasm in the bridge. The girl looks towards Hosu and her friend. She is very worried about them as they were trapped on the other side of the bridge. To save the man, Ho Su had to pull him from the other side of the bridge, from where there is no other way out. The hero yells at the tourists to calm down and asks them to call the emergency services. The tourists are very concerned about what is happening, but listen carefully to Ho Su's instructions and pull out their cell phones to check the connection. The man tries to come to his senses a little and turns his head to Ho Su. He asks the hero how he studied here and who he is. The hero doesn't take his eyes off the destroyed bridge and replies to the man that he has nothing to worry about because he was saved by a fireman. The man looks at the hero with big round eyes of surprise. He stammeringly thanks him for his help and calms down. He shouts to his friends on the other side of the bridge that he was saved by a fireman and they have nothing to worry about. The tourists smile slightly and start laughing nervously, the new information about the hero calming them down a bit. The man tells Ho Su that he only wanted to admire the view, so he climbed up that dangerous bridge. The hero asks the tourists if they were able to use their phones to call the rescue team to the spot. The tourists tell Ho Su that they managed to call the rescue team and they will arrive in 15 minutes. The hero checks his phone. He is surprised that the rescuers will arrive at the scene so quickly and realizes that the Chakdo Mountain Rescue Squad is on its way. The tourists see the rescue squad passing by and are surprised that it is heading into the mountains. 
The squad leader of the rescue group climbs up a ladder and checks with the tourists on the phone for their exact location. The squad commander is a little behind but tries to quickly follow his commander. The officer approaches the commander and asks about the gear that will need to be prepared for the rescue. The commander looks toward the officer and the squad that is trying to catch up with him. The sergeant tells the commander and officer about a dangerous bridge that was going to be dismantled and suggests that the victims may be in that location. Lance Sergeant Gunji says that there is no need for their group to hurry too much because there is a firefighter on the scene. The commander checks the time on his phone and says they absolutely need to get to the scene in seven minutes, and the officers don't understand why they need to be in such a hurry. The man takes a quick snapshot of the mountain scenery on his phone, and Hosu looks out for rescuers to arrive on the scene. The tourist apologizes for his carelessness. He says that the view in the mountains is very beautiful and can't be missed. He beckons Hosu over to him and offers to enjoy the beautiful view of nature with him while they wait for the rescue team. The hero is a little surprised by the tourist's words and slowly walks in the direction the man is pointing. He leans on the fence and the amazing view of huge mountain peaks mixed with forests opens up in front of him. Hosu scrutinizes the amazing natural picture and wet drops of tears form in his eyes. The voice of the rescuers distracts the hero and the man from admiring nature, and they turn towards the ruined bridge. A group of red-clad rescuers emerge from the forest. They look around the place and analyze the situation. The rescuer uses alpine gear and climbs to the top of the mountain where the hiker and Hosu are stuck. Everyone watches breathlessly as the rescuer slowly overcomes the obstacle and climbs higher and higher. The sergeant uses a special drill to make a hole in the mountain and fix a special rope in it. He slowly climbs up the steep slope and clings to protruding rocks with his hands. The commander tells the officer that many people come in here and it is necessary to cordon off the place properly. The tourists become ashamed of their act. Their faces turn red and they try not to look in the direction of the rescue team. The rescuer manages to climb to the top where Hosu and the man are and he leans on a ledge to catch his breath. Hosu reaches out to the rescuer and helps him climb further to the top. The rescuers reach the spot and examine Hosu with great surprise. They look into his eyes with admiration. The hero did not expect such attention. He looks towards the rescuers and realizes their pronounced joy at meeting. The man listens to the conversation between the rescuers and the young fireman. He too is somewhat confused by what he has seen. The rescuer says he saw an article about firefighting in the Chakdo Mountains where Hosu is mentioned as a hero who put out a fire with counterfire. He points the man to the black wasteland that was created by the mountain fire and says that the consequences could have been much worse if not for Hosu's actions. The lifeguard turns toward Hosu with a smile on his face and says that he couldn't imagine being able to meet the legendary firefighter in such a place. The sergeant suggests that the young firefighter decided to practice his stamina for the exam for the special firefighting squad, so he chose the Chakdo Mountains. Hosu becomes a bit distracted and discouraged, having completely forgotten that the special squad exam is coming up in a month and watches as the rescuer prepares his equipment. The rescuer gradually lowers everyone down from the elevated position and dismantles his equipment. He removes his helmet and looks toward his team and the campers who are reprimanding their friend for the commotion he caused. The man apologizes to his friends and promises that he won't risk his life so recklessly again, and the rescue team prepares to return to base. Hosu hands a bottle of water to the junior sergeant and thanks him for his work. The sergeant takes a few sips from the bottle and offers to take Hosu up to the top while there's still time. Hosu says that he has had time to see enough beauty, and now he is only going to climb down. The sergeant ponders Hosu's words and stares at him intently as if trying to understand something. He suggests that Hosu think about his proposal again, because the view from the top is completely different from the one at the middle of the trail. The sergeant's words make Hosu think about the offer again, but he decides against it. Hosu holds his backpack in his hands and slowly moves away from the rescue team, leaving him alone at the foot of the cliff. The rescue team sympathizes with Sergeant Ji Wan because he wanted to hang out more with an amazing man like Hosu. The sergeant asks his squad not to worry about this because he's sure to meet the young firefighter at the special response squad exam. Step by step, Hosu distances himself from the rescuers and heads towards the descent of Mount Chakdo. The hero walks out on a wide path and finds himself at a fork and catches a glimpse of a small signboard. On the sign are two red arrows, one pointing toward the summit of Mount Chakdo and the other showing the direction toward the descent. 
The hero turns towards the descent and looks at the winding road that stretches downward. Hosu turns his head to the left and looks at another road that goes infinitely farther up. The hero puts on his backpack, slightly adjusting its straps heading towards the top of Mount Chakdo. He climbs higher and higher up the slope, and then he remembers the man's words that the only thing that will be at the end is the scenery in the mountains. At the top of the mountain, a stone pedestal is painted on top of the mountain, indicating that it is the summit of Chakdo. Hosu climbs up and stares off into the distance, his eyes illuminated by the bright rays of the sun as it fades into the sunset. He sees the beautiful wooded landscape in front of him and everything makes sense to him again. The men settle into their seats and look intently at Warrant Officer Ik Kwan, who is about to conduct the training. He walks to the screen and talks on slides about the training course for the Special Ambulance Squad. Staff Sergeant Young Jin also came to this course to get into the Special Ambulance Squad. Senior Sergeant and former classmate Sung Day notices his friend. He is very happy that the senior medic has decided to change his life. He moves a little closer to Young Jin and asks him about his job at the fire station and his new girlfriend, Bo Ram. The old friends exchange a few words with each other. Young Jin tries to show that he doesn't care about Sun Tai, but deep down he's happy to see his old friend. From a neighboring building, they hear a loud voice announcing the start of the gathering of applicants for the special response squad. Sung Day is surprised that the special medical squad training camp and the special response squad exam are held on the same day. Young Jin removes the mask from his face a little. He leans on his hand and listens to his classmate. Sung Day asks the senior medical officer about the fire squad and whether anyone from the center is coming to today's training camp. Young Jin gets tired of this conversation and yawns, trying to cover his mouth with his hand. Warrant officer Ik Kwan gets annoyed by the loud conversations between the chief medical officer and Sung Day and asks them to shut up and not interfere with the lecture. As a month passes and winter sets in, lonely trees that have long since shed their leaves stand outside the special response center of Chakdo City. Officers from the special response squad are dressed in warm firefighter vests and beckon the candidates for the squad. Du Jin has come in for his exam. He looks languidly at the people around him without any interest. The rest of the candidates step aside in front of you tall firefighter as his name is called out by the officers from the special response squad. People also turn their gazes to Yeren, who has shown outstanding results on the physical test, which is what draws the attention of the people around her. She stands among the crowd in a warm jacket and occasionally looks around for someone. Yeren hears the voice of a man who has recently approached the group and casts his gaze at him, then quickly returns it to its original position. The newcomer turns out to be a sergeant from the Chakdo Rescue Squad who helped Hosu in the mountains. The commander walks over with a drink in hand to the officers who are discussing the candidates who have come for the exam. Sergeant Gun Jin searches with his eyes in the crowd for Ho Su and notices that he didn't show up for the exam. The tall firefighter twists his head from side to side. He hopes that the young firefighter will appear among the crowd of cadets. He stands among the crowd of special squad candidates and listens to the commands of the officers from the special squad. The commander drinks his tea and walks toward the cadets to announce the start of the exam. He chooses the highest seat to see everyone gathered and greets the candidates with a smile on his face. Du Jin listens to the captain's words. He looks upset about Ho Su's absence, but he's not about to drop the exam halfway through. Yeren stops searching his friend with his eyes and focuses on the words of the special squad captain. During the captain's speech, most of the candidates are encouraged by his words and periodically applaud him. The special squad captain says that the purpose of this part of the exam is to single out people who are immediately ready to go to the scene. The commander stops in the middle of his speech because he saw someone familiar in the crowd and stares at him intently. The candidates notice the firefighter's hesitation and try to figure out what was the source of it. A wide smile appears on the commander's face as if someone he's been waiting for has arrived and the commander continues to talk about the exam. Dujin also notices the commander's hiccup and turns his head back, a smile surfacing on his face at what he sees. Ho Su walks through the crowd and aims to move towards the center where the candidates for the special squad are standing. Yeren feels someone's hand pushing her. The girl barely has enough strength to keep her balance. She angrily turns around to express her resentment to the offending person, but the girl calms down as soon as she sees the young firefighter in front of her. Hosu examines Eren with a calm expression and raises his hand slightly to greet her. 
The girl bites her lip and small tears are visible in her eyes, caused by the joy of seeing Ho Su among the crowd of candidates. Yaren gets a little angry and steps sharply on Ho Su's foot. She tries to get back at him for pushing her, but deep down she is very happy that the hero is back. The commander finishes his speech, and Yaren and Hosu move away from the crowd to a bench to talk amongst themselves. Yaren is surprised that the young firefighter came to the meeting. She heard from Hosu that he wasn't entirely sure when he would return to duty. Hosu ties the laces on his sneakers and tells Aaron that he was obligated to come to this meeting. The hero turns his head at the girl and says that he went to Wan Ho's memory alley, where he met the firefighter who saved him as a child. Yaren looks at Hosu and worries that he was in memory alley. She's afraid he's not ready to accept the loss of Wang Ho yet. The hero looks at Aaron's worried face and tells her about his encounter with Fireman Yung Yul. The story shifts to a few weeks ago, with the man sitting behind the wheel of a car and looking out for signs through the windshield. Ho Su sits in the front seat of the car and waits for the driver to take him to his destination. The car turns left and through the windshield, the driver and Ho Su see a large stone sign that reads, State Memorial Alley. The car drives down the freeway and to their right and left, they see the Korean flag hanging from several flagpoles. The driver says he's never been to Memory Alley and asks Ho Su to help him with his route. Ho Su mentally prepares to visit the alley. He is worried and tries not to talk to the driver and responds with one-word sentences. The driver gets out of the car and shows Ho Su where to go to get to the alley, and the hero goes in that direction. The driver gets into the car and wishes the young fireman a good journey, and Ho Su slowly heads towards Memory Alley. The hero walks a few meters and quiet voices of people come to his ears and he tries to listen to them. He turns his head and sees a young family that has come to Memory Alley with their children. He walks a few more meters and takes a seat near the memorial plaque that is dedicated to firefighter Wang Ho. The memorial plaque is located among others in a small vacant lot and only the letters on it distinguish it from the others. At the foot of the plaque is a photo of Wang Ho which is adorned with two black ribbons. The hero closes his eyes, small leaves fly in front of his nose because of the wind, and Hosu goes with his thoughts into his memories. The young firefighter sees images of the past where he is at ease with Wang Ho, who has already become a firefighter. In front of his eyes, he is asked to work with his friend during the fire when they were running away from the flames. Hosu recalls how Wang Ho covered for him from his superiors and reported false information to the command. During the fire at the construction site, Wang Ho and Ho Su discuss the plan and promise to back each other up in case of trouble, and to cement their vow, they bang on each other's fists. They stand in front of each other and stare silently into each other's eyes as the torrential rain douses them with water from head to toe. Ho Su stands in his ceremonial fireman's uniform, and Wang Ho promises the hero that he will definitely make it to the award ceremony too. The hero opens his eyes and stares silently at Wang Ho's picture and ponders their shared past in his head. He gets up and walks a few meters to head home, examining the stone slabs along the way. Ho Su unfunnily walks through millions of tombstones that are decorated with bouquets of flowers. The hero stops and looks around carefully, as if there is a treasure in this revenge. He sees a tombstone in front of him with the name of Warrant Officer Sung John, who saved him during the fire. Ho Su's eyes widen with surprise. He has been looking for this firefighter for so long to thank him and found him quite by accident among the other heroes on the Walk of Remembrance. He stops and scrutinizes each of the tombstones in front of him. A memory pops into Ho Su's mind with the words of Dojin, who told him at the funeral that all heroes are forgotten sooner or later. The hero falls to his knees in front of those tombstones and tears begin to flow from his eyes. Hosu and Aaron's conversation is interrupted by a familiar voice that suddenly comes from behind them. Du Jin walks towards Hosu and Aaron with a smile on his face. He's very happy to see a young firefighter among the candidates. He tells Hosu that now he has a rival again and he won't have to find a replacement for the hero. Du Jin comes closer and Hosu introduces him to his close friend Yaren and tells her a bit about meeting the tall firefighter. The candidates for the special squad notice the guys talking. They are surprised that Du Jin and Ho Su are always together. The sergeant from the rescue squad listens to what the people are saying and turns his attention to the guys as well. He hears one of the cadets say that the best only walk with the best, and those words make the rescue squad think. 
Sergeant Kwang Yeol is pissed off by the talk between the cadets, and he grits his teeth and promises himself that he won't lose to anyone. The commander asks everyone to reconvene, and the special squad candidates gather on the platform in front of him. The special squad commander looks everyone over and asks if they are ready for the exam. The commander's hands are slightly frozen from the cold, so he puts them in his pocket and continues his speech. Hosu and Yaren listen to the information about the exam together and look towards the special squad leader. The sergeant once again checks the lists of those present, and the commander notes that the training will be part of the next exam, so regardless of the results, all firefighters will benefit from it. The special squad candidates are encouraged by the commander's speech and open up with joy that they can participate in this exam. The special fire squad team looks around at the jubilant cadets, and a smile appears on the sergeant's face. Officer Hay Day goes through a huge number of documents and puts them into a single stack. He is assisted by Captain Beck, who puts the necessary sheets into a single sheet and stills them together. They act synchronously and smoothly. Officer Hay Tay quickly goes through the papers and distributes the sheets on the necessary stacks. Commander Beck takes the stacked sheets and staples them with a hole punch into a single document. There is a maddening silence in the control room, broken only by Sergeant Sung Dok's hands tapping on a key. He quickly types documents and processes the message while his team does the paperwork. The room is filled with the sound of gurgling water being poured into a mug by a special machine. The junior officer walks between the workstations and heads for his desk. He stops and hears the sound of his cell phone, which emits a pleasant melody consisting of two notes. On the officer's desk, among other documents, is a cell phone that moves periodically due to vibration, on its screen hangs information about a call from Yaren. The officer answers the phone call, and the rest of the team puts aside their work and listens to the conversation. When it comes to Hosu and the phone conversation, Officer Hay Day has a few papers fall out of his hands. Due to his excitement, Captain Beck misses his hole punch and several paper clips fly to the floor, never accomplishing their task. Sergeant Sung Diuk misses his keyboard and then stops typing altogether so as not to drown out the phone call. The junior officer with a smile on his face continues to question Yaren about the situation at the exam. Officer Heyday hears that Hosu is doing well. He stops worrying and continues his work at his normal pace. Commander Beck also continues his work with a smile on his face. He is very happy that Hosu has now come to his senses. Officer Heyday offers to order lunch for the whole team at his own expense to celebrate the good news. The officer and commander's conversation is interrupted by the sergeant's words who stops typing and turns to his team. He goes on YouTube and suggests turning on some fun music because the office has gotten too quiet lately. The junior officer watches the conversation within the team with a smile on his face and listens to Aaron on the phone with the edge of his ear. The commander walks into the office of the center director and settles into one of the chairs. He reports to the center director that the young firefighter has recovered from his leave and has returned to duty. The commander rejoices at his own words and twiddles his thumbs with a little excitement. The center director looks toward the commander with a smile on his face and offers him a cup of coffee from the coffee machine. The commander collapses into a soft chair and asks the center director to choose a more expensive drink for such an event. Ho Su, Yaren, and Do Jin stand not far from each other. They learn from the commander that the exam and special training will last a total of four weeks. The officers of the special unit explain to the candidates that they will have to learn a new exam discipline every week. Hosu listens attentively to the instruction from the special squad and is confident that he will be able to pass the exam. The squad commander tells him that the important point of the exam is only the cadet's readiness to go to the scene right away. Firefighters train with a rock climber's kit to climb high ledges and get people off them. They train in new technology and learn drone controls for rescue operations. A man walks into the room and loudly drops a heavy bag not far from his feet. Sergeant Kwang Yo grabs his head. He can't believe he has to live in the dormitory with the other cadets. The cadets are distributed to the bunks and take their place. They don't pay any attention to the loud sergeant. Yaren asks Evan Yo to calm down and says that there are two toilets, so it doesn't matter who lives in the room. The sergeant resents having to be in a group with a tall firefighter again, and Do Jin turns in his direction and stares at him uncomprehendingly. An officer from the rescue team watches the argument between Yuan Yol and Do Jin with a smile. Ho Su looks around at the candidates in the room and notices Sergeant Gun Ji, who saved him during the Mount Chakdo incident. 
The rescuer greets the hero with a smile on his face, and they strike up a conversation with each other. A commotion rises in the room, Hosu and the lifeguard casually chatting amongst themselves, and at the same time, Yuan Yolam grabs Dojin by his clothes and curses at him. Dujin's eyes widen, and he remembers Sergeant Yuan Yol, with whom they went to the fire academy together. The curator walks into the guy's room and asks the group to be quiet because they came here to take the exam, not to have fun. The savior apologizes to the curator for the entire fourth group and promises that they will keep their behavior down. Sergeant Evan Yeol and Do Jin continue to argue loudly amongst themselves, and Aaron gets tired of listening to this buffoonery and heads towards the exit of the room. Standing in the distance of the room is Junior Sergeant Park Chang-il. He's a little uncomfortable with what's going on because he doesn't know anyone. The argument between the tall firefighter and the sergeant is interrupted by a message on the speakers that alerts the entire dorm that a different instructor will be assigned to each group. The special response squad officer advances down the hallway and heads toward the first group. Hyun Sung greets the first group and announces to them that he will be their instructor during the exam. Hyun Seong passes by the other officers from the special response squad as they head to their groups. Sergeant Kang Daegu walks into the room with the second team and introduces himself to the cadets. The fourth team sits in their room waiting for their instructor, their hearts pounding with excitement as they hear the boys in the neighboring rooms already greeting their instructors. The doors of the fourth team's room slowly open, and they see a special squad officer in an instructor's uniform. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong stands in the aisle of the room and tells the fourth group that he will be their instructor. A creepy smile is painted on the sergeant's face as he quickly looks around at all the members of the fourth group. The guys in the fourth group listen attentively to their instructor who explains the basics of the exam and its first step. The sergeant warns the group that the first training will involve the theory of rescue and understanding rescue mechanisms. C.O. Lee Gan gradually retreats to the back of the doorway and asks the cadets to lay out their belongings and head to the lecture hall in ten minutes. Sergeant Kwang Yo, along with the other guys, reply to the sergeant that they understand the rules and begin to lay out their belongings. Sergeant C.O. Lee Gan disappears through the doorway and leaves the fourth team alone. Sergeant Gunji and Hosu discuss the team's handler amongst themselves, the lifeguard noting that Sergeant Seo Lee Gong has a rather creepy smile that looks rather intimidating. Seo Lee Gun slowly walks down the hallway and whistles a tune to himself. He walks past an officer who stares at him intently. The officer stops the sergeant and asks Seo Lee Gong how he did the briefing for his team. The sergeant doesn't turn to his officer and says he conducted the training according to the manual. The officer suspects something wrong. He warns C.O. Lee Gong to make sure the sergeant doesn't bring any unexpected twists and turns to the exam. The officer and sergeant diverge in different directions from the center of the corridor, and a crazy smile is painted on Sergeant C.O. Lee Gong's face. An instructor stands in the center of the lecture hall, explaining to the teams how to work the lifelines. He demonstrates several knots and tells the firefighters the basics of how to use the climbing equipment. Firefighters from different teams take detailed notes and listen to their lecturer with instructors from the officers of the Special Fire Brigade sitting on the back desks. Sergeant Seo Ligon looks around the lecture room and taps his notebook parodically on his desk. He keeps a close eye on his team, who are listening to the lecturer and taking notes on his explanations. As Hosu imitates tying knots on a rope with his hands, Yeren pokes him in the elbow and tells him he's doing it wrong. The hero looks at Aaron incomprehensibly and waits for her to explain why she interrupted him. Aaron makes a frown and gestures that Hosu is wrong all the time. Then she repeats the young firefighter's imitative actions, but does it without the mistakes Hosu made. Yeren puffs up her cheeks and looks in the direction of the hero, who has finally figured out how to tie knots properly. Du Jin makes some notes on his sheet and jots down the lecturer's words. Sergeant Kwang Yeol sits back and decides to see what notes his friend is making. He peeks at the tall firefighter's sheet and notices that the tall firefighter isn't even thinking about writing down the lecture and is just doodling. The sergeant throws Du Jin a quick glance of incomprehension and looks around. All the firefighters are sitting flat at their desks, except for one of the members of Squad 4 whose head is down. The lifeguard gets very bored with the lecture and falls asleep in front of the teacher's nose. Sergeant Gongji wakes up to the lecturer yelling at him and he tries to understand what's going on. The teacher points his finger at him and tells him to concentrate on the material and not to sleep while studying. 
He taps on the blackboard a few times and then beckons with a gesture for the sergeant to get up from his seat. Gongji absentmindedly stands up. He doesn't fully understand what's going on, but he feels embarrassed. Ho Su and Yaren, along with the rest of the team, look at the confused Sergeant Gongji. The lecturer reprimands Sergeant Gun Jin and asks him to look at the board. The lecturer asks the sergeant to repeat the material he explained a few minutes ago. Sergeant Gung Jin tries to concentrate on the lecturer's words and understand what is being asked of him. The lifeguard repeats exactly how to tie knots on the rope because it is his routine. The lecturer looks at him in amazement. He didn't expect the sergeant to be so skillfully trained. His hand, instead of pointing at the sergeant, quickly changes to a thumbs up, and he thanks Gong Ji for repeating the material. The audience applauds the sergeant's explanation, but Gong Jin turns his head aside because he is embarrassed by the praise. Sergeant Seo Li Gong looks at the lifeguard with eyes full of tears of admiration for his story. The instructor continues to watch the lecturer and the firefighters who are taking notes. He opens Sergeant Gun Jin's questionnaire and writes the word. Will pass with his marker and puts a question mark next to it. Istria is transported back a few weeks. The senior officer and the commander discussing the appointment of Sergeant Seo Li Gong as an instructor for the fourth group. The special fire team is distracted from their work and listens to the conversation of their superiors. The commander makes a report and says that he appointed Sergeant Seo Li Gong because he is very capable. Sergeant Do Yun looks worriedly in the commander's direction. His answer isn't enough for him. The commander looks away from his work and notices Sergeant Do Yun's concern around So Li Gong's nomination. He smiles at his officer and says that he understands why Do Yun is so worried about it. The captain says that he realizes that Sergeant So Li Gong isn't really suited to be an instructor. Officer Do Yun listens intently to the commander and rubs his nose as he tries to understand the meaning behind the commander's action. The captain and officer continue to discuss Seo Li Gong, and Do Yun notes that the captain should have consulted with the squad about the instructor candidate for the fourth team. Sergeant Do Yun stares at his commander's monitor and waits for more answers. With a smile on his face, the commander tells the sergeant not to worry about Seo Li Gong and says that every team needs someone who breaks out of the mold. The story shifts to a few years ago. The commander, along with a senior officer and a colonel, are recruiting for a special squad. Seo Li Gan sits in front of them in his dress uniform and answers a question about what the most important role in the rescue squad is. He thinks about the question for a long time and then, with a smile on his face, says that flair is the most important thing in the rescue squad. Seo Li Gong's answer shocks the committee, and the squad leader loses his temper and stops taking notes. The commander remembers Sergeant Seo Li Gong's interview with a smile and tells the officer about it. Officer Do Yun doesn't see anything interesting in the sergeant's answer in the interview. He's sure that Seo Li Gong said it for nothing. The commander gets distracted again and listens to his officer and suggests that he answer the question he asked in the interview. Officer Do Yun is a little surprised by his commander's approach, and he mulls over his answer in his head. The officers of the special fire squad look at their senior fellow officer carefully and expect him to give an interesting answer. Do Yun Seo says with a calm expression that physical and teamwork are the foundation for the rescue squad. The commander leans back in his chair with a smile on his face and says that what's really important in the rescue squad is flair, and the entire special response team understands that very well. Do Yun turns toward Sergeant Seo Li Gong's desk and reminisces about his gut. The story moves back a few years to Do Yun's memories, when there was a fire at the mall and the special response team was on call. Do Yun is drinking his iced coffee from a straw. He walks past a fire truck and notices a noise coming from outside. He walks over to where the noise is and sees Seo Li Gun, who should have gone home a long time ago. Seo Li Gun says that he has a very bad feeling and decides to fill the oxygen tanks. Do Yun doesn't understand the sergeant, and so Li Gong asks him not to grumble and says to fill the oxygen tanks for everyone. Officer Do Yun drinks his coffee and thanks the sergeant for helping him fill the tanks. When the special firefighting team was trapped in a fire with no way out, the tanks that So Li Gong filled saved their lives. Do Yun also warns the sergeants who listened to his conversation that they too will be instructors during the second exam. He asks them to try hard and hopes that they won't give him a hard time because he So Li Gong already has a headache. The sergeants are very surprised at their new assignment as instructors and don't realize what kind of trouble they can cause for the officer. The instructors from the special fire squad watch their commands carefully, 
and Officer Do Yoon looks over to where Seo Li Gong is sitting. Do Yoon sees that So Li Gong has managed to put away his notebook and fall asleep at his desk. He cautiously continues to look in the direction of the sergeant and worries that Seo Li Go will fail in his task. The special squad commander walks up to the podium and thanks the cadets for listening attentively to the long lecture. The firefighters gather their belongings and slowly stretch. They are very tired, and some manage to fall asleep during the class. The commander says that this information was public knowledge, but he hopes that through this lecture the candidates have refreshed their memory. At the end of his speech, the commander asks if today's lecture was useful, and the firefighters unanimously say yes. The commander with a smile on his face looks at the candidates and instructors on the top rows and suggests going to lunch. The lecture is over and everyone leaves the lecture hall, leaving Seo Li gone alone and sleeping peacefully at his desk. The instructors get up from their seats and lead their teams to the dining hall. Seo Li Gong is awakened by the shouting of the commander who asks the fourth group to leave the lecture hall. Sergeant Seo Li Gong applauds and says that the lecture was very rich and useful. The fourth group goes outside in a single formation with their instructor. The firefighters' feet trail behind them, kicking up a pile of dust and dirt. Hosu comes a little closer to Yaren and says that this place reminds him a lot of the fire academy, and the girl listens to the hero's words and tries to warm her hands. Yaren looks around and agrees with Hosu that everything around reminds him of the academy. The group walks past a parking lot and notice a strange fire truck that is painted an uncharacteristic color. Aaron points out the strange fire truck to Hosu and says that maybe this place is different from the academy. Hosu hears a strange noise in the sky and looks up to determine the source of the noise. A fire rescue helicopter flies fairly low over Aaron and Hosu's heads. A strong wind envelops the entire group and practically knocks them off their feet. Instructor Seo Li Gong, with a smile on his face, asks the group to be careful and cover their eyes from the dust. The fourth group's hair becomes badly frayed from the wind, and Ho Su and Yaren come to the conclusion that this place is very different from the academy after all. The firefighters from different groups reach the cafeteria and take their seats next to each other. They eat and discuss the long lecture that took place in the lecture building. Brigadier Park Chang. Il sets down his tray of food and looks for an empty seat. On his tray is a large variety of food and a large handful of rice in the center. He walks between the tables and tries to find a free place to sit. Chang. He'll hear someone's voice calling out to him from behind him. He stops and turns around at the sound. He sees a fireman heading towards him, holding mugs of drinks in his hands. Ho Su approaches the foreman and suggests that he share a table with part of the fourth team. Yaren and Ho Su sit down together at the table and take in their food, but their eyes are fixed on their co-commanders. Brigadier Chang. He'll settles himself across from Ho Su and thanks him for letting him sit next to him. He confesses that he was worried that the young firefighters would be too uncomfortable around him, and so he was hesitant to start a dialogue. Hosu and Yaren silently listen to the foreman's story about himself and introduce themselves to him. Chang Il asks Aaron and Hosu how close they know each other, and the question quickly catches the girl's attention. The girl quickly chews her food and says that she and Hosu went to the same fire academy and now work at the same center. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin also tells the story of meeting a young firefighter in the mountains. The guys have fun getting to know each other and discuss the lecture where Sergeant Gun Jin showed his knowledge of ropes. Brigadier Chang. Il is surprised when he learns that Sergeant Gun Jin works in the rescue squad. A shadow of a silhouette appears on the foreman's face, and he visibly appears in front of the table. The guys see the tall firefighter Du Jin standing in front of them with a tray near their table, asking permission to join them. Hosu happily points out an empty seat to Du Jin and offers to take it, while Aaron is surprised by the large portion of rice on the tall fireman's tray. The guys ask Du Jin about his friend who's been by his side the whole time, but the tall fireman doesn't understand who they're talking about. Du Jin sits down at his seat and doesn't notice Sergeant Kwang Yol, who has been following him the whole time. Kwang Tisk tisks unhappily and casts a baleful glance in the tall fireman's direction. The whole group except Du Jin notices this and is a little startled by the sergeant's menacing stare. Du Jin realizes that there was someone behind him the whole time and turns his head. To his surprise, he sees Kwong and tries to remember how long ago they walked together. Ho Su greets Sergeant Kwong Yul and offers him a seat next to him at the communal table as well. Sergeant Kwong casts a defiant glance in Ho Su's direction 
and tries to remember him he might have seen him before. The sergeant remembers the first exam, he ties his shoelaces and prepares for the next test. He listens as the candidates in his group marvel at the results of the team that was tested that morning. The sergeant finishes preparing his sneakers with a smile on his face. He believes he can set a new record. He hears one of the cadets say Du Jin's name, the first place winner, and the sergeant's body shakes slightly. His confidence is gone. Sergeant Quang walks over to the group and looks at the scoreboard with the overall results of all the teams. He sees that he has only managed to pick up third place overall, and he grits his teeth to an unpleasant grind. Sergeant Kwong silently sits down at the offered seat and begins to eat, while Hosu watches him closely. The hero hopes that Kwan will start talking about himself, but the sergeant takes the chopsticks without saying a word and puts the rice balls in his mouth. The young firefighter shifts his gaze to the other people at the table and wants to continue talking to them. He notices that everyone has started eating and there is a dead silence over the table. Sergeant Quan chews his food and picks at his plate as if trying to find something. He turns his eyes toward Hosu and tries to assess the young firefighter. Hosu eats quietly and doesn't notice Quan's languid gaze hovering over him. Quan can't believe that a deadbeat like Hosu could equal Dojin in results. The firefighters finish their lunch and head out into the open air to their handlers who are waiting for them. The instructor of the fourth fire team, Seo Li Gan, comes forward and tells them what the second lecture will be about. He points to the table behind him, where a drone that the officers of the special squad have prepared is set up. The candidates listen carefully to the information about the drone and learn that the lecture will be about the latest rescue equipment. The commander and officer of the special rescue squad drink hot tea and watch the sergeants and cadets standing outside from the window. Seo Li Gong tells them that the fire drone carries a heat-resistant camera and provides detailed information about the drone, which he asks them to write down. He walks past the front row of firefighters and with a smile on his face continues to tell them about the rescue drone. Sergeant So Lin Gong quickly turns to the firefighter standing in front and asks him how long the drone can stay in the air. The fireman is confused for a few minutes and tries to figure out what happened. He manages his excitement and correctly answers the question from the sergeant from the special squad with clear wording. The lecture continues and the firefighter tries to calm his heart, which is racing with excitement. The commander and officer watch the lecture. They are confident that C.O. Li Gong is up to the task because he is the only one who knows how to operate the drone. Officer Do Yun asks the commander to watch the lecture carefully and overlooks So Li Gong's confidence in So Li Gong as an expert. C.O. Li Gong places a heavy underwater search robot on the desk and talks about its technical properties. The special squad officer also listens to the lecture and stops paying attention to his squad. C.O. Li Gong abruptly asks Officer Hyun Sung to confirm his words, and the instructor hesitates a bit and agrees. C.O. Li Gong raises his finger up and says that today's lecture has come to an end and warns that there will be a written exam on this material on the fifth day. The firefighters unanimously yell, Yes, that's right, and are about to go to their rooms. Officer Seo Li Gan does not continue to stand still, and the firefighters look in his direction with apprehension and misunderstanding. The instructors also look at the officer and don't understand what So Li Gong intends to do next. Seo Li Gong picks up a drone and shares his own opinion on drones. A smile quickly comes off the sergeant's face, and he says that they don't use such drones at the scene because they are very expensive. The commander and the officer look at Seo Li Gong's antics and watch with horror on their faces as they watch his further actions. The firefighters are a little worried and look around at each other in an attempt to find someone who understands what they're talking about. Officer Hyun Sung covers his face with his hand and tries not to look in Sergeant Seo Li Gong's direction. Seo Li Gong's handler warns that if someone decides to use those drones and breaks it, they're going to go down the slope. Hyun Sung continues to cover his face with his hand and thinks that this training will be a complete failure. Officer Do Yoon sits at his desk and mulls over what happened during the drill. The sergeants sit across from him and watch carefully for their officer's next reaction. The sergeant picks up his phone and scrolls through the notifications on his email. Do Yoon says in a calm voice that the training was a failure and blames himself. The sergeants look at Do Yoon, but they don't want to interrupt him, so they decide to keep quiet. Du Yun loses his temper and angrily says that he shouldn't have nominated Seo Li Gong as an instructor for such an official event. The officer calms down and says that he didn't expect such a prank during the briefing. 
The sergeants talk amongst themselves and agree with the senior officer's words. Du Yun folds the lock in his hands and apologizes to the sergeants for the circus that So Li Gong is putting on. Sergeant Hyun Sung says that Do Yun has nothing to apologize for because Lee Gun's class turned out to be very interesting, despite the rude statement at the end. Second Sergeant Hyun Sung also supports Hyun Sung and says that all the cadets were satisfied with the lecture. Do Yun lifts his layered head slightly. He's a little taken aback that his sergeants were satisfied after the briefing. Sergeant Hyun Sung says with a smile on his face that this way of teaching can be many times better than dry facts. Du Yun is surprised at this assessment of the briefing and ponders Lee Gun's act one more time. CO Lee Gun tells the firefighters that in case of an accident, no one will cover for them and they'll just have to rely on themselves. The sergeant asks the new recruits to raise their hands, and Ho Su is about to do so, but Aaron grabs his hand and waves his head negatively. The instructor continues walking between the rows and explains to the firefighters that even if they use the drone to save people, they will still be reprimanded by the high command. CO Lee Gun emphasizes that drones aren't always useless and can be used far away from the fire. Hyun Sung can't stop removing his hand from his face. He has no idea how he can justify Lee Gong's actions to the officer. The firefighters are very surprised by what the instructor tells them, but still continue to listen to him with great interest. CO Lee Gong suggests using drones only when absolutely necessary, when the firefighters are sure they won't damage them. The instructor finishes his lecture and there's a sepulchral silence. Hyun Sung removes his hand from his eyes and looks warily at Sergeant. Sergeant Lee Gong stands in front of the cadets with a smile on his face and asks them why they need this lecture. He doesn't wait for an answer from the firefighters and says that the lecture is needed to get used to continuous training. The firefighters look at him with blank eyes and wait for him to continue his speech. Lee Gong points to the fire drones and talks about how the world and firefighting tools are changing every year, so the cadets need to be ready to adapt. The firefighters understand what Sergeant Seo Lee Gong is trying to convey and listen to his speech with a smile on their faces. Seo Lee Gong takes another look at the drones and firefighters in front of him and says that maybe the equipment will soon become cheaper and everyone will be able to use it without too much trouble. The officers who were standing behind Lee Gong also smile. They realize that no matter how zany the instructor of the 4th Squad is, he says wise things. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong puts his hands behind his back and with a smile on his face suggests that they move from theory to direct practice. Seo Li Gong gestures to the first group and asks them to walk towards the drones. The senior officer is going through various documents and working in the office, while Kang Da Gu sits across from him and texts on the phone. Sergeant Dae Gu receives a message from Brigadier Psycho Gong, who is on his way to the office to pick up a book. Sarge really doesn't want Brigadier Psych Gong to come to the office right now because their team hasn't finished cadet training yet. Chief Officer Do Yun is distracted from his work and looks toward his sergeant with a puzzled expression. Sergeant Dae Gu types a message to his friend and asks him not to come into the office because Do Yun is very angry. Seo Li Gong walks into the office to his team and breaks the sepulchral silence with his loud voice and greets everyone with a smile. He walks past the sergeants and asks them how he did in his class, and the sergeants just nod in response. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong turns his head towards the senior officer who looks at him with his hands folded in a lock. Officer Do Yoon gives his sergeant a fierce look to show that he is not happy with Seo Lee Gong's special training methodology. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong stops in front of his officer and looks at him with a smile and a face full of incomprehension at what is happening. A loud sneeze echoes throughout the small dorm room the cadets have occupied. Sergeant Kwang Yol sits on his bunk and goes over today's day in the new place in his head. There is a creep of the door and it slowly opens to the inside of the room. The sergeant puts his thoughts aside and looks at whoever is walking inside the room. He prematurely gets up from his seat and greets Do Jin because he's sure the tall firefighter must have gotten loose next. Yeren enters the room much to the sergeant's surprise. She was ranked second in the practice results and released before the others. Kwang Yol absent-mindedly looks at the girl he is very uncomfortable, but he continues to stare into her eyes without saying a word. The sergeant slowly sits down on his bunk, and together with Yeren starts a casual conversation, as if there was no awkwardness before. Yeren takes her bunk and suggests that the sergeant address each other informally because they are on the same team. 
Sergeant Kwang Yeol feels a little awkward and looks away somewhere to the side, but agrees to talk informally with the girl. Yaren says they have a few hours before lights out and suggests they do something in the interim. Sergeant Kwang Yeol gets up from his bunk and tries to find the TV remote to turn it on. Sarge's search is interrupted by Ho Su and Gun Jin, who enter the room and happily greet everyone inside. They admire Kwang Yeol's results during practice and ask him to tell them about drone control. The sergeant didn't expect such a reaction from his team to his result during practice. He casts a sharp look at the guys and doesn't want to share information with them because he considers them his rivals. The young firefighter and lifeguard keep pelting the sergeant with questions, and without waiting for an answer, they ask others. The sergeant is very flattered by the praise of his colleagues. He folds his arms on his chest and begins to talk about drones, and Yaren checks the mail on his phone with a smile on his face. In front of the tall firefighter is a tray full of food with a huge mountain of rice in the center. Du Jin turns his head at Brigadier Chang Il's voice and looks at him. Chang Il asks for permission to sit next to Do Jin and looks at the tall fireman's full tray of food in surprise. Du Jin explains to Chang Il that he's waiting for his friend so he doesn't touch the food. The story shifts to the main conference room where a meeting of a special firefighter squad is being held. Chief Officer Do Yun opens his laptop and reads the training plan for the week from it. The special squad commander sits with the instructors and announces the end of training for the day. He thanks everyone for their work. The senior officer reports back to the commander and says that all the cadets are confident that each day will be similar to the previous day. The instructors from the special fire squad talk about how they have prepared thoroughly for tonight. A faint smile flashes across the commander's face, and he orders his squad to begin the special exam for the cadets. The fourth group is all gathered in their room and casually chatting amongst themselves. Rescue Gong Ji looks at his figurine with a smile on his face and wipes it with a wet cloth. The figurine resembles the rescuer himself and is dressed in a brightly colored fire department uniform with the call numbers of the rescue squad emblazoned on it. Yeren notices Gun Jin's fascination and moves a little closer to examine the figure. The lifeguard turns his head to the girl and tells her that he got the figurine while working at the fire department. Yeren listens to Gun Jin's story. The girl is very surprised that the lifeguard got a fancy toy for his service. Gong Jin opens his locker and shows Yaren different trinkets that are dedicated to the rescue service. The girl didn't expect the lifeguard to have a lot of junk in there and looks deep into his drawer with a tired look. Yaren wants to keep the conversation going, but Junior Sergeant Gun Jin's stories really bore her. Sergeant Gun Jin pulls a small badge out of his locker with the numbers of the emergency services flashed on it. He pins the badge on his clothes and tells the girl that everyone can donate money to the victims of unexpected fires. Yaren realizes that her conversation with Gong Jin is getting very long, but she doesn't know how to stop his story. The girl stands by the sergeant and thinks only of how to get away from Gun Jin as quickly as possible. Brigadier Chang, Il sees Aaron hurriedly going to the restroom to escape from the junior sergeant's story. The brigadier's phone rings in his pocket and he searches his pockets for it with his eyes. He checks the mail in his phone and discovers several missed calls from his wife. Brigadier Chang. Il walks out into the busy hallway and tells his wife about the bizarre events at the dormitory. He is very happy to hear his wife's voice and asks her not to worry about him unnecessarily. Through the receiver of the phone, he hears his child's voice and a slight blush slips across his face. Sergeant Kwang Yul walks toward his room with a drink in hand and notices Chang Il's conversation. The sergeant casts a quick glance at the brigadier and then walks through the open door of the fourth team. He walks over to Du Jin and suggests that he practice on the street court. Sergeant Kwong Yol's words pass Do Jin's ears, the tall firefighter too focused on his smartphone screen. The sergeant's shouts reach Do Jin and he slowly turns his gaze to Kwong Yol. The sergeant grits his fang-like sharp teeth and says that he needs to work harder. Du Jin goes back to his phone and tells the sergeant that he has to work three times as hard to get to his level. Sergeant Kwong Yol becomes enraged at such arrogance from Do Jin and he grabs him by his clothes and demands that he explain himself. Yaren absent-mindedly watches the argument between the sergeant and the tall firefighter. The girl can't get used to the constant banter in the room. She makes a cup of coffee for herself and hopes that the guys will calm down very quickly. Yaren hears a noise coming from down the hallway and listens to the strange sounds. She hears the sound of a metal stick tapping either on the wooden doors or on the wall of the corridor. 
Sergeant Sao Li Gong taps the stick on the doors of the groups of candidates and asks them to gather in the common room in 30 minutes. He warns that each team will soon be visited by their instructors and asks everyone to take their seats. Yaren walks over to the water dispenser with pours herself a coffee. She hears the sound of the sergeant's footsteps coming towards her. Sergeant Seo Li Gong looks at Aaron carefully and doesn't understand what she is doing in the hallway. Yaren and the sergeant tensely look at each other and a silent scene occurs between them in the hallway. The girl apologizes to her instructor and asks to be given some time to get some water. Sergeant Seo Li Gong's face spreads into a smile at Yaren's friendliness. Seo Li Gong salutes Yaren and jokes that he will award 10 points to the fourth group for her kindness. The other candidates overhear the conversation between Ernie and Seo Li Gong. They think the fourth group instructor is a real nutcase. Ho Su gets out of the shower and wipes his wet head with a small towel. Yaren holds out a mug of water towards the young firefighter and offers him a treat. The hero finishes wiping his head and thanks the girl for bringing him water. Yaren asks Hosu if there's hot water in the shower because she wanted to take a bath too. The young fireman warns the girl to get ready for tonight. Yaren looks carefully into Hosu's eyes and says she doesn't understand his hint about preparation. The young fireman only smiles back and says that there's nothing special about what he said. Yaren stares at the hero in silence and mulls over his words in his head. Hosu loudly warns the fourth team to all go to bed after lights out. The dormitory where the candidate squads are housed is covered by the black shroud of the night sky. All the groups have gone to bed and there is nothing in the hallway but fire cones and darkness. Only the only sign at the door which reads, Dormitory flickers faint white color. The quarter group has settled down on their beds. They have covered themselves with green sheets and are sleeping peacefully. Sergeant Kwang Yol sleeps on his stomach and snores quite loudly to the whole room. Du Jin has his hand over his eyes and sleeps peacefully on his back. The electronic alarm clock in the room indicates that it will soon be two in the morning. There are a few black shoes walking lonely around the dormitory, whose sound echoes quietly throughout the dormitory. Several silhouettes of people stand near the stairs and head to the upper floors of the dormitory. An instructor from the special fire squad drags a large bag with him and walks towards the candidate's doors. He holds an oxygen mask in his left hand and walks slowly along the long hallway. The instructor stacks firefighting equipment along with oxygen tanks on a small table. A black silhouette stands outside the dormitory and folds his hands in his pockets looking up at the building. The captain of the special squad surveys the building and waits for his team to finish making preparations. The time on the electronic alarm clock pops up showing two in the morning. Bright lights flash in the dormitory windows, and the commander rocks his hands behind his back and observes the scene. The teams are gradually woken up by the sound of a speaker blaring throughout the dormitory. The special squad candidates wake up rubbing their eyes and trying to figure out what's going on. Firefighters open the door to the hallway, where the lights are on and firefighting equipment is set up. From the loudspeaker comes an order from a senior officer that everyone needs to change into protective uniforms in the hallway and head to the stadium. The officer's finger slowly pushes off a large red button that is on a clipboard, among others. Senior Officer Do Yoon uses the loudspeaker and gives several commands to the candidates. The fourth team wakes up and rushes to the exit. Chang Il warns that there are protective clothing in the hallway. Ho Su picks up the fire clothes and tells everyone to hurry to the set because it might be a team test. Do Jin and Aaron try to recover on their beds and rub their sleep-deprived eyes. Sergeant Kwang Yeol curses at the fact that the training is late at night and the team is wearing firefighter uniforms. Yaren stands in the hallway. She puts a gas mask on her face and attaches an oxygen tank to her back. Hosu stops Yaren, who wanted to go ahead of the group to the set. The girl turns her head toward the hero with a questioning expression. Hosu explains that there's no reason to rush and asks them to leave the building altogether. The fourth team puts on a fire suit along with oxygen tanks and a protective mask. They follow each other and take a quick step down the stairs that lead to the exit of the building. Firefighters run out onto the porch and head toward the site. Instructors meet the teams of candidates and check their numbers. The officer in charge arrives at the plaza and alerts the other instructors that his team has arrived at the site. The commander also announces that his full team has arrived at the square. The fourth team walks over to Sergeant Seo Li Gong and stands in front of him. The special squad captain stands in front of the firefighters with his instructors and looks at the dormitory building. He takes his hands behind his back and explains to the firefighters that throughout the training, the teams will be called to the square unexpectedly.
The firefighters listen to the commander's speech and whisper amongst themselves, they don't understand why such training is necessary. One of the firefighters says that his team's room is the farthest away and it's not fair. Seo Li Gong listens to the commander's words and turns his head toward the fireman, who is outraged by the situation. He squeezes through the rows of candidates and makes his way at a brisk pace towards firefighter Kwang Yol. The sergeant looks absent-mindedly at his instructor who asks him about the grievances. Sergeant Kwang Yol says that his team's room is at the very end of the hallway and this situation is unfair. Seo Li Gan breathes nervously and stares in amazement at the disgruntled firefighter. The sergeant calls the fireman by his full name, which gives Kwang Yol goosebumps running down his spine. Sergeant Seo Li Gong's face contorts into an angry grimace, and he tells Kwang Yol that such comments are not acceptable at the scene. Kwang Yol listens attentively to instructor Seo Li Gong and doesn't try to argue with him. Sergeant Seo Li Gong explains to the instructor that this training is not just for looks. He moves a little closer to Sergeant Kwang Yol and stares intently into his eyes. Kwang Yol tries not to make any unnecessary movements. He is startled by the sergeant's words and manner of speech. Seo Li Gong's face takes on an eerie expression as he towers over the firefighter and says that no one at the scene is paying attention to the circumstances. Sergeant Kwang Yol absentmindedly looks forward and apologizes for his ridiculous comment. Instructor Seo Li Gong puts his hand on the candidate's shoulder and says that if you run far, you should get out earlier and faster than the others. Sergeant Kwang Yol looks sternly straight ahead through the helmet of his gas mask and cold sweat runs down his face. He straightens his chest and apologizes to instructor Seo Li Gan for his short-sightedness. The instructors stand in a single row with their hands behind their backs. They watch intently as Sergeant Seo Li Gong reprimands the firefighter. The captain also watches the sergeant and looks around at all the cadets gathered on the grounds. He peers at his officers and asks all but the very last group to go to the dormitory to sleep. The captain turns to his instructors and asks them to keep an eye on the fourth group. Sergeant Kwang Yo frowns slightly at the captain's words, but doesn't dare to challenge them. Du Jin lazily looks around, then casts a glance at his instructors. Ho Su stands evenly on the formation. He was prepared for this turn of events, so there is not a single note of surprise on his face. Yeren looks at the young firefighter. She wonders in her head if Ho Su saw this turn of events. Rescuer Gun Jin looks back at his team and prepares to take his punishment. Brigadier Chang. It looks apprehensively at the instructors, and is the only one who doesn't understand what's going on around him. Officer Hyun Sung orders the fourth group to run a lap around the stadium and the guys run as hard as they can. In full firefighting gear, the fourth team makes a few laps around the stadium and two silhouettes watch them. Sergeant Seo Li Gan watches his group and orders them to run a couple more laps. Senior Officer Yoon Seo approaches the sergeant and asks him not to burden the group so much on their first day. Seo Li Gan's face slips his famous, intimidating smile, and he doesn't say anything back to the officer's request. The sergeant half turns around and tells the officer that he personally determined who would be in the fourth group. Sergeant Seo Li Gong points out that the fourth team is made up of the true elite who placed first in the physical test. Officer Yoon Seo silently looks into Sergeant Seo Li Gong's eyes and analyzes Seo Li Gong's reasoning. Instructor Seo Li Gong says that he sees through the senior officer and is not going to train the fourth group according to the usual rules. He walks towards the dormitory and says that he wants to select the special ones among the special ones and asks the officer to stay out of his way. The officer grabs the handles of the door and explains that it is only through intense training that the best team in the entire country can be created. The senior officer continues to watch silently. He can't remove So Li Gong from his duties as an instructor, even if he wanted to badly. Sergeant Seo Li Gong promises Officer Yoon so that he will select the best and not let down the special squad leader. Officer Yoon Seo stands silently in the middle of the night sight and ponders the sergeant's words. Yoon Seo tucks his hands into his pockets and agrees to the specifics of the squad training under Seo Li Gong. The fourth squad returns to their room after the grueling training and takes off their firefighter uniforms. Ho Su listens to Staff Sergeant Gun Jin, who suggests checking on Sergeant Kwang Yo. The lifeguard worries that Kwang Yol has been standing in the hallway for quite some time, and the whole team needs to get some sleep. Yeren observes the conversation between the young firefighter and Gunjin, but doesn't decide to get involved. 
The lifeguard changes into his regular uniform and tells Hosu that he wants to go to Kuang Yol's hallway to support him. Gung Jin is stopped by Do Jin, who tells him not to go anywhere and to go to bed. Do Jin spreads out on his bunk and tells the lifeguard that it's best not to touch Kuang Yol right now. He explains that Sergeant Kuang is very angry right now and needs to cool off in the hallway. Hosu and Gun Jin look at Do Jin and listen to his explanation. They agree with the tall firefighter's point of view. The small blue sign that reads, Dormitory continues to flash in the dark hallway. Kuang Yol is standing under the sign near the exit by the door. He has already taken off his gas mask and oxygen tank and is holding them in his hands. Kuang recalls the words of Seo Li Gong, the curator, and a small drop of rage pierces his mind, causing him to clench his teeth. The electronic alarm clock shows four hours and 17 minutes on its dial. The lights in the dormitory come on, and the noise of the cadets echoes through the huge four-story building in the middle of the night. The lifeguard throws on his firefighter uniform rather quickly. Hosu looks on in surprise at the sight. Yeren and Dojin quickly put on their uniforms and attach oxygen tanks to their backs. The fourth team comes out one after another wearing gas masks and leave their room. Sergeant Kwang Yol is the first to leave the room. He stands in the hallway and looks at Hosu. Kwang Yol intently assesses the young firefighter with his gaze and watches for his reaction. The hero turns his head toward the sergeant, and behind him, a lifeguard comes out of the room who doesn't understand what's going on between the guys. Rescue Gunjin notices that Ho Su and Kwang Yeol have been up all night and asks about their well-being. Sergeant Kwang Yeol just clucks and rushes along the corridor like a whirlwind, calling his squad to hurry up. The four squad runs one after another in full uniform down the corridor, the firefighters trying to keep up with each other. The second group of candidates see the fourth squad rush past their door and are surprised at their speed. The fourth squad doesn't notice anyone around them and rushes with great speed to the exit of the building. Yeren and Brigadier Chang Il run behind the rest of the group and try to keep up with the team. The dark silhouettes of the firefighters quickly approach the closed glass door of the dormitory building. Sergeant Seo Lee Gan adjusts his collar with a smile on his face and waits for the command of the special squad candidates. He points to senior officer Yoon Seo and says that his training has paid off noticeably. Seo Lee Gan turns to the senior officer with a smile on his face and tries to see his reaction. The full fourth team is among the very first to arrive at the dormitory's night stadium. Senior Officer Yoon Seo looks meaningfully at Sergeant Seo Li Gong and asks what the instructor intends to do with his group now. The officer says that he sits the sergeant through and doesn't believe that Seo Li Gong will let his team go for nothing. Seo Li Gong laughs at the officer and tells him not to envy his excellent skills as an instructor. The instructors from the other squad calmly chat amongst themselves while Yoon Seo and Seo Li Gong talk. The special squad commander and part-time instructor orders his group to march around the stadium because they were the last to arrive. Instructor Seo Li Gong says with a smile on his face that there will be a squad uniform inspection today, and the sergeants are very surprised by this turn of events. The commander smiles slightly and nods approvingly towards Seo Li Gong, and then steps aside. Sergeant Seo Li Gong approaches the first group and says that the squad is having trouble with their uniforms, so they will run around the stadium as well. The instructor of the second group approaches his squad. He notices that the firefighters have mixed up their tanks and orders them to run around the stadium too. Senior Officer Yoon Seo sees Sergeant Seo Li Gong walk up to his group and sighs heavily. The instructor scrutinizes the fourth group's gear and finds no reason to pick on them. Sergeant Kwong Yol stares intently at the instructor and waits to see what he has to say to the squad. Seo Li Gan walks up close to the sergeant and puts his hands behind his back. He says that the purpose of this training is a surprise challenge. The instructor of the fourth group says that there is no point in the training if the squad prepared for it beforehand. Group four is very surprised by their instructor's words and cold sweat runs down Kwong Yol's face. The squad listens attentively to their instructor, who orders them to run along with everyone else because they prepared for the training beforehand. Kwang Yol's veins are showing on his face from anger, and he glares menacingly at Seo Li Gong with the intention of saying something. The fourth squad instructor notices the firefighter's strange look and heads towards him. Sergeant Seo Li Gong bows slightly to Kwang Yol and asks if the firefighter has any dissatisfaction with the instructor's evaluation. Sergeant Kwang Yol tries not to look into the instructor's eyes and to hold back his anger. He firmly replies that he has no complaints about Seo Li Gong. 
The fourth squad whirls through Seo Li Gong's body and rushes to the treadmill to join the rest of the group. Seo Li Gong sees his squad off with a smile on his face and motions to senior officer Yun Seo. Officer Yun Seo tells the sergeant that he chose a bad way of training through torturing one firefighter. In response, the officer hears from C.O. Lee Gong that he doesn't understand anything, and it's high time he took off his rose-colored glasses a long time ago. Kwang Yol is filled with anger and runs ahead of everyone. He utters caustic insults towards his instructor. C.O. Lee Gong explains to the officer that anger is a driving force, and Kwang Yol is very much like him. The fifth day of the candidate's training arrives, and the teacher gives a lecture on advanced knowledge of the rescue rope. He gives the lecture and looks around at the groups of firefighters who are sitting across from him. Squad 4 is asleep and shows no signs of activity on their row. Yeren and Brigadier Chang-il are the only ones from Squad 4 who keep their eyes open. The lecturer turns his gaze to the other side of the hall where the remaining squads are seated. The candidates from the other squads are sleeping soundly, all very tired from the night's training. The lecturer sighs very heavily, but does not decide to make any remarks to anyone and continues the lesson. In the practical class, Sergeant Kwang Yol picks up a joystick to control the quadrocopter. Instructor Seo Ligon takes notes on his computer, and Kwang Yeol demonstrates to the candidates how to masterfully control the flying machine. The story shifts to the fourth group's dorm room, where dead silence reigns. Each member of the fourth group sits apart from each other. The firefighters are very tired and trying to sleep during their break. Brigadier Chang, Il has large bags under his eyes. Sergeant Kwang Yol is very quiet. He is tired and has no energy to argue with anyone. Du Jin is very exhausted from the unexpected training and is worried that he won't be able to make it through the next day. Communication has almost completely stopped between the groups. Their relationship has become a knife edge. The sleepy candidate from Squad 2 and Ho Su walk towards each other down a long hallway. They bump into each other with their shoulders because they didn't notice each other due to lack of sleep. Ho Su has huge bags under his eyes on his face. He slowly turns around and looks towards the cadet. The two firefighters with a calm expression stop in the hallway and stare at each other intently. The cadet from the other team casts an angry look filled with hatred towards Ho Su. Ho Su imagines holding a long and sharp knife blade in his hands. The hero sees in the reflection of the blade his haggard face and the fireman's back, which quickly disappears down a long hallway. In the reflection of the blade, the hero sees Hosu's exhausted face, closes his eyes, and tries to regain consciousness. The face of Sergeant Ku Jinte, who did him a lot of bad things while serving at the center, pops up in front of the hero. Hosu also remembers a military officer in a physical competition who tried to prove himself superior to others. The hero takes another look back at the firefighter who crashed into him. The special squad candidate also stops and turns towards Hosu. Ho Su realizes that no one in this dormitory holds grudges against each other because everyone has a clear goal. The candidate slowly walks down the hallway and disappears into his team's room. The firefighters disperse to their different rooms and each of them has a dream they are working towards. The candidates walk out of their rooms into the hallway and wait for their handlers near the door. Walking past the door of the teams is instructor C.O. Li Gong with an iron baton at his side. The inscription on the back of the instructor's clothes reads, Chakdo 119 Special Rescue Squad. Sergeant Evan Yole sits on his bed and looks at the firefighter's uniform, waiting for another surprise call tonight. He is breathing heavily and dark bags are painted under his eyes, indicating that the sergeant has not slept in a long time. The silence of the room is broken by Junior Sergeant Gun Jin's joyful cries, which attracts the attention of Yuan Yole and Do Jin. The lifeguard enters the room with a joyful expression on his face and informs the team that the unexpected call will not be there at night because of the exam. The team looks at the lifeguard in surprise and can't believe their own ears. Sergeant Yuan Yol is not about to relax. He thinks that instructor Seo Li Gong is bound to pull something. He hears messages from the speaker, the sound of which reverberates throughout the dormitory. Senior Officer Do Yun's voice comes from the loudspeaker, announcing that there will be no challenges on the day of the exam. Sergeant Yuan Yol falls to his knees with joy that he will be able to sleep in peace today. He stands up abruptly and throws his firefighter uniform somewhere to the side, and the firefighters shout loudly with joy. Yeren looks at his joyful crew with a small smile and thinks about the exam. She looks for the young firefighter with her tired eyes and casts her gaze over him. 
The girl snaps her fingers above Hosu's ear to get his attention and asks him to step back for a few words. The team celebrates the small victory, and Yaren and Hosu rush to exit the room into the hallway. The guys go down the stairs and stop in the stairwell to discuss the exam. Yaren asks the young firefighter about how tomorrow's exam will go. Hosu says he's seen some of the future and has a small idea of tomorrow. The girl asks the hero not to tell her about tomorrow's test because she wants to test her strength. The young fireman says with a smile on his face that he is aware of Yaren's request in advance and will not prompt her. Aaron thinks that the selection exam is not an accident scene, and she doesn't need Hosu's help on it. The girl wants to see if she's suitable for the rapid response squad. Yaren looks at Hosu carefully and takes his word that he won't give her any tips today or tomorrow during the exam. The hero agrees with her and wishes her good luck in the special squad exam. The girl looks at Hosu with grateful eyes and nods her head happily. The young firefighter asks Yaren if she'll hit him if he says he's cool and gets an instant punch in the arm from the girl. Their conversation is interrupted by Do Jin, who was listening to their conversation the whole time. The tall fireman asks the guys to be careful because someone might overhear their conversation. Do Jin reminds the hero of the story when he overheard the conversation between him and Wang Ho. Aaron cries out slightly in surprise and doesn't understand what Do Jin is talking about. Hosu asks Doji not to worry about anyone finding out about his gift because he was able to anticipate the appearance of the tall fireman. Aaron looks first at Hosu with slight surprise and then returns his gaze to Do Jin. Do Jin looks at the hero with a calm expression and continues to stand nearby. Senior medic Young Jin lowers the mask from his face and yawns loudly, covering his mouth with his hand. Behind the senior medic is his classmate, who wonders why Young Jin is wearing a firefighter's uniform on a Saturday and not going home. Young Jin turns to the classmate and explains that he will be an instructor for the written exam. The classmate equals the senior medic, and they walk together towards the special fire department building. The bright morning sun illuminates the special fire squad building where the first exam for candidates will be held. The lecturer stands in front of the firefighters and announces the start of the exam. He wishes everyone to do well without any problems. He holds out the exam sheets to instructor Young Jin and asks him to distribute them around the room. Hosu notices that his instructor will be his friend, the medic from the Central Fire Department. He looks at the medic questioningly and then greets him from his seat. Young Jin looks at the hero with a smile on his face and fixes his mask on his face. Everyone in the auditorium is surprised at the familiarity between Young Jin and Hosu. The senior medic walks through the auditorium and hands out the exam sheets. The hero looks at his friend with a smile on his face and prepares to take the written test. The fourth team gathers in the dorm room after the written exam. Brigadier Chang. He'll takes off his fire clothes and asks his team how the written exam went. Sergeant Kwong Yol brushes his finger in his ear and says that the exam was very easy and anyone can pass it if they want to. He scrutinizes his finger and says that he expected much more from the special squad's written text. Sergeant Kwong sticks his hand in his pocket and tells the lifeguard that they're worried about the next exam, which will be held outside. Kwong Yol goes outside and looks in horror at the rescue helicopter, which lifts his hair up with the wind. The rescue helicopter flies very low over the dorm building and raises huge columns of smoke and dirt on the grounds. The orange quadricopter lies on a wooden table waiting to be used. The air from the helicopter blades blows around all the candidates. Dujin covers his eyes from the sand with his hand. The instructors announce the start of the group rescue operation, and the rescue helicopter hovers over the firefighter. The wind from the helicopter's blades intensifies and nearly knocks Aaron off her feet who tries to cover her eyes from the flying sand with her whole hand. Hosu closes his eyes and tries to concentrate on his ability to see the future. He abruptly opens his eyes, which flash a bright blue color, and waits for the end of the back report. The rescue team helicopter lands near the squad of cadets and blows a strong wind around them. Staff Sergeant Gun Jin stands in front of the helicopter and says he hasn't smelled helicopter fuel in a long time. Du Jin, along with some members of the fourth squad, look puzzled in the direction of the helicopter. Ho Su and Yaren close their eyes to keep the sand from getting into them, and the rescue worker looks at the helicopter with a smile on his face. The young firefighter opens his eyes, which glow blue, and uses his gift to see the future. The helicopter blades ignore what's going on around them and spin at a furious speed. The candidates for the special fire squad take off their oxygen masks and wait for orders from their instructors.
The commander of the special squad ignores the noise of the helicopter and looks sternly at his charges. He says that the practical exam will take place in a temporary structure. The fourth group, along with the other firefighters, prepare their equipment and get ready to perform. Sergeant Kwong Yeol hears that during the assignment, each group will have a person to operate the drone. The commander says that the mission will be graded on a point system, and one point will be awarded for each casualty report. He stands behind the temporary structure and assesses with his gaze how much the firefighters have grasped the essence of the task. Instructors from the special squad drag several mannequins into the building as the commander finishes his speech. The first and second squad instructors show the firefighters what the dummies look like so the cadets will memorize them. The commander exhales cold air and tells them that the four-man search party is divided into groups of two. Hosu chooses Dojin as his partner and they continue to listen intently to the commander. Yaren and Brigadier Chang. He'll look around with a bit of surprise on their faces and then continue to look at the commander. Sergeant Seo Li Gan stands with senior officer Du Young to the right of the commander and waits for the exam to begin. The fire teams are surprised to learn that all of one dummy can be 150 kilograms. The commander clarifies that the dummies must be handed to the participant near the helicopter, and the team will receive one point for each dummy rescued. The rescuer looks enthusiastically at the commander and instructors. He learns that he will have to work with ropes, and he is a great expert in this. The instructors point out that they will personally check how tight and secure the dummy will be. The fourth team gathers in a small circle and discusses strategy for the practical exam. The commander finishes his explanation of the special group rescue operation and orders the teams to begin execution. The commander extends his palm upward and extends his finger upward. He says one person locates the victim. He runs his fingers over his hands and demonstrates the number four and says the rest of the team rescues the dummies. The commander makes a few more hand gestures and asks them to remember that one person from the team must stay near the helicopter. He examines each firefighter and notes with a smile on his face that perhaps some of the firefighters will be going home after the exam. The firefighter teams are very excited at the captain's words. They didn't expect that someone could be sent home in the first week. Dujin and Hosu were prepared for this turn of events. They are concentrating on the upcoming exam while Sergeant Kwang Yeol is a little scared of what is happening. The commander says that the significance of this exam is to identify those participants who can go to the scene right away, so the criteria is very strict. The firefighters are reassured when they learn that if there is a minimal gap in scores between the teams, all candidates will stay in the dormitory and continue their training. The commander, with a smile on his face, asks the teams to try their best and says a few words of encouragement to them. The squad members get together and think about the strategy they will use in the exam. The commander is very proud that he was able to gather so many talented people for his exam. He turns sideways to the cadets and orders them to assign major roles to each other. The firefighters salute the departing commander and frantically begin to distribute themselves within the team. The fourth group assigns their roles and approaches their instructor to report their readiness. Instructor Seo Li Gun approaches the fourth team and asks about their squad roles. Sergeant Kwang Yol says he'll be flying the drone during the rescue mission. Yaren and Brigadier Chang. Il say they'll be members of the search squad during the exam. Hosu and Du Jin also join the search team. They put on their fire helmets and get ready to go out. Rescuer Gun Ji says with a smile on his face that he will be in charge of securing the helicopter ropes. Instructor Seo Li Gan orders Kwang Yol to head to where the other drone commanders are gathered, and the sergeant walks away from the team. Yeren and Brigadier Chang ill stretch their arms and prepare to begin the exam. Ho Su and Du Jin discuss strategy and then move closer to their team. Instructor Seo Li Gong asks Junior Sergeant Gun Ji to follow him, and they head towards the helipad. Sergeant Seo Li Gong leads the lifeguard behind him and hums a strange tune to himself. The instructor of the fourth team abruptly turns toward the lifeguard and says that there will be no dropouts in his group. The fourth team stops and looks at their instructor with incomprehension. Sergeant Seo Li Gong tells his group with a smile on his face that he will take the very first place. For a brief moment, there is a sepulchral silence between Seo Li Gong and the firefighter group. The fourth group salutes the sergeant with a smile on their faces and promises him that they will give it their best. The shined boots of the firefighters stand a few centimeters apart. Ho Su and Du Jin stand near the starting line and wait for their instructor's command. 
Ho Su is distracted from his musings when Du Jin addresses him in a loud voice. The tall firefighter says that Aaron understands the power of the hero's ability perfectly, and that's why she refused to help Ho Su in the exam. The young fireman looks at Do Jin in silence and tries to understand what the tall fireman is trying to say with those words. Do Jin turns half turned to the hero and says that he's never encountered Ho Su's abilities before. The tall fireman explains that he doesn't understand at all how Ho Su's gift can help or hinder him during the exam. Do Jin is eager to test exactly how the young firefighter's gift works and warns Ho Su about it. The hero fixes his helmet with a calm expression and continues to listen to the tall firefighter in silence. Hosu agrees with Dojin that today's exam equal, sign the best way to safely find out how much they can do together. Dojin asks Hosu to tell him everything he sees once the instructor gives the signal to start. The instructor asks everyone to get ready to start and prepare to blow their whistle. He brings the whistle close to his mouth and draws more air into his chest. The firefighters look carefully in the instructor's direction and try not to miss his command. Du Jin asks Ho Su to worry more than ever so he can see the strength of the hero's ability at its maximum. Du Jin turns away from Ho Su and looks towards the temporary building and tries to focus. Ho Su stops looking at Do Jin and tries to concentrate on his gift. The tall firefighter starts breathing slowly and reminds Ho Su that when they act together, the hero is the eyes and he will be the hands. Du Jin clenches his hands tightly and tilts the torso of his body slightly after saying a few words. Instructor Hyun Sung blows his whistle with all his might, and a loud sound travels throughout the entire venue. A huge number of firefighters crowd in front of the temporary building and prepare for the instructor's command. Yeren and Brigadier Chang. He'll take the starting position and prepare for the dash. The young firefighter looks strictly straight ahead. He tries not to be distracted by extraneous things. Du Jin stands next to Ho Su and looks at the instructor, waiting for him to give the command to start. The loud sound of the whistle blows several kilometers away and echoes off the walls of the buildings. The fire teams rush towards the temporary building and the practical exam begins. A rescue helicopter hovers above the firefighters and raises swirls of dust and dirt over their heads. The instructor holds tightly to the rope that has been thrown from the firefighting helicopter. A firefighter stands beneath the rescue helicopter and waits for a command from his instructor. A sergeant from the special squad turns to the firefighters and in a loud voice that drowns out the noise of the helicopter, asks them to get ready. The special squad candidates adjust their helmets and focus on their task. The instructor asks the firefighters to observe safety precautions and warns them that other instructors will always be nearby. Sergeant CO Lee Gan inspects the exam site and heads over to the drone commanders. He approaches the firefighters, announces that he will give the command to dispatch the drones to search for the squads. The firefighter picks up the control panel and uses the camera on it to try and find the victims. The drone commander from the second squad radios his comrades about the casualties on the roof of the building. Sergeant Kwong Yo looks at his fellow officer and realizes that he needs to hurry if he wants to get points for his team. He directs his gaze to the control panel and uses the drone to try to find the casualties. A small drone hovers in the air, with a special camera attached to it that allows the drone commanders to see the entire building. Kwang Yo looks around absent-mindedly, worried that he won't be able to do his job, and instructor Seo Li Gong notices the sergeant's concern and gets distracted from his notes. Sergeant Seo Li Gong's loud voice distracts Kwang Yo from his thoughts, and he turns his head toward his instructor. The instructor approaches Sergeant Kwong Yiul and asks him what he was thinking about during the exam. The sergeant replies in a loud voice that everything is fine and looks at the back of instructor Seo Li Gong as he walks away from his seat. Kwong Yiul looks at his drone's camera image and ponders the function of the search party. Instructor Seo Li Gong walks past the other drone commanders and checks to see how they are doing. It occurs to Sergeant Kwong Yiul that only a drone commander can get the highest scores. He thinks about his next strategy and Sergeant Seo Li Gong comes to him. Sergeant Kwang Yo looks at his drone's camera image and tries to find the victims in the building. He realizes that his role is the most important in this exam and tries his best to bring his team the highest score possible. A great deal of doubt gnaws at the sergeant. A cold sweat breaks out on his face and he can't concentrate. Sergeant Kwang clenches his teeth tightly, his mind reeling with thoughts about the exam. Instructor Seo Li Gong looks carefully at Kwang Yol's pensive face. 
Sergeant Kwang Yul spots the injured man and picks up the walkie-talkie to the surprise of his instructor. He reports to the rescue team that there is a casualty in the second room on the left side. Kwang Yul looks at the drone's remote control and sees on his screen as his team pulls the mannequin out of the room. Yaren looks at the flying drone near the window and listens to the walkie-talkie report on the location of the other dummies. Hosu and Dojin get a few more clues through the walkie-talkie about the victim's whereabouts, and the drone watches them through the window. Dojin hears Sergeant Kwang Yol's voice over the walkie-talkie and listens to his report on the location of the dummy mixed with friendly insults. Sergeant Kwang Yol warns his group over the radio that he will give another briefing on the dummy location in a few minutes. Instructor Seo Li Gan watches Kwang Yeol's flawless work with a smile and slight surprise on his face. The sergeant bears his sharp fang-like teeth and continues to search for the dummies with his cameras. Several rescue squads re-enter the building for the remaining dummies inside. Firefighters are pandering in pitch darkness and trying to find anything in the semi-darkness of the building. Sergeant Kwang Yeol smiles because he realized what the exam was all about. Kwang Yeol stops tormenting himself with different thoughts and continues to help his team with the drone with a smile. A lone mannequin lies near the window. It's surrounded by boxes to make it harder for the firefighting teams to find it. Yaren lifts the heavy mannequin in his arms and Brigadier Chang Il offers the girl his help. Brigadier Chang. Il is greatly surprised when he hears from the girl that he can handle the mannequin by himself. Yaren suggests dragging the dummies one at a time to outrun the other groups of firefighters. The girl throws the heavy mannequin onto her shoulders and slowly stands up with it. Brigadier Chang. He looks at Aaron in silence and ponders the girl's suggestion. He agrees that he needs to hurry up and says with a smile on his face that he'll head to the next point. Chang Il makes a dash towards the opposite room where the next mannequin is, and Aaron rises to his full height and heads towards the exit of the building. Several pairs of firefighter legs quickly pass through the narrow hallways of the building. Ho Su and Du Jin run through several rooms together looking for mannequins to pull out. The tall firefighter asks the hero if they should ignore Kwang Yol's reports of dummies in the building. Their conversation is interrupted by the loud voice of a fireman behind them who has discovered a mannequin. Hosu looks toward the fireman and explains to Dojin that the other firemen rely on more than just the walkie-talkie, so they should do the same. The tall firefighter asks the hero if there's a way to turn the situation around and catch up to the other teams in points. The rescue team, who are standing near the helicopter, hear the instructor's voice and turn around. The instructor points to the exit of the building and says that the first team has made the rescue. The candidate from the first team carries the mannequin on his shoulders and runs toward the helipad. The firefighter from the second team runs after the candidate from the first team and also carries the dummy on his shoulders. The candidate from the rescue team places the dummy on the medical stretcher and fastens it with a rope to the helicopter. Lance Sergeant Gun Jin looks toward the exit of the building and waits for his team to appear in the doorway. An officer sits in the control room, mouse over the flat surface of the desk. Senior Officer Yoon Seo looks at the monitor screens and follows the events of the exam. The commander from the special squad approaches Officer Yoon Seo and asks how the rescue operation is going. The commander and the officer in charge stand close to each other and watch the results of the special squad candidates on multiple monitors. The commander notices a strange frame from the surveillance camera and scrutinizes it closely. He tucks his hands into his pocket and asks about the iron door the officer placed at the exam site. The camera hangs in the corner of the building and scrutinizes the firefighters going through the exam. The camera image shows two firefighters standing in front of a huge iron door. Du Jin scrutinizes the obstacle that has appeared in front of him. Ho Su and the tall fireman agree that the iron door in front of them looks very suspicious. The young fireman tells Do Jin that there are seven mannequins behind that iron door. Do Jin looks at the hero and asks him what they should do next with that door. The commander praises the officer for coming up with an interesting mission with rescuing the victims who are separated from the others. He says that he'll have to try really hard to get all the victims out of this room. Senior Officer Yoon Seo agrees with the commander. He says that the reward behind the iron doors is worth the effort. The commander looks at his officer and listens to the report on the scores of the special squad candidates. Officer Yoon Seo points to the monitor and says that the fourth group ranks last among the other teams in terms of scores. Du Jin scrutinizes the door, then casts his gaze at Ho Su with the hope that the young firefighter knows how they should proceed. 
He mumbles aloud the hero's suggestion to throw a rope from the roof to get the dummies. Hosu looks at the tall fireman with a smile on his face and asks him to trust him. The commander calculates the time it will take for the fourth team to get the dummies out and asks the officer if there are other ways. The monitor screen shows Du Jin approaching the iron doors and using hand strength to try to open them. Du Jin takes an iron grip on the narrow gap between the doors and pulls in different directions. A ringing scrape comes from the other side of the door, and the gap slowly increases in size. Du Jin grits his teeth and exerts his best efforts to open the iron door. The chain that holds the door flaps is pulled with tremendous force and begins to ring loudly. The chain cannot withstand the pressure and breaks in half, and the door leaves open in front of the firefighters. Senior Officer Yun Seo grazes his coffee mug from shock, and it promptly flies to the floor. The commander and officer see on their monitor as Do Jin uses his strength to knock the door off its hinges and open the passage. A white cup lies on the floor near the officer's feet and the remains of the coffee gradually pours out of it. Du Jin looks at the passage that has opened up in front of him and with a slight hesitation asks Ho Su if he had foreseen this turn. Ho Su adjusts his helmet slightly, his eyes glowing blue, and he nods to the tall fireman with a smile on his face. The instructor watches carefully as the firefighters fasten the ropes on the dummy and the candidate waits for his team to bring the next dummy. The candidate in the first group carries along with the mannequin and notices the silhouettes of several firefighters following him. Lance Sergeant Gunji notices his group approaching and prepares to receive the dummy. Yaren quickly rushes towards the helipad to get there as quickly as possible. She is followed by Brigadier Chang Il, who is carrying a dummy on his shoulders. In the distance, several silhouettes of legs can be seen near the porch of the building as they rush toward the helicopter. The instructor, along with the other firefighters, try to get a good look at the silhouettes rushing toward them and can't believe their eyes. Yaren pays no attention to the people running behind her, and Brigadier Chang Il turns his head to see who is following them. The sound of mannequins banging against each other carries throughout the examination area. Brigadier Chang Il sees Ho Su running after him, who is running with a dummy in his hands. He also notices Do Jin, who manages to carry several dummies on his shoulders due to his physical abilities. Do Jin and Ho Su run closer, and now the firefighters see that there are more than two dummies on their shoulders. The second squad instructor tries to count how many dummies Ho Su and Do Jin are carrying with them. Sergeant Kang Dae Gu contacts instructor Seo Li Gong on the radio, who is keeping an eye on the drone commanders. Sergeant Seo Li Gong asks his friend with a bit of concern if something bad has happened to him. He is surprised that the sergeant decided to contact him at this time. Sergeant Seo Li Gong hears a report from Sergeant Kang Da Gu that the fourth group brought a lot of dummies to the helipad. Instructor Seo Li Gong listens to the report of the fourth group's success with a smile on his face. An eerie smile slips across Sergeant Seo Li Gong's face. He is very pleased with his group's results. The two firefighters from the first group run towards the helicopter to carry their dummies. The instructor holds out a flat palm in front of the candidates and asks him to become. Rescue Gunjin deals with the dummies with a smile on his face while the instructor prevents the other firefighters from approaching him. There are a large number of mannequins near Staff Sergeant Gunjin, and the instructor does not allow other cadets to get close until the rescuer has finished his work. Several pairs of fire-suited legs rush along the corridor of the building where the exam is being held. Brigadier Chang. He'll contact Sergeant Kwang Yeo by radio to find out where the dummies are and leads his group through the floors according to the information received. An empty cup and a puddle of coffee spilled beside it lie peacefully on the floor. The senior officer watches the results of the fourth squad with great amazement. The commander looks down at the spilled coffee and offers the officer to help clean up the room. The team splits up, Ho Su and Do Jin's feet together rushing along the rooms of the building. The fourth team splits up and decides to act on the information the sergeant gives them. The fire drone is in the air and uses the camera to relay information to the commanders. Kwang Yo looks at the drone's screen and hears the other drone commanders using the walkie-talkies to tell their teams where the victims are. He turns toward the candidates with an angry look and ponders a strategy for his group. Hosu and Do Jin climb the stairs to the fourth floor and follow Sergeant Kwang Yeol's instructions to avoid running into other groups. The tall fireman stares at the hero's back and waits for further commands from him. Hosu tells the tall fireman not to hesitate and wait at this point, but doesn't turn around in his direction. The young firefighter runs ahead and opens the left door, and Doji waves his arms wide and tries to catch up with him. 
The guys bring in another batch of dummies, and Gun Jin ties them with rope to the helicopter. Du Jin looks at Ho Su with astonishment and doesn't understand how the young fireman has the strength to keep running. He decides to keep up with the hero and makes a quick dash in his direction and follows him. Du Jin follows Ho Su, who uses his ability to identify the rooms where the dummies are. The tall fireman stops to catch his breath and ponders the peculiarity of the hero's ability. He looks up and is restrained by the fear of the unknown that lies ahead. Du Jin tries to move his arm, but his body stops obeying him due to fear. Du Jin's eyes stare at the oxygen tank that is visible on Ho Su's back. The tall fireman can clearly see Ho Su's back along with the hero recoiling further and further away from him. Du Jin notices some strange dark shroud around Ho Su that makes it impossible to see what's ahead. Ho Su disappears into the strange dark white fog and Do Jin sees only his silhouette. The tall fireman's footsteps slowly approach the acrid smoke that Ho Su ran through. Du Jin is badly frightened. He grits his teeth and continues to follow the hero despite his fear. Brigadier Chang. Il and Aaron get to the location that Kwong Yoel informed them about, but they see several silhouettes picking up a mannequin. Chang ill realizes that another group has gotten ahead of them and suggests the girl go to the other victims. Brigadier Chang. Il notices that the team has gone ahead and left the mannequin on the ground. The dummy lies motionless in front of the brigadier and the girl, while the other firefighters run away from it in the other direction. He wraps his arms around the mannequin from the back, and realizes that it has a very heavy weight and there is no way to lift it. Brigadier Chang. Il lifts the mannequin slightly and drags it across the floor to the exit of the building. With great effort, Chang Il drags the mannequin. He realizes that the firemen ran away because they realized that the mannequin was too heavy. He tires quickly and thinks he can't handle the weight, but he hears Aaron's voice calling out to him. The girl suggests to Brigadier Chang Il to pull that dummy together, even if it plays to their team's detriment. The instructor praises the third group for their excellent work with the ropes. The candidate from the group rejoices because his team has caught up with the fourth group in terms of points. Rescuers from other squads chat among themselves and wait for their team to bring in the next dummies. The sound of loud approaching footsteps of fire boots interrupts them, and they turn their heads toward the exit of the building. Lance Sergeant Gun G sees his team approaching with the mannequin. Yaren and Brigadier Chang. Il carry the heavy mannequin together and run towards the landing strip. Rescue Gunji accepts the mannequin and thanks his team for a great job. The lifeguard from the other team watches the heavy dummy with a smile on his face and says that his team has a chance to win. Erin is very tired, huge drops of sweat falling from her face, and she turns at the sound of footsteps to see who is walking behind them. She sees Hosu and Dojin carrying one mannequin each on their backs. The firefighters continue to crowd and talk amongst themselves as they wait for their team. A huge silhouette of a tall fireman towers over the firemen, and they stare at him silently. Du Jin looks down at the firemen and asks them to step aside because the mannequin is very heavy. With a huge rumble, the mannequin falls down from Do Jin's shoulders and dust rises into the air. The firemen look toward the heavy mannequin and wonder how Du Jin was able to carry it alone. Du Jin dabs off his gloves and announces to the instructor that he has a replacement in his group. The fourth group looks at the tall firefighter in surprise. They didn't expect him to announce the replacement. Sergeant Kwang Yol swears at Du Jin over the radio and says that because of these actions, Du Jin will ruin the whole briefing. A quadrocopter hovers in the air on the fourth floor of the building and looks at Ho Su and Du Jin through the window. Du Jin says there's no cause for concern, and Sergeant Kwang Yol should continue to do his job. The tall fireman and Yaren stand in the hallway near the window while Do Jin listens to Sergeant Kwang Yol's angry words. Aaron turns to Do Jin and asks why he wanted to switch partners. Do Jin explains that he wants to test a theory by shuffling people. The girl suggests asking Ho Su for his opinion because it'll be much faster that way. Do Jin shakes his head negatively. He says that the problem lies with Aaron. The girl turns back and looks at the tall fireman figure looming over her. Yaren gingerly looks at Do Jin and doesn't understand why the problem lies in her. The mop is carried from side to side across the wet floor and wipes up the remnants of coffee with it. Senior Officer Yoon Seo cleans up the mess with the mop and continues to watch the exam situation on the monitors. The commander looks back and forth at the mop and back and forth at the monitors that show what's going on inside the building. The first group has reached the roof of the second building and is pulling mannequins out of the maze. 
The commander of the first group runs ahead of everyone with a mannequin on his shoulders and leads the team so they don't get lost in the complex maze. A fire drone hovers over the roof of the building and helps the group navigate the maze. The candidate tells his squad leader that they are short of people on the lower floors and have left the dummy to the fourth group. The first group is carried at a brisk pace through the walls of the maze and tries to get to the exit as quickly as possible. The commander looks at the first team with a smile as they work well together. Senior Officer Yoon Seo cleans the floor and tells the commander that the assignments were designed so that all groups work as one team. The commander notes that the first group of special squad candidates are doing a great job. The commander continues to watch the monitors while the senior officer cleans up the coffee residue with a mop. Officer Yoon Seo finishes cleaning up and joins in watching the screens. Yaren and Dojin stand across from each other. They hesitate to say anything. Do Jin casts her eyes downward and says that there's a confidence in Ho Su's steps that he and Aaron lack. The shadow of the tall fireman's silhouette is reflected on the girl's face, and she raises her head to stare straight ahead. Do Jin notes with a wan look on his face that he doesn't know the future like Ho Su can. His eyes slowly look around the room and then stop on Aaron's face again. Do Jin asks Aaron how to act manly at the scene. Yaren listens to the tall fireman, who admiringly talks about the situation in the department store where the girl and the guys perform the feat together. Dujin wonders how it's possible to trust Hosu with all your heart and without looking back. Dujin's mind flashes back to when he followed Hosu and froze with fear of the unknown. The silhouette of a firefighter flashes through his mind time after time as it dissolves into the impenetrable smoke. The girl continues to follow Dujin with her eyes her face showing that she knows exactly what the tall fireman is talking about. Du Jin admits that he thought it was simple to follow Ho Su's orders and move behind him, but he admits that he was very wrong. He waits a moment of silence, then asks Aaron how she managed to conquer her fear of the unknown. The tall firefighter closes his eyes and sees the acrid white smoke beneath his feet, which stiffens his body. He tries to take the slightest step, but his body is restrained by an overwhelming anxiety that prevents him from moving. Aaron turns his back to Dojin and explains to him that the injured people at the scene also blindly follow the firefighter's instructions and have no doubt that this is the best solution. Dojin looks at the back of Yaren walking away from him and ponders the girl's words. The young firefighter's eyes widen with surprise and the realization that he always knew the answer to his question. A few fire helmets and picks lie on the damp ground along with the debris of concrete blocks. Dujin recalls how he climbed into the narrow tunnels without special equipment, holding a flashlight in his teeth. He uses his bare hands to dig up the earth under which his comrades were buried because of the tunnel collapse. Dujin's face is covered in wet dirt, tears welling up in his eyes as he asks the voices above to be silent. The victim shouts into the tunnel where Dujin went after his comrades that she believes in him. Tears run down her sand-dirty cheeks and she forgives Du Jin for not giving up. Du Jin silently looks at Yaren and ponders the situation that happened when the tunnel collapsed. Yaren turns to look at him and waits for the tall fireman to say a word to her response. Du Jin slowly removes the glove from her left hand and reaches up to her face with her free hand. Tears come to the tall fireman's eyes and he wipes them away with his free hand. Aaron looks at Du Jin with a smile on his face. The girl is glad that the tall fireman was able to find the answer to his question. Du Jin still stands for a while, trying to calm his emotions that have played out because of the former memories. Aaron suggests that Du Jin should head forward as soon as possible to catch up with the other groups. Du Jin's fire boots bounce off the floor and make a light rustling sound that travels through the room. Du Jin puts on his fire gloves and uses both hands to adjust the fire helmet on his head. The tall firefighter peers at Aaron. He holds on to the edge of the helmet with one hand and thanks the girl for her words of encouragement. The girl looks at the tall fireman and waits for him to head forward. Dujin asks to address Yaren as Yaren because the girl isn't much older than him. He turns to face her and says that he has a new goal in life, to compete with Ho Su and her. The girl looks at Dujin walking away from her and doesn't understand his last words. Dujin starts to speed up and says that he will definitely come out the winner in the end. He makes a sudden dash along the corridor and quickly moves away from the girl, who has no idea what he's talking about. Yaren looks at Do Jin running away from her with big eyes and doesn't understand what kind of victory the tall fireman is talking about. 
The girl comes to her senses, and together with Du Jin, the guys quickly run to the next mannequin. Sergeant Kuang Yo looks at the quadrocopter camera footage with a smile on his face and loudly announces that he has found the remaining dummies. The drone commander from Squad 3 looks at Sergeant Kuang incomprehensively, while the commander from Squad 1 reports the location of the dummy on the third floor. Instructor C.O. Li Gan approaches the drone commander from Squad 1 and says that his report doesn't matter because Squad 4 has already found the dummy on the third floor. Sergeant C.O. Li Gong makes some notes in his notebook and confirms Sergeant Kuang Yol's words that all the dummies have already been found. The instructor explains to the drone commanders that there are still dummies in the building, but further radio transmissions will only add chaos to the process. Seo Ligon goes to the participants in charge of the ropes and declares the drone control exam over. He slowly walks towards his colleague and is glad that he decided to be in charge of the drone exam personally. Sergeant Seo Ligong stops halfway and slowly turns toward Kuang Yol. Sergeant Kuang Yol looks at the instructor who turns around at him with a bit of apprehension and fears another punishment for his actions. Instructor Seo Li Gong tells Kuang Yol that he performed well on the exam and asks him to keep up the sergeant's performance. Sergeant Kuang Yol tilts his head slightly to the side, his pupils dilating slightly in surprise, not expecting to receive praise from the instructor. The instructor calmly walks to the helipad where the teams leave the rescued dummies, and Kuang Yol silently stares after him. Sergeant Kuang Yol stares down, his face flushed red, and thanks Instructor Seo Li Gong very loudly for his praise. An instructor from the Special Fire Department stops the firefighters and asks everyone to move away from the rescue helicopter. The helicopter blades spin frantically in the air, raising columns of dust and dirt. The instructors, along with the commander and senior officer, look at the rescue helicopter, which is about to shut down its engines. Senior Officer Yoon Seo looks at Instructor Seo Li Gong, who is yawning, long and tired. The commander stands in front of the cadets and thanks everyone for their work. He announces the end of the group rescue operation. Teams of candidates for the special squad stand in front of their instructors and the commander of the special squad, and behind the members of the special squad is a rescue helicopter whose blades have stopped kicking up dust on the territory of the site. The firefighters are very tired after a difficult exam, but they look at the special squad commander with smiles on their faces. The commander's speech about the end of the exam ends, and the teams of special squad candidates break into loud applause. Sergeant Kwang Yul interrupts the sound of applause with his voice and asks when the results of the exam will be available, and Ho Su turns toward the sergeant and looks at him in surprise. Sergeant Kwang Yul, lifeguard Gun Jin, and Do Jin walk over to the information board to find out their results for the exam. Yeren and Ho Su stand close to their group to the large crowd of candidates and look at their results. The bright blue scoreboard displays the ballpark results of each of the three sites the teams worked in. Sergeant Kwang Yol and Lance Sergeant Gun Jin flip through the lists carefully and look for their names against the scores. Kwang Yeol notices the table with the final scores of all the groups and calls out to all the members of the fourth team. The table is painted with the groups and the scores opposite them. The fourth team takes first place in the overall standings at the end of the rescue operation. Lance Sergeant Gun Jin shouts with joy when he notices the fourth team at the top. Sergeant Kwang Yol tells Do Jin that they could have lost to the other teams if not for his good performance on the drone court. Yerin, Ho Su, and Brigadier Chang. He'll watch the argument between the sergeant and the tall firefighter. Du Jin explains to Kwang Yeol that the search team had a very difficult time and they were very unlucky with their location in the building. Sergeant Kwang Yeol grits his sharp teeth and casts an angry look at Do Jin, but realizes that the tall fireman might be right about something. Du Jin says that there are some very capable guys in the other squads too, who shouldn't be written off. Kwang Yeol calms down a bit after the tall fireman's words, but continues to glare at him with his eyes. The guy's argument is interrupted by the young firefighter's words coming from the other side of the crowd. Hosu expresses his gratitude to Sergeant Kwang Yol for his work with the drone and his knowledgeable information during the rescue efforts in the building. Sergeant Kwang Yol blushes at the hero's praise. He begins to stammer and can't find the words to thank Hosu in return. He coughs slightly and says that he finds it very easy to control the drone unlike the others. Du Jin doesn't listen to Kwang Yol's explanation his gaze focused on the young firefighter. 
Hosu looks at Sergeant Kwang Yol with a calm expression on his face and listens to his explanation about the drone. Du Jin is visited by the thought of Ho Su's abilities. He is sure that the young firefighter knew from the beginning that Ho Kwang Yol would greatly outperform the others in controlling the drone. A memory flashes through Du Jin's mind of when they stood together with Ho Su in front of the iron door. Du Jin turns his head slightly to the right and notices a small camera watching them. The small, faintly visible camera is placed in the corner of the room and is filming the firefighters' work inside the building. Du Jin comes to the conclusion that Ho Su has purposely set himself up for the surveillance cameras so as not to arouse suspicion. A light hand reaches for the fabric of the young firefighter's clothing and pulls the sleeve towards himself. Ho Su turns to his left and sees Aaron in front of him, who looks at the hero meaningfully. The girl asks the hero if he lost to the third group in the search for dummies on purpose. Yaren realizes that the young fireman doesn't want to arouse suspicion in the exam, but decides to clarify his point about the rescue teams. Hosu's lips part in a subtle smile, and he nods positively to Aaron in response to her question. The girl chuckles a little and says that now Hosu can call himself a cool hero. The firefighters are distracted from checking their scores because of the voice of the instructors asking the candidates to come closer to them. The instructors from the special fire department ask all the candidates to proceed to the dormitory to change into regular clothes and proceed to dinner. The quiet footsteps of the candidates rush along the long corridor of the loved dormitory. The firefighters talk among themselves about the exam. They are very much dreading Sunday, when they will announce those candidates who failed the exam and will have to go home. Brigadier Chang Il stands near the wall and listens to the restless conversations among the firefighters. He casts a vague glance at them and worries that he might be on the list of those who will be going to their homes on Sunday. Brigadier Chang Il calls his wife and tells her about the rescue exam. He grabs his head and starts nervously brushing his hair with his hand, and his wife tells him not to feel bad about failing the exam. Brigadier Chang Il pauses for a moment and says that his group actually placed first and he passed the exam. He explains to his wife that because the fourth group came in first place, no one will be expelled. His wife can't believe that her husband was able to pass the tests of the exam, but with a slight hesitation, she congratulates him for passing the first stage. Brigadier Chang. He'll tilts his head slightly to the right side and says not to celebrate early because there will be other exams ahead. Chang. He'll listens to the congratulations from his little daughter and wonders if he deserves to be standing in this place. The brigadier's eyes look down somewhere, as if all the answers to his questions lie on the floor. He says goodbye to his family and hangs up the phone. The brigadier looks at his phone screen. He checks to see if there are any missed calls left and reads the mail. Chang Il goes over the past day in his head and thinks about whether or not he is a ballast for his team. The foreman sighs heavily and gradually walks down the stairs, measuring each step. His footsteps ringing down the stairs, the brigadier measures each step and heads for his room. On the way to the common corridor, he remembers the girl, Yerin, with whom they worked and pulled mannequins together. The girl picks up a mannequin and tells Brigadier Chang-il that they need to carry the mannequins each one by one to catch up with the other teams. Ho-su lays the dummy on the ground, and Du-jin asks the brigadier with Aaron how many dummies they were able to drag in one go. The foreman's mind flashes before his eyes as he frantically moves around the mannequin he couldn't lift to his back. He clearly remembers the words of Yeren, who offered her help to pull the heavy mannequin together. Staff Sergeant Gun Jin quickly secures the ropes around the mannequin and prepares it for transportation. Brigadier Chang. He'll watches the work of rescuer Gun Jin and marvels at his skill. He recalls the young firefighter's words, thanking Sergeant Kwang Yol for his work in controlling the drone. The brigadier walks down the stairs step by step, and his eyes sternly look somewhere down below his feet. He steps outside and hears the familiar voice of Gun Jin echoing behind him. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin runs up to Chang Il with a cheerful expression on his face and tells him that the fourth team has been waiting for him for a long time. Gun Jin doesn't wait for a response and grabs Brigadier Chang Il by the arm and runs towards the room with him. On the fourth team's table is a huge amount of food, among which are a few pieces of marinated chicken and potatoes. In the center of the table is a huge pizza that is already cut into several slices for each team member. Chang Il walks into the fourth team's room with Gun Jin and stares in amazement at the festive table. 
The team sits down at the table, and the young firefighter greets the late foreman and tells him that instructor Seo Lee Gon ordered them dinner. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin compliments Ho Su's words and says that this dinner is a reward for their first place. Brigadier Chang. Il didn't expect this from instructor Seo Lee Gun and is stunned by this information. Aaron tells the team that instructor Seo Lee Gun looked very pleased this time, but notes that she is still intimidated by his smile. Brigadier Chang. Il stands immovably in the middle of the room, his mouth slightly open in surprise, but not a single word comes out of his mouth. Sergeant Kwang Yol pulls out his phone and tries to get his attention with a loud cough. Kwang Yol says he wants to read the team a message from instructor C.O. Lee Gun before he starts dinner. The young firefighter turns his eyes to Sergeant Kwang Yol and listens to So Lee Gun's messages from Sergeant. Du Jin interrupts Sergeant Kwang Yeol halfway through and asks him to speak in the same voice as Instructor Seo Li Gun. Sergeant Kwang Yeol ignores the tall firefighter's remark and continues to read out the message, while Do Jin and Junior Sergeant Gun Jin listen in silence. He turns toward Yeren with Ho Su and notes So Li Gong's words of admiration for the work they did during the rescue operation. Du Jin listens to Seo Li Gong's words of praise for their work done, but doesn't pay much attention to it. Kwang Yol reads out a few more messages and comments regarding the fourth squad's work. Ho Su and Yaren laugh amongst themselves about how instructor Seo Li Gong occasionally praises himself in his speech. Brigadier Chang. Il listens to Seo Li Gong's comments and is upset that even in the instructor's eyes, he is nothing. Gunjin listens with a smile on his face as he listens to the instructor's thanks for his work with the dummies and lifelines. Brigadier Chang. Il looks at the guys and is jealous that they are very different from him. The guys continue to chat amongst themselves and joke about their instructor, and Lance Sergeant Gun Jin shows how he did the rope task in the exam. The brigadier rests his hands on his knees and concludes that his abilities are not worthy of mention. Sergeant Kwang Yeol reads out a report that Brigadier Chang Il has played a support role in the fourth group, like an older brother looking out for the others. Chang Il's eyes widen in surprise. He didn't think that instructor Seo Li Gong would say something about him. He listens to the words of gratitude from the instructor and ponders his place in the squad. His face begins to tremble slightly, and a myriad of emotions stir in his head. The sergeant finishes reading the words of thanks, and Chang Il tilts his head slightly and looks down. No one in the guise can see that Brigadier Chang Il has covered his face with his hand and is crying with happiness. Brigadier Chang. Il is very happy that his knowledge and strength helped the fourth team win first place. Sergeant Kwang Yeol reads out Sergeant Seo Li Gun's last words that warn the group not to show food to the other instructors or they will get punished. The guys listen to Seo Li Gun's words with big round eyes of surprise and try to figure out what they should do with the food. Brigadier Chang Il's face, which was glowing with happiness for a few minutes, has turned pale like a black cloud. Various emotions flicker on the faces of the team. They realize that if they don't figure out what to do with the food, they will be punished. From the hallway through the open door to the fourth team's room come the indignant voices of the firemen complaining about the smell of food. The boys jump up abruptly and start running around the entire space of their room. Sergeant Kwang Young Jin opens the window to the room, and Do Jin asks to find a fan to check the room. Late at night, a light is on in the hallway near the control room door, and the sound of monitors rattling can be heard. Sergeant Siu Li Gan sits in the control room and watches a recording of the rescue operation from the surveillance cameras. The sergeants from the special fire team sit in a general meeting and listen to the commander's report. The commander reads out the results of the exam and points out the names of the firefighters who are eliminated from further training. He turns to Sergeant Daegu and Sergeant Hyun Sung and says that the instructors will now have to say goodbye to the guys they are used to. Sergeant Daegu looks at his commanding officer without too much emotion and takes notes on the dropouts. Sergeant Hyun Sung looks very sad after his commander's news, but doesn't dare challenge his decision. Senior Officer Yoon Seo notes that the first and second group loses one man each, leaving 24 men. The commander urges his officers not to relax because the exams ahead will be even tougher. A senior officer confirms the commander's words and says to be prepared for one of the groups to disappear completely. The instructors point out that they have anticipated the situation of a group disappearing and will prepare the candidates for it. Seo Yoon goes through some of the candidates' cases and warns the sergeants not to show emotion to the band members. 
He looks at his subordinates carefully and notes that if the sergeant starts showing emotion, the candidates will be very shocked. Sergeant Daegu and Sergeant Hyun Seong look at their officer with understanding. They realize the consequences of their emotions. The commander agrees with the senior officer and asks all instructors to be careful when dealing with candidates. The senior officer also notes that excessive displays of emotion can lead candidates to take unwarranted actions or can undermine their resolve altogether. The NCOs feel strongly about the senior officer's words, but keep their emotions in check in the presence of the team. They reply that they will do their best to live up to the captain's expectations and will treat the candidates without unnecessary emotion. The senior officer looks at the NCO's determination with a smile on his face and stops worrying about them. The commander looks around his team and notices that instructor Seo Lee Gong is not at the common table. He realizes why Sergeant Seo Lee Gong is absent from the meeting and asks his team where he might be. The sergeants look amongst themselves and silently stare at the commander. They have no idea where instructor Seo Lee Gong might be. The senior officer doesn't know where Sergeant Seo Lee Gong has disappeared to and is a little tense about the instructor's absence from the general meeting. Morning comes and C.O. Lee Gong continues to sit in the control room and click on the exam records. Sergeant C.O. Lee Gong slowly stretches slowly in his chair and looks at the senior officer. The instructor is greatly surprised that it's morning and ignoring the senior officer, he heads to his room. The senior officer asks Sergeant C.O. Lee Gong to stop and explain to him what he was doing all night in the control room. Sergeant C.O. Lee Gong walks further to the doorway like nothing happened and waves goodbye. Yoon Seo doesn't try to stop Seo Lee Gong and silently stares at his slipping silhouette. He turns to the monitor screens and tries to figure out what Seo Lee Gong was so engrossed in at night. The senior officer sees that the monitor screens are coloring the footage from the rescue operation involving the fourth team. On the main monitor, the footage stops on Ho Su's face, which is looking straight into the camera, and Yoon Seo makes the assumption that the young firefighter is interested in Seo Lee Gun. Sergeant Kwang Yeol opens the window and looks out onto the porch outside the dormitory building. Several firefighters are crowded on the porch to say goodbye to those who didn't pass the special squad exam scores. Sergeant Kwang Yeol is called out by the familiar voice of Gun Jin, who is worried about the firefighters leaving. The lifeguard suggests that the sergeant go to training because he's embarrassed to sit idle in front of those who have dropped out. Kwang Yeol says today is the only day off and refuses Gun Jin's request. The guys hear Du Jin's loud footsteps behind them as he approaches them. Du Jin offers the lifeguard to go to training with him instead of Kwang Yeol. Sergeant Kwang Yeol resents Du Jin's words because when he offered the tall firefighter to train, he turned him down. The young firefighter gets out of the shower and wants to join the joint training session too. Hosu ran every day when he worked at the center and he doesn't want to miss the daily workout. Sergeant Kwang Yeol freaks out because Du Jin doesn't want to go to training with him and Lance Sergeant Gun Jin tries to calm him down. The instructor's quiet boots stride down the stairs and reach the fourth floor of the building. Instructor C.O. Lee Gong hears the loud cheers of the fourth group going to the sports field. Sergeant C.O. Lee Gong hums something to himself and turns the corner to see who is making noise so early. He turns the corner and follows the path of the fourth squad's candidates out of curiosity. The fourth squad walks down the long hallway while Do Jin and Kwang Yeol continue to argue loudly amongst themselves. They turn to the stairs and Ho Su notices instructor Seo Lee Gong near the wall. Instructor Seo Lee Gong is leaning against the wall and studying some papers, pretending that he didn't see the fourth team. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong slightly covers his eyes and greets the fourth team led by Ho Su with a smile. The guys didn't expect to see their instructor here and timidly greet Seo Lee Gong back. Instructor Seo Lee Gong pretends to be absorbed in his work but watches the guys closely. He steps away from the wall and walks strictly towards the unsuspecting fourth group. The guys' footsteps shuffle carelessly on the floor and with a slender stride, the guys' feet approach the stairwell. Instructor Seo Lee Gong takes a few measured steps and tries to walk in front of the young firefighter. Ho Su is carelessly chatting with his friends and doesn't notice that the instructor is heading straight for him. Instructor Seo Lee Gong is a few centimeters away from the hero and a slight smile slips onto his face. The instructor's feet and Ho Su's feet are equal to each other, and so Lee Gong is about to do a footstep to test his theory. The young firefighter is saved by his kick, and he notices just in time to see instructor So Lee Gong pass his feet. 
The hero's feet bypass, so Li Gong's footstool and Hosu nearly falls to the floor in surprise. Hosu stands up straight on the floor and exhales that he has been passed over by instructor So Li Gong's mischief. The hero turns to his friends and continues to chat with them as if nothing happened. The instructor silently looks to his feet, and his usual smile disappears from his face. Sergeant Seo Li Gan stands alone in the middle of the hallway, pondering why Ho Su was able to dodge his footstep. The instructor taps his foot to the beat and runs a few thoughts through his head. The young firefighter and the boys continue to move down the hallway, and Ho Su still hasn't realized what mistake he made. The instructor scrutinizes his boot for a few minutes and leaves the hallway. A tangle of thoughts weave together in Sergeant Seo Li Gong's mind, his face spreading into a creepy smile and looking at the back of Ho Su's departing back. The instructor sits back in his chair and taps his finger on his knee, trying to hit the beat. Sergeant Seo Li Gong spins around in his computer chair in the pitch darkness of the room. A lot of information is running through his head, trying to understand why the young firefighter acted so competently during the rescue operation. With great speed, Seo Li Gong flashes a few words, he equates the young fireman's abilities to a special instinct. He realizes that Ho Su didn't just react reflexively during the task, but had thought out the solution to the problem beforehand. Seo Li Gong looks at his feet and assumes that the hero managed to see the whole picture of the exam, and then he used calculations to perform certain actions one after another. The instructor bites his nails and can understand how the young firefighter managed to foresee several events. Sergeant Seo Lin Gan sits in a strange pose and scrolls through the surveillance footage he's been watching all night in his head. He comes to the conclusion that the young firefighter has a supernatural intuition or flair. The story shifts to Seo Li Gun's memories of the rescue operation. Through the surveillance cameras, he saw Ho Su and Do Jin find the iron door and break it down. He was surprised when Ho Su's comrade, Kwang Yol, didn't understand what his group was doing and tried to contact Gur and Do Jin. Seo Li Gong saw on camera how, without the help of Kwang Yol's information, Do Jin and Ho Su were able to find the dummies and not cross paths with the competition. The instructor is particularly impressed by the hero's ability to dodge the most unexpected situations and remembers how he tried to trip Ho Su. He puts all the information together and his pupils constrict as he realizes what is happening. Instructor Seo Li Gong almost jumps up from his chair from the rush of emotion. He thinks that Ho Su doesn't have a sense of intuition and is more like a shaman. The fourth team, along with the young firefighter, are practicing in the gym. Ho Su doesn't realize that the instructor is guessing about his abilities. The firefighter puts on special protective equipment and checks his gas mask. The firefighter moves around in huge protective suits and measures the hazardous substance with a specially designed instrument. The officer looks at the reading of the instrument and orders his team to set up the hazardous air fences. Two firefighters jump up and down shouting about the danger while their colleague uses red tape to fence off the danger zone. A strong stream of air along with water flows from the hole in the metal pipe. The firefighters surround the leak special hose and prepare an absorbent sub substance. The young firefighter watches the actions of his colleagues and prepares to run to their aid in case of a threat. The squad leader points Hosu to the breach and the hero tries to patch the hole in the hose which was formed due to high pressure. Hosu holds a special bandage and tries to find a place to get close to the hole. The hero's eyes light up with a blue glow and he uses his gift to find a way out of the situation. Du Jin stands outside the building in the rain, droplets enveloping his suit. Du Jin radios HQ and reports that the cleanup is complete and he and Yeren return to move the casualties. Yeren and Do Jin quickly run off in the direction of the factory and cross the red line. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin and Brigadier Chang You'll look at the guys running away from them with surprise in their eyes. Seo Li Gong's feet cross the yellow line at regular intervals, oblivious to the sergeant's words. Sergeant Kwang Yeol asks to step away from the yellow line and warns that there has been a leak of a dangerous substance. Sergeant Seo Li Gong takes a few steps again and recrosses the yellow line with his foot. Kwang Yeol once again reiterates to stand behind the line because it could be dangerous to move further. The sergeant's face is veined with anger as he is fed up with instructor Seo Li Gong's jokes. Sergeant Seo Li Gong smiles in response to Kwang Yol's words and continues to step his foot over the yellow line. Chief Officer Yoon Seo records the firefighter's progress during the exam and asks Sergeant Seo Li Gong to stop doing nonsense. 
Sergeant Kwang Yeol turns his head from side to side, looking at Instructor Seo Lee Gong and his squad. He hears Instructor Seo Lee Gong calling him over and turns his head in his direction. Sergeant So Lee Gong points out that the sergeant isn't controlling the scene properly, and Kwang Yeol asks the instructor to stop joking around. Seo Lee Gong looks at the sergeant with a smile on his face and continues to mock him. And so began the chemical accident training for the second week of the special squad dormitory. Sergeant Kwang Yeol turns his back to the instructors to keep an eye on his comrades, and he hears the instructor's resounding laughter from afar. Hosu finds a suitable spot and uses special equipment to shut off the water pressure. The young firefighter contacts his commander by radio and reports that the strapping is complete. Lance Sergeant Gun Jun and Brigadier Park Chang. They'll finish setting up the clearing tent and wait for their team to return. Yeren, along with Do Jin, carry the mannequins out of the building on a special medical stretcher. Instructor C.O. Lee Gun is distracted from his bullying of the sergeants by the words of a senior officer who calls out to him. Senior Officer Yoon Seo points out that there are enough instructors at the exam and asks why Seo Lee Gong decided to show up for it. He takes a few notes and points out that normally under such circumstances, Seo Lee Gong would prefer to loiter. Officer Yoon Seo silently looks at Instructor Seo Lee Gong and waits for him to respond. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong averts his gaze somewhere to the side and walks away from the officer. He needs his hands and says he's going to go take a walk around the exam area. The officer takes a few notes and asks the sergeant where exactly he's going to go. Seo Li Gong rests his hands on the back of his head and says with a confident smile on his face that he's going to go loitering. The candidates walk over to the information board and look at the results of the second week's exam. The blue plaque paints the results of the teams, and on the hazardous area control assessment, all the teams are in the same place. On the chemical spill containment drill, the fourth team comes in last place with a total of five points. On the cleanup of contamination and set up specifically, the fourth team comes first and scores 10 points. The instructors, along with the candidates, also approach the tables and familiarize themselves with the results. On the overall scoreboard, the fourth team is back in first place with a slight lead over the other teams. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong notices that the fourth team had the lowest score in the area where Ho Su was working. He takes a quick look at the rest of the results and disappears down the long hallway of the dormitory. The commander is going through the sheets with the exam results and the personnel files of the special squad candidates. All the instructors are present at the special squad meeting this time, and the commander announces the list of dropouts, which numbers three. Sergeant Hyun Seong is very upset that his group was disbanded and he thinks he is a bad instructor because of it. The senior officer assigns Sergeant Daegu and Sergeant Hyun Sung to watch over the second group together and asks Hyun Sung not to blame himself too much. Hyun Seong nods gratefully toward Yoon Siu, but the officer's words don't cheer up his mood one bit. The senior officer is surprised that Seo Lee Gan came to the meeting and watches what the instructor is doing. He sees that Sergeant So Lee Gong is making some notes in the cadet's personnel file. Sergeant So Lee Gong does not pay attention to those present and continues to make notes on his sheet. The personnel file in which So Lee Gong is relentlessly making notes belongs to Ho Su who has taken a strong interest in the sergeant. All the instructors listen attentively to their commander and take a few notes, while Sergeant So Lee Gong continues to study the young firefighter's file intently. The commander puts the papers in a single stack and announces the end of the discussion of the dropouts. The special squad commander is about to discuss the items for the third week, but is interrupted by a loud shout from the control room. A junior sergeant appears in the aisle and reports an emergency call for a special squad to Kanbu Bridge. The instructors jump up from their seats and listen attentively to the information from the junior sergeant. The commander, along with the instructors, abruptly run out of the meeting room and rush to their gear. As they move, the team commander orders the senior officer to urgently contact Commander Kim Ik Kwan. The loudspeakers in the candidate's dormitory announce a state of emergency due to the departure of the special squad. A voice from the speakers warns that the announcement of the dropouts and tracking items will be submitted in writing, and the candidates whisper among themselves. The fourth squad in its entirety sits in its room and listens to the alert from the speakers. A young firefighter sits on his bed and the message from the speakers gives him a slight shiver. The character abruptly jumps up from his seat, his eyes glowing a bright blue color which means that Hosu has seen the future again. Hosu jumps out of his room, rushing down the stairs to the exit of the dormitory building. 
He descends to the top floor and sees a special response team in full uniform running towards the fire truck in front of him. The young fireman stares intently at the backs of the fleeing instructors and does not know what he should do. Hosu is distracted from his thoughts by the loud voice of instructor Seo Li Gon, who calls out to him. Sergeant So Li Gong adjusts the sleeves of his clothing and asks the young firefighter what is bothering him. The young firefighter can't string two words together out of worry and says with a stammer that everything is fine. Seo Li Gong stares intently into Hosu's eyes and tells him with a serious expression that he can't stand jerks. The young firefighter looks at the sergeant with a scared expression on his face and waits for his words. Sergeant So Li Gong sleeves up his clothes once more and asks Ho Su not to think about such nonsense as behavior or consequences. Ho Su examines the sergeant's face with surprise, but tries not to look him directly in the eye. Instructor Seo Li Gon glares at the young firefighter and warns that if he notices Ho Su trying to hide his head in the sand, he will personally kick the hero out of the dormitory. The young firefighter didn't expect such fervor and speculation about the hero's abilities from his instructor. Sergeant Seo Li Gong says that he is scolded in the squad because of his special flair, but he is not kicked out of the squad. The instructor turns his back on Ho Su and heads for the exit of the dormitory building. A loud shout from a young firefighter stops Seo Li Gong. He turns to Ho Su and hears him warn him about the truck. Sergeant Seo Li Gong thanks the young firefighter for the warning. He turns around to exit the building and heads towards his team. The firefighters, along with the rescue team, pull the victim out of the wreckage of the truck and place him on a stretcher. The firefighter carefully navigates the roofs of the crumpled cars and tries to locate the accident victims. The squad leader contacts the other teams by radio and asks for caution in hospitalizing the injured. A huge number are standing on the bridge in a traffic jam due to a huge accident, and the rescue team along with a dedicated team of firefighters are trying to clear the road. The commander of the rescue operation meets with a group from the special firefighting team. He reports the situation on the bridge and warns about the poor visibility due to the fog. Senior Officer Yoon Seo stands nearby his team. He listens to the rescue report and inspects the broken cars. The commander of the special unit gives his team some orders and is about to move out to the scene of the accident. Chief Coordinator Yu. So Bin arrives at the scene. He greets the commander and assigns firefighters to points. Several feet of firefighters step in a friendly line. They carefully walk past the shards of glass and head towards the accident site. Major So Bin warns the special fire team that several vehicles have stacked up against each other, so this has made the rescue team's job much more difficult. The coordinator suggests using special rescue equipment to secure the area where the rescue will take place. Sergeant Seo Ligon notices the loud voices coming from the crash site and casts his gaze there. The fire department greets the special fire team and hurriedly leaves the accident site so as not to disturb the team from doing their work. The commander turns to his officers and asks them to bring the necessary equipment as soon as possible. Sergeant Seo Ligon doesn't pay attention to the orders. He looks around the scene and finds the vehicle the young firefighter warned him about. He sees a huge truck lying on the bridge, half hanging off the bridge. In Sergeant Seo Li Gun's mind, an image of Ho Su appears, asking him to be very careful with the oversized vehicle. The firefighters from the special squad take the rescue suitcases and return to the scene, where they see a panicked Seo Li Gong. Sergeant Seo Li Gong stands in front of his team and asks them to take their time, cold drops of sweat running down his face. The commander doesn't understand his sergeant's request at all, and senior officer Yoon Seo asks what the reason for Seo Li Gong's anxiety is. Sergeant Seo Li Gong very confusedly waves his hands in different directions and asks the team to work slower with a wide smile. Senior officer Yoon Seo looks with anger at his sergeant. He starts to boil and clenches his teeth tightly. Officer Yoon Seo can't stand Seo Li Gong's clowning and heads over to him. He asks with seriousness on his face not to joke around at the scene. It's not the first time the commander notices this behavior of the sergeant. He asks Seo Li Gong if his behavior is due to a premonition of danger. Seo Li Gong looks away and agrees with the commander's words. He says that he has become very anxious and asks the team to be careful. The sergeant's eyes dart from side to side as if they are searching the air for an answer to the commander's questions and stop at the command. Sergeant Seo Li Gong can't find the words to explain everything to his team. He swings his gaze between the senior officer and the huge truck. Senior officer Yoon Seo notices Seo Li Gong's strange confusion and asks what's wrong with him. 
The commander interrupts Yoon Seo and Seo Li Gong's conversation. He points out that they need to resolve the situation on the bridge as soon as possible to allow other vehicles to pass over the bridge. He gives a few orders and the firefighters pull out special equipment in their usual haste. The commander asks his sergeants to look around the scene and report the current situation. The team led by the commander move away from the truck and head towards their vehicle. Yoon Seo keeps a close eye on Seo Li Gong, who has stayed behind the squad and is standing as if he's standing still. Seo Li Gong goes over the possible dangers of the truck in his head, but none of them fit what he could see. A loud explosion sounds behind the sergeant and interrupts his thoughts about the truck. Bright flames of fire illuminate the faces of the crew who stare in amazement at the huge column of fire. The truck that the young firefighter warned about is completely engulfed in flames, and rescuers are checking the area for any casualties from the explosion. Sergeant Seo Lee Gon can't fully believe what has happened. He continues to stare toward the fire with his mouth open. Officer Yoon Seo looks at the sergeant's surprise and tries to understand how Seo Lee Gong guessed the danger of the truck. Seo Lee Gon doesn't guess at the suspicious look the officer directed at him and is only replaying in his head Ho Su's warning before the team left about the truck. The night sky is lit up by the light that comes from the windows of the dormitory where the candidates for the special unit reside. A sign hangs above one of the rooms where a lively conversation is taking place, a restroom. Hosu stands in the middle of the room and tells his friends that instructor C.O. Lee Gon was able to partially guess his ability to see the future and now calls him a shaman. Yaren and Dojin listen intently to the young firefighter, and they point out that Sergeant So Lee Gong is an extraordinary person even within his squad. The girl is very intimidated by the instructor's flair. She didn't expect someone to be able to determine Hosu's ability with a few deductions. Du Jin points out that Seo Li Gong has always shown himself to be special and is not at all surprised by his deductive abilities. He tells the story of the incident with So Li Gong, where at the central headquarters, the colonel decided to reprimand the sergeant. The colonel points his finger in the direction of Sergeant Seo Li Gong and blames him for the reckless actions of the rapid response team. Sergeant Seo Li Gong listens to the colonel's complaints about the work done without the slightest emotion on his face. He sneaks a large stack of documents that challenge the colonel's reprimand into the office and places them on the officer's desk. The officer in charge of disciplinary action spends several hours in a row reviewing the documents the sergeant has brought him. He tosses several sheets in different directions and clutches his head with loud shouts due to overwork from the sheer amount of incomprehensible information. The young firefighter and Yaren listen intently to the story about the instructor and are amazed at Seo Li Gong's peculiar methodology. The tall fireman points out that according to the sergeant's report, which he provided when reprimanded by the colonel, it appeared that all of Seo Li Gong's actions were perfectly calculated. Yaren suggests that the young firefighter's actions during the exam provided a perfect clue for Seo Li Gong's instructor. Ho Su is very fascinated by the stories about Sergeant Seo Li Gong and admires his deductive skills. He points out to his friends that Sergeant Seo Li Gong is on their side and can be trusted. Yeren and Dojin don't quite understand why Ho Su trusts the sergeant. They look at the hero warily and go over the young firefighter's nicknames that Seo Li Gong gave him. The image of So Li Gong pops up in the hero's mind, asking him not to think about the different consequences and to spill everything out. Hosu pulls his fist forward and says that now he won't hide on the sidelines and will show his best because Seo Li Gong has his back. Du Jin looks at the hero with a smile on his face. He agrees with the young firefighter's decision and hopes that this will be a fun adventure. The tall fireman brings his fist up to Hosu's fist and shrieks the phrase loudly, Black Du Jin. The young fireman looks at Do Jin with a bit of bewilderment and doesn't understand his battle cry. Dujin explains that everyone needs a hero name now and he's already called his own. Hosu goes through a few hero names out loud and the guys suggest that Aaron join in on the fun. The girl grabs her head and points out that the idea of handing out hero names to everyone is extremely delusional. She crosses her arms over her chest and says that there are only three of them so it won't work. Aaron turns around to the guys again when she hears Hosu's loud voice challenging her words. The young firefighter says that they already have four people on their team and asks the girl to join. Aaron clucks loudly but brings her hand to the center where Ho Su and Do Jin's fists are. Sergeant Kwang Yeol puts on his underwater suit, and the instructor watches the sergeant's actions closely. 
The disaster drill exam begins with the instructors closely watching the candidates' actions. A fireboat sails down the river, and on it several special squad candidates conduct a casualty search drill. Two firefighters walk along the shoreline and head towards a huge bridge. A firefighter hears a strange sound and turns toward the water to determine its source. He sees the waves lift the man's upper body and sway it slightly from side to side. The firefighter points to the mannequin and asks his friend to help pull that torso out of the water. The candidate is about to turn the body over to identify the victim, and his colleague suggests calling an instructor. The firefighter does not listen to his friend and grabs the blanket in which the body was wrapped. He pulls the cloth sharply towards him, and out of fear the firefighters jump several meters away. They calm down when they notice that underneath the cloth was just a large pile of debris. The firefighters hear their instructor's voice and are distracted from examining the pile of trash. Instructor Yoon Seo asks what the candidates found and asks them to join the other groups for further search. The commanders salute and take up the task of picking up the trash, while Chief Officer Yoon Seo heads further along the shoreline. The special group's exam is held at a special complex, in conjunction with the Tokchin Water Rescue Squad. The firefighters practice using water transportation and complete an obstacle course on the spacious river. A senior officer listens as his captain, Park Sai Huan, talks to the head of the water rescue center. The sergeants from the special squad are distracted from their work and listen to Commander Sai Huan's conversation as well. The head of the rescue department asks for the commander's help in finding a missing person and offers to conduct an examination at the rescue center. The sergeants discuss with the senior officer about the incident in which a young man jumped into the Toshin River and went missing. The special task force team is worried that the active search team will not be able to conduct the exam in the Tokyan River because of the active search team's actions. The commander and the head of the center discuss possible solutions to the problem of the exam location. Commander Park Sai Huan has an interesting idea and dials the center director again and offers to help his squad and candidates in the search for the missing man. As night falls outside, the team, led by the instructor, stands on the dock and discusses a plan. Instructor Seo Li Gong gives a brief briefing on the scene and asks the fourth team to be careful when working on the water. Du Jin, along with Sergeant Kwang Yol, speak in favor of patrolling the area at night and listen to the briefing from Sergeant Seo Li Gong. Sergeant Seo Li Gong notes that this situation is very different from the planned training, but the candidates will have to do it because the Special Rapid Response Squad has made an agreement with the Rescue Squad to search for a missing person together. Hosu and Yaren stand not far from their team, their gaze is also fixed on the instructor's voice. On the building of the Token Water Rescue Squad headquarters sway peacefully in the faint breeze, and only the voice of the fourth squad comes from far away, breaking any silence. Brigadier Chang Il, along with Lance Sergeant Gun Jin, listen to their instructor's predetermination that they will only patrol the shoreline. The instructor turns to his team and asks them to once again announce the purpose of the assignment, and the fourth squad loudly and accurately recounts the sergeant's instruction. Sergeant C.O. Li Gong examines each person in the squad with his swift gaze. He asks to be prepared for the possibility that the squad might encounter just a body, and Do Jin and Sergeant Kwang Yo look on calmly, as if they were prepared for such an outcome. Instructor Seo Li Gan asks the fourth team to give it their best this night. He wants to find the missing man tonight. The young firefighter agrees with his instructor's opinion, and in his head he thinks of several solutions to find the missing man. Sergeant Seo Li Gong's instruction is interrupted by a special squad member calling out to him. The officer from the special squad announces the commander's briefing and asks the sergeant to report inside the building immediately. The announcement of the briefing comes as a surprise to Seo Li Gong, and he looks at the sergeant with a bit of bewilderment. Sergeant Seo Li Gong takes another look at the fourth team. He is worried about their actions during the search because he won't be around. He urges the team to keep their ears open and lets them go on patrol, and rushes to the commander's briefing. Rescue Squad Commander Zhang Chil Huan stands with a pointer in his hand, waiting for everyone to gather for the briefing. Sergeant Seo Li Gan is the last to enter the briefing room and apologizes for his tardiness. Rescue Squad Commander Chil Huan stands by the information board and shows the points on the map where patrols will be conducted. Aaron writes down the information briefing the squad leader, and the officer looks at her notes carefully and is excited about the new generation of firefighters. 
Commander Chil Huan asks that those present pay special attention to the security cameras and report to Officer Choi Seol if any strange activity is detected. Sergeant Kwang Yol is standing near Dojin. He listens to the briefing and asks what is meant by the phrase, strange actions. The officer points to a large panel that consists of many numbers of small monitors and explains that the cameras may show suspicious people. Commander Chil Huan asks for reports of any strange things the 4th Squad might notice. Brigadier Chung. Il is a little confused by the information he's received, unlike rescue officer Gun Jin who seems used to this kind of situation. Kwang Yeol gets up from his seat and raises his hand to ask a question about the frequency of accidents on the river. He marvels at the fact that there are two three incidents every day involving strange actions of people in the neighborhood. Instructor Seo Lee Gan stands by the door and beckons the fourth squad to assign roles to them. He points to Do Jin and asks him to get busy checking the cameras that are located in the neighborhood. Yaren also joins in monitoring the surveillance cameras because there are too many monitors for one person. Brigadier Kwang Yeol, Gun Jin, and Chang Il gather into one team and go on a search along the river itself. Hosu watches the instructor carefully because he's the only one who didn't get assigned to the squad. Sergeant C.O. Lee Gun walks to the exit of the building with a slight hesitation and asks the young firefighter to poison with him to inspect the opposite side of the river. Yaren and Dojin remain in the building behind the security cameras and stare into the backs of their comrades walking away outside. They silently glance amongst themselves and look slightly wary of the fact that Hosu has gone along with C.O. Lee Gong. Along the curb of the shoreline, two smudged silhouettes walk smoothly, the bright LED lights of the bridge illuminating them in the semi-darkness of the night. Seo Li Gong walks ahead and surveys his surroundings, while the young firefighter trails behind him. Ho Su looks around, a huge number of thoughts running through his mind because he doesn't understand why the sergeant took him along. Sergeant Seo Li Gong sighs heavily and puffs up his chest as if he's going to scream. The young firefighter notices that his instructor has stopped and stares back at him incomprehensibly, waiting for something to happen. Instructor Seo Li Gong stands immovable with his cheeks full of air and waits for a moment. With a loud shout, he turns sharply at Ho Su and scares him so much that the hero jumps a few meters away from the sergeant. Seo Li Gong is overwhelmed with emotion and describes with admiration the car crash and truck explosion that Ho Su foresaw. He puts his arm around the hero's shoulders and says with a smile on his face that he is very happy to see them. Sergeant Seo Li Gan complains that they didn't have time to talk alone, so he took him along to search for the missing man. Instructor Seo Li Gan admires Hosu's ability and thanks the hero for his help. He points out that if the young firefighter hadn't alerted on the truck, there would have been no special response squad. Through loud laughter, he recounts senior officer Yoon Seo's emotions at the scene and laments that Ho Su didn't see Yoon Seo's surprise live. The young firefighter looks at his instructor with a bit of apprehension, intimidated by Seo Li Gong's non-stop laughter. The special squad sergeant suggests that Ho Su use his ability again to quickly find the missing person. Ho Su looks at his instructor confused. He doesn't understand this great attention to his person. Instructor Seo Li Gong insists that this job is perfect for the young firefighter and asks him to use his ability to quickly find the body. Sergeant Seo Li Gong moves slightly away from Ho Su and puts his hand to his ear, waiting for a clue from the hero. A loud crackle of the radio interrupts the conversation between the instructor and the young firefighter, so Li Gong jumps up on the spot in surprise and picks up the radio. The young firefighter and Sergeant Seo Li Gong listen to Brigadier Chang Il's report on the missing person. Three dark figures stand on the dock and shine flashlights toward the river to look for something. Chang Il picks up the walkie-talkie with trembling hands and asks the instructor to come over to him, his voice trembling, and his food manages to convey a clear meaning to his words. Hosu listens to the brigadier's words through the walkie-talkie and looks at his instructor expectantly for further orders. Sergeant Seo Li Gong is annoyed by Brigadier Chang Il's mumbling and stuttering, and asks him to announce the information over the walkie-talkie coolly. A rescue team in yellow vests works the scene, and instructor Seo Li Gan runs up to the fourth team along with Hosu. Brigadier Chang. He'll watch as the rescue team work in shock and doesn't notice the people running up to him. The young firefighter and sergeant cast a glance at the rescuers, and in the same second, fear covers their face. 
People gradually approach the scene and pandemonium near the shore, and a boat pulls up alongside the rescuers and drops off additional reinforcements on the shore. The rescuers discuss the situation among themselves, and a black silhouette watches them from the top of the bridge. A man in a blue sweatshirt is leaning on the railing with his hand and watching the rescuers work. He stands immovably, unnoticed by anyone else's eyes, and looks toward the rescue boat. The rescuers are very busy working and ask for an expert team to be called to the scene. The man removes his hand from the guard rail and slowly walks away along the bridge away from the scene. The special task force commander along with Sergeant Hyun Seong stand under the windows of the dormitory of the special task force candidates. Senior Officer Yoon Seo arranges a training session for the candidates and runs a lap around the dormitory stadium with them. The candidates in heavy firefighter uniforms run a few laps while the commander and his sergeant watch the practice. Sergeant Hyun Seong complains to the commander about the cold weather and folds his arms across his chest to warm up a bit. The sergeant points out to Commander Park Sai Wan that Senior Officer Yoon Seo is training the candidates with great diligence today. Park Sai Wan thinks that the senior officer's actions are due to the recent incident, which is why Yoon Seo is mapping out a new schedule for self development. Sergeant Hyun Seong is not satisfied with the commander's explanation and can't understand the sudden change in the senior officer's behavior. Commander Park Sewan says goodbye to his sergeant with a smile on his face, leaving Hyun Seong bewildered by the training. Senior Officer Yoon Seo continues to run with the candidates lap after lap. He pays no attention to his team's conversation. The senior officer's thoughts are all about the situation on the bridge when the truck explosion occurred. He recalls the huge explosion on the bridge, Yoon Seo along with his team standing immovable and looking at the huge flames that envelop Seo Lee Gong's back. Senior Officer Yoon Seo is very scared. He looks at Seo Lee Gong with the hope that the sergeant will explain the reason for his warning. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong stands with his mouth open in surprise, looking at the flames that are slowly devouring everything around him. Quickly, Seo Li Gong's face transforms into a terrifying smile, which shocks Staff Sergeant Yoon Seo. Without a shred of doubt, Sergeant Seo Li Gong rushes towards the incident and leaves his team behind. The firefighters are not running for the first lap. They are very tired and ask Instructor Yoon Seo to slow down a bit. Chief Officer Yoon Seo doesn't hear the voices of the firefighters trying to catch up with him and breaks the distance. He clenches his teeth tightly and remembers with resentment the smile C.O. Lee Gong went forward with during the bridge fire. Without the slightest hesitation, the senior officer's feet traverse meter after meter and do not allow the candidates to get even one centimeter closer to their instructor. The rescue team, along with squads of firefighters, occupy the Tokyon Water Rescue Squad building. Brigadier Chang Il sits in the waiting room and wraps his hands around his face because he was greatly shocked by the situation on the shore. Yeren enters the room with a mug of warm drink, and the fourth team tries to calm the brigadier down and support him. The girl approaches Brigadier Chang Il and holds out a mug of hot tea for him to come to his senses. In a quiet voice, Chang Il thanks Aaron for the drink and stares blankly inside the cup. Sergeant Kwang Yol tells Do Jin what happened during the patrol on the beach. The guys sit down around the brigadier and Chang Il gradually calms down and takes up drinking tea. Sergeant Kwang Yao says that the victim's face was in the silt, but he doesn't know all the details because Chang Il was the first to find the missing man. The guy's conversation is interrupted by a loud voice coming from behind the door to the restroom. The senior officer of the rescue team stands in the doorway and asks the fourth team to come into the office. Du Jin looks at the foreman with a bit of apprehension and then walks towards the exit of the room. He beckons the girl to follow him and asks the rest of the team to stay in the room and rest a bit. Sergeant Kwang Yeol realizes that his condition isn't the best, so he silently stares at Do Jin's departing back and doesn't decide to argue with him. After a mug of tea, Brigadier Chang Il feels a little better, and Aaron says goodbye to the guys and says he'll be back to them soon. The team looks at the video camera footage of a young man in a thick jacket walking along the bridge. The rescue team officer points to the monitor showing the man in the jacket and asks Yeren and Do Jin if they have seen him on the cameras before. Yeren and Do Jin confirm the officer's speculation and note that the man's actions were very suspicious. The monitor screen flashes several images of the man in the jacket, who stands on the bridge every night and looks toward the river. 
The boys familiarize themselves with the information from the lifeguard and try to figure out what this strange man was doing on the bridge at such a late hour. Outside the building, Sergeant Seo Li Gan and Hosu chat amongst themselves and discuss the man that Brigadier Chang Il recently found. Instructor Seo Li Gan makes the assumption that the missing person looked too strange and didn't look like the person they were looking for. Hosu confirms the instructor's guess and says that the person the rescue team found was missing much earlier. Sergeant Seo Li Gan briefly turns away from the young firefighter and stares at the river, pondering Hosu's words. He assumes that Hosu is being helped by shamans, so he folds his hands in prayer and makes a gesture of thanks towards the river. Sergeant Seo Li Gan turns to Hosu and says that they should wait for information from the expert team to take further action. The young firefighter listens to the sergeant's musings and agrees with So Li Gong's plan. The rescue team officer calls out to Ho Su and Seo Li Gong and asks them to come inside for a bit. Seo Li Gong's face takes on a noticeable smile, and he thanks Ho Su for the timely information. Sergeant Seo Li Gong lightly taps the young firefighter on the back and indicates with a hand gesture that they should go inside the building. The young firefighter is not used to So Li Gong's manners and remains in a stupor of surprise for a while. He quickly replay the sergeant's words in his head and boldly steps behind him inside the building. In the silence of the observation room, only the occasional sound of a computer mouse clicking can be heard. The rescue team officer, along with Yaren and Do Jin, shows Ho Su and So Li Gong some footage of the scene. The instructor casually opens a pack of chips and starts chewing them very loudly to the whole room. He scrutinizes the surveillance footage and his eyes fall on a suspicious man in a winter jacket. The officer tells the special squad sergeant that he has found some surveillance footage where the suspicious man appears. He points to several recordings in the middle of the monitor and points out that the suspicious male only appears during the rescue team's search efforts. The officer is unable to determine the identity of the strange man because of clothing that hides his face. He suggests that the instructor report the strange man to the police and asks for his opinion on the matter, while Seo Li Gong continues to devour chips as if nothing happened. The rescue squad officer turns his head toward the instructor and waits for Seo Li Gong's decision. Seo Li Gong pulls the chips out of the bag rather quickly and lightly rubs his hands together. He points to the hood of the strange man and expresses his suspicions that this man doesn't just come to the bridge for no reason. Sergeant Seo Li Gan licks his fingers from the chips and agrees with the officer to report the suspicious man to the police. He points to some surveillance footage and says that the strange man is bothering rescue efforts for some reason. Seo Li Gan is silent for a while. He's mulling over the information he's received, and chips crumbs are painted on his face. He walks closer to the rescue team officer's computer and flips through a few frames with his keyboard. Sergeant Seo Li Gan zooms in on one of the security camera footage. A creepy smile slips across his face and crumbs fall to the floor. He stops the frame on a suspicious man standing on the bridge, looking toward the rescue team. Sergeant Seo Li Gan moves a little closer to the monitor screen and concludes that the suspicious man may be involved in the missing people. The rescue boat is carried down the river with a loud siren, and a small trail of waves is left behind it. The rescue team approaches the bridge and contacts headquarters with a walkie-talkie. The rescue boat passes under the bridge and the rescuers spot the police department investigating the scene of a suspicious man standing. The officer looks at Seo Li Gong, who can't understand how the mysterious man was able to disappear so quickly. Sergeant Seo Li Gong contacts the police via walkie-talkie and asks for information regarding the suspect on the bridge. He doesn't wait for a response and scrutinizes the area for a place where the culprit could be hiding. Sergeant Seo Li Gan looks toward the shore and tries to spot a suspicious man. The police report that there is no suspicious movement on the bridge, and so Li Gong and the rescue squad officer continue to patrol the river. Seo Li Gong reports to the police unit that there is no suspicious activity on the riverside either. A suspicious man stands knee-deep in the water and heads towards the drainage channel. The man ducks his head slightly and walks into the gutter and moves in the darkness. He turns back to make sure no one is following him and continues his movement deep into the tunnel. The silhouette of the man in the blue jacket slowly heads inside the pipe and then disappears into the darkness of the tunnel. Hosu watches Seo Li Gong, who circles around the video cameras to track down the possible culprit. Sergeant Seo Li Gong convinces the rescue team officer that it's not worth bothering the police early.
Yaren and Dojin stand close to the surveillance camera monitors and prepare to speak as ordered by the instructor. Instructor Seo Li Gan continues to finish his pack of chips and talks about not being in a hurry and suggests that they trust the police to find the suspect. He says that each team should fulfill their role and asks the rescue team officer to take his time to make a decision. The officer contacts the police and reports the suspect, and Sergeant Seo Li Gan gives a brief briefing to his team. Du Jin and Yaren expect to be poisoned again for the search, but the instructor says the search is over for now. Hosu joins the guys. He's completely calm and trusts instructor Seo Li Gan's orders. The guys say goodbye to the instructor and head to the break room to take care of Brigadier Chang Il properly. Sergeant Seo Li Gong watches the guys for a while and stays in the observation room. He looks at the surveillance tapes, each one showing a suspicious man standing on the bridge. Seo Li Gan has almost finished the bag of chips and puts his hand fully into the bag to get the leftovers and doesn't take his gaze off the monitors. Rescue Brigade Officer Choi Seo looks towards Sergeant Seo Li Gong and doesn't understand why he decided to stay in the room. Seo Li Gan continues to study the security footage and asks the officer what happened to the missing person the rescue squads are looking for. Officer Choi Seo takes his eyes off the computer screen and tells Seo Li Gun that eyewitnesses saw the victim throw himself into the water, but the security cameras didn't show it. He thanks the special task force and the candidates for their work, because thanks to them, the center is a little calmer. An officer of the rescue squad is very tired from working at his computer and does a light exercise without getting up from his desk. Sergeant Seo Li Gan puts another piece of chips in his mouth and says that their work hasn't brought any relief to the center because they haven't found the missing person. A few rocks fly down and form small circles on the river when they hit the water. Sergeant Seo Li Gan sits on a small chair near the jetty and periodically throws rocks into the water. The instructor's mind drifts to the words of the rescue team officer regarding the suspicious man. Instructor Seo Li Gong tries to put all the information together and figure out why the man in the jacket was hanging around the rescue team's place of work. His hands automatically pick up a few rocks in his palm and throw them into the water without interrupting his train of thought. Sergeant Seo Li Gong is getting hot, so he takes off his jacket and sits on the chair again to continue throwing rocks into the water. One by one, the stones fly out of his hands and land on the hard surface of the water, leaving behind circles of different sizes. Sergeant Seo Li Gong gets up from his chair and tries to throw the stones as far down the river as possible. He launches another stone, and the thought occurs to him that the suspicious man was standing on the bridge with a clear purpose and could not have known who the rescue team had found. The stone bounces along the water surface as does the endless stream of thoughts that Seo Li Gan runs through his head. The thrown stone bounces back a few times, and in Seo Li Gong's mind, he wonders why the suspect came to the bridge again when the rescue team had already found the body. Seo Li Gong gets tired of throwing rocks into the water and decides to walk along the fence of the building. Suddenly, the sergeant stops and stares intently at the large circle that one of his stones has left. The sergeant of the special fire department looks at the bridge and assumes that the suspicious man knows exactly where the crime scene is, and that's why he keeps coming to watch the rescuers. Seo Li Gan realizes that the only person who can tell the exact location of the victim is the person who threw him into the water. Sergeant Seo Li Gan holds onto the railing of the guardrail and turns around to hear Officer Choi Seal's voice. The rescue team officer runs to the instructor and reports that the police have located the suspect. The police discover the male suspect on the bridge and run after him to catch him. Without the slightest shadow of doubt, the man climbs over the railing and jumps off the bridge into the water so that the police cannot capture him. Kwang Yol and the fourth team are greatly surprised when an officer informs them that a suspicious man has jumped off the bridge. Yaren is angry that the police were unable to catch the culprit and hopes to catch up with him in time to catch him on a hot trail. Instructor Seo Li Gong puts on a life jacket and asks the fourth team to radio for the criminal if he appears on the cameras, while the rescue team officer prepared the boat to leave. Sergeant Seo Li Gong's eyes narrow in surprise and quickly looks over to the fourth squad once more. The fourth squad and Sergeant Seo Li Gong notice that Ho Su is not with them and try to find him at the dock. Water falls in small drops onto the suspect's blue hood and drips down all over his clothes. The suspicious man stands near the tunnel entrance and looks around for his pursuers. He carefully peeks out from behind the tunnel and notices that no one else is following him. 
A man in a wet blue jacket emerges from his hiding place and tries to climb up through the grass. He grasps the grass with his wet hands and gradually climbs up, but his hand slips and he flies down. The man's arm is grabbed by someone's hand that came out of nowhere and pulls the man's body up. Drops of sweat mixed with water run down the man's face. He looks up and tries to see the man who saved him. He sees a young fireman kneeling in front of him and lifting the man's body onto the road. The man opens his mouth wide in surprise when he sees the young fireman in front of him and can't say anything. Hosu's eyes glow with a blue glow in the darkness. A small plaque with his name on it is painted on the young fireman's left chest, and he slowly lifts the man the rescue team has been looking for all this time. The man looks at Hosu, who he didn't expect to be here, and then quickly rips his hand out of the young fireman's palm. With ridiculous screams, the man climbs onto the road and runs as fast as he can away from the young firefighter. The injured man hears foot stomping coming from the direction of his back and looks back. He sees another firefighter whizzing by Hosu's back and rushes toward him. Squad 4 is standing on the dock of the rescue squad building, waiting for the boat that will soon arrive at their location. Sergeant Kwong Yol stands in the middle of his team with a look of bewilderment and asks the guys what's going on. Brigadier Chang Il, along with Staff Sergeant Gun Jin, run to the observation room to review the surveillance footage. Yeren, Do Jin, and Kwong Yol remain standing on the dock, silently watching their fleeing comrades. In the pocket of Aaron's jacket, her phone begins to vibrate, which is slightly peeking out of the pocket of her clothes. Yaren pulls the phone out of her pocket and reads a message from a young firefighter with a little instruction. The girl realizes that she can't help Hosu alone and searches for the tall fireman with her eyes. Du Jin was prepared for such a situation and looks at Aaron waiting for clear instructions. Sergeant Kwang Yol runs into the observation room with a shout, he asks the brigadier and the junior sergeant to check the cameras on the side of the drain. Kwang Yeol explains to Brigadier Chang Il that Ho Su has detected a suspicious person on the side of the sewage pipe. Du Jin and Yaren stand outside the building and listen to the concerned shouts of their crew checking the security cameras. The tall fireman turns his head to Aaron and asks her to tell him what exactly she got in the message from Ho Su. Without the slightest hesitation, Aaron opens the young firefighter's message and shows her phone screen to Du Jin. Du Jin reads Hosu's message carefully and asks her to hurry up, and the girl tucks her phone away in her jacket pocket. The tall fireman and Yaren see Hosu's message on the phone screen, which spells out clear instructions on what needs to be done to find the missing man. The suspicious man tries to run away from his pursuer, but the firefighter's quick feet gradually catch up with him. He keeps turning around while running and can't believe that he's about to be caught soon. Yaren runs after the suspect rather quickly and yells in the man's direction to run slower. The girl gradually catches up with the strange man and breathes directly into the back of his head while the man continues to look around. Sweat runs profusely down the man's face and his guilt runs down his cheeks. He tries to break away from the firewoman, but he lacks the strength. He runs into the park and makes a sharp left turn hoping the girl will lose sight of him and not be able to pursue him further. The man sees restrooms in front of him and thinks to hide in one of them until things quiet down. With the help of surveillance cameras, the remaining guys from the fourth team in the building notice the man and Brigadier Choi Il radio Do Jin with information about the suspect's whereabouts. Do Jin listens to the information from his friends on the radio and prepares to capture the strange man. Brigadier Choi... Il runs a report when the suspect is at the spot where Du Jin is standing. The man doesn't suspect that the firefighters have prepared a trap for him and continues running towards the toilet stalls. The suspect climbs up a small ladder and tries to catch his breath a bit after running. He grabs the handle of the toilet stall door with his left hand to open it and hide inside. The suspicious man steps inside the stall and doesn't notice Du Jin, who has been inside the whole time waiting for him. He turns his gaze forward and freezes in surprise when he sees a tall fireman in front of him. Du Jin pushes the suspicious man with the palm of his hand, and the suspect flies off the door and falls to the floor. The tall fireman watches with a nonchalant expression as the man falls to the floor like a sack of potatoes. Ho Su and Yaren get to where Do Jin is and run towards the man in the blue jacket. The man can't contain his emotions and asks the guys in a panicked scream, Who are they and what are they doing here? Hosu, Yaren, and Do Jin lean over the fallen man and say in a calm voice that they are firefighters who are training here. The suspicious man continues to sit still without moving, 
He can't believe he was able to be caught by such young guys who happen to be firefighters. The dormitory buildings of the Special Rescue Squad candidates are illuminated by bright rays of sunlight. The firefighters approach the information board and read the information regarding the place and time of the disaster and missing persons training exam. The candidates grab their heads when they realize that the exam will be very soon along with the training and they will have no time to rest. They discuss among themselves about the tests that will be conducted during the exam and rejoice that there will be no more night calls due to which they had trouble sleeping. A sign that reads dormitory hangs above the fourth team's room from where there is not the slightest sound. Sergeant Kwong Yol snores loudly and can't hear the other teams discussing his team not taking the next exam due to their actions in catching the fugitive. Brigadier Chang. He also can't hear the voices of envy coming from the other dorm rooms from behind his temple. The fourth team is very tired after their night duty in the rescue team and sleeps without a backward thought. The instructors from the special team, along with the commander, are gathered in the briefing room and discuss the situation that happened to the fourth team during the night. Commander Sai Huan reads the rescue team's report on the identity of the missing man from which he learns that the suspicious man was harboring debts, so he was hiding from relatives and authorities. Sergeant Seo Li Gan notes that the man was constantly watching the rescue team's actions on the bridge to see for himself if the search for him would be stopped. Commander Sai Huan thanks the sergeant for the report and the work done. He's glad that his squad and candidates were able to help the rescue team. He looks toward his remaining two sergeants and warns them that the Tochan Water Rescue Squad will assist the candidates' training in every way possible and asks them to prepare their teams properly. The special squad commander turns his gaze toward Seo Li Gong and tells him that his team is exempted from the exam for their actions. The instructors of the other teams envy Seo Li Gong because he and the fourth team will have plenty of time to rest. Sergeant Seo Li Gong thanks his captain and says that he will do physical training for his team so they won't slack off. Across from the commander at the assembly table sits a low-key human figure who notes the special level of candidates for the special response squad. Chief Coordinator Yu, So Bin drinks his tea and suggests raising the requirements to pass the special exam. The instructor gives the firefighting teams a special training on how to act during a natural disaster and search for missing persons. The candidates for the special squad practice using special scuba equipment and dive underwater in special gear. They break into several teams and on the instructor's command, search the water for special dummies. The instructor approaches the firefighter and checks how well and correctly the oxygen tanks are mounted on the suit. An instructor from the special fire department puts on special vests and prepares the boats for the practical training. Senior officer Yoon Seo tells his sergeant that their team should set a proper example of how to operate the motorboats. Sergeant Hyun Sung complains aloud that thanks to the 4th Squad's work, Instructor Su Li Gong can rest easy. Senior Officer Yoon Seo disagrees with Sergeant Hyun Seong's opinion and points out that Commander Se Huan gave a special assignment to Su Li Gong. The sergeant confirms the officer's words and says that he saw the huge report on the training plan for the fourth team that Seo Li Gong brought to the commander's office. Sergeant Hyun Sung and Officer Yoon Seo look toward their colleague with a little curiosity and ask him what exactly was in Seo Li Gong's training plan. The sergeant only notes that the fourth team's training will be about developing thinking skills, and that's all he's been able to find out. The senior officer expresses his assumption that the thinking skills training sounds very useful and hopes that Seo Li Gong won't engage in nonsense in the absence of the others. Sergeant Hyun Sung lazily raises his head towards the officer and says that he is very tired from this training. Small clouds quickly float across the sky above the dormitory of the special firefighter squad, where only the fourth team, led by instructor Seo Li Gong, remains. The tall firefighter is sitting on his bed, he has his head bowed down and is holding his hands in his lap. The rest of the fourth team are sitting on their beds and doing the same as Du Jin. The fourth team is playing mafia with the instructor, and its lead Ho Su stands in the middle of the room and watches the game. The young firefighter claps his hands and asks the mafia to raise their heads to get to know each other. Kwang Yeo looks up and looks at the other mafia member with a startled expression. Instructor Seo Li Gong also opens his eyes and looks at his fellow player with a smile on his face. Sergeant Kwang Yeol leans forward slightly in surprise that he will be playing on the same team as Seo Li Gong. The sergeant's face contorts in a grimace of incomprehension, his mouth opening in surprise and exposing sharp teeth. 
Instructor CO Li Gong looks at Kuang Yo with his trademark awful smile and anticipates a great game. Ho Su announces that he's starting the day and asks the guys to share their guesses as to who might be the mafia. The guys silently glance amongst themselves and Kuang Yo tries not to arouse too much suspicion. The instructor leans his body slightly forward and announces with a smile on his face that Kuang Yo is the mafia. Sergeant Kuang Yo looks at Seo Li Gong with great surprise and can't understand why the instructor is playing against him even though they are on the same team. Du Jin agrees with the instructor's opinion and thinks that Sergeant Kuang Yo looks like the real mafia. The sergeant swears very loudly at the premature statements and asks Brigadier Chang Il to back him up. Ho Su shuts down the guy's discussions and asks for votes for or against Sergeant Kuang Yul. Five of the six participants in the peace vote vote that Sergeant Kuang Yeol is the mafia. Sergeant Kuang Yeol gets up from his seat and asks Ho Su in a loud voice why the moderator moved so quickly to vote, and the young firefighter claps his hands with a smile on his face and announces that Kuang Yeol was indeed the mafia. Everyone nods happily because there's only one mafia left and prepares for another round of the game. Hosu claps his hands and asks everyone to close their eyes for the mafia to make their move, and Kuang Yeol stands beside him and grits his teeth in anger. The young fireman makes another clap and announces that it's morning so the contestants can raise their heads. Brigadier Chong Il is surprised when Ho Su announces to him that he was targeted by the mob during the night. Instructor Seo Li Gan shouts in the departing brigadier's back that he'll be sure to get revenge and find the culprit. Brigadier Chang. Il nods towards Instructor Seo Li Gong. He presses his hand to his heart and his face spreads into a grateful smile. Sergeant Kuang Yeol gingerly looks towards Brigadier Chang Il. He realizes that if the truth about Seo Li Gong could shock the brigadier. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin starts the day's discussion and talks about knowing who the latest mafia is. The guys stare intently at the lifeguard, and Sergeant Seo Li Gong starts fidgeting in his seat and gets a little worried. The junior sergeant asks Instructor Seo Li Gong how he was able to survive last night and escape the mob. Sergeant Seo Li Gong didn't expect to be reached so quickly and decides to listen carefully to Gong Jin's words. The junior sergeant notes that Seo Li Gong has great intuition, and so the mafia must have dealt with him that night. Instructor Seo Li Gong and Gun Jin look at each other with a smile on their faces and sit in anticipation of the discussion around them. Ho Su, along with the eliminated guys, are carefully watching the battle that has broken out between the two contestants. Sergeant Seo Li Gong lightly scratches his beard and waits for Gong Jin to finish his speech against him. He realizes one thumbs up and notes that no one will get rid of him in the first round of the game, or else the game will become uninteresting. Gun Jin becomes a little nervous. A casual smile flies off his face, and he worries that he might be wrong about the instructor. Sergeant Seo Li Gan continues to push his idea that he is a civilian, and notes that after what the junior sergeant says, a civilian might die during the vote. Du Jin sits not far from the instructor and keeps his eyes on him during the entire conversation between the guys. Yaren looks at both the instructor and the junior sergeant and doesn't know which side she should take. Seo Li Gan looks around the room with a creepy smile, then turns his gaze to Gong Jin and hangs his arm down, waiting for him to say something. Ho Su, along with the eliminated, pull out popcorn from nowhere and continue to silently watch the argument unfold. Seo Li Gong looks directly into the eyes of the junior sergeant and hopes not to be revealed. Gong Jin suggests another way to resolve their conflict and says that it's okay not to vote at all today. The junior sergeant points out that their vote involves three townspeople and one mafia, and there is a 25% chance of finding the mafia. The instructor is very interested in the Lance Sergeant's musing and leans forward a little, and Aaron passes some popcorn over his back to do gin. The girl pops the popcorn in her mouth and listens to the junior sergeant's suggestion to vote in the next round when there's a better chance of finding the mafia. Sergeant Seo Li Gong tries to focus on the information from Gun Jin and ponders how he can do the right thing in this situation. Gong Jin continues to insist that his plan is a good decision for a good citizen. Sergeant Seo Li Gan closes his eyes and runs through several scenarios in his head. Sergeant Kwang Yo and Brigadier Chang Il are eating popcorn and discussing the plan that Gong Jin proposed at the afternoon meeting. Gun Jin's gaze is fixed on Seo Li Gong, just as the instructor begins to parry the junior sergeant's words. Instructor So Li Gong accuses the junior sergeant with a slight smile on his face and declares that all his words are just acting. 
Junior Sergeant Gun Jin is a little shocked by Seo Li Gong's words, but he continues to smile in his face and listens to the accusations against him. Gun Jin continues to bend his line and points out that his offer isn't favorable to the mafia at all, so he's definitely a peaceful man. Hosu does another clap of his hands and announces to the guys that the voting for the meeting has begun. Gun Jin refuses the vote and notes that it doesn't make sense for the peaceful ones, and his decision is supported by Aaron. Seo Li Gun is silent, and Du Jin says without a drop of emotion on his face that he'll skip this round of vote. The young firefighter asks everyone to close their eyes, and the mafia makes another move and points for the victim, who is eliminated from the game. Seo Li Gong gets up from his seat and shows the host with a creepy grimace about taking out Staff Sergeant Gun Jin. Brigadier Chang. Il gets upset that Seo Li Gong turned out to be mafia, and Kuang Yol covers his face with his hand because of the stupidity of the instructor's decision. The young firefighter announces a new day and designates Gun Jin out of the meeting because of the mafia's actions last night. Yaren and Do Jin stare intently at Seo Li Gong, who covers his face with his hand due to realizing the stupidity of his decision. The girl and the tall fireman exchange glances with each other and raise their hands against instructor Seo Li Gong while voting. The peaceful ones celebrate their victory because Seo Li Gong was the last mafia in the game, and the peaceful ones won. Kuang Yeol walks towards the instructor with anger in his eyes and asks Seo Li Gong why he played against him from the beginning. Yaren and Brigadier Chang Il approach the junior sergeant and praise him for his ingenuity in playing against the instructor. A new round of the game begins. Du Jin tries to cover his eyes with his hand to avoid drawing attention to himself, and Seo Li Gong stares intently at Kuang Yol. Instructor Seo Li Gong abruptly jumps up from his seat and points his finger at the sergeant, accusing him of being a mafia. Sergeant Kuang Yeol doesn't understand why So Li Gong is opposing him again. He points out Do Jin's strange behavior and asks him to take a closer look at him. Do Jin is bleeding profusely with sweat. You can see from his face that he's very worried about being suspected by the other guys. Kuang Yeol puts his hand over his heart and asks not to be chosen at the vote, even though he realizes that Seo Li Gun is having a lot of fun with the idea. The junior sergeant looks at Kuang Yol with a smile as he makes excuses for the guys and looks for support in Gun Jin's face. Gong Jin immediately averts his gaze and pretends that he has nothing to do with the sergeant and is not going to defend him. Kuang Yol's jaw drops slightly in surprise. He is very surprised that even the junior sergeant doesn't want to support him. Sergeant Kuang Yol jumps up from his seat again and brings Gun Jin's past reflections as proof of his non-involvement, he asks for Do Jin to be kicked out because of his very suspicious behavior. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin agrees with the sergeant's opinion, but for the sake of general hilarity, he wants to kick out Kuang Yol specifically. The sergeant turns to the others and points his finger in Gun Jin's direction, declaring him the second mafia in the game, but no one listens to him. During the afternoon vote, surprisingly for Kuang Yol, all the contestants vote to remove him from the game. Kuang Yeol, annoyed by what happened, slowly walks to the corner of the room while the young fireman announces that the sergeant was a civilian. Game night arrives and Du Jin and his accomplice pick a new target among the civilians. Gung Jin turns out to be the target of the mob and with a smile on his face he says goodbye to the guys and is eliminated from the game. Sergeant Kuang Yeol is happy that the mafia has targeted the junior sergeant and gloats over Gun Jin, who goes in his direction. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin isn't at all worried about being eliminated from the game and is still confident that he should have kicked Kuang Yeol out in the first round for the sake of overall fun. Du Jin jumps up in his seat in surprise when instructor Seo Li Gong points his finger at him and suggests voting against him. The remaining members unanimously vote against Do Jin and he heads to the eliminated guys while Ho Su announces that the tall firefighter was mafia. Brigadier Chang. It looks at the faces of the cheering guys with a smile and is happy that the game was very fun and memorable for all the participants. The foreman clenches his hand tightly in his fist. He doesn't want to fall behind and plans to give his best in this game. Chang Il is distracted from his thoughts of winning as soon as he hears Aaron's voice and realizes his confused look at the girl standing there. Aaron declares that she will target Chang Il at night and talks about how the mafia wins either way. Du Jin proudly realizes his head, and Sergeant Kuang Yol gets angry and tells the tall firefighter that his team's victory is a credit to Yurin. 
A new round of play begins with Kwong Yil yelling across the room, asking them to stop killing him at the start of every game. Brigadier Chang. He looks at the guys having fun and sighs heavily, realizing he can't compete with the youngsters. Instructor Seo Li Gan rises from his seat and leans on the young firefighter's shoulders. He raises his gaze to the fourth team and asks them to gather because from the start of the next game, the losers will have to run a few laps around the stadium. The guys from the fourth team look at their instructor with surprise. They couldn't have guessed that the physical training would go like this. Seo Li Gong tucks his hands into his pockets and explains that the commander ordered the physical training and he can't do without this extra rule in the game. The instructor's eyes widen slightly, and his trademark terrifying smile appears on his face, and he announces to the boys that he will be the game's host in place of Ho Su. Several feet move after each other at an accelerated pace, raising columns of smoke and sand behind them. Instructor Seo Ligon watches as the losing team winds laps around the dormitory stadium. Sergeant Kwang Yewol and Lance Sergeant Gun Jin watch the losers from the dormitory window and shout mocking slogans. Yeren, Hosu, Dojin, and Brigadier Chang. Ill are among the townspeople who lost, so they are forced to run several laps around the stadium. Yeren really dislikes the guy's bullying and shouts toward the open window that as soon as she finishes running, she'll get to her abusers. Seo Li Gong watches the workout and envisions his game as baited and the guy's as a fish that happily takes his bait. The instructor believes that physical training is just a small maneuver to encourage the squad to work as a team and get out of crisis situations. Brigadier Chang, who can't get used to the skills of the other squad members and is constantly left goofing off. Lance Sergeant Gun Jin and Sergeant Kwang Yo win again and rejoice in their next victory together. Instructor Seo Li Gong watches Ho Su's actions closely during the game and hopes that the young firefighter understands his intentions. The young firefighter runs another lap because of losing. He can use his gift during the game, but can't convince the other players of the truth of his words. Hosu runs another lap and ponders how he can best act when the facts he knows are useless to his surroundings. Instructor Seo Lee Gan watches the young firefighter go through his punishment and pulls some gum out of his pocket to brighten his weight. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong turns his back to the running boys and heads toward the entrance of the dormitory building. He inflates a small balloon with the gum and contemplates how Ho Su can solve his problem. The instructor turns toward the guys running the last lap and hopes the team will help the young firefighter with his problem. A bright sunset illuminates the dormitory building of the special fire department. The sun has long since hidden behind the front of the building. In the central office of the special fire brigade, there are only two officers who are carefully going through the paperwork. Sergeant Hyun Seong runs into the office and interrupts the silence in the room with his loud shout. He walks over to Instructor C.O. Lee Gun's desk and asks about the mafia game in the fourth group. Senior Officer Do Yoon listens intently to his sergeant's conversation after the words about the mafia game. Hyun Sung notices Do Yoon's concerned look and explains that Instructor C.O. Lee Gong was conducting a special physical training session for Squad 4. He returns to C.O. Lee Gong's desk and, in a slightly quieter voice, continues to ask the sergeant about his special training session, after which the entire group was very exhausted. The senior officer guesses that Sergeant Seo Li Gong has been playing mafia with Team 4 all his free time, and he gets angry at his subordinate's unresponsive attitude. The fourth team is in full rest in their room from where not the slightest sound comes from. Yaren puts a towel on her head after showering and accepts a glass of water from Sergeant Kwang Yol. Sergeant Kwang Yol resents the excessive physical training that Seo Li Gong pulled off and points out that even Aaron could barely stand it. Du Jin lies unmoving on his bed. He covers his eyes with his hand and notes that since Kwang Yol has the strength to talk, have the sergeant go to the store and buy food for the whole team. Sergeant Kwang Yol clucks loudly and puts his hands in his pockets and heads for the exit of the room while the junior sergeant looks worriedly at his back. Kwang Yeol notices Gun Jin's concerned look and says he'll go to the store to get food for the whole team. Brigadier Chang. He'll also heads toward the room's exit so he can talk to his wife quietly on the phone and not disturb his team. Ho Su tries to catch his breath after a hard workout and sits on the bed, but he hears Aaron's heavy footsteps and raises his gaze to the girl. In the fourth squad's room, only Ho Su, Do Jin, and Aaron are left, who is very concerned about the hero's actions during the mafia game. 
The girl comes as close as she can to Hosu and asks him why he didn't use his power, but was talking complete nonsense. Du Jin hears Eren's claim and slowly gets up from his seat because he's also curious about Ho Su's strange behavior. Yaren doesn't understand at all why Ho Su, when he was a townie, just followed others even though he had a gift with him. The young firefighter explains that instructor C.O. Lee Gan used the game to find out who else knew about his ability from the fourth team. A faint light from the room door and the sounds of footsteps come from the storage room. Instructor Seo Li Gong sits in a comfortable pose and taps his finger on his knee to the beat of a tune in his head. Sergeant Seo Li Gong concludes that the young firefighter has figured out his scheme and marvels at how cleverly Hosu was able to fool him during the Mafia game. Sergeant Hyun Seong studies the results of the firefighter's water fitness exam with surprise on his face. The instructors from the special firefighter squad are sitting in a general meeting, and a senior officer notices Hyun Seong's concern and asks what's wrong. Instructor Hyun Seong goes through some papers with the exam results and notes that a lot of candidates for the special squad dropped out this time. Senior Officer Do Yoon points out that everyone has a physical fitness overhaul and that the exam was about the specifics of working in the rescue squad. The sergeant notes that the only candidates left were those who could show a solid base of training. Instructor Hyun Sung agrees with his colleagues, but notes that other teams will be thinking about the unfairness of exempting the fourth group from passing the exam after a tough exam. Sergeant Seo Li Gan wags his pen from side to side and points out that the fourth group would have no problem handling this exam as well as the others. The instructors from the other group stop poring over the papers and fix their gazes on Seo Li Gong. Sergeant Seo Li Gong pokes at a few pages of his team's personnel files and notes that the fourth group has been special from the beginning. The instructors take a quick glance at the personnel files of the fourth group candidates and continue to listen to Seo Li Gong's explanation. Seo Li Gong waits for his colleagues to look over the candidate's files before pointing his finger at senior officer Do Yoon, who didn't take his eyes off the sergeant for a moment. Instructor Seo Li Gong notes that Do Yoon specifically recruited gifted candidates for the fourth team to show everyone else how special a firefighting team can be. The special squad leader doesn't interfere with the sergeant's reasoning, and like the senior officer, listens silently. Sergeant Seo Li Gong admires Do Yoon's actions and points out that the senior officer's approach has helped other groups develop their qualities much faster. Instructor Hyun Sung disagrees with Seo Li Gong's position and believes that this method of distribution led to the firefighters starting to give up. The instructor, amidst his team's conversations, recalls a situation that unfolded in his subordinate squad room. He witnessed a conversation between candidates who were discussing the high scores of the fourth team and promised that they would definitely outscore that team. The instructor of the second team was very happy to hear that the candidates did not give up, but even on the contrary, they put their best efforts to overcome the obstacle. The instructors continue to listen to C.O. Lee Gong's explanation. They are surprised that the senior officer was able to carefully plan out a study plan for the entire exam. Instructor Seo Li Gong can't stop admiring the senior officer and says that from the beginning, the fourth group was the criterion for passing the special unit. Senior Officer Do Yoon looks at Sergeant Seo Li Gong's enthusiastic face without the slightest emotion. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin gives a lecture to the candidates on the topic of building collapse and rescuing victims in the rubble. The firefighters are whispering among themselves about the coordinator, who they are seeing live for the first time and are surprised that Yu So Bin is quite young for his position. Coordinator Yu. So Bin coughs lightly to draw the candidates' attention to the lecture and ask them to stop further conversation during class. He makes a few marks on the blackboard with chalk and notes that each person will have to befriend the assigned rescue dog. Hosu listens to the lecturer's explanation with surprise. The young firefighter has never worked with a rescue dog before, and hearing this is new to him. During the lecture, the subject of signaling equipment comes up, and Sergeant Kwang Yeol is greatly inspired that he will once again have to work with the equipment he grew to love so much during his time at the academy. The fourth team listens to the lecturer and gradually assigns tasks to each other to perform during the exam. The instructors take notes of the lectures too, so that they can intelligently assign roles in their squads to the candidates. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin emphasizes during the lecture on the candidates' diligent fulfillment of their roles and asks them to focus on rescue during the exam. Ho Su and Brigadier Chang, 
They'll make some notes in their notebooks and prepare questions for the lecturer. Yu So Bin brings the lecture to a close and notes that the fourth week will be the final week to determine the participants who are worthy of passing the special unit. The candidates are very tired from the lecture and hard training. The firefighters are literally sleeping in their seats, but the sudden loud voice of the coordinator makes them wake up. Yu So Bin walks a little closer to the desks where the candidates are sitting and warns them that the training may go early or it may drag on for weeks. Yaren and Ho Su are surprised by this turn of events. They are used to every training and exam having a clear algorithm and timing. Coordinator Yu Su Bin points out that there are so many variables that can't be influenced and therefore asks for patience. Aaron pondered over which specific variables the head coordinator was talking about, her face covered in a light sweat of excitement. The coordinators from the special squad are focused on filling out paperwork and making notes in their notebooks. They understand more than anyone the importance of the last week's exam. A firefighter holds tightly to the leash of a dog that is barking at something and trying to break free from the candidate's grasp. The rescue dog breaks free from the firefighter's tight grip and rushes after its target, ignoring the words of its master. Lance Sergeant Gong Jin has no problem with the rescue dog. He strokes the dog's back and secures special equipment on it. The second squad instructor explains to the candidates how to operate the special rescue equipment. Sergeant Kwang Yeol is excited to work with the equipment. He stands in front of the other candidates and listens attentively to the instructor's explanation of how to use the search equipment. Du Jin along with Brigadier Chang. He'll have been assigned to the team in charge of the drill. They stand close to the instructor and watch him work. Senior Officer Do Yoon shows them how to operate the drill by example and explains the basics of operating the rig in a loud voice. The tall firefighter doesn't quite understand what the rig is for and wonders why he can't do the same thing with his bare hands. Instructor Hyun Song quickly drives nails into a wooden frame with a fire hammer, demonstrating to his group how to work with the materials. He explains how wooden frames can be used to create temporary support for a building during a rescue operation. Hosu and Yaren carefully record the instructor's explanations for stabilizing a collapsing building and moving heavy objects. Yaren climbs up and tries to measure the height of the building with a measuring ruler, while a young firefighter stands below for backup. The girl stumbles and drops the ruler down. Hosu tells her not to worry and picks it up. The young fireman stares intently at Yaren. He is a little concerned about the girl's absent mindedness during training. Yaren drives a few nails in a wooden frame while Hosu sits next to her and waits for her turn. The hero abruptly jumps up from his seat and stops another hammer blow on a nail in the wooden frame. The girl looks absent-mindedly at Hosu and doesn't understand why the young fireman stopped her while she was working. Hosu looks at Yeren for a while and warns the girl that if she continues like this, she will stab herself in the fingers. Yeren takes a seat nearby on a nearby piece of wood and asks Hosu to finish her work because she can't concentrate. The light sound of opening a soda can held by the woman's hands reverberates throughout the street. Yaren and Ho Su decide to take a little break. They bought a can of soda each and settled down outside the dorm building. The girl looks very depressed. She lowers her gaze to her feet and tries to explain to the young fireman the reason for her anxiety. The girl's thin hands clutch tightly the soda can, which is peacefully resting on her lap and standing motionless. Yaren explains that all her thoughts during the rescue training in the collapsed building are on Wan Ho. The young firefighter looks at Aaron understandingly. He has been through it himself and knows how hard it is for the girl. As they sit on a concrete bench and watch the other squad work, Aaron thanks Hosu for his help with the nailing. Yaren is surprised by the hero's reaction and asks how often Hosu looks into the future with his ability. The young firefighter looks at the girl, then turns his gaze to the working firefighters and says that after Wang Ho leaves, he always looks into the future. The girl didn't expect such words from Ho Su. The hero's answer shocked her a lot, and she doesn't say another word. Ho Su says that before Wang Ho left, he let himself relax and fall asleep. So he promises himself and Aaron that it won't happen to anyone else. In the large meeting room, there is a meeting between the instructors and the commander of the firefighters' special, special, special squad. The special, special squad commander approaches Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin and asks about the exam date for the candidates. Yu So Bin checks the email on his phone and assures the commander in no uncertain terms that the exam will be held on Friday. 
The commander is happy about the fact that he won't have to wait long for the exam to start. He goes to his chair and sits down at the communal table. The chief coordinator says that the exam that will be held on Friday will be important not only for the candidates, but for every branch in Chakdo. The coordinator places his phone on the table so screen up, and the screen display paints a weather report that foreshadows the heavy downpour that will be on Friday. Exam day arrives, and all squads of firefighter candidates gather in front of the dorm building on the center court. The candidates put on their special firefighting equipment, and the clouds gather more and more fully over the dormitory building and block out all the sunlight. The instructor's loud voice coming from the center court reaches every corner of the dormitory building, where silence reigns. All the hallways in the building are lights out because all the firefighters and instructors from the special squad are outside the building. The only room of the video hall exudes blue rays of light from the video recording monitors. One coordinator, Yuso Bin, sits in the room with countless monitors. He holds the remote control tightly in his hands and hopes that thanks to his examination, there will be no more firefighter casualties like the incident of the collapse of the mall building. The TV remote control rests on the head of the chief instructor with such force that it leaves a small dent in his forehead. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin sits at a table in front of the TV and reviews the news report on the incident at the mall building. The TV screen shows two firefighters inside the mall being covered by a huge blob of impenetrable smoke. The Chief Coordinator nervously taps the TV remote on his cheek and continues to watch the tragic report. The TV shows footage of the farewell with Wang Ho where one of his co-workers gives a farewell speech in dress uniform, standing behind the podium. Coordinator Yu So Bin presses a large button on the remote control and turns off the television program. He slowly turns his body in the direction of the window where the loud voices of instructors and firefighters are coming from. The head coordinator rests the TV remote on his desk and walks over to the window to see what's going on outside. With a quick movement of his hands, he opens the curtains that were blocking the sunlight and wrinkles his nose at the light and looks outside. The firefighters, illuminated by the bright rays of sunlight, run after each other and follow the orders of their instructors. The chief coordinator watches the physical training of the candidates for the special firefighter squad with a small smile on his face. Sergeant Kwang Yeol is horrified to learn from his team that the final exam for the special firefighting squad is about to begin. He grabs his head and begins to panic, while the guys talk about the upcoming exam at a relaxed pace. Staff Sergeant Du Jin checks the weather report and says that there will be a heavy downpour on the day of the exam, which he warns his team about. Du Jin notes that instructors have been doing a tremendous amount of physical training recently to prepare candidates for the challenging weather conditions. Team 4 hears the click of the door opening and turns to exit into the hallway. Hosu steps inside the fourth squad's room and hands out special raincoats to everyone to work on during the exam. The appearance of the young firefighter has calmed the guys down a bit, and they distribute the raincoats to each other with fun and light jokes. Brigadier Chang. Il pulls on his raincoat and encourages the guys to show all their abilities because they have one last exam to do. Kwang Yol's eyes brim with tears after the foreman's words, and he smilingly tells the boys that they must all pass this difficult exam together. The young firefighter watches as his team puts on their special firefighter raincoats and waits for them to be ready. A brave smile appears on Hosu's face, and he announces to his team that their clothes under the raincoats will definitely be changed after the last exam. Staff Sergeant Gun Jin goes through the obstacle course with the rescue dog and gives it a series of special commands while running. Sergeant Kwang Yeol works with a search device and learns how to use it in difficult terrain. A firefighter stands on a stone slab and uses a drill to make several even holes in it to make it easier to separate it from other concrete blocks. A young firefighter leans on his feet and slowly lifts the heavy concrete slab to clear the rubble. Several groups of firefighters work with special framing beams to fix the walls of the collapsed building and look warily at the fourth squad. The firefighters see Hosu and Yeren from the fourth squad have accomplished their task in a matter of minutes and have made several secure wooden frames. Heavy rain and quick raindrops that fall from the leaden sky envelops the dormitory building of the special fire squad candidates. Kwang Yol can't sleep because of his worries. He sits on his bed and looks out through the window at the oncoming downpour. Du Jin, who was previously sitting on his phone, notices Kwang Yol's worry and turns his head at him. 
The tall firefighter in his joking manner asks Sergeant Kwong Yol why he is awake at such a late hour. Sergeant Kwong Yol continues to stare at the incessant downpour and talks about how he feels strongly about the upcoming exam that is about to begin. He hears light chuckles coming from the neighboring beds and turns his head back to see the source of the noise. Sergeant Kwong Yeol notices that no one from the fourth team is awake because they're all so worried about the upcoming exam. Du Jin turns toward the rest of the beds and notices that Aaron, unlike the others, was still able to cope with the stress and fell asleep. Brigadier Chang. He lies back on his bed and shares his thoughts with the group about the upcoming building collapse exam. Chang. Il talks about how the exam itself is not difficult, and so everything right now feels like some kind of restful sleep, which worries him greatly. He shares his assumption that there has been some kind of lull among the instructors of the special squad over the past few days, and therefore assumes that something special is to be expected during the exam. Hosu confirms Brigadier Chang Il's fears and points out the fact that he heard the sounds of repairs during the frame building training. The young firefighter assures the others that the sounds of repairs that have been going on throughout the week are inextricably linked to the specialty of building the final exam. The boys listen to the young firefighter's reflections on the special exam, and even the downpour that is loudly drumming on the roof of the building does not disturb them. Brigadier Chang, Il assures everyone that the role assignment and the exam itself will go smoothly because the team has been preparing for this day carefully. Suddenly, someone turns on the lights in the room. Aaron wakes up and the rest of the team looks toward the front door. Instructor C.O. Lee Gon is standing in the doorway. He's smiling in his usual crazy manner, and his body is completely covered by a fireman's raincoat. Sergeant Kwong Yol jumps up slightly on his bed in surprise. He clearly didn't expect to see his crazy instructor so soon. Sergeant C.O. Lee Gong lightly taps his fist on the door jam and turns his back to the fourth team and announces the start of the last exam at the stadium in five minutes. Instructor C.O. Lee Gong calmly paces the stairwell towards the building's exit, and in passing, he hears the anxious cries of the firemen who are trying to gather everything they need to get out. The night downpour does not continue to subside for a moment and the entire dormitory building of the special squad candidates lights up with a bright yellow light that illuminates the darkness. The instructors, along with coordinator Yu So Bin and the special squad commander, stand in raincoats and wait for the candidates to enter the stadium field. The firefighters wearing orange raincoats gradually gather on the stadium field and wait for their instructor's instructions. Instructor step-by-step step rushes along a small iron staircase to position themselves in front of the candidates for the special fire brigade. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin removes his hood and takes a quick glance around everyone present on the stadium field. The fourth squad of special squad candidates stares mesmerized at the chief coordinator and tries to catch every word he says. In a loud and clear voice tearing his vocal cords, Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin announces the start of the final exam for the special fire squad. The instructors stand behind the candidate squads and wait for the chief coordinator's speech to end so that they can assign the participants to specific roles. The chief coordinator stands at a small podium and announces the results of the past exams that the special squad candidates have gone through. The firefighters look up at the chief coordinator with their heads proudly raised to the top and pay no attention to the heavy downpour that is hitting their eyes. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin puts his hands in his pockets and talks about how there are only 12 people left after all the exams. He stops at the descent from the stage and loudly announces that there should not be a single dropout after the last exam. All the assembled candidates for the special squad loudly chorus their agreement with the coordinator and salute him. The coordinators head to their groups of firefighters to assign them to their respective roles. Bright spotlights shine blindingly toward the firefighters and instructors, and brightly illuminate the entire stadium so that the faces and expressions of emotion of everyone in attendance are visible. The firefighters pull their hoods tighter and go to assign roles to their instructor from the special squad. Instructor. So Lee Gong lightly snaps his fingers to call the firefighters back to him and asks them to focus on his voice. He shows the firefighters a small piece of cloth and asks them to perform the same actions as during training with the rescue dog earlier. The instructor walks past the firefighters and assumes a position from which the candidates can perfectly see how they work with their rescue dogs. Seo Li Gong points toward the trees that are absorbing huge torrents of water and orders them to find where the victim is. 
Junior Sergeant Gunjin scrutinizes the area and occasionally glances at his instructor, trying to figure out what the main difficulty of the task is. The candidates for the special squad take the behavior into their own hands and, together with their dogs, begin to slowly scour the terrain. Gong Jin scrutinizes the rag given to him by the instructor and comes to the idea that he needs to act extremely fast. Otherwise, the victim's odor will be washed away by a heavy downpour. Instructor Seo Li Gong notices that the junior sergeant is thinking about something and doesn't move, so he turns his head in his direction and asks him to hurry up. Gong Jin picks up the behavior and firmly holding the handkerchief with the victim's scent in his hands, rushes off to find the man. Instructor C.O. Lee Gon folds his hands behind his back and watches the candidates work with rescue dogs. A firefighter works with special search equipment and reports to Sergeant Kwang Yeol that he can't see anything at all because of the rain. Sergeant Kwang Yeol looks at his partner with apprehension, not anticipating that the rain would make it so difficult to operate the search equipment. The instructor from the special task force calmly watches the firefighting team trying to find the victim under the rubble of the building. He is timing the team and is not distracted by the firefighters' loud conversations about the search equipment. Sergeant Kwang Yeol begins wiping the lens of the rescue device so that a clear picture appears on the monitor screen. Instructor Hyun Song observes candidates working with special wooden support beams to support the building frame. Firefighters pick up the frame and try to carry it through a doorway, but it crashes against the ceiling and can go no further. Sergeant Hyun Seong observes the candidate's blunder and demands that the beam be redesigned so that it can fit through the doorway without a problem. Yaren climbs higher and measures the height of the ceiling to get ahead of how high the wooden beam should be, while Hosu stands below and backs her up. The girl hears the young fireman's concerned voice behind her and turns to see what has happened, Hosu shows with his hands that it is worth lowering the height of the beam a few centimeters down so that it will pass through the doorway. Yerin looks at the young fireman confused. She is sure that her measurements are correct and is not sure why the height of the beam needs to be changed. The hero points to the raindrops that cover the entire floor and says that the wood will absorb all the water so the beam will be much higher in the final job. The firefighters watch Hosu and Yerin work, who are very fast at their jobs and competently make the wooden supports. The wooden support makes a slight grinding sound when placed under the wall, but clearly falls to the correct size. Instructor Hyun Song praises the smooth work of Yerin and Hosu as the boys place another wooden support under the wall. The candidates point out that the fourth team is very fast at the task and can't figure out the secret to creating the right wooden beams. Yerin and Ho Su do not pay attention to the other firefighters' looks and silently continue to make the remaining wooden beams. The firefighters use a special saw and try to saw through some metal sheets to reach the victim. Du Jin looks closely at the metal sheet and tries to see its vulnerable spot, but the raindrops hinder him greatly. Brigadier Chang Il turns toward the instructor and hears the warnings that the rain could severely hinder his ability to see the cutoff point, so he asks the team to be more careful when handling the metal. The firefighters saw through the metal plates at a slow but careful pace and try to get to the right concrete blocks. Brigadier Chang. Il turns to Dojin and notices that his friend has stopped working with the saw and is only looking around. Chief Officer Doyun turns to the fourth team and tries to figure out what the reason is for its work stoppage in clearing the rubble. The tall fireman doesn't pay any attention to the foreman's and senior officer's questions, but only stares at the rain-wet debris of the building. Under Dojin's gas mask, you can hear his rapid breathing, which is getting louder and louder by the minute. The tall fireman scrutinizes his red-stained gloves on which raindrops fall every now and then. Behind the tall fireman's back, there are loud shouts from the instructor and his friend, but he can't hear them because his thoughts are somewhere in the past. Du Jin tastes the taste of bitterness in his mouth and realizes that he is haunted by the fear of the past that still won't let him go. The tall firefighter's entire body is trembling with fear, and he can barely contain the feeling inside him, while his gaze examines the grounds around him. Instructor Du Yun comes close to Do Jin and continues to beckon to him, but he still doesn't get a return answer to his questions. Du Jin quickly takes off his fire helmet and throws it on the floor, while the senior officer and Chang Il look on in amazement at the tall firefighter's actions. Du Jin's actions start to scare the senior officer, so Du Yun tries to speak his sentences slowly and asks the tall fireman one more time what he's up to. 
Du Jin, following his fireman helmet, takes off his fireman's gas mask and raises his face to the sky. To everyone's surprise, Du Jin looks up into the dark sky where the rain is coming from and spreads his arms in different directions away from himself. The senior officer asks Brigadier Do Jin to put on his gear because working without it can be very dangerous for a firefighter. Huge raindrops completely cover Du Jin's face. The tall firefighter starts to take in as much air into his cheeks as possible. With a quick movement of his hands, Du Jin pats his cheeks to gather his thoughts and come to his senses. Senior Officer Do Yun looks at the tall firefighter's unreasonable actions with surprise and can't understand the reason for this behavior. With his heavy blows on his cheeks, the tall fireman accomplishes his goal and his fear recedes from him like a beaten dog. With a slight smile on his face, the tall fireman stands in the midst of the massive amount of rubble and prepares to go back to work without regard for his difficult past. He bends down to the floor where his firefighting equipment and helmet lie, then puts them on his head. Dujin decides to move forward without regard for the past. He adjusts his firefighter's helmet, tears mixed with rainwater streaming down his face. Through the impenetrable darkness, you can see the nose of a dog trying to smell something in the damp earth. The rescue dog begins to dig diligently through the loose earth in front of him to reach his target. Gunjin notices his dog Alpha's actions and discovers a small scrap of yellow clothing in the area where the dog is doing his digging. The junior sergeant grabs the cloth with his free hand and tries to pull it out from under the loose earth. Instructor Sao Li Gong notices that Lance Sergeant Gunjin has managed to find the injured man and is surprised at his quick find. The dog Alf barks at the instructor, trying to call him to him, and Lance Sergeant Gun Jin pulls out a special fire brigade uniform from under the rubble. The instructor moves closer to the excavation site and pats the dog to reward him for his work. Instructor Seo Li Gong continues to stand by the dog for a while and stares mesmerized at Gong Jin, who has succeeded in his task. Sergeant Kwang Yeo listens to the firefighter's report on the approximate location of the victim and tries to point the search device wire in the right direction. He makes several turns around the concrete blocks and through a slot to guide the wire with the observation sensor, while the instructor closely watches the search unit's performance. The wire ends up in one of the crevices of the concrete blocks, where the operator's observation suggests the injured person should be. Sergeant Kwong Yol drives the wire in different directions to pinpoint the victim's exact location, but the firefighters are hampered by rain. The firefighter asks to pay attention to his monitor, on which he sees some strange symbols depicted on a concrete block. On the stone block, buried under the stone rubble, there is an inscription of hieroglyphics which stands for the word resilience. The instructor reports to the search team that they have done their job well and can return to the main site. The firefighter lifts the concrete blocks with great effort and throws them aside to clear the passage. The team reports to instructor Do Yun that they have completely cleared the area of the concrete blocks and have completed their task. Instructor Do Yun's face lights up with a small smile, noting that there were some strange behaviors on Do Jin's part while they were working, but he doesn't see it as a big problem. Instructor Hyun Sung hears the voices of the candidates beckoning him to inspect the wood beam work. Hosu and Yaren are among the first to tackle the wooden beams task and show their result to the instructor. The candidates from the second team look enviously towards the young firefighter and the girl. They were hoping they could overtake the fourth team. Instructor Hyun Sung turns his gaze to the second team's work and asks Hosu and Yaren to help them finish the wooden beams because all the firefighters must work as one. Hosu and Yaren respond to the instructor's remark without a shadow of a doubt with words so accurate and rush to help their colleagues. Instructor Seo Li Gong's smile seems even more sinister under the low light and heavy downpour. He stands on a small podium and announces the end of the role assignment exam. The firefighters are walking along a small road that has been heavily washed away in the downpour. They struggle to follow each other due to their heavy equipment. Sergeant Kwang Yol is very tired. He moves very slowly, measuring every step, and behind him is Junior Sergeant Gun Jin. Gun Jin rests his hand on Kwang Yol's oxygen tank and pushes the sergeant forward to make it easier for him to walk. Sergeant Kwang Yol notices someone's support from behind and turns back around to see his aide. Staff Sergeant Gun Jin looks at the sergeant who has turned toward him with a smile and expects him to say something. 
Sergeant Kwang Yeo quickly turns back around and tells the junior sergeant through gritted teeth that he doesn't need his help at all. The firefighters rush down the steep slope and up the hill, while Gung Jin continues to nudge Sergeant Kwang Yeo lightly despite his words. Du Jin walks among the first in the squad, rivulets of water running down his face, and his breathing begins to gradually hitch due to his conversation with his girlfriend. The tall firefighter notes that mountain training becomes very difficult in rainy weather and asks Yaren to remain vigilant. Yaren points to the road ahead and mentions that this is the spot from which the sounds of construction work have been coming from for the past week. Brigadier Chung. Il shows his anxiety about the last stage of the exam. He is very much stressed by the no-nonsense atmosphere among the squad instructors. With every step that Aaron takes forward, she feels less confident. The girl is becoming very uneasy about the unknown that awaits all the candidates ahead. The young firefighter also feels anxious about the next challenge, but continues forward without too much notice or doubt. The mud of the road keeps sticking to the firefighter's boots, trying to slow their step now and then, if not stop the entire group from moving at all. Du Jin notices that Yaren has noticeably slackened her speed and offers his help so that the girl can catch up with the group. Yaren asks her friends not to worry about her slow stride. She decides to walk forward to quickly dispel her anxiety of the unknown ahead. With quick spurts forward, Yaren overtakes the rest of the team and climbs a tall ladder that stretches into endless darkness. The tall fireman looks at Aaron running away from him with surprise on his face. He didn't expect the girl to have so much strength left. Brigadier Chang. Il is also surprised by the girl's physical strength and then looks around the firefighting group for his friends. The firefighters trail off, and Chang Il looks around and can't find Ho Su, who has gotten separated from his group. The candidates from the second group turn back and notice a young firefighter walking at the end of the entire group of firefighters. The firefighters look amongst themselves and hypothesize as to why Ho Su has decided to walk at the end of the entire squad. The young fireman walks on the damp ground, ignoring the puddles and mud under his boots. Hosu does not pay attention to the loud conversations of the candidates who are discussing his person and silently looks at his feet. His eyes are staring at the floor, the symbol on his firefighter's helmet reflecting the light of the lanterns that illuminate the candidates all the way. The young fireman tries to remain calm and breathes extremely evenly. Unlike the others, he is well aware of the severe test that awaits the squad. Yaren gets to the exam site. The girl is horrified to see what the instructors have prepared for all the candidates for the special fire squad. Instructor Seo Li Gong notices that Yaren has a horrified expression on her face and shows her the locations of the final exam. The girl's jaw drops slightly from horror and surprise, and she only looks at Instructor Seo Li Gong. Bright flames illuminate the firefighters' faces, and the instructor points to the burning building and explains to Aaron that the special fire squad team led by the coordinator has recreated the scene of the horrible incident. The firefighters are standing in front of the burning shopping center where a beautiful firefighter, a friend of Yaren and Ho Su, was once left under the rubble. The fire covers the roof of the building rather quickly, where a huge amount of water has accumulated and the firefighters seem like ants compared to the height of the mall building. Yaren clenches her hands tightly with anger and pain. She recalls the events that still hurt her soul. Tears protrude in the girl's eyes. She can't forget how her friend Wang Ho got trapped under the rubble and disappeared from the fire station forever. The instructor watches the massive shopping center burn and says that all the instructors know how much pain Ho Su and Yaren had to endure, but it was still decided to choose this place for the exam. Aaron's face expresses some anger towards instructor Seo Li Gong for the fact that he and his team are going to remind her of her friend's tragic fate. Instructor Seo Li Gong looks at Yaren's crying face without the slightest emotion and says that the team has recreated the commercial building to the smallest detail. Full of anger and hatred, a sharp blow catches instructor Seo Li Gong's face and his helmet flies off his head and falls to the ground. The instructors stand by the fire truck while Sergeant Hyun Sung watches in amazement as the events between Yaren and Seo Li Gong unfold. Instructor Hyun Sung wants to go and resolve the conflict between the firefighters, but he is stopped by the senior officer's strong hand that rests on his shoulder. Sergeant Seo Li Gong reaches with his left hand for the fire helmet lying on the floor, picks it up from the ground. Yaren continues to stare with anger in his eyes at Instructor So Li Gan with the clear intent to deliver another punch. 
Instructor Seo Lee Gong adjusts the fire helmet on his head and warns Yeren that he has no problem dodging her next punch. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong licks his bruised cheek and explains to Aaron that he's had similar experiences and understands the guy's feelings. A storm of emotion sweeps across Aaron's face. She silently looks at Seo Lee Gong and decides not to punch him in the face again. Instructor Seo Lee Gong turns towards the burning building and talks about how the purpose of the exam is to make sure the firefighters don't lose anyone else. From behind the girl and Seo Lee Gong come the slow footsteps of the last firefighter, who stops behind them. Hosu looks towards Aaron and then flips his gaze to the burning mall, the hero's eyes glowing blue as he prepares to use his gift to its full maximum in this exam. Instructor Seo Lee Gan taps on Aaron's helmet and encourages the girl to get angry at every hard task, as she does at this moment. A slight smirk appears on the instructor's face, and his gaze is completely fixed on the girl, who continues to get angry at him. Yaren ignores the bright flames that illuminate all the faces of those present and continues to stare at the instructor. Seo Li Gong spits somewhere to the side and talks about how only anger can save them during the mission, and if they do nothing, nothing will change in their lives. Without the slightest shadow of doubt, instructor Seo Li Gong rushes closer to the fire toward his team and says that a generational change will take place today. Aaron stares dumbfoundedly at the back of Seo Li Gong running away from her and ponders all the words he said to her. Instructor Seo Li Gong stands proudly and looks at the huge pillar of fire in front of him. He addresses all the firefighters and asks them to stand up in the face of danger and never forget their comrade. Tears come to Yeren's eyes, with a huge number of thoughts flying around in her head, but the girl tries to focus on the fire that has unfolded right in front of her. Warm air along with sparks from the fire rushes towards the firefighters, and the guys try to cover their faces with their hands to avoid getting burned. Candidates for the special fire brigade put on fire uniforms with special equipment and prepare to enter the building at the instructor's command. Hosu puts on his gas mask with a quick hand movement and joins his team, his eyes burning blue as he uses his ability to see the future. Coordinator Yu. So Bin stands in front of the building and waits for all the candidates to gather at the main site. The special squad commander walks up to the main coordinator and announces to him that all the exam participants have arrived at the site and are waiting for his command. The chief coordinator tucks his hands in the pockets of his raincoat and does not react to the commander's words in any way, but only silently observes the burning building. The commander understands Yuso Bin's concern and asks the head coordinator if he has managed to get his thoughts in order. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin reluctantly turns to the special unit commander and says that he doesn't have any extra thoughts in his head. He walks past the commander and heads over to the special squad candidates to announce the start of the exam. A huge crowd consisting of firefighters and special squad instructors are stationed in front of the burning mall building and prepare to extinguish the fire. Chief Coordinator Yu. So Bin comes out to give a speech to the special squad candidates and talks about the basic stages of firefighting. He expresses his gratitude to each firefighter who made it to the target in the difficult weather without any hesitation or words. The firefighters pay attention to the coordinator, who gives basic instructions, and to the burning building, which lights up the whole area. The chief coordinator puts his hands in his pockets and announces in front of all the firefighters the beginning of the exam topic building collapse, and rescue of victims in the rubble. Hosu listens to the chief coordinator's orders and does not take his eyes off the burning shopping mall where his close friend was once trapped under the rubble. The chief coordinator urges all units to act carefully and coherently because about two months ago, an irreparable tragedy happened in a similar building. Instructors from the Special Fire Brigade, along with their chief officer, listen to the coordinator's speech and prepare to speak with the firefighters. The firefighters look at each other as they learn from the words of Chief Coordinator Yu. So been about the sad fate of Wang Ho, a candidate for the special squad and an excellent firefighter. Yaren and Dojin listened to the Chief Coordinator's words with special trepidation because Wang Ho was a close friend to them. The members of the fourth squad realize the importance of the exam. They wait for the end of the Chief Coordinator's speech and prepare to go into the thick of things. Yu Seo Bin's breathing starts to quicken at the end of the speech, and he struggles with his last words as the firefighters are a large and close-knit family to him. The captain of the special unit looks at the chief coordinator with a smile on his face. 
Yu So Bin's words inspiring the commander to do more. A heavy downpour doesn't stop coming down from the heavens for a second, but even that doesn't allow the water to extinguish the fire, which seems to be getting stronger from the rain. The chief coordinator notes that such incidents must not be allowed to happen at least one more time in the history of the firehouse. Yaren's hair is folded into a single line because of the rain, but the girl doesn't pay attention to the discomfort, and her attention is fully focused on the burning mall building. The firefighters' faces show raw and serious emotion, ready to rush into the building at the slightest command from their commander and do everything in their power to stop the fire. Chief Coordinator Yu Su Bin raises a finger up and points out to the candidates the falling rain mixed with ash falling on the heads of the firefighters and says that harsh conditions are the biggest enemy in putting out any fire. Yu So Bin walks from side to side and gazes into the faces of each of the firefighters, hoping to see sincerity and willingness to go all the way. He points toward the talking building once more and says that the exam should teach the firefighters to fulfill the main task under any conditions, which is to save everyone. Hosu adjusts his fire mask and waits patiently for the time when he can go into the thick of it. The chief coordinator looks somewhere in the center of the crowd and in a clear voice asks all the participants to show strong determination in passing this exam. With each successive word from the chief coordinator, the firefighters' faces fill with more and more determination and willingness to do the impossible. Yusobin asks all the participants that even if they don't have the necessary equipment to accomplish the mission, they must do their best to get it in a matter of seconds. Each subsequent word of the chief coordinator gets louder and louder. He asks everyone not to choose means and methods, but to make a strong case and have the determination to call for reinforcements if necessary. All the firefighters respond clearly and loudly to Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin that they will make every effort to do their best. The special squad commander looks at the cheering crowd of firefighters and prepares to speak with his equipment. The instructors from the special fire squad are inspired by the coordinator's speech, they stretch their arms and prepare to support the firefighters in case of an emergency. The enthusiastic shouts of the firefighters can be heard for several kilometers. The chief coordinator waits for the voices of the firefighters to subside to continue his speech further. The chief coordinator points his finger at each participant in the exam and announces that today each of them will become a member of the special response squad with special equipment. He hopes that this amount of time and sacrifice will finally pay off, and he will be able to form a special fire team, and with the help of the candidates, he hopes to make up for the lack of manpower. The coordinator finishes his speech. He slowly takes out a small remote control and points it towards the mall building. Yuso Bin presses the remote control button, and a huge gust of fire along with a sonic full blast sweeps through the depths of the mall building breaking all the obstacles along with the windows along the way. The firefighters cover their face with their hands from surprise and fright at such an unexpected sound that erupted inside the building. The head coordinator stands motionless and watches as the flames engulf the remaining floors of the mall and ooze out of the broken windows. The whirlwind picks up small shards of glass and throws them towards the firefighters mixed with the fire. The firefighters shield themselves with their hands from the strong gust of air and try to dodge the sharp shards of glass from the mall building. The building begins to tilt slightly forward, its walls unable to withstand the onslaught of hot air and beginning to crack. Yaren looks at the other firefighters in horror. She clutches her fire helmet tightly in her hands and doesn't know what to do. The candidates for the special squad quickly put on gas masks and fasten fire helmets on their heads to protect themselves from the shards of the building. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin raises his fingers up and makes a few gestures with one hand. He sits down on one knee in front of the firefighters and, surrounded by instructors from the special unit, gestures orders to the firefighters. Hosu watches each gesture of the chief coordinator and tries to guess what they mean together. The young firefighter guesses what the chief instructor's orders are and to the surprise of the other firefighters rushes forward to the burning building. He rises to his full height and notices the ghost of a firefighter who quickly rushes towards the entrance of the building. Instructor Seo Li Gan notices Hosu's concerned look and watches the fireman's actions intently. He abruptly rises from his seat and puts his hands on the young fireman's shoulders to stop Hosu from acting recklessly and force him to the ground. 
Instructor Seo Lee Gon and the young firefighter silently stare in the wake of the ghostly firefighter, whose silhouette rushes inside the building. The ghostly fireman's cylinder has the name Kim Wan Ho emblazoned on it, and the silhouette disappears into the depths of the building rather quickly. The mall building is torn apart by another even more devastating explosion that scatters the concrete walls of the building in different directions, as if they weigh nothing. Instructor Seo Lee Gan holds the young firefighter tightly by the shoulders and tries to discern the reasons why Ho Su decided to move so recklessly toward the building. The firefighter stands in the middle of the street, staring at the rain whose drops are slowly dripping down his fire mask. The fire department brings the water cannon closer to the burning building and begins to extinguish the fire, while the rescue squads inspect the building for casualties. The captain of the fire brigade reports to the chief coordinator that the smoke inside the building is very thick, making it impossible to determine the source of the fire. Coordinator Yu So Bin listens to the chief coordinator's report that the burning building is too close to other buildings, so it will not be possible to get rid of the thick smoke anytime soon. The firefighters are waiting for the rescue squad, which is stuck on the expressway and won't arrive on the scene anytime soon. The first squad commander reports to the chief coordinator that the search for victims on the first floors of the building is complete, and only the top tier of the building remains. Firefighters stand near the fire truck. They watch the fire gradually extinguish the fire in the shopping center and wait for the rescue team. A firefighter notices a man standing near the building calling his relatives. The firefighter interrupts a conversation between the squad leader and the chief coordinator, who were standing near the fire truck and discussing a plan for further work. The young firefighter stands next to the man and states that there is a victim on the fifth floor of the building who has not yet been rescued by the fire brigade. The fire brigade commander and the chief coordinator quickly look amongst themselves. They realize they need to make a quick decision to save the victim. The commander approaches his fire brigade and informs them of the victim, who may still be in the mall on the fifth floor. He asks to keep the squad extremely vigilant and, if possible, to team up with their colleagues and not to take any hasty action. Wang Ho, along with the other firefighters, listens to the squad leader's briefing and prepares to move out to the mall. The squad commander asks Wang Ho not to interfere with the fire department and goes with his team to help the injured man, leaving the firemen to look after the supplies. Wan Ho agrees with the captain's words, but he is heartbroken at the thought of being useless and superfluous here. He prepares equipment for the fire brigade and hears a man talking to his co-worker. The man learns from the conversation with his colleague that another person may be inside the mall and that Wang Ho overheard the conversation. The fireman finds the victim on the fifth floor and puts an oxygen mask on his face to avoid carbon monoxide poisoning. The firefighters, along with the victim, slowly descend the building's narrow staircase and head toward the mall's exit. The firefighter rests his hand on the wall of the building and notices a huge crack that is gradually growing all over the wall. He can't believe that the crack is formed in the stairwell and decides not to bother his squad leader unnecessarily. The squad leader hears the crackling of a walkie-talkie through which he is contacted by Wang Ho, who has remained outside the building. From the information provided by Wan Ho, the squad leader learns that there is another victim in the building who needs to be rescued. The commander notices a huge crack that continues to spread across the entire wall of the stairwell and continues to listen to Wan Ho's report over the radio. Wang Ho listens to the commander's order for the firefighter to report this information to the center and then take the firefighting equipment and bring the injured man out with the squad. With a quick pace, Wang Ho puts on the firefighting equipment along with the oxygen tanks and goes to the entrance of the mall building. The young firefighter quickly climbs up the stairwell and meets up with the fire brigade, who are heading towards the exit of the building. Wang Ho opens the doors to the outside and helps get the injured man out into the fresh air. He walks past the main squad and heads through the commander up the stairwell to locate the casualty as early as possible. The commander doesn't like the young firefighter's decision, but he realizes that every second counts and he needs to hurry. He walks to the exit of the building and casts a quick glance at Wan Ho's back. The commander tells the fireman not to do anything serious and to wait for help from the main squad. The firefighters take the injured man out and ask the ambulance personnel to help the man as quickly as possible. More cracks are forming on the roof of the building due to the huge amount of rainwater that is trapped on top of the building. 
The firefighters, along with the rescue team, placed the injured man on a stretcher and placed them in the ambulance cab. The squad commander hears loud rumblings coming from the side of the mall building. He sees the building begin to collapse in a matter of seconds, scattering concrete debris across the street. The frame of the building slowly goes down, and the concrete debris scatters in different directions away from the building with a devastating rumble. The instructors of the special squad are carefully watching the reaction of the candidates to the collapse of the building and prepare to come to the rescue if necessary. The huge airflow almost knocks Yeren off her feet, but the girl manages to keep her balance and covers herself with her hands from the hot air. Some of the firefighters are much less lucky and fall to the ground because they couldn't resist the strong wind flow. The candidates for the special squad squat and protect their face with their hands so that an accidental shard of glass or concrete particles don't hit their heads. A second destructive wave rolls in from all sides of the fire units with the intention of blowing them out of their path, but the firefighters hold firmly to their feet. Hosu closes his eyes and tries to breathe evenly so as not to panic and get rid of the obsession he recently saw. Instructor Doyun gets up from his seat and orders them to move quickly to the collapse site and pull the dummies out from under the rubble of the building. The runners move out to the site of the mall collapse, and Chief Officer Doyun sets the timer for 20 minutes from the time they start. Several firefighters take their rescue dogs with them and also rush with the others to the rubble of the building. Sergeant Kwong Yol peeks through a gap and tries to locate a mannequin under the rubble, while his comrade carries a detection device to the hole. The firefighters use special equipment and move from point to point in search of the dummies that are under the rubble. Du Jin uses a special fire saw to cut through thick blocks of stone to break up the rubble. The tall firefighter thinks the work is going very slowly and starts to get agitated, but Foreman Chang-il stands behind him and tries to calm Dojin down and encourages him to keep his head up while working. Instructor Hyun Sung watches his team work and asks the firefighters to take their time while working with the wooden beams. Yeren doesn't pay attention to the instructor's words and uses a hammer to hammer nails into the wooden supports with quick movements. Hosu makes a gesture with his hand and asks Aaron not to hurry, but to do the work clearly and then go together to look for the dummies. The young firefighter says that Chance will definitely smile on them and ask them to put safety first. A huge number of firefighters stand over the wreckage of the building and search among the rubble for the only mannequin, which is somewhere under the concrete slabs. Du Jin is distracted from his work and pays attention to Gun Jin's voice calling him over. Staff Sergeant Gun Jin stands with his dog and tells Do Jin that Alpha has managed to find something amongst the rubble of the building, the second group instructor puts his hands up to his face and announces in a loud voice that the fire brigades should act to report so as not to search the same place twice. The firefighters scrutinize the floor plan of the building and hope to find some clues to the mannequin's whereabouts. The special squad commander puts his hand to his chin and looks thoughtfully in the direction of the candidates. He suggests that the candidates may not have the designated time to locate the mannequin. The chief coordinator looks towards the squad and agrees with the commander's opinion, but hopes that despite the terrible confusion that reigns in the area, the squad of extraordinary people will be able to accomplish the task in the appointed time. The commander and chief coordinator are distracted from their observations and look at the special squad instructors approaching them. Staff Sergeant Do Yoon thinks that finding the mannequin in 20 minutes is almost impossible and notes that even a special rescue squad firefighter would not be able to accomplish this difficult task in his opinion. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong fundamentally disagrees with the senior sergeant's position, and notes that with the new equipment, everything is possible. Senior Officer Do Yoon agrees with Instructor Seo Lee Gong's comment and apologizes for his tactlessness to the commander and chief coordinator. The commander looks at the senior officer with a smile. He is happy that Du Yun realizes his mistake and believes in the candidate's abilities. The chief coordinator points his finger at the blocked main passage and notes that the candidates are perfectly capable of handling the task in less than 20 minutes. The firefighters coordinate among themselves and continue to remove the rubble with their hands and specialized equipment. The special task force commander checks his watch to see how much time the firefighters have left to find the dummy. The contestants turn around at the squad leader's words that the time for the task has expired and returned to the site. The special fire brigade commander stands in front of the squad and explains that 20 minutes is a time called the golden hour, 
and you can't always manage to save people in that time. Tears well up in Hosu's eyes as he is saddened by the fact that even with his ability, he can't make it in time. The commander of the special squad asks the candidates for the special squad not to despair and asks them to keep searching because the firemen are almost close to the location of the mannequin. The firemen are very angry at their helplessness. They tearfully listen to their commander and try to pull themselves together to continue their work. The commander stands in front of the group and announces the start of a new round of searching for the mannequin under the rubble of the commercial building. The instructors give a few orders and ask the candidate squads to follow them to the trade building. Hosu looks at the dark sky from which rain has been pouring for hours. The young firefighter's heart is tormented by longing for his close friend. The young fireman sees the future again, in which Gong Jin runs with a rescue dog and searches every place. Yeren drives the last nail into the wooden frame and discovers that Ho Su, who has been with her all along, has disappeared somewhere. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin is distracted from his search among the rubble as soon as he hears Ho Su's familiar voice calling out to him. A young firefighter stands beside Do Jin and asks the team to check one spot because he thinks there might be a mannequin there. The fourth team gathers together and studies the building plan that the instructors provided, while Ho Su holds the map in his hands and tries to figure out the exact location of the dummy. He points to the map and says that the dummy should be at the spot where the firefighters found Wan Ho during the horrific incident. Sergeant Kwang Yol and Do Jin listen carefully to Ho Su's speculation and try to figure out where the dummy might be. Ho Su's explanation is interrupted by the high-pitched voice of Gun Jin, who asks to hear his side of the story. Junior Sergeant Gung Jin reveals that because of his curiosity, he read a local newspaper article and speculates on the possible location of the mannequin. The young firefighter interrupts the junior sergeant's words half-heartedly and asks for details along the way so as not to lose a minute of precious time. The squad commander specifically notices the actions of the fourth group led by Ho Su and notes that the squad has a very good speed. The young firefighter and his team carefully go through the debris and try to find the dummy among the rubble. Staff Sergeant Du Yun notices the fourth team's worksite and mentions that there's someone among this well-coordinated team who read the news report, but he's sure it can't help the team find the mannequin in time. The guys drag some slabs and finally open the rubble, but there is no sign of the mannequin in the area. The young firefighter falls to his knees and can't believe the squad's careful work was done for nothing. He digs his hands firmly into the concrete blocks and continues his search for the dummy and ignores the words of his comrades. The fourth team pulls Ho Su away from the unfortunate spot and asks the hero to calm down and come to his senses, while the young firefighter continues to reach for the spot where the team was excavating. The rain pours down like a bucket, and with it begins a new attempt of Ho Su with the help of his gift to find a mannequin under the rubble of the building. Instructor Seo Li Gong sees the young fireman running into the thick of it, pulls him back by the scruff of his neck, and reprimands him for his unresponsive behavior in a loud voice. Hosu silently listens to his instructor's words, his gaze staring into the void, his eyes gradually closing, and he collapses from fatigue. The hero watches for the tenth time as the building of the shopping center explodes. He looks with his blue eyes at the bright flames and assures himself that this time he will cope with the task in the allotted time. The story takes us back in time as Wang Ho explores the stairwell looking for a survivor and discovers a deep crack in the wall. Yaren takes a few heavy swipes with a fireman's canvas and drives another nail into the wooden frame. Standing over her is Hosu, who rests a hand on his hammer and watches the girl work. Yaren turns toward the young firefighter and with a questioning look on his face tries to figure out what's going on. Sergeant Kwang Yaol uses the search kit to investigate another crevice and tries to find the dummy. Hosu takes a quick step toward Sergeant Kwang Yol and his assistant with the search kit. Sergeant Kwang Yol and his friend notice the young firefighter's approach and look in his direction with concern and slight incomprehension. Hosu heads toward Dojin and Brigadier Chang Il, who are working with a fire saw and cutting concrete blocks with it. Du Jin is distracted from his work when Ho Su beckons him over. He turns back, and to his surprise, he notices most of the fourth squad behind him. Ho Su, Yurin, and Sergeant Kwang Yeol stand together and ask the guys to come with them because the young firefighter has an idea where the dummy might be. Wan Ho realizes that the building is about to collapse, so he tries to find a place where the last victim might be hiding. Junior Sergeant Gong Jin runs with his rescue dog and tries to scent the location of the mannequin. 
Gong Jin warns Ho Su that the odor fades rather quickly, so the group has little time to search. Ho Su realizes the seriousness of the situation, and for a while he runs silently looking at the junior sergeant, but then nods his head and says that he is sure of the location of the mannequin. The fourth squad full squad, led by firefighter Ho Su, runs towards the possible location of the dummy. The instructor of the second squad wants to shout a warning that the teams need to check the building plan, but abruptly stops when he sees the fourth team beside him. The instructor notices that the fourth team is already busily working with the building plan map and discussing the possible locations of the dummy. With a smile on his face, he looks at the smooth work of the fourth squad and continues to shout words of encouragement to the other teams. The commander of the special firefighter squad puts his finger to his lips and looks at the work of the fourth group of candidates with curiosity. Instructor Seo Li Gan rests a hand on senior officer Du Young's shoulder and notes that the fourth team is performing much faster than the others anticipated. Ho Su and Yaren get to the designated location before the others and take a quick look at the scene. Du Jin points out the huge concrete beams and slabs to the team and tells them that without special equipment, they have no chance of a successful search. Firefighters from Squad 4 keep a close eye on their dog, Alpha, who sniffs every rubble pile and tries to find the marked mannequin. Lance Sergeant Gun Jin notices that his dog has stopped near a rock and is sniffing it thoroughly. He calls his team over and tells them that Alpha has found something among the rubble. Sergeant Kwang Yol asks Gung Jin to take his time and suggests using the search apparatus to check what's inside the rubble. He lowers the probe inside and tries to find a place to start drilling and clear the area of debris. The fireman unfolds his apparatus and motions for Brigadier Chang Il to take his place at the monitor while he intends to go after his group. He quickly rushes through the wreckage in search of his squad, while Brigadier Chang Il sits down at the monitor and tries to see something in it. Yaren stares in the wake of the fleeing firefighter. She thinks about the fact that the last exam just needs cooperation between the different groups. The chief coordinator and special squad leader hear the voice of a firefighter calling his squad to the fourth group for help. Firefighters from other squads come to the aid of the fourth squad, and together they begin to remove the debris from the building. The chief coordinator tearfully watches the smooth work of his team and involuntarily recalls the tragic incident. A firefighter runs to chief coordinator Yu So Bin and asks for instructions on how to conduct the operation in the collapsed building. The chief coordinator recalls the horrific events when a huge number of firefighters without special equipment searched through the rubble of the building looking for his comrade. His face is covered in dirt and horror at what happened, and he hears the firefighters shouting and talking, but he can't make out a single word. Yu So Bin realizes that there is nothing they can do for Wan Ho, and his helplessness brings tears to his eyes. The fire department commander climbs up to the wreckage of the building and inspects the scene with his old eyes. He gives several orders in a loud voice and asks to thoroughly search every millimeter of the mall rubble. The fire department, only with the help of their hands and common efforts, starts to take apart the resulting rubble piece by piece. Chief Coordinator Yu. So Bin looks at the work of the fire brigade team with horror in his eyes and cannot believe that such a thing could happen during his operation. The fire brigade commander of the second squad and the chief coordinator discuss the current situation and think about the plan for the rescue operation. The second squad commander asks the coordinator not to interfere in the search for Wang Ho because only the Jing Wang center commander can help find his subordinate in this chaos. The candidates for the special squad take the rubble together and use a vast array of improvised tools to clear the rubble. Ho Su watches the fire teams in action. He helps coordinate the action and periodically gives orders to his squad. The chief coordinator's eyes are increasingly filled with tears, but his gaze continues to be directed toward the working fire squads. The special fire squad commander interrupts the team's search. He heads towards the fourth squad and draws the attention of the guys. Sergeant Kwang Yeol and Gun Jin remove the special equipment and allow the special squad to go forward. The special squad commander, along with his subordinates, calmly strides towards the epicenter of the team's excavation. The fourth team watches the approach of the special fire brigade carefully and listens to the commander's reflections on the golden hour, which is the Maginot line for the fire brigade. The special squad commander, along with his squad stop and silently stare at the back of Ho Su, who is holding something in his hands. 
The young firefighter clutches the dummy in his hands tightly. The fourth squad surrounds him, and the commander announces the successful completion of the exam for all the participants. Next to the mannequin that Hosu is holding is another one dressed in a business suit. The instructors left it specially as a sign that Wang Ho covered the injured man from injury with his body and saved his life. Hosu tearfully looks at the mannequin he is holding in his hands. His grief for his close friend is boundless, and nothing in the world can take away the pain. The other mannequin lies alone on the ground in the damp rain, and the firefighters move away from the scene of the disaster and disperse to their instructors. A new day is dawning for the Chakdo Central Fire Department, and bright rays of sunlight illuminate the fire department buildings on all sides of it. The TV screen runs a report on the heroic actions of firefighter Wang Ho and on his rescued high school student who regained consciousness after 83 days. The second team of firefighters, led by their commander, is closely watching the news report about their employee. The commanders are very proud of Van Ho's actions. They finish the news report with a smile on their end and hope to have more such heroes in their department. A junior sergeant calls out a new member of the fire brigade and asks him not to slack off and show up on time. The sergeant's gloating at the newcomer is interrupted by Young Jin, who draws the attention of everyone in the room with a loud voice. He lightly adjusts his medical mask and lowers it from his nose to his small chin. Young Jin walks closer to the sergeants and slightly audibly says the famous saying, if the tiger leaves the cave, the fox reigns there. Captain Beck welcomes the senior medic back from training with a smile on his face. He lightly teases Young Jin and calls him the tiger from the proverb. Sergeant Young Jin indignantly shouts at Captain Beck and doesn't understand why he's being compared to a tiger. The firefighters from the second team begin to banter with the captain about the returning Young Jin and call him either a returning fox or a tiger. The commander asks Young Jin about the end of the special squad's training, to which he gets a reply from the chief medical officer that all the courses are over. The commander of the second squad is angered by Young Jin's question about Bo Ram's whereabouts, and the commander of the first squad says that the girl is in the locker room and will soon appear in the control room. Young Jin ignores his commander's words, causing him to become enraged and seething with anger, and the first squad leader tries to calm him down. The medical staff meet in the locker room and discuss the work plan for the rest of the day. The younger lifeguard is surprised to hear from Young Jin about feeding him a delicious lunch. The senior medic twirls his finger in his ear and explains that he gave all the calls to the junior sergeant, and so the latter is indebted to him. The junior sergeant turns toward the commander and hopes for support from him, but the second squad leader tells him to back off and not to ask anything more. Young Jin turns at the sound of laughter coming from behind him and looks at the unfamiliar firefighter with glasses and tries to figure out who it is. The guy with glasses tilts his head slightly to the side and looks questioningly at the senior medic's strange look directed in his direction. The senior medic examines the unfamiliar man from head to toe and asks him directly what he has forgotten in the fire station. The junior sergeant is surprised by Young Jin's question. He rests his hand on the guy's shoulder and points to his glasses and says that the person in front of him is none other than Jay In from the support staff. Young Jin ponders the junior sergeant's words, but there's no way he can remember the person standing across from him. The sergeant starts shaking the protein jar up and down with a loud sound, and Young Jin covers one ear with his finger because of the unpleasant sound. The sergeant explains to Young Jin that during his and Ho Su's absence, he took it upon himself to personally train Jay In, and with increased training, he improved the support man's health. The large number of words coming out of the sergeant's lips and the sudden change in Jay In's appearance surprises the senior medic, and he once again looks around for any changes. The senior medic can't understand how the sergeant managed to change a person so drastically in such a short period of time, and the fire team laughs at his strange reaction. The second squad commander is annoyed by the noise in the control room and complains that Young Jin only arrived five minutes ago, but he's already making a fuss over the entire fire brigade building. The second squad commander grabs his hands on his head and complains to the other commander about the senior medic making such a fuss that he's had a headache since this morning. Young Jin is surprised when he hears from the squad leader's mouth that in addition to his return, another firefighter has returned to the fire brigade building. The second squad leader continues to hold on to his sore head and says that Hosu is talking to the center director on the top floor. He abruptly gets up from his seat and demands that Young Jin also go to the center director to say hello to him in person. 
Young Jin covers his face with one hand and complains that there's too much hassle with the formalities in the fire brigade. He lightly fixes his hair and asks his commanding officer if Hosu has been accepted into the special fire brigade based on his exam results. Du Jin returns to his hometown Dako fire station, which is lit up by bright rays of sunshine and has several flagpoles near its entrance. The director of the center adjusts his cap and smilingly welcomes Du Jin back from his exams, asking him about the exams and being happy that his subordinate has returned safely. The center director notes that Du Jin has been ready for a long time to pass these special exams and become part of the elite squad. He asks the tall firefighter to be sure to check on his squad, which is out for a morning run before he leaves. The fire squad runs a few kilometers down long streets and does a few laps around their station. At the finish point, they are met by Do Jin, who clocked their result and greets his team with a smile on his face. The firefighter team is very happy to see their old friend. They try to catch their breath after their marathon and interrupt each other to inquire about Do Jin's results in the special squad exam. A man's hand raises a small yellow pistol and prepares to pull the trigger. A young woman in a white spring jacket stands in the stadium bleachers watching her team. With the sound of the gunshot, the athletes start running on their treadmills and rush as fast as possible to the finish line. The girl notices the mistakes of the runners and shouts warnings and remarks towards the running athletes. Yaren looks at his friend, who is completely oblivious to the presence of someone else in the stadium stand. The girl holds huge bags of food in her hands and greets her longtime high school friend with a smile on her face. The friend didn't expect to see Yarin on the stadium platform. After a moment of silence, she starts asking a few questions and asks if Yarin managed to get into the special squad. The peak of Mount Chakdo is illuminated by the pale rays of sunset, and a small stone pedestal is painted on its peak. Chakdo mountain rescuers have come to the aid of an injured man and are examining his leg with suspected broken bones. The man says he will not be able to continue on the trail with this injury and asks the rescuers to take him to the medical center. The rescue team commander asks the man not to worry about the situation and promises to take care of his transportation to the nearest trauma center. The mountain rescue team hears the sound of approaching footsteps. They turn their heads and see a familiar silhouette in front of them. Staff Sergeant Gun Jin stands in front of his squad and offers his assistance in transporting the injured man. The rescue squad commander asks Gung Jin why he came up here and how the special squad exams went. He points out that only the mountain rescue team has the right to climb Mount Chakdo, noting that Gung Jin now belongs to the special rescue team. Brigadier Chang. Il returns to his home. He lifts his daughter high to the ceiling with his hands and looks at her happy eyes. The grandmother sits in a wide armchair and watches the conversation between the young daughter and her father with a smile on her face. A girl comes home with her shopping. She hears her husband's voice and quickly takes off her slippers to see his face as soon as possible. Chang Il's wife walks into the spacious room and with tears in her eyes and a slight smile on her face asks her husband how the exam for the special firefighting unit went. Sergeant Kwang Yo stands in front of the center's director, who is drinking his hot tea and watching the firefighters work from his office. Kwang Yo expresses his appreciation and thanks the center director for giving him the opportunity to prove himself in the special firefighter squad exam. With a smile on his face and taking another sip of tea, the center director declares that all the credit goes to Kwang Yo because he was able to take the chance correctly. He finishes the rest of the tea in the plastic cup and asks with a little apprehension about Kwang Yo's result in the special fire brigade exam. There is an awkward silence in the room, and Sergeant Kwang Yo bares his sharp, fang like teeth and declares that he has passed the special fire brigade. Ho Su folds his hands behind his back and sits across from the center's director, who is seated at his desk. The young firefighter announces with a calm expression that he has passed to the special rescue and emergency response squad. The center director is very happy to hear about Ho Su's success. He says that no other situation could have happened. The center director's face lights up with a small smile and asks Ho Su if the young firefighter has learned anything at the Chakdo Center. He doesn't wait for Ho Su to answer and starts looking for something in his desk, and then asks when the transfer to the special squad will take place. Ho Su looks at the center director's restless movements and says that he'll transfer as soon as the special rescue squad is officially formed. The center director pulls out a heavy folder from the top shelves and suggests that Hosu will make a sergeant before being transferred to the special squad, elegantly.
Hosu's head tilt slightly to the side in surprise. He didn't expect to be promoted so quickly, especially from the center director. Hosu rises up so high that his head lightly touches the ceiling, and he loudly says that he will do his best to keep Chakdo safe until the very end. The center director asks the young firefighter to lower himself down, and then he tucks the stack of documents under his desk. Hosu thanks the center director for all the time he's spent at the Chakdo Fire Department Center and says that he's learned a lot in the intervening time. He puts his hand to his head and salutes in front of the center director, and then says the word, safety in a loud voice. The center director salutes and watches as the young firefighter opens the door and leaves his office. The center director lightly adjusts his fireman's cap, his face lighting up with a small smile because he is very happy to see Hosu back. He casts his aged gaze at the open door and thinks about how much the young firefighter has changed throughout his time at the Chakdo station. Hosu walks into the control room where the second team is in full force to greet him and give him many smiles. The young firefighter stands in the aisle for a while and looks around at his old friends, then salutes them and says clearly and distinctly that Junior Sergeant Hosu has successfully passed all of his exams and has made it into the special rescue squad. Young Jin and the rest of the guys notice that the hero now looks completely different and that he has a strong wind of the special squad. The young firefighter continues to hold his hand to his temple and looks at his friends with a huge smile on his face, who can't stop admiring his accomplishments. Things remain the same in the Chakdo Fire Brigade building, and with the return of Hosu and young Jin, the control room is abuzz with excitement. Junior Sergeant Hosu takes his desk and listens to the guys talk about the situations and calls that happened while he was away. A loud fire siren interrupts the guy's dialogue and a second fire brigade is dispatched to the call. The guys head to the locker room at a fast pace, and there they change into the department's firefighter uniforms. The young firefighter puts on his fire helmet and places an oxygen tank on his back, and his comrades rush to the fire truck. He takes a few heavy exhalations, and his eyes glow a bright blue light, now more ready than ever for another call to the fire department. The fire blazes around firefighter Do Yun, who is lying on the ground unmoving, and someone is holding an oxygen mask to his face. Sweat drips from the commander's face as he looks at his subordinate with a smile, oblivious to the fire around him. Do Yun looks at his commander who presses the oxygen mask to his face and starts to panic and asks his commander not to risk it for him. Commander Sung Jung Yul looks at his subordinate with a smile on his face and asks him not to worry too much about nothing. Firefighter Du Yun apologizes to Commander Zhang Yul for breaking the set 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 of rules and promises that he won't make that mistake again. Du Yun continues to panic, large drops of salt water from crying appearing on his face, and he blames himself audibly for not acting according to the rules. The commander's hand grips the oxygen mask tightly and Sung Jung Yul utters his last words to his subordinate. Commander Sung Jong explains that they only have one respirator for the two of them, and physically, Du Yun is much stronger than him. Sung Jun asks him not to give in to his emotions in a difficult situation, but Du Yun can't contain his sadness, and tears flow profusely from his eyes. Commander Sung Jun smiles slightly and points out that giving in to emotions is a bad habit for any firefighter, especially in such a critical situation. Huge tongues of fire gradually surround the firefighters, and Commander Sung Jun says that he made his own choices and asks Du Yun not to blame himself for the situation. Du Yun stares at his commander in silence, his eyes rounded at the horror of what he sees, and the firefighter realizes that this is his last conversation with his commander. Sung Jun proudly declares that he is the commander of the second squad of the rapid response team and asks Du Yun to listen carefully to his orders. He slowly removes his hand from the respirator on Du Yun's face and asks him to memorize this place well and find a way out of the fire, and bring reinforcements to this place afterwards. Du Yun closes his eyes and listens carefully to the commander's words. He tries to calm his emotions, but tears continuously burst out of his eyes and flow down his cheeks like streams. Senior Officer Du Yun folds his hands behind his back and stands in front of the tombstone. He came to Memorial Alley to visit his old friend. The wind lightly ripples the grass beneath the tombstone, and on the tombstone itself, the inscription, Warrant Officer Sung Jung Yul, is engraved in clear letters. 
Chief Officer Do Yoon stands silently against the stone slab, reminiscing about the fateful day when he made a terrible mistake and made his commanding officer pay for it. Do Yoon looks at the tombstones, each decorated with flowers, and to his surprise he notices a fireman's helmet on one of them. He walks closer and sees that the helmet of a special fire brigade is next to Wang Ho's tombstone. The senior officer looks at his squad's helmet carefully and with some surprise, and then he comes to realize why the helmet is there, and a small smile lights up his face. The special rapid response squad is sitting at their desks and dealing with the huge stack of paperwork that has accumulated over the course of the exam. Junior Sergeant Ho Su greets the special squad team and asks Sergeant Han Sung if they have an extra special fire squad helmet. The young firefighter is confused and doesn't know how to explain to Sergeant Hyun Seong why he needs an extra special response squad helmet. Ho Su and Hyun Seong are interrupted by Sergeant Seo Lee Gan, who tries to enter the squad room and asks his colleague to give the helmet to the young firefighter without any questions. Sergeant Seo Lee Gan stands in the doorway with a huge pile of boxes in his hands and tries to go inside the room. Seo Lee Gong beckons to Junior Sergeant Ho Su and asks him to hold the door to the room while he brings the heavy boxes inside. On top of the boxes is a special squad helmet, so Lee Gong's face takes on a strange expression and the sergeant tries to hint at Ho Su to take the helmet for himself. The young firefighter looks at Sergeant Seo Lee Gong with a perplexed look on his face and doesn't understand what he's hinting at. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong can't stand Ho Su's confusion and directly asks him to take the helmet that is on the boxes. So Lee Gong understands why Ho Su needs an extra helmet. He walks a few meters forward with the boxes and asks the young fireman to say hello to Wan Ho from him. Junior Sergeant Ho Su thanks instructor Seo Lee Gong for his help in a loud voice and leaves the special squad building. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong walks up to Sergeant Hyun Sung with a smile and calls him an extremely misunderstood firefighter and looks at his misunderstanding eyes. Senior Officer Do Yoon, who has been watching the conversation between Ho Su and Hyun Sung the whole time, asks his Sergeant Seo Lee Gong why he came to the office on his day off. Do Yoon is extremely surprised when he finds out that Seo Lee Gong is sorting out his things and preparing to move into the new fire station building. Instructor Seo Lee Gong says with a smile on his face that the entire team will soon be working in the new building for the Special Rescue and Ambulance Squad. The smile on Seo Lee Gong's face disappears in a flash as the rest of the team members stare at their comrade incomprehensibly. A senior officer explains to Seo Lee Gong that the move to the new building has been postponed for a month due to rising material costs. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong stands frozen in his seat, while Sergeant Hyun Sung says that they had put up a notice about the postponement a long time ago. Seo Lee Gong's energy disappears in a split second as he mumbles some phrases to himself and wonders how he could have missed the announcement. Sergeant Hyun Sung looks at his comrade with a bit of concern and tries to make out his mumbling to himself. Sergeant Kang Dai Gu walks down the hallways carrying large boxes of items and heads towards the exit of the fire station building. He looks toward Instructor Seo Lee Gun, who is standing silently next to Sergeant Hyun Sung. Sergeant Hyun Sung realizes that Kang Dai Gu doesn't know that the move to the new building will be delayed for a few days either and warns his comrade about it. Sergeant Kang Dai Gu hears the sergeant's request to put everything back where it belongs, but doesn't understand why he has to put the boxes back where they belong. Senior Officer Do Yoon and the special squad leader observe the box bustle and Sergeant Kang Dai Gu who, like Sergeant Seo Lee Gong, has just recently learned that the move is being postponed. Senior Officer Do Yoon stands in front of his former commanding officer's gravestone and informs him that after four years, Sung Jun's dream has finally come true. Do Yoon speaks in hushed tones about how the new building for the Special Rescue and Ambulance Squad will soon be finished. He completely fails to notice the young firefighter who has also come to Memorial Alley and is holding a bouquet of flowers. Senior Officer Do Yoon turns around at the sound of footsteps and sees Junior Sergeant Ho Su standing in front of him with the bouquet of flowers. The young firefighter stands with a small bouquet of flowers wrapped in a paper bag and looks at Do Yoon in surprise. Do Yoon looks at the hero from head to toe and points his finger at the flowers, noting that he now understands why Ho Su needed a helmet from a special firefighting squad. Hosu didn't expect to see an officer from the Special Fire Brigade at the Walk of Remembrance and listens to Do Yoon's reasoning in silence. 
Senior Officer Do Yoon holds his hands behind his back and talks about how he sometimes admires the quick thinking of the special fire squad guy. Ho Su doesn't immediately realize who exactly he's talking about, but then he guesses that Do Yoon was referring to Sergeant Seo Lee Gong. The young firefighter looks around and asks Do Yoon what brought the instructor to Memorial Alley that day. The older officer smiles slightly and then turns his head toward the captain's tombstone and says that he too came to say hello to the man, just like Ho Su. He talks about how there is a man in Memorial Alley who more than anyone wanted a special rescue and ambulance squad. The young firefighter stares at his instructor for a while and then looks around trying to figure out who the senior officer is talking about. The fire helmet of the special squad lies peacefully next to the tombstone, and the fire squad symbol on the top of his head periodically reflects the sun's rays. Hosu looks towards the fire helmet with a smile and ponders Senior Officer Do Yun's words. Senior Officer Do Yun distracts Hosu from his thoughts with his voice and wishes the young firefighter to work his remaining time at the safety center properly. Do Yoon says goodbye to Ho Su and tells him that they will see each other again in the new Special Squad Center building, and the young firefighter says he will do his best in the future. Junior Sergeant Ho Su salutes and says the word. Safety in the back to the departing senior officer Do Yoon. Do Yoon exits the Memorial Alley grounds and heads mournfully along a small road and notices a small flower bouquet vendor on his way. The senior officer stops for a while near the flower shop and looks at the various bouquets of flowers. He thinks about making sure to pick up a new bouquet for his commanding officer who is in the Walk of Remembrance. He takes a few steps forward and decides that next time he will definitely buy a bouquet at this flower shop and goes on his way. Lance Sergeant Ho Su clutches the bouquet of white flowers firmly to his chest and walks through the memorial walk area. He stops in front of a headstone and places the bouquet of flowers beside it with extreme care. The young firefighter stands still for a moment and looks at the memorial on which he has placed his bouquet of flowers with a smile. A beautiful bouquet of white flowers lies on the tombstone dedicated to the warrant officer who once saved Ho Su and Du Yun's lives. A fire truck driver from the Chakdo Security Center rushes to a fire call on the open road between buildings. The director of the center contacts headquarters by radio and reports that the Chakdo Fire Squad will soon arrive on the scene. Two fire trucks from the same department equalize on the road and try as if to outrun each other. An officer uses a radio to listen to instructions from headquarters that the Chakdo Center Fire Brigade will split into two squads when they arrive on the scene. The commander of the entire operation rides in a special fire truck and rushes to the scene with everyone else. Chief Coordinator Yu. So Bin takes the walkie-talkie in his free hand and listens to the reports of the fire brigade commanders. He coughs a little and tells all the units under his control that the fire is in its most active phase, so he asks the firefighters to check their equipment carefully before arriving at the scene. The chief coordinator warns the fire brigade that there will be no civilians in the factory, but in any case, he points out the need to be extra cautious and pay attention to safety. A team of paramedics from the Chakdo department receives orders from the chief coordinator and goes to the nearest hospital to get the patient to the doctors as quickly as possible to go to the aid of the fire team. The center director designates his team as number one and awaits instructions from the chief coordinator over the radio. Center officer Chakdo designates his team as number two and Lance Sergeant Ho Su sits in the back seats and waits for the fire truck to arrive on the scene. The two fire trucks rush through the narrow streets of the city, which are car-free at this time of day, fortunately for the fire crews. The teams arrive on the scene. The firefighters pull fire hoses from the engines and head towards the hearth of the fire. A huge burning factory building is surrounded by a long fire hose that the fire crews have deployed. Captain Bake and the second squad leader decide that they will contain the fire and not allow it to spread until reinforcements arrive. Division Center Director Chakdo speaks to the firefighting squads and orders them to direct all efforts to contain the flames. He notes that the tongues of flame are not visible, but the heat from them is very dangerous. Lance Sergeant Ho Su listens to the Center Director's commands and prepares to prepare a fire hose to contain the flames. The Center Director orders Sergeant Sung Dok to take an observation position and asks the firefighters to remain focused in any eventuality. He points Sergeant Sung Dok to the fire truck and asks him to keep an eye on it to make sure it doesn't get too hot from the heat to prohibitive temperatures. 
Sergeant Sung Deok listens to the center director's warning that the squad will receive a disciplinary reprimand for equipment failure if they slip up. Lance Sergeant Ho Su approaches Sergeant Sung Dok with a water cannon and suggests that he start by pouring water on the fire trucks. He fires the water cannon at the fire trucks and Sergeant Song Dok points his finger in the direction to shoot water. Officer Heyday is pouring water cannon fire on the fire and asks Ho Su to pour water on his suit because he's getting very hot from the hot air. Lance Sergeant Ho Su does not hesitate to take the fire hose and sprinkles Officer Hey Day with a strong stream of cold water. Lance Sergeant Ho Su and Officer Hey Day stand close to each other and together use the water cannons to contain the flames. Second Captain and Captain Beck watch their team work and look at each other. They observe Ho Su and notice that the young firefighter has grown a lot during his training in the Special Fire Brigade and has become a very experienced firefighter. Junior Sergeant Hosu is standing firmly on his own two feet and is relentlessly pouring water on the fire from the water cannon. He carefully watches the gusts of flames that are reflected brightly in the glass of his fire helmet. The conversation between the commander and Captain Beck is interrupted by a fire siren, which is accompanied by the arrival of a squad of paramedics from the Chakdo Center. Young Jin puts on his firefighter uniform and lazily climbs out of his ambulance to survey the scene. He adjusts his medical mask and pulls it down over his chin, then watches the firefighting team at work. The senior medic takes a seat on the trunk of the medical vehicle and alerts his team that the coordinator assures them that there are no casualties, so they can rest for now. Captain Beck and the commander watch the smooth work of their squad with a smile on their faces and are proud to see that Lance Sergeant Ho Su has grown a lot. The Chakdo Division Paramedic Squad watches the fire squad's work and hopes that there are no casualties at the scene. Officer Hay Day keeps the fire from spreading further, and Sergeant Sun Doc monitors the temperature of the fire trucks. Staff Sergeant Ho Su assists Officer Hay Day with containing the fire and looks around carefully for threats. The center's director keeps an unemotional eye on his team and waits for reinforcements of firefighters from other centers. A huge column of smoke rises in the air above the heads of the fire brigades that arrive to help the Chakdo unit. As night falls, the windows of the Chakdo Fire Brigade building gleam with a silvery glow, and some of them have bright lights burning in them. The fire brigade has returned to their unit, the squad checks the fire equipment, and Officer Hay Day along with Junior Sergeant Ho Su send the fire hoses out to dry. The second squad commander needs his back and complains that the job of putting out the fire took too long. The young firefighter sits down at his seat and is about to shred the paperwork that has accumulated during his absence. He notices the cell phone alert that has been on his desk all day. Junior Sergeant Ho Su checks his cell phone's email and looks to see if there are any missed calls or messages. On the screen of the young firefighter's phone, the general dialogue of the candidates of the fourth squad is on. The guys are discussing the latest incidents among themselves, and Sergeant Kwang Yol sends a photo from the scene of a forest fire suppression. Hosu carefully reads the general conference and shares with his friends about the fire he attended today. A young firefighter is distracted from his phone screen when he hears the familiar voices of the firefighters from Squad 1. The second squad commander greets his colleagues. He is surprised that the rumor that his team spent all day at the scene has spread so quickly among the other firefighters. The first squad commander greets Commander Shin and says that his team is here just in case they need help. He banters with the second squad commander and talks about age taking its toll and suggests that Sheen should retire. Junior Sergeant Ho Su listens to the commander's jokes with a smile, and Yaren moves closer to the hero and stares at him intently. The girl asks the young firefighter about a past call and listens attentively to Ho Su's story about a dark incident at the factory. Yaren notices that the young firefighter is not tired at all after the long call. She gives him a slight nudge in the back and suggests that they clean up the garage together. The commander's attention shifts to Yeren and Hosu, who quickly leave the common room. They don't understand where the guys are in such a hurry. The commanders continue to discuss Yeren and Hosu's departure amongst themselves, while Young Jin and Bo Ram silently stare at the back of the departing firefighters, who will soon become part of the special response team. The night sky full of stars and small black clouds rises above the huge headquarters building of the Chakdo Central Fire Station. In the small fire department coordination room, an evening meeting is being held to discuss the recent fires. 
Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin holds several firefighting photos firmly in his hand and scrutinizes them. He sits on a small couch and talks to the squad that is busy investigating the fires in the Chokdo region. The head of the fire investigation squad talks about recent incidents and points to the first photo where the Dako Fire Brigade was working. A charred shopping center building is painted on the photo, and a member of the fire investigation squad talks about the cause of the fire in the building. Du Jin is in front of the charred mall building and sends a few messages to the general conference, while a member of the fire investigation squad sets up his camera to take some photos of the scene. The second photo shows the scene where the Safo Fire Brigade, which includes Sergeant Kwang Yol, was working. Sergeant Kwang Yol returns to the fire trucks with the squad and notices a man with a black vest with the words Fire Investigation Department emblazoned on his back. The last photo shows the burning factory building where the fire brigade of the Chakdo unit was working. The chief coordinator studies all the photos from the scene and speculates that the occurrence of such large fires at short intervals looks rather suspicious. The head of the fire investigation team confirms the chief coordinator's speculation and tells Yu So Bin that they may be dealing with an arsonist, and after saying that, he holds out some more photos to the chief coordinator. The photos show that a special flammable substance was found in each place where the fire occurred. Chief Coordinator Yu. So Bin takes another look at the stack of photos that the fire investigation department has given him and realizes that he will have to work with deliberate arson. Rays of sunlight illuminate the central headquarters of the Chakdo City Fire Department, where the arsonists' activities are being discussed. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin enters the chief's office and provides him with physical evidence and photographs of the arsonist's workplace. The chief of department scrutinizes the police report and photos from the scene where the flammable substance was found. Yu So Bin points out that the firefighters made several mistakes in their work, so the arsonist's actions were not immediately detected. Fire Chief Huang Chiu Zhou continues to study the report and listens to the chief coordinator's report on the serial arsonist's activities. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin reports that he personally selected several people from the fire investigation team to study the information and investigate the fires around Chakdo. Yu So Bin assures Colonel Huang Chul Zhou that the materials received from the fire investigation team and the agreement of the police will make it possible to make every effort to catch the culprit. The fire chief examines a photograph of the crime tools and suggests that the arson attacks may be related to the fire squirrel case. The chief coordinator was surprised to hear about the fire squirrel case. He finds it hard to believe that this is the work of an arsonist who has committed 97 arsons in 17 years. Fire chief Huang Chul points out the crime weapon and assures the coordinator that the arson weapon in the recent fires is the same as in the fire squirrel case. Colonel Huang Chiu Zhou rises from his seat and heads to the coat rack to put on his uniform, and Yu Xiu Bin promises to tell the police that the culprit is possibly a copycat of the fire squirrel. The fire chief sighs heavily and adjusts the collar of his shirt. He can't believe that someone could imitate a fire squirrel. The chief coordinator notices the colonel's security regarding serial arson and waits for further orders from him. The colonel tells Yu So Bin that they've encountered a similar case together before and asks him to find the copycat as soon as possible. He throws his jacket over his shoulders and heads for the exit of his office, glancing in the direction of the head coordinator. Fire Chief Huang Chiu Zhou stops in the middle of the room. He can't believe that there is a copycat fire squirrel in the middle of the current generation. He adjusts his jacket and asks the head coordinator with a serious look on his face if there is a person in the current generation who will imitate the crazy fire squirrel. The chief coordinator replies that he will certainly use all resources to find a serial arsonist who imitates a fiery squirrel. Colonel Huang Cheol Zhou opens his office door stops in the middle of the doorway. He asks to find the arsonist no later than the end of this week and disappears into the hallway of the building. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin stands confused in the colonel's office and can't find the right words to respond to the fire chief's words. Yu So Bin comes to his senses and salutes, but it's too late. The door has long since slammed shut and the colonel has left his office. The fire chief walks along the long hallway. He puts his hands in his pockets and ponders the information about the serial arsonist. The colonel's polished boots slip on the clean floor and make a light thud on contact that echoes throughout the fire center building. 
An angry grimace appears on the fire chief's face as the colonel replayed the reports and reports from the police and special fire investigation squad in his head. He recalls how the report from the chief coordinator indicated that, fortunately, the arsonist's targets were places where there should be no loss of life. A nervous smile runs across the fire chief's face now and then, annoyed that the arsonist is not taking the firefighters seriously. The second fire squad gathers for a small meeting in the dispatch room about recent fire events. The commander of the second fire squad lazily makes notes in his notebook and tells his squad that thanks to the investigation of the fire research squad, information has been received about the existence of an arsonist who was responsible for the recent factory fire. Officer Heite and Lance Sergeant Hosu stand nearby and listen to their commander's report. The commander reports that other unit centers have been affected by the serial arsonist, so he reports a possible order to work together with other fire squads. The second squad commander turns to Officer Hei Dei, Junior Sergeant Ho Su, and Sergeant Song Dok and asks them to carefully check their reports on yesterday's fire so that in case of a question from the investigation committee, the firefighters will be able to respond clearly and concisely. The firefighters nod toward their commander and begin to study their own reports from yesterday's incident. Sergeant Sung Diok checks his reports and exchanges a quick glance with the other guys. He couldn't imagine that yesterday's fire could have been caused by a serial arsonist. Officer Heyday checks his reports like the rest of the guys. He has never encountered an arsonist in his job and is a little worried about it. The commander studies the news reports on his computer and rests his head on his free hand. He has heard of a serial arsonist before and hopes that this time the culprit will be caught quickly. All is not quiet in the fire department of Sampho Center either. The shouts of firefighters can be heard every now and then from the fire department building as they carefully prepare for their next outing. Firefighters check oxygen tanks for air supply and distribute equipment among themselves, while a lone one inspects the fire truck and fixes damaged parts in it. A firefighter pulls a lone wire out of the truck and uses a wrench to secure it with a metal washer. Sergeant Kwang Yol keeps a close eye on the other parts of the fire truck and looks for other possible breakdowns. He makes an awkward movement with his hand and the washer that the firefighter was recently screwing in rapidly rolls away from him in the opposite direction. The metal washer hits the center director's polished shoe and stops moving completely. Sergeant Kwang Yol watches the puck's movement and as soon as it stops near the boots, the sergeant immediately stops talking and looks at the center director. Center Director Sampho crouches down and with his free hand picks up the small iron puck from the ground. He scrutinizes the hexagonal puck in his hands and looks through it at the confused Kwang Yil. The Center Director, in an expensive suit with a smile on his face, walks up to Sergeant Kwang Yil and holds out the lost hex bolt to him. Sergeant Kwang Yil is very happy to see the Director, who very rarely shows up at the Center Fire Department and exchanges a few sentences with him. The sergeant points the center director to the stairs and talks about how the entire fire brigade is just waiting for the director to show up at the office. The center director hums something to himself and slowly walks up the stairs before turning right and rushing down the narrow hallway. The director approaches the office room and hears the fireman talking restlessly about a serial arsonist who has reappeared in Chakdo territory. The man realizes that the matter is urgent, so he quickens his step and the arguing voices grow louder and louder with each step he takes. He takes hold of the door handle with his right hand and opens it toward him to enter the office space where the firefighters are gathered. The firefighters, along with their commanders, are discussing the serial arsonist. They are afraid to be proactive because it will only scare the perpetrator away. The fire squad commander and his subordinates spot the center manager at the last moment and welcome him into the office cubicle. The fire crew greets Manager Kim, who has brought another trinket into the fire brigade office. Manager Kim greets the fire crews and, with a smile on his face, asks them what they were talking about amongst themselves a moment ago. The hex washer rolls across the asphalt surface again and tries to get as far away from its pursuer as possible. Sergeant Kwang Yil berates himself for his lack of focus and rushes after the iron puck to catch it and put it back in place. A new day begins for the Sampho Central Fire Station, which is illuminated by the bright rays of the morning sun. A firefighter heads toward the office exit and asks his commanding officer to give him a few minutes for a short smoke break. He leaves the room and heads to the roof of the building through the stairwell. Midway through, the firefighter stops to catch his breath. 
The firefighter opens the door to the roof of the building and does a little exercise to stretch his muscles after sitting for so long in his office cubicle. He takes the last cigarette out of his pack and shoves it between his teeth to smoke and forget his worries for a couple minutes. The firefighter hears the sound of police flashers and lowers his gaze to the street to see what the problem is. He sees a police car parked on the side of the parking lot and two uniformed police officers leading a man to their car. The suspect screams loudly and tries to break free from the cop's grasp, but the men's strong arms do not loosen their grip for a second. The firefighter continues to hold his cigarette, which he never had time to smoke, in his teeth and stares intently into people's faces. The police officers stop for a brief moment and explain to the male suspect that he has been detained on suspicion of willful arson within the city of Chocto. The firefighter recognizes the male suspect as Manager Kim, his mouth falls open in surprise and his cigarette falls to the floor. The firefighter abruptly turns around and runs toward the stairwell to inform his crew and commanding officer as quickly as possible of the incident he has just witnessed. The door that led to the balcony landing quickly closes with a huge metallic rattle. In a small ashtray, which already contains several steers, a firefighter's cigarette lies peacefully, slowly smoldering in the fresh air. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin reports to Fire Chief Huang Chul Zhou that his team has managed to arrest a fairly likely suspect in a serial arson case. Colonel Huang Chul Zhou continues to stare out the window of his office and asks the Chief Coordinator how the joint work between the police department and the fire investigation squad went. Yu So Bin takes in more air in his chest, and after a brief hesitation, he replies that thanks to the actions of both units, it was possible to catch the culprit immediately. In the coordination room of the Special Fire Investigation Unit, there is a lively discussion among the staff. Chief Coordinator Yu Su Bin sits on a cushioned sofa and examines a huge stack of documents related to the arsonist cases, while a member of the Special Fire Investigation Squad carries him several more stacks of documents. The commander of the Fire Investigation Squad brings a brown envelope to the large stacks of papers and points to the table, and says that here are all the cases of major or minor fires since last September, where the cause has not yet been determined. The chief coordinator goes through the sheets of fire brigade reports and comes to the conclusion that among the majority of unclosed cases, there is clear evidence of deliberate arson. The commander of the special fire investigation squad says that his team has revisited the scenes and conducted a cross-investigation. The chief coordinator listens to the report of the special unit commander and reaches for the brown envelope. He opens it and hands out the documents that were inside. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin pulls out a large number of photos from the envelope, showing the likely items used by the arsonist. Yu So Bin examines the arson scene photos and discovers several inscriptions on the back wall of the photos that were taken by the special fire investigation unit. On the back of each photo, which was in a brown envelope, is painted the year, date, and month when the arson was set at that location. The commander of the Special Fire Investigation Squad arranges the photos in chronological order and notes for the chief coordinator the importance of this action. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin guesses what the head of the fire investigation team wants to show him and nods silently in his direction. The crime scene photos are placed in such a way that there are quite large objects at the top and very small devices with the size of a human finger at the very end. The head of the fire investigation department sits down across from the head coordinator and explains that all the photos are in chronological order. He points out that with each new fire, the perpetrator has learned from his mistakes. Yu Seo Bin takes another look at all the crime scene photos and then casts his eyes over to the special squad representatives, hoping that they will provide some more information. The commander of the special fire investigation squad notes that in all the cases, the arson sites were chosen so that there would be no human casualties. The chief coordinator listens to the words of the squad commander and learns that all crimes took place no more than five kilometers from fire stations which leads him to believe that the arsonist is afraid of human casualties. The commander points his finger at one of the arsonist's case photos and notes that the arsonist is definitely paying attention to what condition the fire station is in. He considers the arsonist a coward, so for him, the serial arsonists are afraid of making a serious mess. Chief Coordinator Yu. So Bin disagrees with the team leader's opinion and points out that the person who commits arson is really fearless 
because he has access to information about the fire stations. The chief coordinator holds out the photos in the fire investigation squad commander's hand and points out that the serial arsonist is someone who thoroughly knows everything about the fire crews. The police team pats manager Kim's hands and puts him in a police car for further conversation at the station. The multi-story building of Sampho Police Station, Chakdo City, is colorful under the rays of the bright spring sun. Security cameras stand all around the station building and record what goes on inside the police station building. Manager Kim sits in an interrogation room, with a stout man sitting across from him, recording the manager's statement into his laptop. Kim jumps up from his seat and loudly proclaims that he is not guilty of setting fires and certainly not a serial arsonist. The tough cop looks at Kim with a calm expression on his face and tells him that the police have plenty of evidence on him that the manager was involved in the arsons. He turns the laptop screen forward to the manager and tells him that the police station has a huge amount of footage that proves Kim was near the crime scene. Manager Kim begins to panic when he learns from the cop that his personal cell phone was found near the scene of the last arson. The tough cop suggests that the manager confess to his crime and then his sentence will be halved. Manager Kim shakes his head. He raises his shackled hands to the top and talks about how the head of the department will make him do that. The policeman scratches his beard with his hand and listens to Kim's statement that the department head is acting extremely suspicious and is completely obsessed with ashes. Manager Kim tearfully continues to claim that he was set up by the department head who ordered him to videotape the fire. He tries to catch his breath after his rant and then adds that the department head knew exactly where and when the fire would happen. The tough police officer with a calm expression continues to listen to Manager Kim and his complaint about the department head. Sweat keeps dripping down Manager Kim's face, and he continues to assure the policeman that it was the department head who set the fire and decided to frame him. The manager notices that the policeman is not paying any attention to his arguments and decides to shut up for a while. The sturdy policeman sighs heavily, he puts his fingers to the temple of his head and sarcastically states that the department head who is currently on a business trip is a serial arsonist. He spreads his hands apart and talks about how the department head has incredible strength since he was able to set the fire and then escape to the other side of the ocean. Tears appear in Manager Kim's eyes. The man has no idea what to say to convince the policeman of his innocence. The detective with a tired expression continues to listen to the manager's arguments, in which he does not believe at all and considers them a complete nonsense. Tears begin to flow from Kim's eyes, which look like small streams. The manager suggests the policeman to check his correspondence with the head of the department, where it will be clearly seen that he was not involved in the arson. The detective continues to listen to the manager's arguments and looks directly into his crying eyes without any extra emotion. The manager's loud voice carries throughout the police station so that even the officers behind the protective glass can hear perfectly what Kim is saying. The police officers flip through documents and listen intently to the arguments of Kim's manager, who is trying to prove his innocence. A detective with a stern look on his face listens to the manager, who assures that he was always there before the other firefighters. Manager Kim points his hands in the direction of the police officer and says that the department head most likely fabricated his business trip. A man in a business suit strolls peacefully through the park at night, the soles of his shoes making muffled sounds as they touch the pavement. An elderly man strolls past a basketball court where several young boys are playing amongst themselves. Sergeant Kwang Yol holds the ball tightly in his hands and tries to beat Do Jin, who stands in a defensive stance and doesn't let anyone get past him. Lance Sergeant Gun Jin closes down Ho Su so that the young firefighter doesn't get a pass from his team. An elderly man in a business suit adjusts his glasses and watches the fourth team play for a while. Junior Sergeant Ho Su notices the man stare and turns his head in his direction to find out the reason for this strange behavior. The elderly man adjusts his glasses once more. He rushes off to the back of the park and stops watching the young boys play. Manager Kim tries to pull his cell phone out of his pocket to show the detective a picture of the squad captain. The tough cop pulls a bag of confiscated items from his desk containing Manager Kim's cell phone and places it on the desk. Manager Kim looks at the confiscated phone with tearful eyes and then turns his gaze to the tough cop. The detective folds his hands in a lock and waits to see what the suspect's next move will be. The manager with trembling hands pulls his cell phone out of the evidence bag and tries to find a picture of his boss. 
The manager shows his cell phone screen to the detective with a picture of his department head. The department head that manager Kim reports to is none other than Fire Chief Choi. The bright light of the street lamps illuminates the basketball court, which is nestled in a small park. Sergeant Quang Yol and Lance Sergeant Ho Su are severely exhausted and are trying to catch their breath after a tough match. Lance Sergeant Gun Jin is not the least bit tired, unlike the others. He makes a few moves and prepares to pass to start another round of the game. Gun Jin ignores Sergeant Quang Yol's request for a brief respite and runs to the opposite basketball hoop. He hits the basketball on the ground a few times and then gives a pass to his teammate with a slight hand motion. Du Jin has no problem catching the pass from Gong Jin and a new round of basketball match begins. Sergeant Quang Yol quickly runs up to Do Jin and stands in front of him to prevent him from going any further towards the ring. The tall fireman with a nonchalant expression takes a few swings of his basketball sword against the pavement and prepares to outmaneuver his opponent. Sergeant Quang Yol continues to stand in front of Do Jin and declares with a loud shout that there's no way he's letting him pass him forward. Du Jin doesn't stop running the ball and tries to find a weak spot in Sergeant Kwang Yol's defense. He takes a sharp step to the side and easily dribbles around Sergeant Kwang Yol at high speed and then heads towards his opponent's basketball hoop. Sergeant Kwang Yol turns around sharply and tries to move in the direction of the tall fireman's movement to stop him. Kwang Yol's legs brace against each other, causing the sergeant to almost fall face first onto the pavement, but he manages to get into an advantageous position. Du Jin sees where Kwang Yol is going and returns to his original position to make a deceptive maneuver. Sergeant Kwang Yol looks at the tall firefighter's maneuver in amazement and can't believe Du Jin was able to outsmart him. He falls to the ground with a thud and tries to come to his senses while Du Jin stands calmly in front of him and continues to dribble a basketball. Du Jin looks down at the fallen Kwang Yol and arrogantly states that it's probably very cold to sit on the ground. The tall fireman ignores the indignation of Kwang Yol sitting on the ground and heads towards the basketball hoop. He stops a few meters away from his goal because he notices a new obstacle has appeared in front of him. A young fireman blocks the path to the ring with his body and intends to stop the invincible Do Jin. The tall fireman looks at Hosu with a smile on his face and contemplates his next maneuver to win the round. Junior Sergeant Ho Su spreads his arms apart and prepares to fend off the tall fireman's attack. Du Jin hears his teammate scream and looks around to see where the sound is coming from. To his left, the tall firefighter sees Lance Sergeant Gun Jin running towards the ring and waiting for a pass. Du Jin, without further thought, throws the ball to his right side so that Gun Jim can throw the basketball into the basket. The tall fireman performs a deceptive maneuver and makes Ho Su believe he passed the ball, but at that moment gives himself a pass to his left hand. The tall fireman makes a sharp dash and intends to pass Ho Su's defense without much trouble for himself. Du Jin is surprised to notice that the basketball is no longer in his hands for some reason and looks around for it. He automatically walks a few meters and looks at his empty hand where the basketball should have been. Du Jin looks behind him at the young fireman standing there, who for some reason doesn't move from his spot. The young firefighter, to Du Jin's surprise, holds the basketball firmly in his two hands and prepares to make a pass. Junior Sergeant Ho Su turns towards the tall firefighter and looks at him with bright blue eyes that see the future. The tall fireman turns to the other team members and hears Sergeant Kwang Yol laughing, who is gloating heavily over his defeat. Du Jin pays no attention to Kwang Yol's loud laughter and watches as Junior Sergeant Ho Su calmly guides the basketball. The tall firefighter really wants to beat the hero despite his ability to see the future and runs towards him. Du Jin quickly catches up to Ho Su, thanks to his tall stature, and shuts him down from advancing any further, while Kwang Yol and Gun Jin take a seat under the basketball net. The young firefighter doesn't think much of it and gives a quick pass to Sergeant Kwang Yul, who wasn't far away from him. Kwang Yol holds the ball firmly in his hands and thinks about the best way to get to the ring and throw the basketball in. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin runs away from the basketball ring and aims towards Kwang Yol to stop his advance. Sergeant Kwang Yol's face lights up with a sharp smile. He sees that the opponent's ring is now unprotected and sees this as a great chance for him to successfully attack. Kwang Yol does a small jump in place and holds the basketball firmly in both hands to complete the three-point shot. He makes a slight motion with his hand and the ball rushes towards the basketball ring, and Du Jin rushes towards it to intercept it.
Du Jin gets to the basketball ring pretty quickly, but the ball is already over the basketball net and about to hit it. The tall fireman looks at the flying basketball and contemplates a way to stop it so the enemy team doesn't get the points. He flexes his legs slightly, and in a split second, he makes a lightning fast leap towards the ball to intercept it before it hits the ring. Kwang Yol's hands freeze in a throwing pose, and his mouth falls open slightly in surprise when he sees the high jump Do Jin makes. The ball flies clearly into the center of the basketball basket, and it seems that no one is able to stop the team from getting the coveted points anymore. Du Jin punches his fist through the net and pushes the ball out the other side, preventing Kwang Yul from making a three-point shot. Kwang Yul looks indignantly at the tall firefighter's actions and declares that Do Jin has violated the rules of basketball. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin can't say a single word. The speed and height of Do Jin's jump greatly surprised him. Young firefighter Ho Su wipes tears from his eyes with laughter. He finds this ball situation very comical. The department chief corrects his glasses with one hand and walks past the basketball court where the fourth team is having their friendly match. The junior sergeant is holding the ball and notices the department head's strange gaze that is directed at their game. Gong Jin notices that the young firefighter is distracted by something and has no problem knocking the basketball out of his hands. He picks it up and makes a high pass so Du Jin can do his signature slam dunk. The tall fireman notices the pass from his comrade and makes a high jump to pick up the ball to Kwang Yul's surprise. He grabs the basketball with both hands and throws it through the ring from top to bottom, and Kwang Yul irritably yells at Do Jin to not make that caustic smile when scoring anymore. Night falls and the streetlights in the park begin to slowly fade out one by one, leaving the basketball court in a semi-darkness of darkness. Du Jin and Junior Sergeant Ho Su sit on the same bench and judge between themselves about the basketball game they just finished. The tall firefighter opens a can of soda and declares that he is very impressed that a young firefighter can use his ability without a problem. Lance Sergeant Ho Su is very exhausted after the match. He puts a towel on his wet head and tries to recover. A tall fireman examines the tired Ho Su and asks how far ahead the young fireman can see in his current condition. The loud sound of a soda can being opened seems to awaken the young fireman from his sleep. He jumps up in his seat and looks around restlessly. The young firefighter is covered in copious drops of cold sweat, and the tall firefighter Du Jin looks at his friend with some confusion. Sergeant Kwang Yol runs through the park and tries to get away from the pursuing junior sergeant Gun Jin, who is breathing down his back. Kwang Yol immediately speeds up his run when he hears the voice of a young lifeguard behind him asking him to slow down a bit. Sergeant Kwang Yol stops abruptly and turns towards Gong Jin. He accuses the younger sergeant of purposely lying about his basketball skills to come out victorious. Gong Jin looks at the angry Kwang Yol with a smile and declares that sports are only interesting when you win at it. Sergeant Kwang Yol is greatly angered by the young firefighter's words, and he clenches his fang-like sharp teeth tightly. He turns away from Gong Jin and continues his run to the toilet stall and asks the young lifeguard not to chase him, to which he hears the young sergeant's contradictory shouts that he needs to go to the toilet stall too. Sergeant Kwang Yol stops in the road again and clenching his teeth asks why they need to go to the restroom together. He turns towards the restroom stalls and he becomes very uncomfortable with their gloomy appearance. Kwang Yeol turns around to Gong Jin again with a startled expression on his face and says that going to the restroom stalls together is a great idea because that way they can get closer. The boy's legs are carried in a quick stride toward Gong Jin and Kwang Yeol to warn them of the impending threat. Junior Sergeant Ho Su runs behind Do Jin and asks the tall fireman exactly what the other guys need to say to make them believe their words are true. Du Jin suggests running ahead of the younger firefighter to portray the appearance of training and then leading the squad to the fire scene. The tall firefighter assures Junior Sergeant Ho Su that if the hero behaves as naturally as possible, everything will definitely work out. The young firefighter nods toward Do Jin and speeds up his run to overtake the tall firefighter and run ahead of him. The department chief adjusts his glasses and finds a spacious spot in the center of the park where no one is around. The man picks up a small metal washer and stuffs it with a cloth that is soaked in a fire-hazardous substance. With a huge grin on his face, he looks at his bizarre invention and looks around for possible witnesses. The chief of the department takes his blue lighter in his hand with a crazed expression and is about to set another fire. 
The young firefighter manages to find all the guys and they run along the jogging path through the night park. Du Jin and Ho Su pretend it's all a little practice after a game of basketball, but they're actually looking for the arsonist. Sergeant Kwang Yol can barely keep up with the guys. He weaves in at the very back of the group and asks the guys to wait for him for a bit. He yells back to Du Jin and Ho Su that the guys are really into sports and that the cross country run doesn't matter after the basketball game. Lance Sergeant Gun Jin turns to the trailing Kwang Yol. He mimics Do Jin's voice and says in a languid voice the phrase, that's why you're a long way from me. At night, there isn't a soul on the road that runs through the park, and only the voices of the boys interrupt the silence of the trees. The department head puts out his lighter as soon as he hears Kwang Yol's loud voice coming from behind his back. Due to his fright, the man drops his incendiary device and it disappears somewhere deep in the tall grass. The man's face turns a purple hue, his eyes running back and forth across the grass in an attempt to find the incendiary device he needs. He makes several movements with his hands across the grass in an attempt to find the right place to start the arson by feel. The man squats down and continues to frantically search for a place to start the fire. The arsonist begins to panic when he hears the voices of a young firefighter and Do Jin a few meters behind him. Junior Sergeant Ho Su and Do Jin arrive at the spot where the fire was supposed to be. But to their surprise, they don't see the slightest sign of fire. Their dialogue is interrupted by a loud crunch of twigs behind them, and Ho Su turns his head back to find out where the sound is coming from. To their great surprise, the guys find a man holding a lighter in his hands and slowly backs away from them in the opposite direction. The department head rises to his feet, all of his sleeves and part of his jacket covered in yellow leaves, and his face expresses the emotion of fright. Du Jin casts a quick glance in the direction of the frightened man in the suit and tries to figure out what such a person could have forgotten here at this late hour of the day. The arsonist is even more startled by the menacing expression on the tall fireman's face and tries to get out on the road as quickly as possible. The young fireman looks at the arsonist carefully but doesn't understand why the fire still hasn't ignited. Hosu's eyes light up with a bright blue light. He uses his ability to see the future to find out the reason why the fire still hasn't ignited. Du Jin points his finger at the terrified man and suggests that Hosu's actions changed the future and prevented the arsonist from setting the fire. The department head grits his teeth and continues to slowly back away from the guys who are beginning to suspect him. He walks over to the fence and is about to swing over it, while Do Jin continues to discuss the situation with Ho Su. The tall firefighter suggests that they managed to catch the arsonist at the scene, and that's the reason the fire didn't happen, and then he heads towards the man. The department head overhears the guy's conversation. He catches a glimpse of them with a catching motion of his hands and quickly swings over the road fence and aims away from them. Do Jin and Ho Su get out of the ravine and chase after the serial arsonist who is trying to get away from them. A car drives towards the guys and the arsonist, with its bright headlights illuminating the road in front of it and the guys' faces. The car uses all the headlights it has to illuminate the night road in front of it and does not notice the people running in front of it. The car's bright headlights dazzle the guys' eyes, causing them to slow down and the department head to get even further away from his pursuers. Sergeant Kwang Yol and Gun Jin sit on the guardrail of the road and wait for the guys, who should have gotten back to them long ago. Sergeant Kwang Yol grumbles that the guys have been gone for quite a while. He scolds Do Jin and Hosu for not thinking of a way back. And Junior Sergeant Gun Jin squats on the pavement and draws something on the pavement with a wooden stick. He looks around and notices a running white car parked at the edge of the road. Sergeant Kwang Yol lazily turns his head from side to side, but suddenly he hears loud stomping feet and turns his gaze in the direction of the sound. The department head runs towards Kwang Yol because his car is next to him and tries to get away from his pursuers. He looks at the sergeant with a frightened expression on his face, but he's not going to stop for a moment. Sergeant Kwang Yol opens his mouth in surprise and watches the man in the business suit running. Du Jin, along with Ho Su, run towards Kwang Yol and yell at him to grab the criminal immediately. The tall fireman declares in a loud voice that the man who just ran past Kwang Yol is a serial arsonist. Sergeant Kwang Yol and Lance Sergeant Gun Jin stand like dumbfounded and don't understand what happened or why the guys are chasing the man. The department head opens the door of his white car and quickly gets in to get rid of his pursuers. 
He gingerly looks back at the fire department guys running towards him and quickly turns the ignition key. The serial arsonist's car speeds down the asphalt road and leaves the fourth fire department with nothing. The guys try to chase the car for a while, but they can't keep up with the speed of the car and stop in the middle of the road. Sergeant Kwang Yo follows the guys. He tries to find out from the guys the reason for their chase after the suspicious man. The guys arrive at the place where the serial arsonist wanted to set another fire, and Sergeant Kwang Yo doesn't understand which criminal his friends are talking about. He says the guys are wrong because the police department has already caught the criminal who was working in an industrial complex next to the fire center. The young firefighter silently digs in the ground and finds the very bolt with white rope that the criminal wanted to use to set the fire. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin sniffs the arsonist's bizarre invention and declares that the cloth is completely soaked in gasoline. Kwang Yo looks at the guys carefully, his eyes widening slightly in surprise. He can't believe that the culprit is still at large. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin suggests calling the police to let them investigate the case, and Kwang Yo pulls a phone out of his pocket and makes the call. Gun Jin looks around the area around him, while Kwang Yo talks to the police department on the phone and tells them about what happened in the park. Du Jin looks around and, without making eye contact with Ho Su, asks the young firefighter why the hero didn't use his ability and catch the arsonist. Junior Sergeant Ho Su twists the criminal's bolt in his hand and shakes his head negatively, saying that it couldn't have been done. Ho Su looks toward the wooded area, and Du Jin nods silently and assumes that the young firefighter had a good reason for doing so. The police car arrives at the scene where the fourth squad of the fire brigade is waiting. The detective and the suspected manager, Kim, get out of the car accompanied by police officers. Sergeant Kwang Yo looks on in surprise as his friend Kim is led in handcuffs to the scene. Manager Kim runs to Sergeant Kwang Yo with a smile on his face and tells him what happened at the police station. Sergeant Kwang Yo is very happy to meet his friend Kim, and with smiles on their faces, they strike up a casual conversation. The detective looks sternly in the direction of Kim's manager, while his colleague looks around and tries to find the crime scene with his eyes. He walks over to Kim and with a deft hand movement using a special key, frees the manager's hands from the iron handcuffs. Manager Kim continues to talk to Kwang Yeol and rejoices in the fact that he is not the one who has been cleared of all charges while the detective and his colleague await the arrival of their officers. An officer from the police department arrives on the scene and he salutes and reports on the crime scene. The head of the emergency arson investigation unit leads several specialists in special suits to gather evidence. The guys are sitting in the center of the park. They are very concerned about the fact that the police have failed to catch the real serial arsonist. Junior Sergeant Ho Su explains that the department head who was running away from them was the same serial arsonist who has been wanted for quite some time. Du Jin and Ho Su exchange their opinions about the strange man, while Kwang Yo talks to his commanding officer and tells him about the incident. Sergeant Kwang Yo reports to his commanding officer that the police have completed their investigation, and he will soon arrive at headquarters to testify. Kwang Yo points toward the exit of the park and says goodbye to the boys. He offers Gun Jin to take him home in his car. Junior Sergeant Gun Jin thanks Kwang Yo for his help and gladly accepts his offer. He says goodbye to the guys and hurriedly follows Kwang Yul. Du Jin looks at the backs of the departing boys, sad that they couldn't catch the culprit, and the young firefighter folds his hands and ponders the situation. Junior Sergeant Ho Su didn't want to let the serial arsonist go, but he had no choice but to let him go. The tall firefighter turns towards Ho Su and wants to know the details of why the hero let the arsonist get away. The young firefighter's eyes light up blue as he runs through the many events in his head and recalls the reason why the arsonist was able to escape. In another timeline, Hosu runs swiftly towards the department head to grab him, and the man desperately digs into the inside pocket of his jacket. With a deft movement of his hands, the man pulls out a small plastic bottle that is filled with a flammable substance. He sprays the flammable substance in the direction of the young firefighter who intended to grab him. The department chief lights his lighter and throws it towards Junior Sergeant Ho Su, who is doused with the flammable liquid. The young firefighter, along with his clothes, bursts into flames like a match and ignites in a bright blaze of fire. He tells Do Jin that in another timeline, a serial arsonist set him on fire without the slightest hesitation. The tall firefighter looks over at Ho Su worriedly. He couldn't imagine that the reason the hero couldn't capture the culprit was so serious. Junior Sergeant Hosu folds the lock in his hands.
He tells Du Jin that he's worried that there might be real victims in the arsonist's case now. The young fireman's gaze turns as cold as ice as he tells Du Jin that the culprit is truly dangerous and must be caught. The young firefighter Ho Su recalls the words of his instructor, C.O. Lee Gong, who once told him that you don't need to think about such nonsense as consequences if your instincts can save many lives. Ho Su also recalled his recent conversation with the director of the Chakdo Division Center, who wanted to make him a sergeant and offered to take on a case. Junior Sergeant Ho Su looks somewhere in the distance and declares to Dojin in a calm voice that they must capture the arsonist at all costs. The young firefighter is replaying in his head footage from another time period where he is set on fire by a criminal, while Dojin watches the scene in horror. A huge column of flames engulfs Ho Su from head to toe, causing the young firefighter to scream in unbearable pain and the heat of the fire. The fire department colonel presses a small rag firmly against his cut to close the wound as soon as possible. The colonel's face squinting in uncomfortable pain, he stares intently at his hand and hopes that the wound will heal soon. Colonel Jong Hyun Chul, the head of the Chaco Central Department, greets his guest from the chemical department with a smile on his face. A man in a brown jacket places a small vase of flowers on the table with an inscription with best wishes for the firefighters attached. The central chief gets up from his seat and heads over to the vase to examine it closely. A man in a brown jacket introduces himself as Choi Ji Hyun and reveals that he is a division chief at Sammy Chemical. Colonel Jong Hyun Chul takes a seat in a cushioned chair across from the chemical plant chief and wonders what he can do for him. The plant manager, Ji Hong, scrutinizes the colonel and adjusts his glasses slightly as he listens to the colonel's misunderstandings about the purpose of his visit. Ji Hong waits for the colonel to finish his speech before he corrects his glasses and says that he only brought the gift as a tribute to the fire department. The head of the central department is watching carefully the guest from the chemical plant, who is seated across from him. The head of the chemical plant assures the colonel that the beautiful vase is just a token of respect and that he just wanted to meet the colonel in person. Colonel Jung Hyun Chul looks at his guest with a calm expression, but his facial expressions and the strange gift from the head of the company have him very puzzled. The colonel holds his injured hand tightly in a cloth and remembers a past conversation with the chemical plant chief. Colonel Cho Kwang Nak unceremoniously walks into the office of the head of the central office and informs him that the serial arsonist is none other than Chi Hong, the head of the chemical plant. He lowers his eyes to the floor and sees a huge broken vase of flowers with a white label with painted wishes for the firefighters on it. Colonel Cho Kwang raises his head at the central department chief. He is a bit confused and doesn't know what to say next. Chief Hyung Chul continues to hold his wound with a white handkerchief and looks menacingly at Colonel Cho Kwang. An awkward pause briefly hangs in the air between the two colonels as Fire Chief Chakdo Cho Kwang reports on the investigation regarding the head of the chemical factory. Head of the central office, Young Chul, stops his colleague half-heartedly and says that he knows exactly what the situation is at the moment. He is surprised to hear from his colleague that a contract has been signed between the factory and the fire department for the supply of fire hoses. Colonel Hyung Chul is wondering how such a small company could have a contract with a government agency. He turns his gaze sharply to his colleague and asks with a loud intonation how a small company managed to survive the fearsome competition. Colonel Cho Kwang begins to stammer and suggests that the head of the chemical plant had some help from above. Cho Kwang flinches sharply and his face takes on a frightened expression as he realizes it's about him. Colonel Hyun Chul's face takes on horrified features and he covers part of his face with his palm and talks about how no one has ever been able to strike him to the core before. Colonel Cho Kwang coughs slightly and says that the head of the department has decided not to limit himself to cooperating with the police, but to use a special fire department. Colonel Hyung Chul clasps his watch on his wrist and ponders his colleague's report and agrees with the suggestion to involve the fire department. Hyun Chul adjusts the collar of his jacket, and at the threshold of his office door, he says he's going straight to the head of the department. He turns around abruptly and with a gentle smile on his face, asks his colleague to call one of the employees and clean the office. The first team of the Chakdo Central Division is on night duty. The firefighters are sitting in an office room listening to a breaking news report. On the big TV screen, the news anchor is speaking. The girl tells that the police department has recently released the first suspect, Mr. Kim, from custody. 
Yaren listens to the news report and worries that the serial arsonist is still walking around free. The girl is reporting from the scene where the real culprit, Choi Ji-hoon, was last seen, intent on setting a fire in a park area. Yaren pays attention to the noisy notifications her cell phone makes and gets distracted from watching the news. The girl picks up her phone and discovers several missed messages from her fellow fourth squad members. Yaren decides that she will reply a little later to her friend's messages and turns the sound off completely so that the phone doesn't interfere with her work. She puts the phone aside and settles at her desk to start working on her paperwork. Yaren looks at the phone in surprise because it has started making loud noises again, which sound very much like a ringing sound. The girl picks up her cell phone and sees on the screen of her device a call notification from her friend Ho Su. The yellow lights of the bustling metropolis brightly illuminate the city's night sky, causing the stars to hide behind the clouds. At night, the city roads never cease to rest, with hundreds of cars passing through them in a hurry to go about their business. The small building of the Kamho Fire Station is located in the center of the city. Like the rest of the city, it does not sleep even at night. The firefighters are working out in the gym and discussing a serial arsonist who turns out to be the director of a chemical plant. The firemen assume that the police will catch the culprit sooner or later, so they have a casual conversation with each other and don't worry about the arsonist. Sergeant Gyun Seok does a few waits and suggests to his friend an interesting solution, to catch the culprit themselves. The firefighter smiles and suggests that his friend just wants a reward so he can get a chance to join the special response squad. Sergeant Gyun Seok wipes his glasses and talks about how he had to miss the special fire squad exams because of a few statements in civil court, but now he wants to make up for it. Sergeant G. Gyun Seok from the security center wipes his sweaty cheeks with his hand and promises his friend that he will personally catch the culprit. A poster of serial arsonist Choi Ji Hoon is put up in the city with his face and details about his physique. In Chakto City, passenger cars and buses flow from side to side uninterruptedly. It seems that the news of the serial arsonist has not stirred up the public much. Police officers patrol the surrounding park area. They are looking for the perpetrator's car because they know its make and license plate number. The patrol team manages to find the car of the criminal, which he left on the curb, and they quickly head towards it. The police officers conduct a thorough search of the criminal's car, but except for an illegal spy radio, they manage to find nothing. Serial arsonist Ji Hong drives his car through the city at night and listens to the police squad's transmissions with the spy radio. Chi Hong's face lights up with a bright smile as he realizes that he knows the direction of all the patrol cars in the city thanks to his walkie-talkie. The head of the police department shows a map of Chakdo City. He says that the criminal is unable to avoid all the police checkpoints and leave the city without a means of transportation. Arsonist Ji Hong walks through the night city along the garages in an attempt to find a suitable car to escape the city. He carefully makes it to his house, but finds squads of police waiting for his return near the entrance of the building. The head of the police department provides photos of the hotels and orders his squad leaders to comb each one. The police squad search the perpetrator's room and interview Ji Hoon's neighbors, showing a picture of the perpetrator. The police go into each room of the hotel to make sure the serial arsonist is not hiding in one of them. Chief Choi Chi Hong is very tired. He hasn't slept in days and goes into the bathing facilities to relax a bit. He undresses near his locker and notices the police squad, causing him to have to leave the premises very quickly. The serial arsonist manages to sneak past the cops, removes his goggles and plunges into the warm bath. He enjoys the warm bath with a smile on his face and is proud that he was able to get past all the police patrols. The police assume that chemical plant manager Ji Hong will definitely contact his manager Kim, so they decide to patrol at the manager's house and wait for the call. Du Jin comes to the restaurant at the request of Junior Sergeant Ho Su, who wants to discuss the serial arsonist case with him. The young firefighter tells Do Jin that the police are misguided in their investigation and don't understand how to catch a criminal. The tall firefighter listens to his friend, but doesn't understand why Ho Su is ironclad that the police are failing in their investigation. Junior Sergeant Ho Su reveals that with his ability he has been able to see an alternate future for a huge period of time. The tall fireman looks at Ho Su with surprise. He doesn't quite understand what exactly the young fireman was able to see. The story moves to an alternate future where a criminal manages to douse Hosu with a flammable mixture and set him on fire.
A squad of medical workers carefully place the young firefighter screaming in pain on a stretcher and take him to the intensive care unit. Surgeons perform several complex surgeries and then place a breathing tube on Hosu's face. Hosu wakes up in the general ward, every part of his body bandaged. He feels intense pain and tries to understand what is happening. He turns his head to the left and looks at the TV news program on, which is about a serial arsonist. The news anchor calls the culprit Ji Hong, the second fire squirrel, and tells him that there have been six arson attacks in one month. The correspondent reports from the scene of the last arson and says that this time there were several victims who suffered minor burns. The tall fireman is very surprised by Ho Su's story. He couldn't imagine that the ability to see the future could work in such a way. The young fireman thinks that the wanted notice is a small annoyance for serial arsonist Chi Hong. Ho Su is absolutely certain that the arson attacks won't stop, so he suggests Dojin deal with the arsonist together. Ji Hong, the head of the chemical plant, sits in front of the mirror and scratches a small stubble on his face with his hand. He looks at his reflection carefully and thinks about the wanted notice that the police department has put up. The chemical plant supervisor adjusts his stubble with a small razor and heads toward the locker room. The perpetrator, Chi Hong, walks along the bathhouse corridor and leaves his broken glasses on a small wooden table. The cops check out the locker room and their eyes stop on Chief Chi Hong, who is stowing his belongings neatly. They head over to him and ask to see the man's face and show any identification he has. The firefighters get a little worried when serial arsonist Chi Hong continues to stand by his locker. Chi Hong apologizes to the police officers and closes his locker. He has changed his hair and face a lot, so the law enforcement officers can't recognize him as a criminal. He rummages through his locker for a long time and holds out his ID card to the policeman and smiles broadly. The policeman takes the ID card in his hand and sees that it belongs to one Pang Cho Bai, who lives in the 123rd apartment. The policeman checks against Ji Hong's face and the fake ID, and then holds out the ID card back into the supervisor's hands. The serial arsonist exhales heavily. He's very happy that he managed to outsmart the law enforcers again. Warden Lee Hong is left alone in the locker room. He bangs a chicken egg on the wooden bench a few times to crack it. He has rented a small room for himself, and in complete silence, he takes his small dinner, which consists of nothing but eggs. Li Hong hits the wooden bench harder and harder with each new egg and greedily devours it. The serial arsonist recalls his past work. His female employee apologizes with a calm expression and says that it's very difficult for her to do his assignment. The head of the department screams at Chief Choi and tells him that his request will be denied because his department has no business doing nonsense. Li Hong once again shows up at his director's office and hears insults and accusations of total incompetence. Chief Li Hong closes himself off from the flames of the burning chemical plant building. He doesn't know what to do and looks around. He watches as the fire blows out the windows of the chemical plant and spreads throughout the building. Chief Li Hong looks at the fire and without looking at his phone dials emergency services to call the fire department to the scene. Serial arsonist Li Hong looks at the phone from where the dispatcher's voice comes out asking, what can he do to help? Li Hong walks around for a very long time. He thanks the dispatcher for his work and can't find the words to report the fire. Chief Li Hong tells the dispatcher on the phone that he is an employee of the chemical plant and gives his full name. Li Hong, an employee of the chemical plant, starts to panic. Tears start to flow from his eyes and he can't find the right words to report the fire. To the great surprise of Li Hong's supervisor, the dispatcher has no problem understanding what has happened and informs him that a team of firefighters will arrive on the scene soon. The serial arsonist is sitting in the locker room changing his shoes. He reminisces about his hard work that he had no place in. A horrible smile paints on serial arsonist Li Hong's face as he remembers the fire he saw for the first time in his life. Junior Sergeant Ho Su points out that the serial arsonist is bound to prove himself and set several arsons. Du Jin sits idly at his desk and listens to Ho Su's story that the police's suggestion that the perpetrator's inaction is fatally flawed. The young firefighter points out that there are big differences from the alternate future because in it, the police couldn't find the perp's walkie-talkie and car. Ho Su reveals that the serial arsonist's real goal is not the arsons themselves, but to summon firefighters to the scene of the fire. Du Jin looks at the young fireman with a nervous smile. 
He's not sure that without a walkie-talkie and a car, Chief Lee Hong will be able to pull off another arson attack. The tall fireman realizes to his horror that there is another way the serial arsonist can achieve his goal without information. The young firefighter nods approvingly in Du Jin's direction and talks about how Chief Lee Hong is certain to commit a grand crime, so the fire department declares an emergency meeting. Junior Sergeant Ho Su has heard before about the special emergency assembly order, and he explains to the tall firefighter that if such an order comes to fruition, the fire departments from the surrounding areas will be forced to join forces and go to the scene. The tall firefighter is very worried that the serial arsonist will decide to start a fire on a huge scale and wants it to remain just a small speculation. The young firefighter raises a finger up and brings it up to his blue eye. He talks about seeing the scene of a grand fire at some point. Dujin nervously swirls the tube in his glass and talks about how the situation is much more serious than he realized. Hosu talks about how even though he knows the supposed location of the huge fire, he doesn't know when exactly it will happen. The young firefighter closes his eyes and is transported to the future for a while. He stands beside Yeren and Dojin in the night forest. The guys are silently watching a huge fire that is consuming the construction site of a huge shopping center building. Junior Sergeant Hosu points out that Yeren was with them at the time of the fire, and so the grand fire will not happen tonight. The story shifts to the future that Hosu saw. Yeren is standing at the forest edge and stares in the direction of the fire with her mouth open in surprise. Hosu is sure the fire won't happen today. He tells Dojin that Yeren called and asked her to take a vacation for three days. The tall fireman finishes his cocktail and ponders the young fireman's words about the upcoming fire. Dujin tightly closes the lid on his cocktail and voices his assumption that during the three days of Yeren's vacation, when the girl is with them, there will be a fire. The young fireman nods silently. He looks at the tall fireman and expects him to help him in this difficult endeavor. The tall fireman crosses his arms on his chest with a smile on his face. He praises Hosu for his competent use of the ability to see the future. Junior Sergeant Hosu twirls the coffee glass in his hand and talks about how when Aaron is around him, he is more excited and can see the future much farther ahead. The tall firefighter looks at his friend carefully. He hopes Ho Su understands why he has a restless feeling in his heart when Aaron is around. Du Jin closes his eyes in frustration when Ho Su voices that the object of his worry lies in the sudden blow that Yaren could strike at any moment. The young fireman finishes his cocktail and looks at the tall fireman and his frustration with mild bewilderment. Du Jin brushes off any unnecessary emotion. He stands up abruptly from his table and asks the young firefighter for a plan of action. The young firefighter is walking through the night city in casual clothes, a small black backpack on his back. Sergeant Ji Gyun Seok puts an earpiece in his ears and uses them to talk to his friend and the fire department. The fireman asks Gyun Seok not to take any hasty action because the police department is capable of dealing with the arsonist on their own. Young Sergeant Gyun Seok ignores his colleague's words and continues to study the empty room of the building under construction. Gyun Seok stops by a large concrete column of the building and tells his friend that if he just sits and waits, the chance will slip away. The sergeant finds a secluded spot and picks through his small bag. He tells his friend that the serial arsonist might want to play around properly before he leaves. Sergeant Goon Sayok pulls a small baseball bat out of his backpack and starts patrolling the construction building, talking to his friend along the way. The firefighter tells the sergeant through his headphones that he will only waste his day off if he continues to stay at the construction site. Goon Sayok interrupts his friend's speech, looking out over the city from the ledge of the building under construction, and says that if a criminal's goal is to attract as much attention as possible, he will definitely target the buildings of the department store under construction. The huge building of the department store under construction looms in the distance, and only Sergeant Gyun Seok is hidden in its semi-darkness. Sergeant Gyun Seok makes the assumption that if there is a huge fire at the construction site, firefighters from different regions will surely rush to the site. He walks over to a small metal fence and looks down, imagining in his head how many fire trucks would be here in case of a fire. A huge picture of a fire breaks out in Gyun Seok's mind, with a huge number of fire trucks piling up underneath a building under construction. Sergeant Gyun Seok steps away from the small balcony and examines the construction site step by step for a serial arsonist. Bright rays of sunlight illuminate Sergeant Gyun Seok's back. It's dawn, 
and the firefighter decides to take a well-deserved rest. Minutes later, serial arsonist Lee Hong appears at the spot where Gyun Seok once stood, having chosen a mall building under construction as his target for arson. The tall fireman checks his watch. He assumes that the Neo Department Store construction building will be the arsonist's target. The young firefighter stares silently at Dojin, then suggests a nighttime ambush on the arsonist. The serial arsonist swarms the restricted area looking for missing ingredients. He, like the firefighters, is preparing for his arson. Above Chief Lee Hong's head, a red sign is painted that states that there are fire hazardous substances in the area, and the passage is off limits to outsiders. Young Jin and Bo Ram spend time in the place, visiting a large shopping center. The girl tries on a small silver ring on her hand. The saleswoman takes Bo Ram's hand and points out that the girl has beautiful hands because a silver ring doesn't fit everyone. The old woman smiles broadly and says that she didn't sell the silver ring on purpose and was waiting for customers she liked. Bo Ram looks at the saleswoman with a smile, while Young Jin looks around and waits for his girlfriend's decision. The salesgirl's gaze gets narrower as she looks at Young Jin and thinks about how to convince the man to buy a ring for his beloved. Young Jin is distracted from his reverie when he hears the elderly salesgirl's voice asking to see the other rings. The elderly girl shows her entire assortment of merchandise and assures the young couple that there is nothing better than the silver ring on her counter. The saleswoman is confident that her flawless sales technique will get anyone to buy her merchandise and waits for Young Jin to agree to pay for the ring. The senior medicine man looks at his girlfriend carefully and waits for her to make a decision to buy the silver ring. The saleswoman makes the assumption that if the couple walks around the department store, someone else will be able to buy the ring at that time. Young Jin and the elderly salesgirl are very surprised when they hear Bo Ram say that she doesn't want to buy that silver ring. The girl says that the ring will have to be removed all the time at the scene, and she's afraid she'll lose it because of that. The saleswoman looks at the girl in surprise and doesn't understand what kind of call and scene we are talking about. Bo Ram smiles good-naturedly at the salesgirl and holds out a silver ring to her, thanking her for her help in choosing the ring. The girl runs after Young Jin, trying to catch up with him, while the saleswoman remains alone at her counter, still bewildered by the incident. Bo Ram clings tightly to Young Jin's shoulder and says frustratedly that she wanted to buy a pair of rings before the chief medical officer left for the special unit. Young Jin points to the construction site and says that once the new department store is finished, they can go shopping again. Bo Ram nods cheerfully, and the couple continues to walk through the narrow streets of the city, discussing where to go for a warm meal. None of the people suspect that soon the peaceful construction site of Neo's department store may turn into a huge ash pit. The girl tells Young Jin that she wants to go into the restroom and asks the senior medic to wait outside for a while. The senior medic looks at Bo Ram's back and thinks about the pair of rings his girlfriend was talking about. He turns back abruptly and runs to the counter where he and Bo Ram had recently seen the silver ring. The saleswoman tiredly lays out her merchandise, then turns at the sound of quick footsteps approaching her counter. Young Jin stands in front of the counter. Trying to catch his breath, he tells the shopkeeper that he wants to buy the ring along with a chain around his neck. The saleswoman smiles wryly and, in a calm voice, charges a hefty price for a silver ring and chain. A huge number of different stores and souvenir stores stand one after another waiting for customers to open their doors. Young fireman Ho Su and tall fireman Du Jin sit next to each other in a coffee shop and sip their drinks. The guys wait for Yeren to arrive and tell the girl about their plan to ambush a serial arsonist in a building under construction. Yeren sits opposite the guys with her hands folded on her chest and thinks over the guy's strange proposal, which the girl doesn't really believe will be successful. Junior Sergeant Hosu and Dojin look at each other when they hear Yarin's suggestion to simply call the police to the location of the alleged perpetrator. The girl suggests coming up with some excuse to call the police to the construction site when the arsonist is there. Yaren looks around and sees a small camping bag with supplies for illuminating the area on a nearby table, and with a sharp kick of his foot, he shoves the lamp off the table. The tall fireman stands up abruptly from his seat and declares that the lamp Yaren just tossed off belonged to him. Du Jin carefully reassembles the lamp and is relieved when he realizes that the lamp was just separated into parts and not broken. The tall fireman quickly reassembles the lamp with deft hand movements and talks about how it takes up very little space if rolled up well. The young firefighter admires Du Jin's reasoning, 
and Yaren again irritably asks why the guys need a camping lamp. Junior Sergeant Ho Su's calm voice calms the girl down, and she turns her gaze to the young firefighter. Ho Su tells Aaron that if they call the police to the scene of the alleged crime, they won't be able to get to the construction site themselves, and Dojin shows the girl a comfortable sleeping bag while explaining to the young fireman. The hero points out that the police would never allow the fireman to catch a dangerous criminal, so he suggests that they act on their own in apprehending the serial arsonist. The girl continues to listen to Hosu and covers her face with her hand in annoyance when she sees Dojin pulling out another item from his hiking backpack. Do Jin and Staff Sergeant Ho Su abruptly freeze when they hear the indignation from their friend. Yaren suggests that the guys first hide inside a mall under construction before reporting a possible crime to the police. The boys look admiringly at their clever companion and agree with Aaron's plan to call the police. With a smile on her face, she raises a finger in the air and suggests that they go home to pack up their belongings and meet up later in the evening. Bright rays of sunlight illuminate the huge complex of the Neo Shopping Center building under construction, which at first glance doesn't have a single soul in it. Young Sergeant Ji Geun Seok sits on the top floor of the building, propped up against a concrete partition, waiting for a serial arsonist. The sergeant has been sitting alone in the huge building for quite some time, and decides to throw a baseball at the wall out of boredom. Geun Seok has been sitting on the concrete floor for several hours. He has taken off his glasses and stares sleepily toward the wall across from him. Small bags form under the young sergeant's eyes, indicating that Geun Seok has been up all night. An abandoned baseball rolls peacefully toward its owner, and a few rays of sunlight reflect a small, round shadow off the ball. The sergeant closes his eyes and reminisces about his hard work days, a huge pile of pages flying beside his nonchalant face. The center director points his finger at him, and in a loud voice reprimands him for the huge number of civil lawsuits sent to court. The center director's mouth drools with anger for Sergeant Gyun Seok's unprofessional behavior while rescuing a man with a fracture. Sergeant Gyun Seok stares emotionlessly at the center director yelling at him and waits for this conversation to finally end. The center commander's voice is so loud that the entire fire station, which is in the office building, can clearly hear his indignation directed at Gyun Seok. The sergeant puts his hands behind his back and says in a calm voice, that no one saw him carry the injured man out and why he did so. The center director starts to boil. He slowly turns around to the sergeant and starts yelling at him again. For the first time in the entire conversation, there is an emotion of surprise on Gyun Suk's face at such indignation from the center director. The center director points out that the sergeant has no right to correct him and is only obligated to rebuke him and apologize for his misconduct. The squad leader walks past the center director's office and hears loud shouting coming from the door. Commander Kang Myung Jun walks into the center director's office and interrupts the heavy conversation between the sergeant and the director. The commander with a smile on his face approaches the sergeant. He puts his hand on Gyun Seok's back and asks the center director not to waste priceless words on the misbehaving sergeant. Sergeant Gyun Seok is deeply impressed by his commander's words, but he doesn't dare to object and silently listens to his speech. The commander pats the sergeant on the back and listens to the center director's angry speech about not letting things go. Commander Kang Myung Jun just nods silently and smiles in response to the center director's anger at Sergeant Gun Suk's performance. The commander clutches his sergeant's clothes tightly because he knows very well that the center director is wrong, but he can't say anything in response. The baseball slowly rolls to its owner's feet and distracts Sergeant Gyun Suk from his thoughts about the past incident. As the sergeant slowly picks up the baseball from the floor, he examines it and thinks about how he should have handled the situation with the victim for whom he has a huge lawsuit in civil court. Night falls. The bright stars of the night sky illuminate a huge mall building under construction with only one person inside. Sergeant Gaon Seok continues to fly in his thoughts and clutches the baseball tightly in his palm with his right hand. He sees several dark figures heading towards the construction site fence of the commercial building. Yaren and Ho Su look up to the upper floors of the commercial building and notice a sergeant there, silhouetted against the bright starry sky. Do Jin notices the worry on the boys' faces. He throws his hiking backpack off his shoulders and heads in their direction. 
The tall firefighter kneads his shoulders in a circular motion and asks Junior Sergeant Ho Su what they will do about the suspicious man upstairs. Yaren adjusts his cap slightly and pulls it over his eyes, and Ho Su assures the guys that the suspicious man is definitely not a criminal. Young firefighter Ho Su says that the suspicious man has pretty good clothes and a young age, which doesn't make him look like a serial arsonist at all. A loud bang inside the hiking bag stops Hosu's speech, and the young firefighter turns toward the sound. Aaron grabs Du Jin's hiking backpack by the strap and talks about how the guys can't make any more noise because the culprit could be anywhere. The girl throws the backpack on her shoulders and suggests that they act carefully and quietly, or else their efforts will be for naught. Yaren walks over to Do Jin and holds out the backpack to him. The girl suggests avoiding the fifth floor for now and sitting quietly on the fourth floor. The tall fireman doesn't fully agree with the girl's suggestion. He points out that the fourth floor is much more spacious. Du Jin suggests climbing higher to spot and catch the culprit faster, but Aaron waves his head negatively. The girl turns her head to the tall firefighter and explains that if they occupy the lower floors of the building, the criminal will have nowhere to run. Junior Sergeant Ho Su listens intently to Yaren's plan and moves with the guys, but stops as soon as the girl calls out to him. Yaren asks Ho Su to call the police and tell them that he's seen the criminal here often, and the young firefighter quickly puts his hand in his pocket to pull out his cell phone. A building under construction stands lonely in the distance from the other houses, and the guys slowly and carefully head in its direction. The firefighters follow each other and climb up the tall staircase that leads to the fourth floor of the building. Junior Sergeant Ho Su stops near the iron grate that sits along the length of the stairwell and looks up to see what is below. The young firefighter continues to follow Aaron and notices a silver thermos sticking out of her half-opened backpack. With each step the girl takes, the thermos swings from side to side and then abruptly falls out of the backpack and flies downward. The thermos is about to make contact with the iron railing of the stairs, but Ho Su manages to catch it with his free hand and avoid the loud noise. The young fireman exhales heavily and looks at the thermos that he managed to catch by some miracle. He takes a long look at it and then looks up, where he hears some strange scraping of the iron steps. Yaren also notices this strange sound and raises his startled gaze in the direction of the strange noise. Junior Sergeant Ho Su and Yaren look up at the top of the red stairs and try to figure out what is making the strange noises. Du Jin, who has gone ahead of the guys, comes down the stairs and calms down Yaren and Ho Su because they were startled by the sound of the tall fireman's footsteps. Yaren rises from the steps and hears the distant noise of a car gradually approaching the construction site. Young Sergeant Ji Gyun Seok holds a baseball tightly in his hand and sits immovably on the fifth floor, listening to the extraneous sounds. A small car rushes through the narrow streets of the building, heading toward the construction site its bright headlights illuminating the paved road and neighboring buildings. Yaren recognizes this car as a police patrol and suggests that the guys hurry to the fourth floor as quickly as possible. The guys hide in a huge hurry in the back of the building. They completely fail to notice that they have mistakenly entered the fifth floor of the construction site. The young Sergeant Ji Gyun Siok hears the sound of a car engine. He gets up from his seat and with a bat in his hands goes to see what's going on outside. The sergeant leans on the iron railing with his free hand and looks around carefully for the source of the noise. He notices a small white car parked near the construction site building, parked near the fence but left with its headlights on. The face of a police department detective peeks out of the white car as he dines on a burger and scrutinizes the construction site. A new day is dawning. Bright rays of sunlight break through the clear sky that is covered with cotton wool clouds and illuminate the construction site of the shopping center. Sergeant Ji Gyun walks down to the lower floors and goes into the restroom stall to clean up and wash his face. Near the sink, O oh places his cell phone, which plays a breaking news report about a serial arsonist. The young sergeant washes his face several times and learns from the breaking news report that the police have increased the number of search parties. Sergeant Ji Gyun Seok removes his hands from his wet face and stares at the phone screen for a while as the news report plays. The sergeant wipes his face with a towel and ponders the information of the breaking news report. He doesn't know how to react properly to the fact that the police still haven't caught the criminal. Gyun Seok wipes his face thoroughly with a towel 
and hopes for the serial arsonist to show up at the construction site. He wipes his glasses and remembers the car that stopped near the construction site in the late afternoon and assumes that it definitely didn't have the culprit in it. The sergeant once again goes over the recent events in his head as he suddenly hears the voices of people approaching the restroom stall. Yaren, Du Jin, and Ho Su head towards the restroom stalls to clean up and discuss bookworks along the way. The girl looks around in the toilet stall and Du Jin tells Ho Su about the book he and the girl were reading together at night. Aaron's head stops spinning from side to side and freezes in one direction, while the guys continue to talk about books in a carefree manner. The girl holds out her palm to the guys, causing the young firefighter Ho Su and Du Jin to quickly fall silent and listen to their surroundings. Yaren puts his finger to his lips to hint to the guys with a gesture that they should be quiet, and with his other hand, he points toward the sinks. The guys notice the wet brush on the sink that Sergeant Ji Gyun Siuk forgot to take with him in his haste and stare at it silently. Sergeant Ji Gyun Siok opens the door of his cubicle and watches with a surprised look on his face as the guys discover his brush. To his surprise, the young sergeant hears more voices heading towards the toilet stalls and closes the door. The guys turn to leave the restroom stall and hear a loud conversation coming from outside from two men whose footsteps are slowly approaching them. The detective and his assistant go into the restroom stalls and discuss what a witness has told them about seeing the perpetrator near the construction site. The assistant detective suddenly falls silent and his head lolls in the direction of the sinks of the toilet stall he is entering. The police officers enter the two of them into the toilet stalls and look around carefully, while not uttering a single word. They see the perfectly clean and well-maintained sinks in front of them and marvel at the beauty of the restroom that the builders have already finished. Someone's hand tightly grips Sergeant Ji Gaon Suk's brush, which he had unceremoniously left lying on the sink. The guys manage to hide in the toilet stall, but completely miss Sergeant Ji Gaon Suk, who was previously hiding in the same toilet stall. Yaren holds the sergeant's brush in her hands and brings her finger to her lips to gesture to the guys about staying quiet. The girl's face suddenly turns pale, and her mouth opens slightly in surprise as she looks at her friends. Yaren notices that amongst Ho Su and Do Jin, there is Sergeant Ji Gyun Siok sitting on the toilet, who the guys didn't notice when they entered the stall. The girl quickly covers her mouth with one hand to keep from screaming in fright and giving away her location to the police. Do Jin and the young firefighter Ho Su turn back to see what surprised and scared the girl so much. Yaren quickly covers the mouth of Junior Sergeant Ho Su, who almost screams at the sudden appearance of another person in the stall. The hero immediately covers Du Jin's mouth with his palm so that he too won't make a single sound before the police officers leave. The tall firefighter closes Sergeant Gun Suk's mouth with a lightning fast hand, causing his glasses to fall off his face. The guys press their palms firmly against each other's mouths and try not to make a single sound so they won't be discovered by the police. The detective washes his face and raises his head towards his assistant as he continues to talk about the construction site. The detective's colleague washes his hands and points out that the construction site of a building under construction is too exposed a place for everyone to safely enter. The detective agrees with his associate and says that the place could use at least some security to keep an eye on the area. The boys listen to the conversation between the two policemen, and their eyes are fixed on the door of the toilet stall where they are hiding, because they are afraid that the policemen might open it. Young Sergeant Gyun Seok scrutinizes the guys who so unceremoniously barged into his stall and tries to figure out what they're doing here. As the sergeant looks at the guys' backs, a suggestion flashes through his mind that they might be criminals. Yeren, Dojin, and Ho Su seem to sense Sergeant Gyun Suk's piercing gaze and turn in his direction. Young Sergeant Gyun Seok looks questioningly at the guys who turn around, whose gaze is piercing in his direction. The tall fireman scrutinizes Gyun Seok he suggests that the serial arsonist across from him might be sitting across from him. Sergeant Goon Seok realizes that the guys are looking at him with great suspicion. He starts to turn his head from side to side so that his glasses almost fly off his face. Goon Seok looks at the guys appraisingly and guesses that one of them called the police squad on purpose because he guessed the possible target of the serial arsonist. The young firefighter continues to listen to the police talk and turns his head toward the sergeant to scrutinize him. Sergeant Gyun Seok calms down slightly when he learns that the guys around him are not criminals and sits silently on the toilet, waiting for the cops to finally leave.
The guys, to their surprise, hear the voice of the detective's assistant suggesting that they send a daytime patrol to the construction site. The detective shakes off his wet hands and offers to walk through the construction site again to check out the place for himself. He turns to his co-worker and asks if he has an extra towel, but the deputy just silently waves his hands. The guys get very tense when they hear the assistant detective suggest that they could use toilet paper from the stalls to wipe their hands. The detective says there is no need to use toilet paper. He wipes his wet hands on his clothes and heads with his assistant to exit the restroom stalls. Yaren carefully opens the toilet stall door and checks through the small slit to see if the police have left. The young fireman and Ho-Su silently look at the girl and wait for her command to come out. The young sergeant Ji gun Seok glances back and forth at the stall door and Do-Jin, who glances in his direction in an extremely aggressive manner. The detective and his assistant leave the restroom stall and continue their patrol while discussing the serial arsonist. Yaren gives the command and the guys like a huge bullet fly out of the stuffy stall towards the toilet sinks. The girl turns to the guys and discusses the situation. The guy's belongings are left in the building under construction, and she is afraid that the day patrol might find them. Aaron interrupts her reasoning and looks at the tall firefighter and Sergeant Gyun Seok, who are fighting with each other. Sergeant Gyun Seok and Do Jin are holding each other tightly by the fabric of their clothes and trying to figure out the other's identity. The young firefighter tries to separate the guys and gingerly looks towards Aaron, who only sighs heavily and watches the argument between the stranger and the tall firefighter. The guys, along with Sergeant Giunsiak, go outside and discuss the situation between them. The sergeant adjusts his glasses and scrutinizes each person across from him. Junior Sergeant Ho Su feels Aaron's gaze on him and whispers for her to trust him in this situation. Sergeant Giunsiak looks at the firefighter ID card that the hero provided him and realizes that the firefighters in front of him are firefighters just like himself. He holds out the fire ID card back to Ho Su and asks his co-workers what they are at this construction site for. The young firefighter takes his ID card back and explains that they're here to catch a serial arsonist, and Yaren and Do Jin stare at the young sergeant in silence. Gyun Siok looks at his colleagues with a haughty smile and says that they're doing a lot of nonsense since they've decided to catch the three of them. The sergeant sighs heavily. The guys continue to stare at Gyun Siok and wait to see what he has to say next, and Aaron gets angry at the sergeant's pompous way of talking. Gunseok fixes his glasses and calls the guys yokels who have no idea what they're getting into. The young firefighter doesn't pay attention to his fellow officer's rude words and silently listens to the sergeant, while Aaron opens his mouth but can't find the right words. Sergeant Gunseok points out that the police or himself will soon catch the serial arsonist and suggests that the guys go home. Yaren and the young firemen are very surprised by this turn of events. They didn't expect the sergeant to insist that they leave the construction site. Sergeant Gunseok lifts his chin and says that he will give the guys one good piece of advice. Don't be heroes. Aaron assures Gunseok that he's in the same situation as the guys and doesn't understand how the sergeant is different from them. The sergeant walks up to Aaron with a smile on his face and talks about how he's not like them because he has nowhere to go back to unlike the guys. The girl looks up at Sergeant Gyun Suk, his face expressing surprise at the sincerity of the sergeant in front of her. Sergeant Gyun Seok tells her that he was sued when he saved a man, so he won't be getting promoted in the fire department anymore. Du Jin takes her gaze away from the sergeant and scratches the back of her head as she ponders Sergeant Gyun Seok's words. Sergeant Gyun Seok explains to the guys that the only thing he can do with his own hands is to catch a serial arsonist. The sergeant turns his back to the guys. He waves goodbye to them and calls himself a total loser. He slowly walks towards the mall building under construction and asks the guys not to follow him because otherwise his bad luck will spill over to them. Gyun Seok pauses in place for a while and then turns around with a smile on his face, saying that if among the things the guys left behind are items from the fire station, have them pointed out when testifying at the police station. The guys stare silently at the back of the departing Sergeant Gyun Suk and don't utter a single word in response to his advice. Du Jin interrupts the silence and explains to the guys that sometimes there are people who are well traumatized by reality but not turned inside out. Sergeant Gyun Seok silently heads to his seat at the construction site and ponders the meeting with his colleagues in his head. The silence at the construction site is interrupted by a loud voice calling out to a detective of the police station. 
The detective goes to the top floor of the building under construction and asks his partner to speak as quietly as possible. The detective's co-worker points to the sleeping bags and belongings the boys left behind and says that at least three people slept here. The deputy suggests that the detective tell the base about his find because they may not be able to handle three criminals. The detective fully agrees with his colleague, but warns that if these people turn out to be simple homeless people, he will not take responsibility for this call. The deputy fumbles through his pockets on the twist and offers to go back to the car to get his handcuffs, and the detective nods approvingly and tells him to calm down. The detective tells his deputy in the back to be as quiet as possible and continues to look through the guy's belongings they left on the fifth floor. The detective squats down and opens the camping bag he assumes the teenager may have left behind. He hears the quick sounds of footsteps approaching him and turns his head, beckoning to his deputy. A man is heading towards the detective, who is holding a wrench in his hands and knocks the sloppy detective out with it. Sergeant G. Gyun Seok examines his wrinkled glasses and spins the meeting with his colleagues from the fire department in his head. The sergeant walks down the narrow street along the fence of the construction site and remembers Du Jin's face, which reminds him a lot of someone. The sergeant takes a few steps, his breathing starts to gradually hitch, and he keeps replaying his memories of the tall firefighter in his head. Gyun Seok stops abruptly in the middle of the road and turns his head in the direction of the guys he was recently talking to. The sergeant's face fills with slight surprise, small drops of sweat dripping down his face. Gyun Seok finally remembers how he knows the tall fireman's name. The story shifts to Sergeant Gyun Seok's memories when his squad arrived at the disaster of the tunnel collapse. As the firefighting squad gets out of the vehicle and checks their equipment, Sergeant Gun Seok looks at the collapsed tunnel in amazement and freezes in horror. Commander Kang Myung Jun sees the concern on his subordinate's face and comes closer to see what happened. Sergeant Gun Seok regains consciousness when he hears the voice of his commanding officer calling him over. The firefighters head toward the tunnel to help the injured, while Commander Myung Jun pats Gun Seok on the back and tells him not to think about anything and just follow orders. Warrant Officer Kong Myung Jun says he understands the sergeant's feelings, but asks him to focus on the mission and not think about anything else. Sergeant Gyun Seok apologizes for his thoughtfulness to his commanding officer and says he's ready to move out on the mission. Second Squad Leader Kong Myung Jun points to the sergeant's feet and asks him to stand so that all the strength doesn't leave his legs, so as not to show weakness to the others. Sergeant Gyun Seok is distracted from his commander's words and listens to the firefighter squad's conversations over the radio. Gyun Seok's face takes on an expression of horror when he learns through the walkie-talkie that another squad of firefighters is under the rubble. The fire brigade surrounds the collapsed tunnel from all sides and thinks of a plan of action to remove the rubble. The firefighters listen to the sounds inside the collapsed tunnel and hear what sounds like someone raking the ground in front of them with their hands. Sergeant Gyun Seok and Warrant Officer Kong Myung Jun watch in amazement as the fireman's hands emerge from under the rubble. The firefighters run to the injured firefighter without slowing down and pull him by his arms to pull him out from under the rubble of the collapsed tunnel. The sergeant's eyes watch in horror and awe as firefighters pull people out of a passageway that one firefighter dug out with his own hands. Firefighter Du Jin's face, covered in dust and dirt, finally comes into view, and the firefighter's eyes stare tiredly somewhere in the distance. A second fire squad surrounds the dirty upside-down Dojin and questions him about what happened inside the tunnel. The exhausted tall firefighter very slowly but accurately tells what is happening inside the tunnel. There is not a single living spot on Dojin's face. Sergeant Goon Seok stands in the middle of the street proudly alone. He remembers Dojin's act and is ashamed that he couldn't recognize the tall fireman right away. The sergeant recalls the horrible words he said towards the guys, his face turning a shade of red which he covers with his hand. Silence falls on the construction site. Only the distant voice of the detective's assistant echoes between the concrete slabs. The detective's colleague jingles the metal handcuffs he holds in his hand and walks up to the top floor of the construction building where he missed his colleague. He looks around carefully, holding the handcuffs in his right hand and cannot find where the senior detective has disappeared to. The voice of the assistant detective searching for his colleague comes over the walkie-talkie, which lies lonely on the concrete floor. The detective sits bound hand and foot near the large blue barrels and is unable to answer his partner's call on the radio. 
He yells loudly in the direction of the serial arsonist to let him go immediately and tries to get out of the tight ropes. The detective notices that his body is tied to some blue barrel in which a strange liquid, which smells like gasoline, is splashing. Serial arsonist Ji Hong carefully places the blue barrel near the entrance to the seventh floor and asks the detective not to fidget too much. Otherwise, he risks dousing himself with the flammable substance. The detective raises his head and looks contemptuously in the direction of the criminal, but decides not to say anything so as not to bring trouble on himself. The serial arsonist calmly pours the fuel from the gasoline canister into the blue barrel and says that he now understands exactly who has been cowering on the lower floors all this time. Chief Ji Hong explains that he was very scared of getting caught, so he decided to hide inside the building until things settled down. He continues pouring fuel into the barrels and notes that he did absolutely the right thing when he decided to disarm the detective and tie him up. The detective listens attentively to the criminal's musings but can't figure out what kind of swarming ants the serial arsonist had in mind. The policeman comes to the conclusion that those sleeping bags, which he recently saw, do not belong to the criminal at all, but to some guys and he begins to worry for their safety. Serial arsonist Ji Hong whistles a tune to himself and continues pouring fuel into the blue barrels. The detective looks at his walkie-talkie and tries to think of a way to contact his comrade and warn him about the culprit. The assistant detective looks at his walkie-talkie. He is very concerned that his fellow detective is not answering his walkie-talkie to his request. The police officer is distracted from his musings when he hears the loud footsteps of a man coming down to the lower floor. Sergeant G. Gyun Seok walks down the stairs with his bag and unexpectedly meets eyes with the assistant detective. Gyun Seok didn't expect to see a policeman on the lower floors. He realizes that now he has no way out of the situation. The exchange of glances between the sergeant and the assistant detective ends as soon as they notice the walkie-talkie flying down from the top floor. Young firefighter Ho Su, Ye Rin, and Do Jin watch the upper floors of the building from where the quiet voices of people are coming from. The boys watch as the detective's walkie-talkie flies out from the top floor and swiftly flies down towards them. The assistant detective scrutinizes the sergeant and demands that he explain what he forgot at the construction site, and Gyun Seok can't string two words together. Sergeant Goon Seok puts his bare palm forward and asks the cop not to jump to quick conclusions. Yaren looks up carefully and watches in amazement as the falling black radio flies down with great speed. The young firefighter abruptly grabs Yaren by the shoulder and pulls the girl away from the flying downward police radio. Junior Sergeant Hosu holds the girl tightly in his arms, his eyes glowing a bright blue light due to the fact that he has used the gift of seeing the future. The detective sits tied up next to a barrel and contemplates the plan he plans to use to warn his colleague of the danger upstairs. The cop watches the serial criminal and waits for him to be distracted so he can put his plan into action. He realizes that he's bound hand and foot, so he won't be able to get out anytime soon, so he decides to throw his walkie-talkie downstairs to signal the seriousness of the situation. The assistant detective ties up Sergeant Gon Suk and charges him with disorderly conduct and then arrests him. Sergeant Ji Gyun Seok stands against a concrete wall and tries to explain that he was in a building under construction to catch an arsonist. The assistant detective hears a foreign voice coming from behind him and turns toward the sound. Young firefighter Ho Su is standing with Yaren on the stairs and explains to the assistant detective that they were able to find serial arsonist Chi Hong. Junior Sergeant Ho Su walks up the stairwell with Do Jin and Yaren walking behind him. The hero tells the police officer that the culprit is hiding on the top floor. The assistant detective looks at Hosu and the guys following him in surprise, not expecting to see someone other than the serial arsonist at the construction site. The story rewinds slightly as the young firefighter pulls Aaron aside to keep the heavy police radio from hitting her head. Junior Sergeant Hosu quickly jumps up from his seat, much to Aaron's surprise, and picks up the fallen police radio. Du Jin looks confusedly towards the fleeing Ho Su. Everything happens so fast that the tall firefighter can't find the words. Yaren stares at the fleeing young fireman incomprehensibly. She fixes her cap and yells after Ho Su to wait for her friends. Ho Su doesn't listen to his friends' shouts at all and just keeps speeding away to get to the department store building under construction. The young fireman realizes that the serial arsonist has been at the construction site all along, and he plans to climb to the top floor to stop him. 
Do Jin and Yaren run after the young fireman? They don't understand what exactly is going on, but decide to follow Ho Su by all means. Ho Su, a junior sergeant, doesn't stop for a second, turns his head toward the guys catching up with him, and shouts to them that the serial arsonist has been at the construction site from the beginning and has been hiding on the upper floors. As the detective waits for help from his partner, he looks fearfully at the serial arsonist who starts talking nonsense. Serial arsonist Chi Hong exposes his teeth in a horrible smile and complains to the police officer that he had a very hard time when everyone was looking for him on the streets of the city. Chief Chi Hong continues to smile madly, his eyes widen to a remodel, and he raises his arms up, crossing them in prayer, and begins praising the fire department. Chi Han continues his tirade about the great mission he is obligated to accomplish for the fire department and uncorks the cream hose cork with his teeth. The serial arsonist plugs the pump hose into the gasoline canister and continues pumping the fire mixture into the blue barrels. Chief Chi Hong turns to the detective with a smile on his face and tells him that he must prepare something outstanding for the firefighters or their call will go to waste. The young firefighter takes quick strides across the stairwell, followed by Dojin and Yaren, who try to question Ho-Su about what's going on. Aaron runs after Ho-Su, breathing heavily, but finds the strength to ask the young fireman about Sergeant gun who can handle the arsonist himself. The young fireman's eyes light up with a radiant blue light, and he assures the guys that the sergeant can't handle the arsonist without their help. Ho-Su tells them that Sergeant gun Seok, by his own account, carefully scoured the huge building every day, climbing higher and higher, but only managed to get to the fifth floor. Serial arsonist Ji Huan manages to hide from his pursuer despite the sergeant's efforts to carefully inspect the building under construction. Chief Ji Huan hides in a secluded corner and waits for Sergeant Gyun Seok to finish his thorough search of the building under construction. A young firefighter tells his friends that a serial arsonist has taken a detective from the police department hostage. Du Jin looks toward Ho Su and ponders how to proceed now that the criminal has taken a police officer hostage. Aaron looks fearfully at the hero. She was shocked by the news that a serial arsonist went so far as to kidnap a police officer. The young firefighter continues to climb the concrete steps at a brisk pace. He talks about how if the police squad hadn't arrived on the scene, Sergeant Gyun Siok could have been held hostage. But even so, he notes that the situation is critical. The assistant detective pins Gun Siok firmly against the concrete wall and handcuffs him, while the sergeant tries to justify himself and explain the situation. After a few flights of stairs, the guys reach the assistant detective and the sergeant, and Ho Su warns them that there is a criminal on the upper floors. The assistant detective's face takes on a look of surprise when Ho Su holds out to him the walkie-talkie of his co-worker who recently went missing. The cop gets nervous. He twists Sergeant Gaon Suk's arms and asks the guys in a loud voice who they are. The assistant detective warns that if the guys answer wrong, he'll break the wrists of the sergeant he's handcuffing. The young firefighter talks about how they don't have time to argue because the other detective is now being held captive by a serial arsonist. The assistant detective listens intently to Junior Sergeant Ho Su's story and asks him to tell him exactly what happened here. Serial arsonist Chi Hong looks up at the sunny sky and talks about how everything should be luxurious today for the fire department's arrival. Chief Chi Hong slowly spills the flammable liquid around the barrels, where the tied-up detective of the police station sits. The policeman tries to free his body from the tight ropes, but his feet only slip on the flammable liquid which smells like gasoline. The detective looks under his feet with great apprehension. He realizes that he is in great danger, and there is no way out of this situation. The serial arsonist laughs loudly and says that for more fire squads, we need to set up a big scene. The fire squad guys run with the assistant detective and discuss along the way a plan to stop the serial arsonist and save the policeman. The cop pulls a cell phone out of his pocket and talks about calling for backup just in case. The assistant detective hears the sound of splashing water. He freezes in place and looks at his feet. A serial arsonist is pouring gasoline down the stairs with a canister and pump hose, coating the stairwell with the flammable substance. The fire department guys and a police officer look up and try to figure out the source of the strange sound coming from the top floor. Sergeant Gyunseok looks up and is startled to see a serial arsonist up ahead, spilling gasoline on the stairs.
Boss Jihoon's face lights up with a creepy smile as he calls the guys and the cop little ants who are interfering with his great cause. Serial arsonist Chi Hong sprays gasoline in all directions and talks about how the guys shouldn't have been in such a hurry because they would have gotten an invitation to the Grand Festival anyway. A policeman watches the whole scene with horror and notices his colleague who is tied to the blue barrels with a rope. Yeren and Do Jin watch in amazement at the serial arsonist's madness, while Sergeant Gyun Seok is frightened and doesn't move from his seat. The assistant detective runs towards the criminal, even though the stairs are completely filled with gasoline, and asks the arsonist where his colleague is. Serial arsonist Chi Hong smiles playfully and ignites a strange device in his right hand and prepares to set the gasoline on fire. The policeman holds the handcuffs in his hand and runs towards the criminal, but starts to hesitate when he sees the strange lighter in Chi Hong's hand. The serial arsonist apologizes to the policeman and talks about needing even more time because he didn't have time to get everything ready for the night. The arsonist points out to the cop the flammable mixture that is spreading all over the stairs and asks him not to move or he will set it on fire in no time. The policeman looks at the huge puddle of gasoline under his feet and is afraid to make any movement. Serial arsonist Ji Hong puts his finger to his lips and asks the policeman to keep his voice down and then he won't hurt anyone. The guys and the policemen stop at the entrance to the top floor, all realizing that there is no way to capture the arsonist now. The assistant detective contacts the police station and tells them what happened, while Ho Su talks to the guys and discusses a plan of further action. Du Jin turns toward a police officer who is on the phone and asks if anyone has contacted the fire department. Yaren takes a seat on the wooden blocks and says that the assistant detective has already reported the situation to command. Junior Sergeant Ho Su turns his gaze to the tall firefighter who addresses his question. Du Jin tells Ho Su that he has always trusted him and tried to act without a shred of doubt, so he asks if he can trust the hero in such a difficult situation. Young Sergeant Gun Seok watches the discussion between the two firefighters and looks back and forth at Ho Su and Do Jin. Ho Su says that Du Jin can trust him completely, while Aaron points out that there's no other way to capture the arsonist, so they have no choice. The tall firefighter only gives a brief expression of agreement and looks at Ho Su with a smile, and there's a sepulchral silence between the guys for a while. Sergeant Gyun Seok takes a strong interest in the young firefighter that Do Jin is relying on so much in a dire situation. The detective sits silently tied to a barrel and contemplates a plan to escape from the serial arsonist while he's distracted by his work. The arsonist, Ji Hong, grabs the policeman by the head and tells him that the detective is now an important hostage to him and he cannot let him go. There is an urgent meeting at the Situation Center in Chakdo City regarding the situation surrounding the serial arsonist who is at the Neo Department Store construction site. The dispatcher is scrutinizing a myriad of screens and notices a message from a police assistant on the monitor display. He beckons the commander over and asks him to peruse the recordings of recent calls that pop up on his monitor. Colonel Chakdo of the Central Fire Station questions Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin about the police officer's emergency call. The Chief Coordinator reports that they were able to figure out the location of the serial arsonist and officers from the fire department are already on the scene. The colonel looks at Yu Seobin carefully and asks in surprise if the fire department is at the scene, hoping that the chief coordinator has just misspoken. A large number of fire trucks rush to the scene, led by a yellow car that belongs to a special rapid response unit. Sergeant Hyun-seong scrutinizes the police officer's report from the scene where the special response team is headed. To everyone's surprise, the team notices that several cadets are already at the scene from the words of the assistant detective. The commander looks over his squad with a smile and calls the candidates from the fourth squad, real lunatics. The foreman from the special relief squad watches in amazement at the turmoil that reigns in the Chakdo City Central Squad. The second fire squad checks the reports from the scene and prepares to leave towards the construction site of the shopping center. The commander hears his cell phone ringing. He asks the fire department to take their time preparing the fire truck and demands to wait for his orders. The commander's cell phone display shows the name, Ko Jin, who is the commander of the third squad. Warrant officer Jin Chul talks to his colleague from the second squad and tells him that Yeren is already at the scene. The center director looks at the third squad leader who is very worried about Yeren without much emotion. The second squad leader orders Brigadier Jae Ying to print out the call information 
and then goes back to talking to the third squad leader. He looks carefully at the call list and realizes that headquarters has declared a stage two fire emergency. The center director adjusts his fire helmet slightly and keeps his eyes on the road through the windshield of the fire truck. A huge number of fire trucks rush through the night city towards the construction site of the Neo shopping building. The firefighters arrive on the scene in daylight. They set up small yellow tents and prepare to hold a general meeting. The head of the police department, Sampho, arrives at the construction site with his aides and looks around the area. A colonel from the fire department headquarters arrives at the site with Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin and announces the start of the briefing. The firefighter gathers in a spacious yellow tent, where an officer shows a recording from a TV news channel on a small screen. The fire and police chiefs are informed that the TV station's helicopter managed to capture a short video of a perpetrator in a building under construction. A firefighter shows the short footage, which shows the serial arsonist on the top floor of the building with a smile on his face, waving his hand, and a bound man lying next to him. The chief coordinator takes his gaze away from the monitor due to mild disgust and asks the firefighter if he was able to understand what the perpetrator was yelling. The head of the police department and the colonel of the fire center learn from the firefighter's words that the perpetrator is requesting that all attempts to enter the building cease, or else he threatens to immediately burn the building down along with the hostage. A special fire team enters the command tent during the briefing to familiarize themselves with the situation. The chief of police loudly assures that he has no intention of negotiating with the hostage taker and asks them to find another way. The special assignment unit listens attentively to the police chief's statement and waits for a reaction from the colonel from the fire department. The police officer scrutinizes the map of the building and cannot say for sure if there is another way to enter the building without the perpetrator's knowledge. The chief of the police department notices the special squad and declares that from this point forward, all firefighters in the squad are subject to the instructions of the police. He turns his back to the firefighting squad and in a calm voice tells the firefighters to do everything possible to prevent the fire. The colonel of the central fire station turns to the special fire brigade and asks them if they understand the order. Chief Coordinator Yu Su Bin and the special fire brigade unit say in unison that they have understood the order and are ready to carry it out. A firefighter abruptly runs into the command tent and pointing somewhere behind him says that there is a huge crowd of reporters outside. The firefighter tries to stop the huge crowd of reporters with his hands and asks them not to get close to the building under construction because the firefighters are conducting a special operation. Police officers assist the firefighters and help them push the crowd of reporters as far away from the dangerous facility as possible. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin, along with the head of the police department, carefully slides the entrance of the tent and watches the huge crowd of reporters. Senior Officer Do Yoon volunteers to help with the huge crowd of reporters and heads for the tent's exit. Following the senior officer is Sergeant Yun Seong, who also offers his help against the reporters. The colonel of the fire department keeps a close eye on the firefighters from the special unit as they leave the tent at a fast pace. The firefighters from the special squad leave the tent and rush towards their colleagues with great speed to help them deal with the crowd of reporters. The senior officer, along with a sergeant, hear the sound of helicopter propellers and look up to see the source of the noise. A blue reporter helicopter flies over the heads of the firefighters and takes a bird's eye view of the scene. The firefighters, along with the police department chief, are outraged when they notice a helicopter from another TV station circling above the firefighters. The police department chief comes out of the commander's tent and yells profanities toward the reporter's helicopter, but the police chief's words do not reach the pilot's ears. The helicopter hovers over a mall building under construction, and a reporter peers out of the helicopter, intent on capturing the scene with his camera. Reporter Seth Bale picks up a massive camera and begins his aerial report over the town of Chakdo. The firefighters who remained at the police headquarters of the special fire squad are watching the breaking news report from the scene with their phones. The second fire squad of the Chakdo Fire Department is closely watching the report from the scene. Instructor C.O. Lee Gon is awakened by the loud noise of the TV and watches the breaking news program out of the corner of his eye. A firefighter shows a breaking news program that is live and fears the wrath of his supervisor. The chief of the police department asks his subordinates in a loud voice what kind of TV station is running the program and orders his officers to get rid of the reporter's helicopter urgently. 
The viewing of the urgent news report is interrupted by a policeman who bursts into the commander's tent holding a walkie-talkie. The policeman holds the walkie-talkie firmly in his hands and says that a message has come in from the officers inside the building. The chief of the police department and the colonel of the fire center turn toward the policeman and are surprised to learn that there is a fire department inside the building. Young firefighter Ho Su takes the police radio in his hands and contacts the commanders to report the situation inside the building. He contacts the chief of the police department using the walkie-talkie and at the same time watches a breaking news report on his phone. The young firefighter's eyes shining brightly blue, Ho Su asks the police department chief to rescind the order to stop the TV crew from filming by helicopter. The police department chief takes the walkie-talkie in his hands and indignantly asks the young firefighter why he should rescind his order. Chief Coordinator Yu Su Bin looks questioningly at the special squad leader, hoping that in his eyes he will find the answer to the reasons for Ho Su's actions. The special squad commander exchanges glances with the chief coordinator, showing that he doesn't understand the young firefighter's actions either. The chief coordinator turns his head toward the colonel of the fire department, who is beginning to boil with anger at the young Sergeant Hosu's unceremonious behavior. A cold sweat runs down the special squad commander's face as he notices the accumulated emotions of anger and resentment on the colonel's face. The police department chief continues to listen to Junior Sergeant Hosu's suggestion, but his head is turned toward the angry face of the fire department colonel. The chief coordinator, along with the special unit commander, head towards the exit of the tent to avoid being caught in the fire department colonel's hot hand. The fire department commanders listen in amazement to young firefighter Hosu's speech, which is broadcast on all the firefighters' radios. Hosu tells the police department chief that serial arsonist Ji Hong is often distracted by reporters' helicopters, and due to this weakness of the criminal, he proposes an operation to catch him. Sergeant Ji Gyun Siok looks at the young firefighter with surprise and terror in his eyes as he is not afraid to lay out his plan in front of the police and fire department chiefs. The firefighters from the special fire department, who are sitting in their office, marvel at Junior Sergeant Hosu's courage. Instructor Seo Li Gan swaying in his chair, a slight smile appears on his face after Hosu's words that he heard over the radio. Fire Chief Huang Chil Jo, Without taking the walkie-talkie out of the police department chief's hands, he talks about how everyone is currently gathered here to help the police in this case. He looks menacingly at the walkie-talkie he snatched from the police department chief's hands and waits for Junior Sergeant Ho Su to respond. The young firefighter tells the fire chief on the walkie-talkie that he is well aware of the situation with the walkie-talkie he has. Huang Chiol Jo asks Hosu what the hero considers to be an important obstacle between the police and firefighters when making a plan for the operation at the meeting. Sergeant Goon Siok covers his hands as if he's about to explode. He realizes that Ho Su is now walking through a minefield and his mistake will cost him his job. Junior Sergeant Ho Su answers the colonel's question and says that the people in the building are an obstacle to the work of the police and firefighters. The chief of the police department silently watches the fire department chief's conversation and decides not to intervene in the dialogue. Fire department center director Chakdo puts his hand on his head as he hears the conversation between the police department chief and Lance Sergeant Hosu over his radio. The department chief's serious tone greatly scares the second team that is left at the fire center. They are worried that the hero might lose his place in the fire department forever. Huang Cheol Jo says over the radio that he is not going to gamble with Ho Su, where human lives are at stake, and is going to end the conversation. The firefighters from the special unit discuss the altercation that took place between Ho Su and the fire chief. They admire Ho Su's courage because even though they are there, their whole body is gripped by a strong shiver. Instructor Seo Li Go sits on his chair, leaning on his arms and listening to his co-workers talk about the young firefighter. C.O. Lee Go rocks back in her chair and assures that the police will do as Junior Sergeant Ho Su asked her to do. The special squad's conversation is interrupted by a loud voice coming from the squad radio station placed in the office area. The chief of the police department snatches the radio from Huang Chul Jo and asks Junior Sergeant Ho Su through it what the plan is. Instructor C.O. Lee Gan turns to his colleagues and says that the police department's agreement was obvious. The firefighters from the special unit are surprised by C.O. Lee Gan's statement. They don't understand why the instructor feels so strongly about the matter. 
Instructor Seo Li Gong begins to show various gestures towards his colleagues who are watching him closely. A special squad firefighter tries to pass to Sergeant Seo Li Gong. He is very angry that the instructor is belittling his intellectual abilities, and his colleague tries to stop the angry firefighter. Sergeant So Li Gong shows his co-workers three fingers and tells them that the special police squad was founded exactly three years ago, but in that time there have been no serious incidents in Chakdo. Instructor Seo Li Gong makes a few gestures with his hands and says that the event the police department has been longing for has finally come to pass. He points to his phone screen and talks about how it was the police officers who called in the reporter's helicopter to arrange black PR for themselves. Seo Li Gong explains that the police department has an opportunity to prove why the special police squad is needed in Chakdo City. The firefighters from the special squad are shocked by Seo Li Gong's reasoning. They didn't think that the situation with the serial arsonist could lead to such a plot twist. The junior sergeant talks about how he was able to get permission from the police department and now the team can act. The young firefighter turns his head in the direction of the indignant remarks that fly from Sergeant Gaon Suk's direction. The sergeant sees Ho Su's impetuous gaze on him. He swiftly waves his palms and asks the hero not to look at him with that look. Du Jin and Yeren turn around towards the sergeant and watch his strange reaction after the young firefighter's words over the radio. Sergeant Gyun Seok dues the young firefighter later to say that he was the one who made him do such a reckless act. Junior Sergeant Ho Su nods slowly and begins to chuckle quietly at Sergeant Gyun Seok's remark. Gyun Seok turns to the tall fireman and asks how Do Jin managed to meet a guy as reckless as Ho Su. The tall fireman looks at Sergeant Gyun Seok carefully and asks him if they've ever met before. The young sergeant coughs slightly and tells Do Jin that he's obviously confused about something because they haven't met before. He puts his hand on the assistant detective's shoulder and suggests that he take care of the hostage release, while he says that he'll keep an eye on Ji Hoon's movements. Sergeant Gyun Seok looks at Do Jin and can't think of a suitable role for him in this operation to catch the criminal. The tall firefighter stands across from the sergeant and suggests that he go with the detective to rescue the hostage. Du Jin walks past the young firefighter and asks Ho Su what exactly he should do during the operation, and the hero asks only to check his cell phone. Sergeant Gun Siok, Do Jin, and the assistant detective get together and prepare to run to the top floor of the building under construction. They rush down the stairwell pretty quickly and try not to slip on the gasoline that Chief Ji Hong spilled before. Yaren adjusts his cap and asks the young firefighter if the operation is going according to the general plan. Hosu turns to face the girl, his cheeks lifting slightly in a smile, and he says that the operation is under his full control. Senior Officer Do Yoon can't believe that the head of the police department authorized a reckless operation. Do Yoon discusses the situation with the chief coordinator and his squad leader, while nearby the police chief clears things up with the fire chief. Fire Chief Huang Chiol Jo clutches tightly at the clothes of the police chief, while a police officer tries to separate the two chiefs. Yaren and Hosu wind thick ropes around concrete bars, the girl not entirely sure if the young firefighter has come up with the best option possible. The girl winds the rope tightly on the concrete column, and Hosu asks the girl not to worry because he is confident in his plan. Junior Sergeant Hosu says he has looked at several options for the future and his plan is the safest, among all of them. The stockpile of thick rope is slowly depleting and the guys finish preparing the trap for the serial arsonist. The young fireman looks at Yaren and talks about needing the girl's strength as soon as their conversation is over. Aaron doesn't understand what Hosu is talking about and looks at the confident young firefighter with round eyes of surprise. Hosu ties a rope around himself and runs towards the open terrace of the mall building under construction. The young fireman pays no attention to the girl's anxious cries, his eyes shine brightly, and he runs straight ahead at full speed. The reporter's helicopter makes several circles around the construction site of the mall building to capture every bit of the building on camera. The reporter turns off his microphone and marvels that he has gotten his hands on such an exclusive report that will make him golden. The man sits in the open window of the helicopter and asks the pilot to fly as close to the building as possible so he can catch all the important moments before the police change their minds. Fire Chief Huang holds the police department chief by the collar of his clothes and asks him not to trust such a significant plan to young firefighters. The police department chief strongly implores Huang on Cheol Zhou to let him go. He points out that, 
The fire department that is inside wouldn't have been able to get out any other way. The chief of the police department assures the colonel that if the fire brigade that is inside would have just gone outside, it would have led to even worse consequences. He says you can't stand idly by in such a critical situation because every minute of time is precious. The fire chief clenches his teeth tightly and the veins on his forehead swell with anger, but he doesn't say anything back to the police department colonel. The chief of the police department asks his colleague to come to his senses because the plan Hosu came up with is perfect for such a critical situation. Han Chul completely disagrees with his police colleague, explaining that the plan will only benefit the police officer, because if the operation fails, he will be able to blame the firefighter who came up with the plan. The chief of the police department takes a hard look at his colleague and decides to let him say what he thinks about him. The argument between the two chiefs is interrupted by the sergeant's loud report that a special police unit will soon arrive on the scene. The chief of the police department looks on with a smile on his face, as the special police squad is stationed in a temporary tent camp. The head of the fire department looks at the elite squad arriving. He realizes with horror what kind of game his colleague is really up to. The head of the police department says that he will take full responsibility and make sure to recover all lives from the captivity of the serial arsonist. He swipes his finger near his temple and says that it's impossible to sensationalize around such a case, but the fire department can do a great job of helping in this matter. The fire chief breaks free from his subordinate's grip. He walks over to the policeman and grabs him by the scruff of his clothes. People gather around a large screen television set which is showing a breaking news report from the scene of a construction accident at the Neo Department Store construction site. Every place where there is a TV set is broadcasting a live breaking news report about serial arsonist Ji Hong and the plight of his hostage. Chief Coordinator Yu Seo Bin reports to his superiors that they were able to pinpoint the exact location of serial arsonist Ji Hoon because the criminal turned on his cell phone. Chief Ji Hong squats and watches the breaking news report with his cell phone. The serial arsonist's face lights up with a bright smile. Chief Ji Hong is very happy to have so much interest and attention. The criminal opens an internet site of a TV news channel where people correspond in real time and chats words of thanks to the police and fire department for their work. A detective watches the serial arsonist's actions with a disdainful expression on his face, but realizes he has no power to stop the criminal at this point. The policeman hears some muffled stomping to his right and turns his eyes in the direction of the source of the noise. The detective sees to his right a small squad consisting of Do Jin, a sergeant, and his assistant who has come to free him. The policeman makes a hand gesture that the bound detective didn't make any unnecessary noises, while the rest of his team scans the area for the perpetrator. Chief Ji Hong is distracted from his phone and rapturously lifts his head up and stares at the ceiling in silence for a while. The serial arsonist looks around and walks along the spilled gasoline toward the balcony where the reporter's helicopter recently flew over. Chief Ji Hong walks over to the metal fence and watches the reporter's helicopter winding circles around the building. The reporter broadcasts live, showing the perpetrator Ji Hong reappearing on the balcony deck after a long time. The serial arsonist leans on the metal fence and watches the sun, which will soon hide behind the horizon. Chief Ji Hong eagerly waits for the sun to set and night to fall so he can set the grand fire he has dreamed of for so long. The serial arsonist watches the slipping rays of the sun with a crazy smile on his face and shouts loudly from the balcony deck that his name will be remembered forever. The TV breaking news reporter continues to film the perpetrator, and the viewers on their TV screen see the serial arsonist once again hiding in the back of the building. The reporter shouts to the pilot that it is urgent to turn the helicopter around so that the arsonist can be watched for a while longer. The pilot objects to the reporter's words and says that their television station had negotiated with the police on completely different terms. The detective stares in surprise at the serial arsonist, who slowly heads in his direction and stops a few meters away. Warden Ji Hong rubs his beard with his hand and talks about how he is completely unaware of the name of the detective in front of him. The detective is sitting tied to a barrel, but with the help of the rescue squad, he managed to free his hands from the restraints. The policeman fidgets his legs in different directions and tries to free them from the thick ropes while Ji Hong gives his speech. The serial arsonist tells the detective that he was always called Chief Choi and shows him a cell phone screen with a breaking news broadcast. 
The perpetrator smiles broadly as he points his finger at the running line of the breaking news broadcast and says that his name is Choi Ji Hong. Sergeant Goon Seok and Dojin hide behind a nearby stone wall and wait for the serial arsonist to get distracted again. Chief Ji Hong talks admiringly about the firefighters who helped him remember his real name. The detective opens his mouth in surprise. To him, all the serial arsonist's words are complete nonsense that he doesn't understand. The serial arsonist's face quickly changes from calm to irritated, his veins swollen, and his name is Choi Ji Hong. The detective unties the knots of the ropes and watches as the criminal screams his name nonstop. The cop is completely free of the ropes and abruptly jumps up from his seat to grab the serial arsonist. The detective almost touches the criminal's clothes, but because of his quick movements, he slips on the spilled gasoline and falls to the floor. The serial arsonist looks at the lying policeman in surprise. He didn't expect the detective to be able to free himself from his ropes. The criminal looks ahead of him in confusion, and the rescue team runs out from the right side towards the fallen detective with a loud shout. Sergeant Gaon Seok looks at the serial arsonist. They don't dare to get closer to him because they fear the criminal's further actions. The assistant detective picks up the fallen detective and looks disdainfully towards the serial arsonist. Several emotions slip onto Chief Ji Hong's face, ranging from surprise to outrage when he sees the sheer number of people in front of him. The story shifts back a few minutes. The detective notices the rescue team and asks his assistant what kind of people have gathered with him. Du Jin squats down and begins to untie the ropes that have immobilized the police officer, and the assistant detective explains to his colleague that he needs to get out of here faster. The assistant detective helps Do Jin untangle the ropes, while Sergeant Gyun Siok uses his phone to track the location of the serial arsonist and asks his friends to hurry. On the screen of the young sergeant's phone, a live news report is turned on, with cameras watching the actions of Chief Ji Hoon. The detective asks the rescue team to just loosen the rope so that the perpetrator won't suspect anything, and they have a chance to capture him, while Sergeant Gun Siak cautiously looks around. The detective tells his assistant that as soon as the criminal Ji Hong lets his guard down, he'll grab him with his bare hands and asks him to be the backup. The detective's wrist bears the marks of the many ropes that held the cop tight for a long period of time. The detective's assistant is very worried about his colleague, who has suffered a lot from the actions of the criminal, but decides not to argue with the policeman. The detective looks at his assistant with a smile and quietly asks him and his team to leave him and says that he will cope with the criminal himself. The events of the story return to the moment where the rescue team watches in horror as the detective slips on gasoline and falls at the feet of the serial arsonist. A look of surprise is thrown off Chief Ji Hoon's face as he shouts loudly toward the rescue team and hurls insults in their direction. Sergeant Gyun Seok looks at Chief Ji Hong very confused, unlike Do Jin, who was prepared for this turn of events. The serial arsonist pulls out his lighter from his pocket and says that now the rescue team, along with the detective, will learn the consequences of not listening to him earlier. The rescue team watches the criminal Chi Hong in silence. They realize that every next move could be their last. Warden Chi Hong clenches his teeth tightly in a fit of anger. He is very tired of everyone around him trying to thwart his grand scheme. The serial arsonist looks around at the rescuers and talks about how the people who didn't listen to his words turned him into a monster. Chief Ji Hoon's feet slowly approach the rescuers, his boots making squelching noises as he steps on the spilled gasoline. Du Jin and Sergeant Gyun Siok stare silently at the criminal approaching them, who clutches a lighter tightly in his hands and prepares to set them on fire. The serial arsonist, Ji Hoon, comes up close to the guys and holds the lighter up to their faces, saying that he should have caught Chief Choi earlier. The assistant detective and the policeman open their mouths in horror as they stare at the perpetrator, terrified that they could be set on fire at any second. Serial arsonist Ji Hong runs towards the rescue team with a burning lighter, but the squad manages to dodge and avoid the brutal fate. Chief Ji Hong looks at the men who dodged him with anger in his eyes. He says that now they realize who they are dealing with. The serial arsonist takes a few swings of his lighter at the people, and says that now everyone can see his true colors. The firefighters along with the police officers try to stay as far away from the lighter fire as possible and slowly heal back. A reporter's helicopter flies over a building under construction and films the serial arsonist's attack on the rescue squad.
The people in the restaurant are distracted from their food and tensely watch the breaking news report from the helicopter. The perpetrator, Chi Hong, continues to point the burning lighter at the people and talks about how he is going to burn with them so that everyone will remember his name. Chief Ji Hong's face contorts into a creepy smile. He says that once the curtain falls on his life, he will start a new beautiful life as a serial arsonist. The police officers watch in horror as the mad arsonist is ready to burn everyone around him, including himself. Du Jin and Gyun Seok realize that they are in great danger, but they can't do anything about it and just silently listen to the words of the madman in front of them. Young Sergeant Gyun Seok hears a strange noise coming from his left side and turns his gaze there in surprise. Serial arsonist Ji Hong focuses all his disdainful gaze on the rescue squad and notices no one around him. Du Jin slowly makes his way towards Chief Ji Han, despite the criminal's warning that he will set fire to anyone who comes near him. The serial arsonist waves his lighter in front of him and looks fearfully at the tall firefighter who slowly approaches him. A young firefighter Ho Su's voice echoes throughout the building, saying that only Chief Chi Hong is a victim and a spectator. Chief Ji Hong is greatly surprised when Do Jin identifies himself as a fire sergeant from the Dako Security Center. Du Jin says he is a firefighter who saved a huge number of people single-handedly during the tunnel collapse in the Maybon Mountains. The serial arsonist is overcome with terror after the tall fireman's words, and cold sweat begins to flow profusely down his face. Bright rays of sunlight illuminate Sammy's small chemical plant, which is located on the outskirts of town. Manager Kim walks up to his boss's workstation with a huge stack of papers to hand to him. Chief Ji Hong licks his fingers and reaches for the firefighter's monthly books that Manager Kim has collected for him. Chief Ji Hong reads one of the monthlies, which is dedicated to firefighter Do Jin, who single-handedly saved a huge number of people with just his hands. The tall firefighter tells the criminal that the story will tell of the meeting between the great firefighter Do Jin and the serial arsonist and Ji Hong's name will not appear on any line of the news story. Sergeant Giyun Seok confirms the tall firefighter's words, saying that anyone who hears Do Jin's name immediately knows who they're talking about. Do Jin turns his gaze to the young sergeant and listens intently to the enthusiastic speech directed at him. Serial arsonist Ji Hong is shocked by the words of the young sergeant and Do Jin. He didn't expect to see a true legend of the fire department in front of him. Chief Ji Hong rejects the squad's offer to surrender voluntarily and continues to wave the burning lighter in front of him. Criminal Chi Hong freezes with his burning lighter in place when he hears a loudspeaker voice coming from somewhere above. Several police helicopters hover in the air above the unfinished mall building and shine bright spotlights on Chief Ji Hong's figure. The bright beams of the helicopter spotlight illuminate everyone on the top floor of the building. The police officers cover their eyes with their hands so that the spotlight beam doesn't blind them. A voice blares from the helicopter's loudspeaker, urging serial arsonist Chi Hong to surrender immediately, and a small SWAT team quickly lands on the roof of the building via rope cable. Chief Ji Hong looks intently at the helicopter, from where the voice of the commander of the special police squad comes from. The serial arsonist puts his head down and realizes that it's all over for him now, and the special police squad will soon capture him. The spotlight beams brightly illuminate the figure of Chief Ji Hoon, who stands immovably still and contemplates his plan of action. A sudden smile lights up the face of the serial arsonist. Another crazy idea has entered Chief Ji Hong's mind. Chief Chi Hong, without raising his head, loudly thanks the firefighters for giving him an idea to leave his name in human history. Du Jin and Sergeant Giyun Siok try to look in the perpetrator's direction, but the bright beams of the spotlights blind their eyes and prevent them from seeing Ji Hoon more closely. The serial arsonist says he's found a way to remain the protagonist until the end, and he jumps down from the balcony of the building. Young firefighter Ho Su rushes toward the balcony railing and his body is strapped with a safety rope. The reporter's helicopter cameras capture serial arsonist Chi Hong flying swiftly down from the top floor of the building. Junior Sergeant Ho Su runs toward the balcony deck to intercept the culprit, his eyes glowing bright blue as he uses his ability to see the future. Under the beams of the helicopter's bright spotlight, Ho Su jumps out of the building and grabs the serial arsonist, who flies down from a great height. The people who had been watching the breaking news report the whole time grab their heads and stand up from their seats in surprise. In the briefing tent, 
All the firefighters and police officers watch as the serial arsonist flies down from the top floor of the building. Instructor C.O. Lee Gan snatches the phone from his colleagues to carefully watch the latest snippets of the report from the scene. Senior Officer Do Yoon grabs his head and can't believe what he sees above the special, and the special squad captain opens his mouth in surprise. Sergeant Hyun Seong and his colleague from the special fire squad watch the falling serial arsonist in silence and amazement. The fire chief and the police department chief watch with open mouths at the rapid progression of events. The reporter of the TV news channel is frozen and amazed by the criminal's actions and cannot get a single sound out of his mouth. A young firefighter, Ho Su, tied with a safety rope, jumps out of the balcony and catches the falling criminal, Ji Hong, with his hands. Sergeant Gyun Siok and the police officers look at the spot where serial arsonist Ji Hong was just a short time ago. Gyun Siok makes a dash toward the balcony to find out what happened, while Do Jin silently watches the scene unfold before him. Sergeant Gyun Seok grabs onto the iron fence and tries to see where the perpetrator fell while the police officers slowly approach him. The young sergeant doesn't see where the perpetrator is gone and, to everyone's surprise, runs to the stairwell to get down a little lower. Yaren grits his teeth and holds on tightly to the rope to pull the young fireman out along with the serial arsonist. The girl holds the thick rope with both hands and moves away from the balcony railing with quick jerks. Chief Ji Hong looks around in surprise and realizes that someone has grabbed him and saved him from falling. The young firefighter's eyes glow blue, and he swings the rope from side to side to find himself back in the building under construction. Junior Sergeant Ho Su kicks the balcony railing with his feet and rushes into the building with Chief Chi Hong. Ho Su pushes the serial arsonist away from him with one palm and lands with both feet on the concrete floor. Chief Wan Ho lets out a frantic scream and flies several meters inside the building, still unaware of what is happening. The police rapid response squad quickly descends the ropes following the move and penetrates to the bottom floor of the building. The special police squad points their weapons at the serial arsonist and orders him to surrender immediately, while police and firefighters descend from the upper floors to see what happened. Chief Ji Hong looks around him in amazement and can't understand what happened and why he is back inside the building. The serial's eyes fill with tears of indignation as he glares angrily at the young firefighter who thwarted his grand plan. The bright light from the police gun illuminates the face of the serial arsonist, and the spotlight of the police helicopter illuminates the silhouette of Junior Lieutenant Ho Su. The detective and his assistant bring out the handcuffed criminal Chi Hong, while the police officer tries to keep the huge stream of journalists away from them. With the serial arsonist's face covered with a white rag, Chief Chi Hong hears a myriad of questions coming from the mouths of reporters. Fire Chief and Chief Coordinator Yu, so Bin silently look at serial arsonist Ji Hong. Fire Chief Huang Chul and Chief Coordinator Yu Seo Bin turn back as they hear the voices of reporters coming from behind them. A female reporter and a reporter walk up to the chief of department and ask him on camera a few questions about the recent incident involving serial arsonist Ji Hong. The reporters are very interested in the man who managed to save Chief Chi Hong at the very last moment. Blinding camera flashes blind the chief coordinator and the chief, who tries to cover his eyes with his hand to avoid going blind. Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin suggests that the commander return to the main center soon so that the reporters will leave him alone. The reporters don't lag behind the fire department chief for a moment and keep asking him questions while the police department chief watches in the background. The chief of the police department is very angry that all the journalists' attention is directed only at the fire brigades and no one notices the work of the special police unit. The firefighters are gathering near their vehicles and preparing to return to base after the hazardous emergency has been lifted. Empty fire tents continue to remain at the construction site of the commercial building for some time. Several fire crews, along with a special police unit, remain on the scene for a short patrol of the surrounding area. The police manage to apprehend the dangerous criminal, but the decision has been made to have the police and firefighters work together to conduct a thorough search of the building to dispose of all flammable liquids. A police officer observes his irritated commander, who expresses indignation at the end of the incident. The chief of the police department expresses resentment that the fire department got all the glory. The police officer, with a smile on his face, recalls young firefighter Ho Su, who saved a serial arsonist without a second thought and says it was awesome. 
The chief of the police department looks questioningly yet irritably at his assistant, who admires the fireman's action. The police officer coughs and tries to change the subject and asks his commander if there are any more assignments for the special police squad. The assistant chief notes that if an explosive or flammable substance is found in the building, it would be a good result for the special police squad. The chief of the police department looks at his assistant with disappointment and asks him to cut the nonsense. The director of the Chacto Department Center arrives on the scene. He turns to hear the voice of a firefighter calling out to him. The fire brigade officer suggests that the center director check on Yaren and Hosu, who still haven't been released home and have been ordered to stay. The center director turns away from the officer and says that the boys have already flown the nest and nothing will happen to them. The firefighters, along with a special team, gather in one tent to discuss the events at the construction site. Young firefighter Ho Su stands in the command tent with his friends and waits for the words of the commander who called him here. The fire department chief sits on a chair and talks about how the young firefighter has ruined the entire system with his actions, while Chief Coordinator Yu So Bin stands behind listening to the chief's words. Standing next to the young firefighter are his friends who were at the scene and helped him with the capture of the serial arsonist. The fire chief points out that the hero's actions put several dozen firefighters in jeopardy. Senior Officer Yu. So Bin listens attentively to the chief's accusations and closes his eyes as he ponders how he should proceed. Young Sergeant Gyun Seok looks around absent-mindedly and then says that he was the one responsible for the operation. Young firefighter Ho Su loudly interrupts the sergeant and says that he is ready to be punished for his reckless actions. Sergeant Gun Seok looks contemptuously at Junior Sergeant Ho Su and in his head calls him a fool for taking the fire upon himself. Fire Chief Kiel Jo turns his head toward Aaron, who talks about being willing to be punished. The girl explains to the commander that everyone understood the seriousness of their misdeeds from the beginning, so they're willing to be punished. The commander sighs heavily and says that it is the responsibility of the boys to restore the inviolability of the system that they themselves have broken. The lights in the convenience store burn brightly, illuminating the nighttime streets of the big city. The guys gather together outside the store to store and discuss the situation amongst themselves. Sergeant Goon Siok warns the guys to gather at nine o'clock tomorrow near the headquarters so as not to be late for the disciplinary committee meeting. He walks a few meters away from the guys, then stops and shouts after them that he will tell them more about everything tomorrow. Yeren stands next to Hosu and tells Sergeant Gyun Seok to go home soon and not to worry about anything. The young firefighter looks at his friends and says to the departing sergeant that they have become each other's battle buddies. Junior Sergeant Hosu turns his gaze to Aaron as she asks him more about the situation at the construction site. Yaren asks the hero, was there another way that would have helped them capture the serial arsonist even easier? The young firefighter puts his head down and sadly assures that he chose the best way, but he couldn't have foreseen what would happen after catching the culprit. Du Jin and Yaren listen intently to Junior Sergeant Ho Su's speech about how he chose an outcome where there wasn't a single loss of life. The tall firefighter nods toward Ho Su and talks about how even if there were no hostages inside the building, a fire in such a huge building could have caused unpleasant consequences. Du Jin points out that the whole city could have caught fire in a chain at once if they'd allowed a fire at the construction site. The young firefighter agrees with Dojin's opinion, but doesn't look up. He feels ashamed for putting his friends in harm's way. Dojin and Aaron look worriedly at the slumped Ho Su, who asks them if they're okay with the situation. The young firefighter points out that no one will realize that their actions saved a huge number of lives and no one will ever thank them for it. The hero raises his head and is surprised to see a smile on the faces of his friends, who are not the least bit upset about the situation. Yaren adjusts her cap and says that the pathos of Staff Sergeant Hosu's speeches made her shiver. The girl explains that she's been running her whole life and didn't care if anyone found out about her perseverance, so she asks Hosu not to worry about nothing. Tears well up in Hosu's eyes from happiness, and Dojin and Yaren look away somewhere and contemplate the disciplinary committee meeting. The bright rays of the morning sun illuminate the central headquarters, where the disciplinary committee meeting on the serial arsonist case will be held very soon. The guard emerges from his booth. He hums music to himself and sweeps the floor of excess dust and accumulated leaves. 
He hears the sound of a car pulling up and peers through its windshield to see who exactly is pulling up to his checkpoint. The guard quickly straightens up when he sees the car of the commissioner general, who has personally come to inquire about the situation. The driver informs the commissioner that they have arrived at the central fire department of Chakdo City. The commissioner general is holding a cell phone in his hand and is perusing the breaking news report on the serial arsonist case. A security guard quickly picks up a corded phone and calls the control room to announce the commissioner general's arrival. The guard's voice shakes violently because no one expected such a high-ranking figure to visit the Chakdo Division fire station. Young firefighter Ho Su writes to his friend Do Jin about bragging heartily during the disciplinary committee, so that Sergeant Ji Hong doesn't become the protagonist of the whole incident. The sun shines on the Chakdo fire station, where the firefighters start their hard work with renewed vigor and discuss the recent incident among themselves. The firefighters, along with their commanders, listen to a breaking news report that focuses on the work of a special police squad to gather evidence at the scene. The firefighters grab their heads when they learn that the police department will be checking out the arsonist tools with the criminal Ji Hong. The center director sits in his office and also watches a news report that celebrates the special actions of firefighter Ho Su, who saved serial arsonist Chi Hong. The colonel looks at his secretary and asks in horror, why did the commissioner general come in person and not report this in advance? The secretary reveals that the commissioner visited her department just recently, and it was all because of the actions of firefighter Ho Su. The colonel adjusts his tie and grabs his headdress. He is very worried that he is going to have to talk to the commissioner general because of Ho Su's actions. The fireman contacts the professor, who is a member of the disciplinary committee, and says that the meeting will be held a little later. The colonel, along with his secretary, show the fireman to finish his conversation as soon as possible and approach them. The head of the department explains that the commissar general has arrived and demands that the office be put in order immediately. The fireman looks at the colonel uncomprehendingly and does not understand why the commissar general should arrive so soon without any warning. The fireman realizes that the commissar general has already arrived at the fire station and quickly begins to clean up the office with the secretary and the colonel. The fire chief meets the commissar general in his office and dialogues with him about the reasons for his unexpected appearance. The commissioner general drinks hot coffee and tells the commander that he will personally attend the opening of the special rapid response and ambulance center. The fire chief thanks the commissioner for such great attention to the special unit and asks if his personal presence will interfere with other plans. The commissioner general looks at his chauffeur and says that the police are very eager to show off their special squad, if the television reports are to be believed. He suggests that since the police are drawing their attention to the special police squad, the fire department should keep up with them. The commissioner explains that the chance to show the media the face of the fire department, especially when it comes to the special squad, should not be missed. The fire chief agrees with the commissioner, and the commissioner puts the cup on the table and talks about making some noise since this is what happened. The commander looks intently at the commissioner, who inquires about the recent winner of the firefighter contest. The aide tells the commissioner that the winner of the firefighter contest was from the Chakdo Safety Center. The Commissioner General smiles and points out that the city of Chakdo is filled with a lot of talent among firefighters. The fire chief is surprised to learn that the Commissioner General is planning to hold a New Year's Eve event at the fire department's new special fire department building. The Commissioner General proposes to combine the New Year's Eve date and the opening time of the fire department's special detachment building, much to the surprise of everyone present. The assistant commissioner interjects information regarding opening the special response center on the same day as the New Year's Eve event. The commissioner general asks his assistant with a smile if there are any problems with combining the holiday and the opening of the new building, and the assistant nervously rubs his tie and says that he will certainly do his best. He turns to the central command commander and notes that the opening of the special response center is an event with great meaning. The commander is greatly shocked by the postponement of the opening date of the special response building, but tries not to miss a single word, the commissioner says. The commissioner suggests inviting the families of the award winners so they can grave comfortably watch the firefighter awards ceremony. He reaches for his mug of hot coffee without taking his eyes off the commander and talks about the fact that after the recent incident, public attention is heavily focused on the firefighters, so we need to forge iron while it's hot. The commissioner general puts his foot on his leg and finishes his coffee and stares intently at the fire chief's reaction.
The fire chief looks at the commissioner in surprise and asks him exactly what he means. The commander is shocked that the commissioner general is celebrating young firefighter Ho Su, to whom the eyes of the entire community are fixed. A breaking news report reveals that the man who threw himself in the air and saved serial arsonist Chi Hong turned out to be Junior Sergeant Ho Su of the fire department. The fire brigade of Chakdo City's Central Division is surprised to hear a news report recounting his colleagues' heroic actions. The center director folds his arms across his chest and watches the breaking news report through the monitor screen. A wide smile appears on the center director's face as the reporter notes the young firefighter's special merits and points out that Hosu has already received a letter of appreciation. Sergeant Gyun Seok asks the guys in surprise why no one said anything about Junior Sergeant Hosu having visited the disciplinary committee before. The young firefighter scratches the back of his head and tells them that he was involved in the case of Koo Jin Dai, who was kicked out of the fire department. Sergeant Gyun Seok puts his hand over his face and talks about how the guys could have talked about their experiences with the disciplinary committee earlier and worries that he looks like a nerd in their eyes. Gyun Seok talks about how this is far from the first time he's attended a disciplinary committee meeting, but notes that he can't duck above Ho Su. Yeren looks at the sergeant with a smile and jokingly asks Gyun Seok for some advice. Sergeant Gyun Seok notices that it's quite chilly outside and suggests they go inside to get some hot coffee. The firefighter slowly approaches the entrance of the Central Fire Department building, where the disciplinary committee meeting will be held. Inside the building, one can see a large number of dark silhouettes crowding the narrow aisles of the fire headquarters. The Commissioner General heads towards the exit of the fire building while crowds of reporters gather around him to ask him questions. The Commissioner looks around and stares silently at the reporters, who take a myriad of pictures and shower him with endless questions. The assistant commissioner keeps the reporters away from his boss and asks them not to pester the gentleman with silly questions. Young firefighter Ho Su listens to Sergeant Gyun Suk's musings and pays no attention to what's ahead of him, while Do Jin and Yeren follow behind him. The commissioner general looks at the reporters surrounding him and without looking ahead reaches for the door handle to go outside. The young firefighter Ho Su is very taken by the young sergeant's words, and grabs the handle to open the doors to go inside. The Commissioner General opens the doors in front of him and looks intently at the guys in front of him, bright camera flashes coming from behind his back. Young firefighter Ho Su looks at the Commissioner intently and doesn't fully understand what's going on, and the guys don't pay attention to the chief at all. Young Sergeant Ho Su, along with the guys, notices the huge pandemonium of people that are right in front of him. A huge number of reporters meet the guys with camera flashes and ask a huge number of questions about the incident at the construction site of Neo Department Store. Du Jin cautiously looks around, cold sweat running down his face as he clearly didn't expect so many people to be in the building. Yeren slightly opens his mouth in surprise. He doesn't know what to say to the reporters in response to their questions and stares at them with wide open eyes. A huge number of microphones and camera are pointed at the absent-minded Hosu. The reporters continue to ask questions without waiting for answers to the previous ones. A junior sergeant with a slight look of bewilderment on his face notices the commissioner general ahead of the guys, but doesn't realize what he's doing here. The commissar general looks at the guys tiredly and continues to ignore any questions from the reporters. He takes a few small steps and slowly walks towards the young firefighter Hosu, who is standing away from the door. The commissioner notices with a smile on his face that the young firefighter is surrounded by a large number of reporters, but ignores it and continues to move towards him. The commissioner general walks right up to Ho Su and extends his hand to him to meet the young hero. The young fireman looks very absent-mindedly back and forth at the commissioner general and the hand he has extended towards him and doesn't know what he should do. The young fireman and the commissioner general exchange a firm handshake and a huge number of reporters begin to surround them and film them. The commissioner general smiles and congratulates Ho Su on making it to the special rapid response and ambulance center. Junior Sergeant Ho Su continues to stare absent-mindedly at the commissioner. He can't fully comprehend what is going on around him. Fire Department Chief Wang Chiol Jo contacts the rescue squad commander to discuss the situation around the commissioner general's statement. Chief Coordinator Yu. So Bin stands beside his commander and listens to his conversation with the rescue squad chief. 
The commander is distracted from his call and turns his head to the chief coordinator who asks if everything is all right. Chief Coordinator Yu. So Bin voices his concerns about the disciplinary committee meeting that was supposed to reprimand Ho Su. The fire chief corrects his watch on his wrist and says that it will now be quite difficult to reprimand the young firefighter and his team. Huang Chul Zhou looks at the head coordinator and asks him why he was the one to take the head coordinator's place when there were people much more capable than him. Yu Seo Bin puts his hands behind his back and says that there were indeed capable firefighters in his squad who could have taken his position. The fire chief's face lights up with a bright smile. He repeats his question once more and stares intently at the chief coordinator. Yu So Bin stares intently at the gathering commander and can't find the words to answer his question. The fire chief throws his jacket over his shoulders and talks about how they took their seats because they were able to stand out. He casts his gaze downward and talks about how there are some things that have nothing to do with system or order. Luck. The head coordinator looks at his commander silently. Kaol Joe's words shocked him, but he realizes that it's the absolute truth. Chief Chiol Joe points out that one must respect luck in any form to avoid becoming arrogant. The fire chief heads toward the exit of the office and explains that his position can't be obtained through outstanding ability alone. The commander tucks his hands into his pants pockets and says before he leaves that junior sergeant Ho Su is a very lucky man. Young firefighter Ho Su and his friends are at the disciplinary committee meeting and awaiting its decision. The colonel takes a few sheets of paper in his hands and reads the disciplinary committee's decision to firefighter Ho Su and the other three participants in the meeting. He adjusts his cap and reads out the decision that no punishment will be imposed on Lance Sergeant Ho Su and his friends. The loud words of the head of the disciplinary committee echo throughout the room. The head coordinator looks silently at the guys who are shocked by the colonel's decision. The second squad commander meets Ho Su in the control room and asks what the hero did during the weekend. The officer and sergeant watch with a smile as junior sergeant Ho Su reports to his captain. The center director sits at his desk and asks the young firefighter what he did on his day off. Lance Sergeant Ho Su salutes and says that he went to the mountains and slept, so there wasn't much to do during his day off. The young firefighter takes a seat at his workstation and hears young Jin's voice, who starts teasing him. The senior medic at the head of his team asks Ho Su what the hero did after his night shift and laughs at him. Junior Sergeant Ho Su smiles in response to young Jin's words. Oh, he's very happy that the entire fire brigade worried about him a lot during the serial arsonist incident. Yaren picks up his phone and replies to his commander's messages, who asks, What the girl is doing now? The girl is running through a park at night and concurrently responding to messages from her commander, who keeps distracting her with messages. The center director of the fire station is drinking his hot drink and watching the fire team training from his office window. The fire department is having a physical workout with Du Jin. All the firefighters are very exhausted and the tall firefighter offers to run another lap. Sergeant Ji Gyun Seok tells his commanding officer what happened at the disciplinary committee meeting and his meeting with the commissioner. The center director hands the young sergeant a hot drink and offers to sit down to tell him more about his meeting with the commissioner general. The center director smiles broadly and listens to the sergeant, who talks about the commissioner's expression of his respect for a job well done. The director of the center listens attentively to his subordinate and then states that if the sergeant has any problems, he will solve them in a flash and help. The sergeant of the special unit stumbles on the stairwell and flies fishily down, dropping the huge boxes he was carrying in his hands. Senior Officer Do Yoon looks at his sergeant carefully and asks him to stop making jokes and get to work. Special Squad Sergeant Do Yoon tearfully looks at his Sergeant Do Yoon's back and cries out that he really did fall and apologizes to his commanding officer while Sergeant Hyun Sung runs to his aid. Sergeant Hyun Sung picks up some boxes from the floor and offers to walk with him, and his colleague thanks him for his help. Senior Officer Do Yoon continues to walk forward and asks not to be named Special Squad Leader just yet. Sergeant Do Yoon takes apart the blue boxes of belongings and arranges them around his workstation in the office. In one of the open boxes filled with belongings, Sergeant Do Yoon notices an upside-down photograph on top of all the items. He leans over the box and scrutinizes the photo he holds in his hands. The special squad commander distracts Do Yoon from his thoughts and stands in the aisle and beckons the senior officer over to him. 
The special squad commander folds his arms across his chest and asks Sergeant Do Yoon how the move and preparations for the New Year's Eve event are going. Sergeant Do Yoon points out that it's a lot of work because the move to the new headquarters was announced out of the blue, so it's not easy to adjust the schedule. With a slight smile on his face, the special squad commander listens attentively to Do Yoon, who will soon replace him as special squad captain. The senior officer looks at his captain with a calm expression and states that everyone was looking forward to the move, so there will be a bit of a mess anyway. Sergeant Do Yoon casts his gaze once more at the picture that shows the old special squad staff when Song, his former mentor, was the commander. Lance Sergeant Ho Su and Officer Hei Day listen to the commander's warning that an official order has arrived for a New Year's Eve event to be held in a big way. The commander holds his head with his hand and notes with a smile that all the dignitaries will be at the event, including the commissioner general himself with the head of the province. Lance Sergeant Ho Su apologizes for causing so much inconvenience to his unit firefighter, and Captain Back notes that the hero should be proud of the job he's done. The second squad commander completely agrees with Captain Bake's opinion and notes that Hosu has a decent reason to be proud, since he's on the award lists. The commander looks back and forth at the monitor screen, then at Junior Sergeant Hosu, and tells the hero that he will receive an award from the Commissioner General of Firefighters at the award ceremony. The second fire brigade and paramedic team is greatly surprised that the young firefighter will be honored by the Commissioner General himself. The director of the center sits in his office and looks up information through his computer about the upcoming New Year's Eve event and the lists of firefighters who will participate in the award ceremony. Young firefighter Ho Su learns with great surprise on his face from his commanding officer and Captain Bayek that he will receive a special promotion to the first step. On the news channel, the anchors are very vividly discussing the opening of the special rapid response and ambulance center. The professor corrects his glasses and tells the anchors what exactly the special rescue and ambulance center will do. The firefighters from the special squad are getting ready to move and listening to a news report. The officer asks them to turn off the TV so as not to be distracted from their work. The firefighter turns off the TV, and Sergeant Hyun Sung and his colleague discuss the irritation of their commanding officer, Ik Kwan, who is nervous about the latest news. Hyun Sung and the special squad sergeant hear a familiar voice in the hallway and turn to the source of the noise to find out who is in the office. Instructor Seo Lee Gan welcomes his colleagues into the office and asks why everyone is so early in the move. Commander Ik Kwan looks at Sergeant Seo Lee Gan with slight irritation. He says that there are 10 minutes left before shift change and asks the sergeant to help his co-workers with the move to the new building. Sergeant Seo Lee Gong completely ignores his commanding officer's words and asks Sergeant Hyun Sung, where exactly is Senior Officer Do Yoon? Instructor Seo Lee Gong learns that the senior officer is at the warehouse and goes there to meet him. A sergeant from the special squad makes the assumption that the senior officer specifically went to the warehouse area to show Seo Lee Gong something. The guys laugh out loud as they discuss Do Yoon's surprise for Seo Lee Gong, and the instructor goes to the warehouse without suspecting anything. The story moves back a few years, with firefighter Seo Lee Gong sitting bored at his workplace and listening to the conversation of his colleagues. The firefighters from the special squad discuss the tragic story with Commander Seo Lee Gong and wonder about the decision to leave the commander's seat empty. Commander Ik Kwan asks his subordinates to put aside unnecessary talk and not take such a huge interest in the other fire team. Ik Kwan turns to his computer and says that the management will decide for themselves how best to proceed and sends the firefighters off to work. The commander walks down a large, long hallway. He is completely immersed in his thoughts and passes the office of the large assembly hall. The senior officer tells his comrades that their special squad team will only consist of three men and a temporary commander will be present during the day. Sergeant Hyun Sung and his colleagues sit with a tired look on their faces, with huge bags visible under their eyes because no one in the squad has been able to accept the loss of their commander. Sergeant Do Yoon notes that the special response squad will only consist of three people and explains that the squad leader's seat will be empty for now. Do Yoon's comrades listen carefully to the senior officer's words. They have long realized that the decision to empty the commander's seat is not a personal whim. Senior Officer Wee Do Yoon points out that everyone around him, including the command, thinks that the decision to empty the commander's seat is the whims of children. 
The temporary commander of the special unit stops a few meters away from the assembly hall and listens to Du Yun's loud voice coming from the office. Senior Officer Du Yun talks about how the decision to empty the commander's seat is just a postponement that will last until the squad members are willing to appoint a new commander. Hyun Sung and the special squad sergeant look closely at the senior officer and admire his unwavering determination. Sergeant Do Yoon says that he wants to prove during the deferment that only three people are enough for the second special squad team. The special squad leader leans against the wall and listens with a smile on his face to Do Yoon's reasoning that they don't need a captain because everyone is perfectly capable of handling their role in the squad. Chief Do Yoon says that he will change himself first and lead his loyal friends to change. The firefighters discuss amongst themselves the commotion that happened in the second special squad and observe their training. The second squad in full firefighter uniforms runs lap after lap around the fire station stadium, oblivious to the nighttime. Sergeant Do Yoon holds Sergeant Hyun Sung tightly by his clothes and forces him to run the last lap. The special squad commander interrupts the firefighters' discussion and encourages them to return to their squad to follow suit and start practicing harder. The firefighters from the third squad salute the commander and announce that they will go to work back in the building. The commander watches the firefighters as they head to the stairwell and quickly disappear into the lighted areas of the building. The commander's gaze quickly turns to the firefighters from the special squad being trained by Officer Do Yoon. The firefighters overcome their physical pain and continue to run forward with Senior Officer Do Yoon pulling them along. Sergeant Hyun Sung smilingly recalls the hard training he went through thanks to Do Yoon's willpower and help. The firefighter and chief officer Do Yoon are sorting through boxes in the warehouse, and the sergeant is distracted when he hears the familiar stomping of feet. Sergeant C.O. Lee Gan greets the senior officer, who isn't too pleased with the instructor's appearance here and asks him to wait in the office. Sergeant C.O. Lee Gong says that if he had stayed in the office, he would have been swamped with a huge amount of work, for which Do Yoon calls him insolent. Instructor Seo Li Gong looks at the senior sergeant carrying boxes with a smile on his face and asks why Du Yun called him in. Senior Officer Du Yun informs him that the organizational structure of the special squad has been adopted, and he wants Seo Li Gong to know everything in advance. Sergeant Du Yun sits down at his workstation, and Seo Li Gong leans on the bulletin board and expresses his uncertainty about the special squad building opening soon. Instructor Seo Li Gong continues to voice his worries about the upcoming event, and Sergeant Do Yoon asks him to be quiet for at least five minutes. Sergeant Seo Li Gong notices that a huge printer starts printing something on a large sheet of paper with a loud sound. The printer beeps that the printing is complete, and the sergeants from the special squad discuss about the things that need to be moved to the new building. Sergeant Seo Li Gong says with a smile on his face that he'll bring the paper from the printer because no one notices the printer finishing. Du Yun starts to get angry. Sergeant Hyun Sung is about to take the printed paper, but Sergeant Seo Li Gong snatches the sheet with a slight movement of his hand and tells his colleague that he is late. Instructor Seo Li Gong examines the printed sheet of information on the special squad with great interest. Sergeant Seo Li Gong learns that Do Yun is now the commander of the special squad and congratulates him on his new position. On a huge sheet of paper, the new members of the special special squad are revealed, with Wee Do Yoon as the commander and Sergeant Seo Li Gong as his deputy. The story moves to a psychiatric hospital with a sign at the entrance that reads, A house of love and hope that has prepared a new life. Behind the thick bars is the hand of a serial arsonist who has been placed in a psychiatric hospital for treatment of his disorder. From Warden Chi Hong's cell, there are sounds of indignation and dissent at the fact that he now finds himself locked within the walls of the hospital facility. Warden Chi Hong rises up on his toes to peer out the door window to see what is going on inside the building. A guard is patrolling the area and hears the loud voice of the criminal Chi Hong coming from his room. The guard turns sharply toward the serial arsonist's door and demands silence in his cell in a loud voice. Warden Ji Hong stares at the guard with his mouth open in surprise, but he immediately shuts up and the building falls silent again. The psychiatric hospital guard continues his patrol down the quiet corridor and checks the remaining cells. Warden Ji Hoon is outraged at not being called by name. He grits his teeth and yells loudly that his name is not number 207. 
Chi Hong's indignant screams are interrupted by a TV remote that flies straight at his head from his cellmate, who is fed up with the screaming. The serial arsonist falls to his knees. He grasps his head with both hands because of the pain and goes silent. The big man rolls up the sleeves of his clothes and says that if he hears the noise Ji Hong is making because of his name one more time, he will deal with him vividly. The criminal Ji Hong cautiously looks back at the criminal mastermind who asks what his name is. The serial arsonist looks at his tag, which is attached to his clothes, and says his name is number 207. Sunlight illuminates the Chado Central Fire Department, where the firefighters are busily discussing enlisting their guys in a new special operations squad. The second squad commander signs some papers, and looking at Hosu asks him when the enrollment in the special rapid response squad will take place. The young firefighter takes the signed papers from the commander and explains that there will be a New Year's Eve event on the second, and after that, the squad assignment will take place on the third. Chief Officer Hei Day and Chief Medical Officer Young Jin congratulate Ho Su on her promotion. Captain Beck, with a smile on his face, joins in congratulating the squad and says that if Sergeant Ho Su keeps moving at this pace, he'll soon be promoted to Staff Sergeant. The second squad commander believes that the young firefighter will go much further and become a special response squad leader in a couple years. He portrays Sergeant Ho Su, who has become a squad leader and can communicate with the head of the department as an equal. The second team of firefighters, along with a senior medic, laugh at their commander's impersonation, and Sergeant Ho Su gets embarrassed and says he wouldn't take advantage of his position. Officer Hei Day is distracted from the conversation between Sergeant Ho Su and the second squad leader when his colleague beckons him over. The commander tells the young firefighter that he really wants to see him as commander, and Ho Su turns his head to the guys who want to say something to him. Officer Hei Day stands next to the second squad sergeant and holds out a blue box as a gift from both of them. Sergeant Ho Su looks surprised at the box being held out in his direction, and Officer Hei Day explains to the hero that it's a gift in honor of his promotion to sergeant. Officer Hei Day places the blue box in Sergeant Ho Su's hands and explains that the entire team discounted him for a shared gift and asks the hero to open it. Sergeant Hosu is very surprised when he opens the gift, and then his eyes fill with tears of happiness and he expresses his gratitude to the entire squad for the gift. Young Jin sits at his desk and waves his hand away, saying that he has nothing to do with the gift. The blue box neatly contains the epaulets of a sergeant, and the entire fire department loudly applauds and congratulates Hosu on his promotion. From the fire brigade building at the central station, there are loud shouts from Sergeant Hosu as he thanks his team for the wonderful gift. Chief Medic Yong Jin puffs up his cheeks and says he doesn't understand why the team put on this show, because the epaulets will be given once more in the department, and calls the whole thing kindergarten. Young Jin feels very sorry for having to drop the money for the gift, even though he felt sorry for them, and Bo Ram slowly heads over to him during his reflection. Bo Ram touches the senior medic's shoulder and with a look asks him to follow her, and she quickly disappears into the doorway of the office room. The senior medic walks down to the ambulance and asks Bo Ram why she called him so suddenly. The girl smiles wryly and says that it's urgent to check the ambulance, and the senior medic doesn't understand why such a procedure is necessary right now. The senior medic opens the car door and points out that the back of the ambulance is a mess since Bo Ram jumped forward so quickly. Young Jin looks through the car and complains about the third team making a mess again, but suddenly his eyes fall on a strange object lying in the car. There is a red box lying on the seat of the ambulance, and next to it is a small envelope with a heart in the center. The commander puts his hands behind his head and asks Bo Ram, who has returned to the office space, how Young Jin reacted. Bo Ram only spreads her hands with a smile on her face and says that the senior medic won't be back with the guys for a while. Young Jin cleans up the inside of the ambulance interior and puts all the items in their proper places. The senior medic's face lights up with a small smile, and the shoulder epaulets of the senior sergeant's epaulets that the team gave him are painted on his shoulder. Yaren walks down a busy street and talks to her commander, who informs her that she is going to the second team's corporate party to celebrate Ho Su's promotion. The commander asks her to congratulate the young firefighter and asks Aaron to convince him that he really deserves the promotion. The girl asks her commander not to worry about Ho Su and promises that she will do her best to congratulate the young firefighter as sincerely as possible. 
A tall guy in a hoodie approaches Aaron and asks her how close is the corporate venue where Hosu's promotion will be celebrated. Du Jin points out that he would be extremely uncomfortable in unfamiliar company, but is going to go anyway because it's important for him to congratulate Ho Su on his promotion. Du Jin and Aaron stand in front of a huge building that lights up the night city with its bright glow, and it's in this building that Ho Su's promotion party is being held. The second squad is seated at a large table, and the commander raises his glass and congratulates Sergeant Ho Su on his promotion and asks the hero to prove himself to the new squad. The second squad commander tells Ho Su that it is very rare for firefighters to have such events and asks him to appreciate and remember the occasion with pride. Young firefighter Ho Su smiles broadly. He is very happy to see so many people who have come to congratulate him on his promotion. The commander of the second squad suggests that everyone should rather grab some food because the center director is paying for everything. The firefighters loudly applaud the director of the center, but he only waves away, making it clear that he does not want so much attention to his person. The commander has a rosy blush on his cheeks from the alcohol he drank, and he urges all the guests to order only pork or beef so as not to steal from the center director. Commander Bayek watches carefully as the center's director grievingly drinks a glass of vodka. The commanders sit at the same table but celebrate with everyone else. The guys clink loudly at the communal table and shower Sergeant Ho Su with a huge amount of congratulations in honor of his promotion. There are toasts and eulogies directed towards Ho Su from different parts of the table, and Young Jin is very concerned about his girlfriend Bo Ram and asks her to drink slower. The sergeant from the second squad talks about their first meeting with Ho Su. He says he is greatly saddened by the sergeant's departure, but also happy that the young firefighter will now serve in the special squad. Sergeant Hosu keeps the conversation going with his colleague, while in the background, Bo Ram scolds Young Jin for not fully grilling the meat. Sergeant and young firefighter Hosu smile as they reminisce about their shared firefighting experiences during their time at the Chakdo Central Station. Officer Heitai is distracted from his food and listens intently to the boy's conversation as he remembers the horrific forest fire on Mount Chakdo. The senior officer recalls an incident where a young firefighter, Ho Su, pushed him aside and thus saved him from a huge torrent of fire. The officer thinks hard about the incident on Mount Chakdo, his gaze drifting downward, and he thinks about what would have happened if a firefighter like Ho Su hadn't been around him. Senior officer Hei Day is distracted from his sad thoughts. His face lights up with a smile and he congratulates Sergeant Ho Su on his promotion from the bottom of his heart. Young Jin sits across from Bo Ram and, watching Ho Su sob again, complains that the young firefighter cries too often, and he's tired of listening to it. Bo Ram's girlfriend gets angry at the senior medic. She shoves lettuce leaves in his mouth and tells him that he should cry too. The center director, the second squad leader, and Captain Back sit at the same table. They clink glasses and raise their glasses to Sergeant Ho Su. The center director drinks his glass, and the commander and captain ask him, if he was satisfied with junior firefighter Ho Su, who caused a lot of trouble in the beginning. The center director looks at Sergeant Ho Su and talks about how he was unable to rein him in and hopes another firefighter will be able to do so. The center director turns his attention to the commander, who is very worried that young firefighter Ho Su will end up in the special firefighting squad. The second squad commander notes that in the center squad, Chakdo Ho Su was constantly covered up, and someone even turned a blind eye to his misdeeds, which may not be the case in his new squad. The second squad leader's musings are interrupted by Aaron, who has come along with Do Jin to congratulate the young firefighter on his promotion. Aaron greets the second firefighting team and looks for Sergeant Ho Su, while Do Jin stands behind her and tries not to show his face to the firefighters. Bo Ram points at Do Jin, who is hiding behind Aaron's back, and asks who the tall firefighter is who came with the girl. Sergeant Ho Su greets the new guests with a smile and says that the man standing in front of them is firefighter Du Jin. Senior officer Hei Day, along with the second squad sergeant, are greatly surprised when they learn that the strange guest is a tunnel collapse hero who saved many lives. Yaren actively greets the guys, while Do Jin takes off his hood and tries to find a place to sit down. The tall firefighter heads over to the table where the captains are sitting and bows low to greet them and fully introduces himself. The second squad leader greets Du Jin with a smile on his face and motions for him to sit with the others to share a communal meal. 
The tall firefighter thanks for the warm welcome, and the second squad leader asks to order only pork, causing the center director to choke up slightly. The commanders silently watch Du Jin, who wishes them a good meal, and heads to the communal table with all the guys. The tall firefighter sits down at the large table. Sergeant Sung Dok extends his hand to Do Jin to greet him. Senior Officer Hei Dae also greets Do Jin and says he's a big fan of his, and in the background, Young Jin asks Yaren about the tall firefighter. Sergeant Sung Duk looks at his hand after shaking hands with the tall firefighter and is amazed at Do Jin's high physical fitness. Do Jin notes that all the guys are very focused on him and thanks them for thinking only good things about him. Senior Officer Hei Day becomes uncomfortable after the tall firefighter's words and apologizes for his overly pushy behavior. Sergeant Sung Duke doesn't pay any attention to the officer's confusion and Do Jin's words and continues to ask the firefighter about his family. The medical officer reveals that Sergeant Ho Su has told him a lot about the tall firefighter and asks Du Jin to elaborate on how he was able to confront the criminal. The tall firefighter barely has time to answer the second team's questions. The firefighters keep asking him a huge number of questions and watching him curiously. Yaren asks the guys whether Sergeant Ho Su drank a congratulatory shot for such a memorable event as a promotion. Young firefighter Ho Su stares absentmindedly at the guys not really thirsty but realizing he has no choice, and Sergeant Sun Doc waves the bottle at him. Senior Officer Hey Day is distracted by a muffled ringing coming from his pocket where his cell phone is. Officer Hey Tay goes outside and talks to his mom on the phone. He tells her that Junior was promoted today, so the other team has gathered at a restaurant to celebrate. Officer Hey Day says goodbye to his mom, and he hears Sergeant Sung Doc open the door that leads outside. Sergeant Sung Doc was looking for the restroom, but gets lost in the huge room, and Officer Hei Day gives him directions. Officer Hei Day washes his hands in the restroom and hears the firefighter's concerned voice coming from the restroom stall. He wipes his hands and indicates that they are close to the firefighter who is sitting in the stall, and therefore wants to ask for his help. When the word money comes from the stall, Sergeant Hei Day starts to panic and says that his request has nothing to do with material. The officer asks if there will be a promotion exam next year, and he hears a clear yes in response from the toilet stall. As he turns toward the mirror and looks at his reflection, Hey Day expresses concern that he might get kicked out because he won't pass the exam. Sergeant Sung Deok says that he's the one who needs to worry about the promotion exam because he's facing a serious opponent like Hei Tai. He shouts loudly from the toilet stall that he's not worried about the exam at all, but he can't give a reason for his confidence. Sergeant Sung Deok compares the exam to a muscle exercise he does every day without paying attention to extraneous factors. Officer Hei Day listens intently to the sergeant's musings about a mirror that merely reflects the body and has no meaning. Sergeant Hei Day stares at his reflection for a long time. He tries to think about Sergeant Sung Dok's words that the exam is just part of his job. Sergeant Sung Deok comes out of the toilet stall. He washes his hands and asks the officer if his advice helped because he's not very good at it. Officer Hei Day smiles slightly in Sergeant Sung Dok's direction and says that his words are enough for him to make the right decision for him. The loud shouts of the boys reach the commander's table where the center director and commanders silently watch their subordinates having fun. The second squad leader says that it's time for the old guys to leave and let the youngsters have some fun, and the center director agrees with a smile on his face. Commander Back looks at the commanders in surprise as they raise their glasses and suggest they pack up as soon as possible. Commander Shin notes that the second team has a great atmosphere that he hasn't seen among other fire teams in a long time. The center director looks into his glass and talks about how it's usually no big deal in a fire organization to change members and turns his gaze towards the guys. The commanders clink their glasses with each other and offer to go out and drink together elsewhere so as not to embarrass the guys who are celebrating Hosu's promotion. The firefighters have fun at the shared table. Young Jin hugs his girlfriend, Bo Ram, tightly, and Aaron takes a picture of them on his phone screen. As the commanders leave the restaurant, they pull on their warm jackets and say goodbye to the guys, who stay behind to celebrate the young firefighter's promotion. The tall firefighter and Sergeant Sung Deok squeeze each other's hands tightly and have an arm wrestling contest. Du Jin makes a move and puts Sergeant Sung Deok's hand on the table with a sharp lunge and wins the sparring match. The guys stand in front of Young Jin and salute him as their senior and congratulate him on his promotion. 
The firefighters raise their glasses and toast to joining the special fire and rescue squad, and Bo Ram films them on his phone camera. Bo Ram gathers the firefighters in a big pile and takes some general photos that everyone will remember this wonderful day. Flakes of snow slowly fall to the ground and cover the tents that protect the crops from the harsh weather. A small family is discussing their son's transfer to another unit. The man is sure they shouldn't come for the sake of congratulating their boy on joining another fire department. The woman assures her husband that it's worth it to check on their son and notes that he might be offended that they didn't come to congratulate him. Snow slowly covers the new fire station building, which belongs to the new Special Rapid Response and Rescue Squad, and people are slowly approaching the entrance to the building where the big celebration will be held. A fireman sets several folders of awards for firefighters on a table. He asks the commissioner general to briefly familiarize himself with them, and when the announcer gives the command to simply hand them out from the podium. The commissioner general also familiarizes himself with the New Year's Eve speech to be given when the event begins. He carefully reads the speech sheet that the aide has provided him, and there is a sepulchral silence in the booth. The aide pulls the commissioner from his musings, and asks him if he is okay with the speech that has been prepared for him. The man points to his wife's cell phone buzzing in his pocket and talks about how as soon as they remembered their son, he called them immediately. He looks carefully at the screen of his phone and wonders why his son is calling at this hour, and the woman asks for the phone. The man picks up the phone and speaks to his son. He asks how the ceremony is going and wonders if they should come to congratulate him in person. The woman hears her husband and son talking, and as soon as the award ceremony is mentioned, she says that they should go to the celebration. The assistant commissioner is surprised when he asks about the start time of the event. He is trying to come to his senses and overcome his excitement. The commissioner general listens to the information from his assistant that the event is no more than ten minutes away, and suggests that they stay in the office for now and enjoy the comfort. A father listens attentively to his son's story, and talks about making sure to have a good breakfast on such an important day, while his wife keeps telling him what to ask for during the conversation. The woman adjusts her hat and then takes it off completely and extends her hand to her husband to talk to her son on the phone. A huge number of people gather in the auditorium. The announcer finishes his opening speech and asks the commissioner general to say a few words to the audience. The assistant commissioner general opens a small door and invites his boss to come on stage to give his speech. A man says goodbye to his son and wishes him every success in receiving the award and then hands the phone to his wife. The commissioner general walks on stage to the crowd's raucous cheers, and a reporter points a camera at him and takes a few shots. Young firefighter Hosu says goodbye to his mom and wishes his family a happy new year, then hangs up the phone. The commissioner general takes a seat behind the podium. He places a few sheets in front of him and prepares to make a short speech. A huge number of cameras brightly flash the figure of the Commissioner General, and the applause gradually subsides. Sergeant Ho Su looks carefully at the General Secretary, who is about to give a big speech congratulating and inaugurating the new fire center. The Commissioner General waits until there is absolute silence. In the crowd of people, he notices young firefighter Ho Su causing a small smile to appear on his face. The commissioner turns to the reporters and notes that they are so actively filming him behind the podium that they have blinded him and he can't begin to read his speech. He marvels at the sheer number of reporters at today's event and jokes that they are all gathered in line for the food being handed out at the entrance. The commissioner general understands exactly what the journalists expect from him. He folds the papers in front of him and says that the opening ceremony of the Special Rapid Response and Ambulance Center will be a little later. He takes a few papers in his hand and talks about how now everyone will have to listen to a boring congratulatory speech and then the award ceremony will take place. The firefighters and guests chuckle after the Commissioner General's words. They love the fact that he talks so openly to the reporters. The Commissioner General's face lights up with a beaming smile he says that since the early birds have flown here, something should be arranged for an early show to kill the worm. The reporters freeze in bewilderment. They don't understand what the Commissar General wants to show them. The Commissioner points his hand toward the hall and tells the reporters to look around carefully, for they almost missed the new commander of the rescue and ambulance squad. The reporters, along with the firefighters and guests present, turn back to see the special squad commander. 
Special Rescue Squad Commander Park Sai Hwan didn't expect such a setup from the Commissioner General and stares in amazement at the huge number of faces whose attention is focused on his person. Reporters turn their gaze toward Major Park Sai Hwan and use various devices to take pictures of his astonished face. A blinding flash of light flashes across the members of the special rescue team. Firefighters try to shield themselves from the blinding camera flashes, and only Seo Lee Gong, who fell asleep at the ceremony, doesn't care about the reporter's attention. Special Rescue Squad Commander Park Sai Hwan stares absent-mindedly at the camera lenses and waves his hand whimsically because of the awkwardness of what is happening. Instructor C.O. Lee Gon listens to music on his headphones, not caring at all what's going on around him or who's paying attention. Late firefighters from other brigades gradually pull up and take their seats in the back rows. Du Jin takes up a lot of space around him. The firefighters who sit behind him can barely see anything in front of them and try to get around his back. Brigadier Chang. Il is heartbroken as the ceremony begins and tears start to flow from his eyes, much to the surprise of the firefighters sitting next to him. Young firefighter Hosu sits not far from Yeren, and they enjoy the opening ceremonies together, which is presented by the Commissioner General. The provincial chief speaks behind the podium. He congratulates the firefighters on a wonderful celebration and hopes that the firefighters will be the ones to do the impossible. He finishes his pompous speech and all the firefighters loudly applaud as the provincial chief leaves the stage. The provincial chief bows low in front of the entire hall, and a huge number of bright camera flashes illuminate his silhouette. The host thanks the provincial chief for the warm words he spoke about firefighters during his beautiful speech. He announces the start of the award ceremony, Sergeant Song Dok, and Officer Hei Day nudge Ho Su by the shoulder and tell him that it will soon be his turn to go on stage. The host asks all the award contenders to come forward and wait in front of the stage, and a distracted Hosu carefully walks along the rows of his team, who shout his name loudly and applaud him. Sergeant Hosu buttons up his jacket and walks on stage to the award contenders to take a seat next to them. The young firefighter notices a strange firefighter with glasses ahead of him that he has never seen before and stops his gaze on him. The fireman with the black glasses notices Hosu's gaze that was directed at him and looks back at the young fireman. The young firefighters exchange glances with each other and ignore the firefighters who are being honored at this moment. The firefighters applaud loudly and wait for the provincial chief to personally hand out the certificates, while the gaze of the young firefighter with glasses keeps following Sergeant Ho Su. The host reads out the award for Staff Sergeant Kim Seung Bin, who receives the Shining Lives Award for being able to resuscitate a huge number of people. The presenter reads off the sheet another award, which is to receive a special promotion and a cash bonus. Young firefighter Ho Su scrutinizes the plaque with the name of the firefighter standing next to him. Sergeant Ho Su looks at the fireman with glasses with a smile and recognizes him as Chian Jin, who participated in the firefighting competition and won first place. Chian Jin realizes with horror that Wang Ho's friend is standing in front of him, worried that the young fireman might be angry with him for what happened to Wang Ho on that fateful day. Sergeant Hosu looks closely at Fireman Cheon Jin and raises his fist, which is pointed in his direction. Fireman Cheon Jin's face contorts in a grimace of pain and regret for his act that brought Wang Ho to the Walk of Fame. In front of Fireman Cheon Jin's eyes, the image of Wang Ho appears, who just like Ho Su was now bringing his fist up to him to congratulate him for some achievement. Junior Sergeant Cheon Jin Su bangs his fist against Sergeant Ho Su's fist and walks up to the stage to receive his award, which is labeled as To the Strongest Firefighter. Major Park Se Wan sits next to his special squad and listens to the presenter who announces the next stage of the awards, while instructor Seo Lee Gon continues to sleep in his chair.